Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Death at 710. Yes, we have that crime club book for you. Come right over. <laughs> You're here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. Death at 710 by H.F.S. Moore. The very intriguing story of a beautiful woman who was in love with death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. The train was due to leave at 710 in the evening. And at exactly eight minutes after seven, Mark Kent, a well-known mystery writer, was in drawing room B, his own drawing room, when the door opened. And he was surprised to see a young, beautiful woman. He was even more surprised at the way she giggled. (laughs) Hello. Hello yourself and see how you like it. My name is Susan Ward Steele. Well, I'm flattered, (laughs) but haven't you made a mistake? You're Mark Kent. The mystery writer. <laughs> I adore mystery writers. <laughs> mm. Mm. Well, your pictures don't do you justice. <sighs> How about getting me a drink? Uh, don't you think you've had enough? Oh, be a good boy and get me a drink. <laughs> i better get you back to your compartment. <sighs> I'm going to Reno. A long trip. I saw you come on the train. I knew it was going to be interesting. <laughs> I'm not going to Reno. You should have seen Gerald's face this morning when I said goodbye to him. He's my husband. Mm. Such a pain in the neck. Oh, look, Susan, do you mind... And you should have seen Claire Ellis' face when I told her that I was going to marry Pierce Carlton. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And my stepbrother, Robert Ward's face, when I wouldn't let him have the money. Mm -hmm. So many faces. And all so long. (laughs) Will you do me a favor, please? Mm -hmm. Oh, Pierce will marry me. You just watch, Mark. In six weeks, when I come back from Reno, (laughs) he'll never tell me again he's not the marrying kind. Yeah, yeah. How about that drink you promised me? I didn't, Susan. I want a drink. I've got to have a drink. Uh, Later, please. Anything. Water. Just Uh, drink. Take it easy, kid. Take it. I've never been so thirsty. Please. Water. Ginger ale. All about Chicago and points west. Susan. Albany, uh, West Stop. All about. No, no. Conductor. Conductor, hold the train. There's a dead woman on board. Four days later, Mark Kent was in a room at police headquarters with Captain McNair, his friend. They were comparing notes, the results of intensive investigation, and some speculation. <laughs> We start with the atropine, Cap. That's what killed her. Yeah, one pill. That's usually enough. Now, here's what the book says about atropine. Hmm. An organic alkaloid which causes death in humans without coarse anatomical change. No pain. That's right. Uh, Symptoms include dryness of mouth and throat, giddiness, wild talk. Death usually takes place within eight hours. The coroner told me there's no set rule about that. It can happen in six hours, in four hours, in one hour. Mm-hmm. It can happen in ten hours. Well, we know from what Gerald mm-hmm. Steele told us, Susan didn't get up until almost 11 o'clock. Yeah. Cap, are you willing to do some speculating? If it doesn't mess up the facts. What facts? All right, go ahead. But remember... You're not writing a book. This was a real murder, and I'm a real policeman. Now, we've got a pretty good idea of the kind of man Gerald Steele is. There's no record that he ever had a job. His wife, Susan, was very rich. So? Okay. We know that she left a will, giving him half her estate. Mm. And we know that she was going to Reno to get a divorce. Another man, Pierce Carlton. Mm. Now, let's combine what Gerald told us about that morning four days ago and what, for reasons of uh, self-preservation, he might have forgotten to tell us. Go ahead. I'm listening. All right. It's 11 o'clock. Susan Ward Steele has just gotten out of bed, and after the usual routine, she goes into the kitchen where she finds her husband sitting before a big breakfast. She's a little annoyed. Good morning, Joe. Enjoying yourself? Any objections to my being hungry? Oh, no. I thought today you might have less of an appetite. I'm not responsible for today, Susan. Ham, eggs, toast, and coffee. Is that your first helping, dear? Oh, nuts. You don't say. You're so articulate. 
Where's Tommaso? I told him to take the day off. You told him? Yes. What's the matter with that? But, darling, you don't pay his salary. I had an idea that we wouldn't want any strangers around the house today. You're so sweet. But I'm not spending today with you. Oh? I'm having lunch with Robert, tea with Claire Ellis, and then... Mm, would you like to guess? Cocktails with Pierce Carlton, the great send-off. Don't be so bitter. He works for a living. Sure. Well, at least he has an office. Pour me some coffee, please. Yes. You want eggs, too? No. Just black coffee without sugar. A full cup. You must have had a big night. Where'd Pierce take you? Places. Lots of people. I heard you slept well last night. Susan. You were snoring when I came in. Oh, for pity's sakes. First I get it because I'm eating, now it's because I slept. <laughs> you don't think much of me. You're a parasite, Gerald. And you're beginning to look like one. You don't care what you say, do you? Oh, don't tell me that there's pride under that expanding waistline. Just one more word out of you and I'll... Yes? <sighs> What's the use? I can't take it. I don't want you to go. Really? I'm thrilled. If you go through with the divorce, I don't know what I'll do. I know one thing you'll have to do. Get a job. Huh? Let me spell it for you. J-O-B. It's what people do for money. What'd you ever do for yours? Oh, smart. I picked a family with a rich uncle. Sure, you can talk. You inherit a million dollars. You're smart. Well, let me tell you one thing, Susan. Don't if you bother, honey. I've got something much more important to tell you. I'm not leaving you any money to live on. What? And I'm changing my will. I see. The half of my estate that you've been praying for will go to Pierce Carlton. If I should die. When do you perform the operation? After Pierce and I are married. In the meantime, if I should get hit by a truck... Yeah? Oh, darling, don't wish so hard. I'm really being very loyal to you. Yeah. Oh, well. What time's your lunch date with Robert? One o'clock. Good heavens, look at the time. I'll have to hurry. It takes me an hour to get my hair put up. Do you want some more coffee? Oh, I'd love it, but I can't spare a minute. Why didn't you tell me it was so late? It's your appointment, Angel. You, you should have... You don't want another cup? Oh, dear. I really need it. All right. Bring it in the bedroom. No cream or sugar. Yes, ma'am. Anything you say, ma'am. I aim to please. <laughs> There it is, Cap. Gerald Steele had motive and opportunity. You're only guessing, Mark. Well, the will's on file, isn't it? We got the story of the second cup of coffee from Gerald himself. Yeah, but the rest of the stuff, about the argument, about her changing the will. Pure speculation. The deductions of a mystery book writer. Mm. Now, what about Robert Ward, the stepbrother? He's about 15 years older than Susan, businessman. How's business? Well, we got a report from several banks that he's been trying to borrow money. They all turn him down. Uh-huh, that makes him an interesting suspect. Now, let's combine fact and fiction again and see what happened at lunch. Robert Ward told us that he'd reserved a private dining room for the occasion at the Swank Cafe Aurelia. Susan was very cheerful all through lunch. What time is your train, Susan? 7.10. No, it's only half past two now. I'm meeting Claire Ellis at three o'clock. Tea and gossip at her apartment. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have eaten so much. Susan... Yes, Robert. I've been waiting very patiently. What do you mean? You didn't ask me here to a private dining room to discuss my unimportant life. You're very clever. Thanks, darling. Now, what is it that you don't want your servants to overhear? I, uh, I need money. You? I know it comes as a shock, but the truth is I've, uh... How much, Robert? A hundred thousand dollars. Really? Of course, it'll be a loan, Susan. I'll pay it back in due time. I'll give you a note or a mortgage, whatever you like. Business is bad. And... I've had a very serious setback. My entire output of washing machine motors is defective. Oh, my. What's the poor housewife going to do? We know what's wrong, and we can correct it easily enough, but naturally, it can't be done without money. Naturally. I've never been without cash before, but I expanded recently, and that took all my liquid assets. <laughs> Even when you're in trouble, you talk like a bank statement. When did this delightful thing happen? Two weeks ago. Why didn't you come to me right away? Well, I didn't want to bother you. I'm a businessman, and naturally, my first call was at the banks. Naturally. Did they turn you down? They didn't consider me a good risk. Overexpansion. Oh, darling, you're as skinny as a toothpick. Susan, please don't be facetious. I'm in serious trouble. Oh. If I don't get that merchandise out of my factory, I'll go bankrupt. I won't even be able to pay my creditors. 
A hundred thousand dollars. Yes, it shouldn't mean anything to you. You can spare it. Oh, I can spare it. But tell me, Robert, dear, when did you ever do anything for me? Now, don't refuse me. You preached, called me a fool for not putting my money into a good, sound business. A wild, empty-headed fool. I tried to make you realize your responsibilities. Uncle Jeffrey left his money to us in good faith. It was our duty to protect it. I still got mine. And I've got mine in factories, machinery, and merchandise. Now I'm asking you to help me liquidate it. No. Good Lord, Susan, how can you be so heartless? I've been practicing. But... Very well, I'm not going to beg you. Don't give up hope, dear. I've taken care of you in my will. Thanks to Uncle Jeffrey, you have no choice. Half of your estate must go to me. And half of your estate should go to me. But where is it? You can look for it after I'm dead. Oh, what in the name of thunder did I do with those things? What things? My pills, my box of pickup pills. Oh, here it is, my vest pocket. So you've come to that, huh? Just these last two weeks, doctor's prescription. I've been living in the devil's own basement, tired and depressed. What do they do for you? They give me a pickup, that's all. Get the tired feeling out of my system, clear my head. Perfectly harmless. Hmm, sounds interesting. Would you like one? Why not? I had a big night, and I've got a bigger day ahead of me. One pill will keep you going for hours. Flip it into the back of your mouth and wash it down with water. After you, darling. Very well. I never take chances. Well, here's to you. Uh, how soon before it starts functioning? Very soon. And now I think we ought to go, Susan. I don't want you to be late for your appointment with Claire Ellis. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a possibility, Cap. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. So is a trip to the moon. Uh, uh, you better stick to writing mystery books, Mark. If you make a mistake, nobody burns. Except maybe your publisher. Did Robert Ward take a pickup pill while you were grilling him three days ago? Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me he had a box full of atropine pills when he met Susan Steele? Maybe. And that he passed them off as pickup pills? Maybe. But according to your own speculation, he took one of those pills himself. Now, why didn't it kill him? You might have had one in that box that was harmless. Huh? You know, a real pickup pill. Sure, sure. Put that in your next bookmark. It'll read fine. I will. But for the time being, you won't mind if I keep it a secret from the district attorney, will you? No, no, I don't mind. <laughs> Shall we go on? Go ahead. I'm on 24-hour duty. Well, the next stop that Susan Steele made was Claire Ellis's apartment. Now, what do we know about Claire? She served tea and ice cream cake. But not because she liked Susan. Oh, you've got a private line to her inner thoughts, huh? Didn't you notice how she was defending Pierce Carlton as um, you were questioning her? I noticed it. Yeah, he's the man Susan Steele expects to marry. And Claire's in love with him. Hmm. Now let's see what we can get out of the situation in which two women in love with the same man meet for tea a few hours before one of them dies on a train, the victim of murder by slow poison. I'll get the tea things, Susan. They're in the kitchen. Oh, there's no rush, Claire. I'm not meeting Pierce until five. The lovely romantic orchid room. <laughs> I told the sweet boy I must have orchids on our wedding day. Slews and slews of them. <laughs> Susan, you know why I asked you here? Of course. To plead with me. We used to be good friends. Used to be? I'm sorry to hear that, honey. Susan, don't marry Pierce Carlton. <laughs> He doesn't love you, Susan. <laughs> Pierce and I were practically engaged when I introduced him to you. Why did you make a play for him? You had a husband. I was smitten. You were smitten. Believe me, darling, I've been living in a delayed paradise for three whole months. You've never loved anyone but yourself, and the only reason you went after Pierce was because he was mine. He was a conquest. Does it make any difference? You'll never be able to keep him, Susan. <laughs> Pierce is in some kind of trouble. You have money. Did he tell you all about it? Uh... Well, he told me. Doesn't that prove something? Well, what is it, Susan? What's wrong with Pierce? It's confidential, dear. Between sweethearts. I'll get the tea if you still want it. Oh, I want it. I'm a glutton for punishment. I hope you won't have to take much more of it. Ever. <laughs> Why not? Hello, and don't keep me waiting. Oh, it's you. Of course, Gerald. Are you surprised to hear I'm still breathing? Where's Claire? 
Oh, she's downstairs sweeping the sidewalk. She pays off the back rent that way. I'd like to talk to her, please. Oh, she can't be disturbed. Now look here, Susan. But I can give her a message. Ask her to call me back. No love and kisses? Not yet. I was only thinking we might go for a walk in the park. A walk? How thrilling. Gerald, darling, when did you give up driving? Oh, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you might have held that phone for me, Susan. Who called? Pierce. He simply had to tell me how much he loved me. Claire, dear, watch your manners. Trays were meant to be put down, not dropped. I'm sorry. And those exquisite ice cream cakes. You almost ruined them. That one's for you, Susan. Thanks, dear, for remembering that I adore blueberries. I never forget a lot of things. Motive and opportunity. Love and ice cream cake. Hey, Mark? Well, that's how it looks on paper, Cap. You think Claire Ellis buried the atropine in the cake? Oh, she did. She's darn clever. But uh, I don't know anybody who chews ice cream. If she did. Now, how do you figure out the business about that phone call? Well, Claire Ellis told us that Susan had received a call from Pierce. Go on. Pierce denied it. But Gerald admitted that he phoned Claire and spoke to Susan. Mm -hmm. Claire didn't know about the call, therefore Susan told her it was from Pierce Carlton. Q.E.D. Whoops, not yet, Cap. We've still got to prove a murderer. Now, what about Pierce Carlton? He's in the stock brokerage business with his father. Good, solid family background, old stock. Yeah, that doesn't keep him from being a playboy, does it? I'm not interested in what he does, Mark, only in what he did four days ago. And in what he did before then. That goes without saying, my boys are checking. I think they're going to find that he's in a mess. A money mess. Anything's possible with you around. Okay. What happened the day we spoke to Claire Ellis? Your eyes popped. You saw a beautiful woman. Could be, but she was upset. Every time you mentioned Pierce Carlton, she had jitters. Why? Somebody told me she's in love with the guy. I told you, Cap. I oh, did. sure, I knew I couldn't have gotten it from the facts. She kept saying over and over that Pierce was innocent. He had no reason for killing Susan. Cap, that girl knows something. Well, so does everybody else in this case, except me. About Pierce Carlton, I mean. And I'm sure she didn't know it the day Susan was killed. Who told her? I don't know. What? Mark, did I hear right? Did you say you don't know? Uh, let's uh, let's go on to item number four. Susan and Pierce at the orchid room. Dinner before train time. Soft lights, orchids on the table. A perfect setting for romance. Darling, darling, six weeks, six long weeks without you. <laughs> He'll get used to it. Don't laugh at me, please. I'm going to miss you terribly. There's a lot of excitement in Reno and cowboys. Yes, how can you say that to me? Don't you like cowboys? I like you better. How was Gerald this morning? Oh, why talk about him? Why not? He's human. What's the matter with you? You'd rather talk about everyone but us. <laughs> it's a wonder you don't ask me about Claire. You know, I saw her this afternoon, too. Why don't you have to ask me about her? You never could take kidding, could you? Oh, I didn't realize. Pierce will be married just as soon as I can get back from Reno. Have some more wine, Susan. You'll be waiting for me at the station. I don't want to come back to New York and be alone for a minute. Suppose I'm not waiting. But you've got to be. Why? Because I'm depending on you. I'm going through a divorce for you. For me? I thought it was because Gerald ate too much. Pierce, would this come under the head of what you call kidding? Put your head on my shoulder and I'll, uh, I'll tell you a secret. I'd rather look you straight in the eye. I've been doing a lot of thinking. Yes? I've come to the conclusion that Gerald is a nice guy. What does that mean? You ought to stick with him. You know, till death do you part. You didn't think so last night. I wasn't thinking last night, honey. The whole process started this afternoon. I woke up and there was a vision of a wedding bell. It scared the wits out of me. You're out of luck, Pierce. I'm not letting you out of your promise. Look, Susan, be sensible. Marriage and I were never meant for each other. I'm just not the marrying kind. No? Put your head on my shoulder and I'll tell you a secret. I'd rather just keep sitting beside you. Do you remember a certain crying jag that you had on a couple of weeks ago? Susan, I've never been drunk in my life. You were that night. And you told me a whole lot of things that you're going to regret in just about a minute. Suppose you tell them right back to me now. You lost a lot of money on a gambling boat before I met you. Huh? You paid off in IOUs. And when the gambler got tired of waiting for the cash, he threatened to see Papa. 
That's when you became a thief. Good Lord, Susan, what are you talking about? You took bonds out of your father's safe. He's got so many of them, you were sure they'd never be missed. I told you that? Your conscience was bothering you. <laughs> Bet you didn't know you had one. It's a sense you haven't. No, dear. I might really like beating your father, telling him about those bonds. Yeah? I'm so glad you'll be waiting for me when I get back from Reno. Yeah. Come to think of it, not every woman wants to marry a thief. Oh, I'm lucky, huh? All right, let's celebrate with a drink. Friends? What else? You hold all the aces. <laughs> then we'll drink to that. Oh, no. Don't waste it that way. What's wrong? Let's lock arms. Then I'll drink out of your glass and you'll drink out of mine. Why, of course. Just like real sweethearts. Yes, dear. There's nothing like good old sparkling burgundy for launching a new life. Properly. There it is, Cap. The last episode. And you finish it with the old switch trick. The atropine pill in Pierce Carlton's glass. <laughs> I'm surprised at your mark. It's corny. Well, it happens to be true. Poison or no poison. Found out about it only this afternoon. You don't say. Who told you? Waiter in the orchid room. He saw them lock arms. And he remembered for ten bucks. What? You give me the name of that guy. I'll have him brought in here and I'll Easy book him. Easy. Oh. Hello, Captain McNair talking. Homicide. That's all right, Finley. Go ahead. Uh, what? Are you sure? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, check in at headquarters and file a report. I'll take care of the rest. What uh, sign of the horoscope were you born under, Mark? I don't know. Why? Well, you're either very smart or very lucky. Pierce Carlton lost $80,000 on Jimmy Bryson's gambling boat four months ago. Uh-huh. Uh, Finley just got it from Bryson himself. The uh, debt's been paid. That's how it is, Cap. When you go by character, you can't go wrong. Maybe I ought to have a little more respect for you, huh? Well, I'll just read my books and I'll be happy. Yeah. Now, let's see. We've got four suspects. Gerald Steele, the husband who was going to be left holding the empty bag. And who was still in the will for half of the fortune. Right. Mm -hmm. Robert Ward, the stepbrother who needed money and was turned down. He's in the will for the other half. My money's on him. Uh, maybe. Claire Ellis, the lovesick rival, and Pierce Carlton, who didn't want to get married but who talked too much to Susan. Every one of them had motive and opportunity. What does your imagination advise us to do now? Uh... I got an idea, Captain. Hmm? Can you get me a sample of Susan Steele's handwriting? Yeah, her signature's on her will. I've yeah. got a copy of it over there in the case file. All right, let's get the best handwriting man you've got, and then you and I will go to work catching a murderer. Mm -hmm. Does your imagination tell you where? Oh, of course. At my apartment. Mark, if this works, I'll buy you a new hat, mm. and I'll eat your old one. And, uh, I'm supposed to be all alone, Captain. Uh, Gerald Steele? Yes? Uh, this is Mark Tent. Are you free to talk? What kind of a question is that? You'll understand. I was the last one to see your wife alive. So I read in the papers. You're also a friend of the police. <laughs> Only when it's convenient. For example, I didn't tell them that Susan gave me a note before she died. A what? Uh, there's a name in it, a murderer's name. Look here, Ken, what's that got to do with me? It's for sale, Gerald. I had nothing to do with Susan's death. Oh, of course, but who's going to believe it? Does that note give my name? Is is that what Susan's done to me? I'll be in my apartment until 7.10, Gerald. Uh, you're going to inherit a lot of money. I'm sure you'll want a partner to help you enjoy it. You certainly got your nerve with you, Mark. I've also got you for protection, Cap. Now we'll just do a repeat performance on Robert Ward. And uh, then we'll uh, go down the line, Claire Ellis and Pierce Carlton. One of them's liable to bite. Stay in that other room, Cap, and don't wait for gunfire. Don't worry about me, kid. Mm. Yes, yes, I heard you the first time. Hello, Miss Ellis. Come right in. Uh, would you mind if I called you Claire? I want that letter, Mr. Kent. Uh, you wouldn't mind. And I thought this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. All I want from you is that letter. I've got a gun in my handbag, and I'm not afraid to use it. I didn't think you would be. How much money did you bring? I didn't bring any. Well, Mr. Kent? I've got the answer, lady. Oh. And I'll take the handbag, too. I didn't kill Susan. Now, please, give me a chance to explain. Sure, sure. Come on. No, no. Pierce told Susan that he wasn't going to marry her. 
And I know she put his name on that letter. You don't have to protect that guy anymore. He told me the whole story the day after Susan died about her threat and why she threatened him. I made him tell me. Yeah, let's go. No, 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 please. Hmm? Somebody wants to come in here, Cam. Another one? Um, here's a magazine. Take Claire into that other room and read the advertisements to her. Yeah, come on, you. When that guy works in a case, you never know what's going to pop next. Coming. Oh. Get out of my way, Kent. Uh, <clears throat> with pleasure, but I'd be glad to do it, even if you didn't have a gun. Mr. Ward? Are you alone? Uh, now that you're here, practically. I don't trust you. Put up your hands and walk toward that other room. Oh, you're kidding, aren't you? Move along. I'm not going to waste any time on you. All right, but since when do blackmailers work with an audience? Just walk directly in front of me and into that room. I'm in. <laughs> you're a bigger fool than I thought, Mr. Kent. You should have protected yourself with a lie. Well, we, uh... All make mistakes, Mr. Warren. You've made your last one. I'm going to kill you. Don't you want that letter? I'll find it later, or I'll burn your apartment out of existence. I've got a right to my share of Susan's estate, and the law won't take it away from me now. So it was you who killed her? Of course. I needed money for my business, and she refused to lend it to me, the fool. No intelligence is she to know when I was prepared for every emergency. Yes, I sort of had that figured out. This box of pills. Pickup pills. Mm. A wonderful tonic. Unfortunately for Susan, the one I let her pick was Adropine. Uh, don't look now, Mr. Ward, but there's a man behind you. <laughs> Drop that gun. Drop it. Captain McNair. Yeah, with bracelets you can't buy at Tiffany's. You uh, should have looked when I told you, Mr. Ward. Well, sure. Well, Mark, it gets me how you figured this whole thing out. Ah, uh, I'm a dreamer. Uh, would you uh, like to take care of my old hat now? Your old hat? What do you expect me to do with it? We said you were going to eat it, didn't you? Oh, oh yeah. But I said I'd buy a new one first. Well, a deal's a deal, but uh, I hope you won't mind waiting. I uh, no, I won't mind. <laughs> And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, Death at 710, based on a story by H.F.S. Moore. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Raymond Edward Johnson played the part of Mark Kent. Helen Shields was Susan Ward Steele. Cameron Pudum was Captain McNair. Ted Osborne played Gerald Steele. Eleanor Phelps was Claire Ellis. King Calder was Pierce Carlton. And Reese Taylor was heard as Robert Ward. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. The amazing Mr. Malone. Operator. Operator. Get me the office of John J. Malone. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Amazing Mr. Malone, an exciting half hour of mystery starring George Petrie as the lawyer whose practice before every type of bar has become a legend. Our locale is the city of Chicago, the time, the present, and the hero of these weekly adventures, The Amazing Mr. Malone. <laughs> Malone's a name, John J. Malone, attorney and counselor at law. Tonight in our study of the cliché, let's examine the oldie, never judge a book by its cover. As Exhibit A, I give you Richie Holland. Mr. Holland is the good-looking boy behind the desk in 427 of the Wentworth building. To watch him check his gun, you'd think he was auditioning for the part of a private detective in some movie thriller. He certainly looks the type, which is surprising. That's exactly what he is. Yeah. You Richie Holland? That's right. I got a friend who wants to see you, sweetheart. Well? Suppose you put away the pop gun first. Huh? You think that'd scare him? Yeah, his mother was once frightened by a wedding. <laughs> yeah, that's very funny. I must remember that. I'll write it down so you won't forget to do that. All right, Fred. Everything okay, Sandy? Everything's okay. 
Holland, uh, this is Mr. Fontaine. Hello, Holland. Sit down. All right, Sandy. Wait outside. Hey, don't you think I'd I better said stick... said wait outside. Anything you say, sweetheart. If you want me, just yell. I'll try to remember. Nice boy. Somebody ask you? No. I suppose you keep your mouth shut. I'll look. Fun. Maybe you'd better take a look first. What are your rates? I get $40 a day plus expenses. I'll pay you 100 with 1000 in advance. You interested? No end. I'm looking for a girl named Connie Burton. Why? If I'm willing to shell out this kind of money, I must have a reason. Yeah, but you'd rather not tell it to me. Obviously. What did you say her name was again? Connie Burton. Connie Burton. Got a description? I can do better than that. Here's a picture. Well. This is business, Mr. Holland. Well, it could be pleasure, too. Not going to be. With all my heart, Connie. So, you know, that's very pretty sentiment. You think you can find her for me? Sure she's here in Chicago? I'm positive. She came here from Boston a year ago. Oh, then I'll find her. Where can I reach you when I do? There's no telling. I like to be on the move, but don't worry, Holland. I'll keep in touch. That you can depend on. Yeah, Jim. Do you realize what time it is? I've been waiting with dinner for three hours. Oh, it must be pretty cold by now. That's not funny. This is the fourth time this week. Where have you been? Working. So that's the new name for it. Look, June, I've had a tough day. Would you mind very much if we dispense with the arguments for one night? I bet she never argues with you. Who never argues with That me? girl. Look, June, there is no girl. I told you I'm working on a case. Then why didn't you phone me? Or were the wires down? Where's the paper? Richie, I'm talking to you. Well, fortunately, I can't hear you. You'll hear plenty before I'm through. Is this the girl? Where did you get that picture? I found it in one of your suits, and I love the inscription. With all my heart, Connie. It's not what you think. It never is. Well, you can tell her that the next time I see her, what do I'll you mean make it. The next time. I know where she lived. What? You thought you put one over on me, didn't you? What do you mean? You know where she lives. Let me go. Well? I saw her in Marshall Fields on Tuesday, and I followed her. Oh, you two are real clever. What are you babbling about? She must have thought that by bleaching her hair and going under the name of Lila Grayson, I wouldn't be suspicious. Well, you're crazy. I suppose she doesn't live at the Beverly. You saw this yes, girl? Yes, I did. And she's living at the Beverly? You're not fooling me with this act. Richie, where are you going? Richie! <laughs> Hello? Is that you, Connie? What? What did you call me? Isn't this Connie Burton? No. No, you've got the wrong number. My name is Isla Grayson. Well, then I guess you wouldn't be interested in my message. I'm sorry if I... Wait, wait, wait. Wait a minute. Who are you? What difference does it make? Well, I, uh... I just thought that I recognized your voice. My name is Richie Holland. Oh, well, um... Assuming that I was Connie Burton, what's the message? A couple of your friends. Who? Fred Fontaine, boy named Sandy. Why are you telling me this? <laughs> well, darned if I know. But I once saw a picture of you, and it did something to me. Look, if this is a trap... Would I phone ahead and warn you? I'd like to be your friend. I could sure use one. Well, consider me a volunteer. Can I drop around? Um, uh, how does 10 o'clock tonight suit you? It suits me fine. I'll be seeing you, girl. Take care of yourself till then. <laughs> I hate to heckle, Mr. Holland, but that was a red light you just passed. Would you do me a favor? What? You call me Richie? All right. No, no. Go on. Say it. Richie. How's that? It sounded just the way I thought it would. I don't understand you. I don't understand myself. You mind if we park? Not if you want to. Well? No, I liked your hair better the other way. What? You know, the way it was in the picture before you bleached it. 
I hope you realize you're not making sense. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows that better than I do. Listen, Connie, I'm, I'm a private detective. I see. A week ago, two boys came into my office. Fontaine and Sandy. Yeah. They wanted me to locate you. And you did. No, that, that, that was a fluke. See, June saw your picture and remembered running into you at field. She, she followed you to the Beverly. Who's June? It's my wife. She must be a real help to you in your work. No, she was just jealous. And she had reason to be. What do you mean? Well, why do you think I called you without notifying Fontaine? Maybe you wanted to check first. No. Look, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I fell for you. You what? First time I saw your picture. <laughs> it's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, things like that just don't happen in real life. As I said before, you're not making sense. I know that. I'm all mixed up. Well, what do you intend to do? Well, I... I want to go on seeing you. And what about Fontaine? That doesn't worry me. Well, it worries me. Oh, don't let it. Just don't let anything bother you. No, Richie, don't. Don't, please. Well? Funny you saying you're all mixed up. Why? Because I think I'm going to be in the same boat. Move over, darling, and make room. <laughs> Sweetheart. Well, this is a surprise. We meant it to be. We? Mr. Fontaine is here, too. Oh. All right, Fred. Hello, Holland. How are you? Sandy and I were in the neighborhood, so we thought we'd drop by. It's very nice of you. Mind if we sit down? No, I'll help yourself. Well, what's the story? The story? On the assignment I gave you. Oh, well, I've been running into bad luck, Fontaine. I, I haven't been able to find the girl. It's been six weeks. Oh, time sure does fly. Don't it? Well, I'm uh, sorry to let you boys down. <laughs> I don't think you did, Richie. Tell me again. You remember our deal? Certainly. You were to get $100 a day plus expenses. So? So, outside of that original 1000 I gave you, you haven't asked for any more. That's not in character. Why not? Well, I pride myself on being a good judge of human nature. And I'd say you had a large streak of larceny in your makeup. Really? Really. And I can't figure out any reason why you'd miss an opportunity to clip me. Unless. Unless what? You found Connie Burton. Well, then why wouldn't I tell you? Because you're real clever. Where is she, Holland? I have no idea. What do you think, Sandy? Well, if you want my humble opinion, I'd say he was lying. That's my opinion, too. You want me to try coaxing him? Please. Listen, you big lug, you put a finger on me. No, and... you don't. Oh, sure. Sweetheart was reaching for his pop gun, huh? That's not nice. If you don't get out of here, you know I'll... what? Uh, you no good, dirty bum. Where is she, Richie? What do you think I tell you now? All right, Sandy. Carry on. Come on, sweetheart. Charge! I said charge! Well, what do you say? Drop this. Okay, sweetheart. I'm glad you don't give in too easy. Because that's just how I get my kicks. And tonight I'm really gonna lick. Just a second. Yes? Hello, Connie. Who are you? That's a very good question. But in the final analysis, who is anybody? Are oh, you crazy? You're too literal-minded. Me? I'm a philosopher. Did you ever read Nietzsche or Schopenhauer? Listen, you... you... Should... Oh. <laughs> oh, isn't that silly? How are you going to find the time? What's the idea of the gun? I wish you wouldn't take this personally, Connie. Believe me, I, I got nothing against who you. Who are you? Well, if you've got to call me something... Try Harry. I don't know you. Does anybody know anybody else? It's hard enough to know yourself. As Spangler once wrote... He put you up to this? Oh, now, you're not listening to me, Connie. You're, you're like all the... Who put rest... you up to this? See, see, you're obsessed with your own petty problems. 
But if you analyze any problem, the solution is, is perfectly simple. In your case, a mere tightening of the fingers. No! Oh. See how simple it was? Now you can sleep, Connie. Your problems are over. It was just one of those things, just one of those crazy things, one of those bells that now and then ring, just one of those things. It was just one of those not... It's funny. It was just one of those things, just one of those crazy things. I must be in the wrong office. Uh-huh. Hello? Is that you, Malone? Who's this, Lieutenant Brooks? Yeah. I'm glad you called, Lieutenant. The darndest things happened. Just a second ago, I walked into the office singing just one of those things. And there was no one there. Ain't it amazing? You were 15 minutes late, Counselor. What do you mean? Well, that's when we picked up a little lady who was waiting for you. Who? Her name is June Holland. June Holland? Yeah, yeah. We're inclined to think she's responsible for the murder of one Lila Grace and alias Connie Burton. And this June Holland wants me to represent her? Yeah, so it figures she must be innocent. Absolutely. Well, maybe this is our week to amaze you. Come on, Tom Malone, we're waiting. You are listening to The Amazing Mr. Malone. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Here's a special program note on NBC's lineup of top adventure shows. This Sunday evening, four outstanding mystery features are yours over NBC. Starting with Tom Conway as the debonair gentleman adventurer, Simon Templer, alias The Saint. Then Lloyd Nolan, one of the nation's most popular screen actors, is featured as Martin Kane, Private Eye. Next, the second broadcast in a new series starring Carlton Young in the double role of Philip Galt and The Whisperer. Later in the evening, we travel to the Orient to join forces with Mr. Moto. Yes, for the best in Sunday evening listening pleasure, tune to NBC for Tom Conway as The Saint, screen actor Lloyd Nolan featured as Martin Kane, Private Eye, Carlton Young as The Whisperer, and Adventures in the Troubled Lands of the Far East with Mr. Moto. And now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. And that's where I got into the act. Two hours and 47 minutes after the murder of Connie Burton, I was down at headquarters. As I walked over from my office, I made an interesting discovery. The path from my door leading to the Homicide Bureau was an inch lower than the adjacent territory. I was in a rut. Well, as I live and breathe. That's what amazes me, Lieutenant. What? Why you live and breathe? Oh, that's a splendid one. Where's my client? Oh, wouldn't you care to pass a few pleasantries with me? Where's June Holland? Oh, I guess I don't have it for you anymore. Sussman! Did someone mention my name? Now, Mr. Malone would like to see his client. His slightest wish is my command. Have you boys ever considered radio as a career? Well, we're working on an act, but we're stuck for a name. Why'd you call it the Bob Hope Show? Oh, you heard that somewhere. And shut off that teletype. Well, as long as you ask so nicely. Where is he? Uh, right here, Mrs. Holland. Are you Malone? Uh, don't answer that, Counselor. It might tend to incriminate and degrade you. Don't mind here, Mrs. Holland. His mother was frightened by the happiness, boys. Sit down. Thank you. Now, what do you know about this Connie Burton? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I suppose you didn't know that your husband was running around with her. That's a lie. It was just business with Richie. He was hired to find her. What do you mean he was hired to find her? He's a private detective. Well, what do you got to say to that, Lieutenant? Oh, it was hardly business. You see, her husband was seeing this, Connie, for over a month. Right after they met, he made her move from the Beverly to the Marvin. That's not true. Then why were you around the Beverly checking on her? Because uh, I, I was... Just trying to help Richie. Despite the fact that he moved out on you four weeks ago? Well, I didn't kill her. I never handled a gun in my life. That's possible. Well, you mean she hired a torpedo for the job? Yeah. You got a line on him? Give us time. Meanwhile, you expect my client to sit here. If you have no objection. I've got a hundred, but I don't think they'll do me any good. Well, sit tight, Mrs. Holland. I'll get you dispossessed as soon as I can. Yeah. 
I'm looking for... Hey, what happened to you? I got to mind my own business. Oh. Maybe a moral on that for you. I can't see where. You, Richie Holland? What if I am? I'm glad to know you. My name is John J. Malone. Well? I'm representing your wife. What for? Didn't you know the cops are holding her for murder? What are you mumbling about? A girl named Connie Burton was knocked off tonight. What did you say? Hey, easy, fella. You're ruining the drape. I asked you something, Malone. Obviously, the police haven't been here yet. What did you say about Connie? She was murdered. And I must have told her. You must have told who what? None of your business. Where is she? Your wife? No, Connie. Well, just where you might expect. I gotta see her. Now, wait a minute, Holland. Your wife is in a spot. The police think she was behind the kill. I'm crazy. I know who did it. Who? Never mind. I handle this my own way. They call your way murder. Is that what they call it? The last I heard. Well, you shouldn't complain. You may get another case out of this yet. See what you can do for us on a family rate. See tonight's paper, Fontaine? No, I haven't, Sandy. There's a wonderful story on the front page. <laughs> I mean wonderful. If the sword it appeals to you. And it certainly <laughs> does to you. Yeah, you betcha. Seems a little girl named Connie Burton was shot and killed last night. Let's see that. Connie Burton. Haven't I heard that name before? I wouldn't know. I'm probably confusing it with two other girls. Anyway, they're holding the wife of a private dick named Richie Holland for the murder. This may come as a shock to you, Sandy, but I know how to read. Well, I didn't want you to strain yourself. Seems this June Holland was just... Who's that? Get behind the door. I got you. Just a moment. Hello, Fontaine. All I can say, Holland, is your recuperative powers must be tremendous. They are. Sandy will be awfully disappointed in himself. What can I do for you? I just wanted to check something. Did I tell you where to find Connie before I passed out? What do you think? I'm asking the questions now. Well, put away that gun, Richie. Might give people wrong ideas. Yeah, who, for example? For example, me. What? No, as you were, sweetheart. Just drop the cannon. Would you be uh, kind enough to dispose of that, Mr. Fontaine? Gladly. Hey, you made a field goal. Now, listen, you guys. Now, take it easy, sweetheart. We'll get back to you. What do you suggest? For well, you? he's pretty persistent. Let's dream up something very special for the boy. Something that'll really discourage him. Hey, I got an idea. Well, suppose you illustrate on Mr. Holland. He's all yours, Sandy. Hello? You're molding, boy. Speak up. I want to talk to John J. Malone. Who is this? It's Richie Holland. You sound like you had another accident. Listen, Malone. I'll, I'll tell you who killed Connie. Who? A couple of boys named Fred Fontaine and Sandy Oppenheim. You must be mistaken. I tell you, they killed her. They hired me to find her. And when I wouldn't spell, they beat it out of me. What do they want with her? I don't know. She came here from Boston a year ago, and, and then... And then... Hello, Holland. Holland! Amazing. Simply amazing the way that man recuperates. I must be losing my touch. I figured he'd be out for at least another couple of hours. Is it all right with you girls if I hang up now? Why, of course, Mr. Malone. You followed instructions beautifully. You thought you were responsible for Connie's murder. The man's obviously a psychopath. Now, look, Malone, I've got a proposition for you. Let's hear it. They'll cut you in for 10%. How much does that mean in dollars and cents? Don't you know Long Division? Never even heard of her. You know something, Fred? I think we're wasting our time. I don't think he knows anything about Connie. I'm inclined to agree with you, Sandy. I'm sorry if we inconvenienced you, Mr. Malone. Now, wait a minute, boys. You can't walk off like that. He's right, Fred. I forgot something. Oh. Thanks for reminding me, sweetheart. I'm much obliged. <laughs> You're listening to The Amazing Mr. Malone.
Independence Day last Wednesday was celebrated as a day of rededication to the principles upon which our country was founded. Each of us can play a part in this year of rededication to the principles of our founding fathers by taking several important steps. The success of the activity will depend on, first, a more active participation by citizens in the affairs of the nation, state, and community. Second, an increased awareness of our individual rights and liberties. Third, an augmented pride in America's past and its accomplishments. And fourth, a wider recognition of the importance of making this country an example to the world of the strength and effectiveness of our own form of government. And now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. Well, that's what I get for using my head. It never fails. And after Sandy threw me that kiss, I took off for cloud 16. It's lovely up there this time of the year. There are 20 beautiful maidens for every man, and I'm the only man allowed. And then someone went and yanked my cloud from under me. All right, Malone, time to wake up. Mm. Come on, come on. Uh Oh, I wish I had my camera here. I'd love to have a picture of this. Oh. What happened? Well, you tell me you were here. I'm not so sure. Oh, my head. Oh, it's real pretty. Who does your makeup? Shut up. No, I mean it. I mean it. That that streak of red running through your hair gives you a certain uh, je ne sais quoi. That's French, you know. Stop showing off your education. Uh, actually, I never got out of kindergarten. Well, I guess this ought to convince you. Convince me of what? That June Holland didn't kill Connie Burton. Now, what's one thing got to do with another? What do you think Fontaine and his boy went to work on me? Uh, which Fontaine is that, Fred? Yeah, you know him? Not as well as I'd like to. He's a Boston product. What do you know about a Sandy Oppenheim? Well, it's rumored that he's been associated with Fontaine in several banking ventures. Well, there was at least one other member in the firm. Who? Connie Burton. You're crazy. Listen, Lieutenant, they came to Chicago expressly to find her. And it's your contention they did? Definitely. Pick him up and pick up Richie Holland. Anything else you'd like? Well, while you're at it, you might as well pick me up, too. I'm not doing anybody any good on this floor. Hey, sweetheart. Me? Yeah. How long do you intend to keep us here? I really don't know. Now, look, sweetheart, That's we... enough, Sandy. You don't hear Mr. Holland complaining. I never do, Fontaine. That's what I admire about you. You always take your medicine like the little man you are. Listen, why don't All you... All right, hold it, Holland. That'll do. Open him up, Sussman. Hi, Hank. Hello, Counselor. Hey, what's the idea with the towel on your head? I'm doing a mind-reading act at the Orpheum. Everybody here? Everybody but Mrs. Holland. Well, suppose you get it. Aye, aye, sir. I think you gentlemen all know Mr. Malone. Sure. Hello, boys. My, it's awfully quiet all of a sudden. What's the matter, Fontaine? Don't you remember me? I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Sure you did. You and your friend were up to see me this afternoon. You remember that, Sandy? Well, you can't prove it by me. Well, that's understandable. I've changed a little since then. Look, Lieutenant, I got a headache of my own. Do I have to sit through this? How about it, Counselor? All right, Holland. In deference to you, we'll make it short and sweet. You all know why we're here. I don't. Okay, Fontaine, we'll take it from the beginning. We're here to find out who is responsible for the murder of Connie Burton. According to the paper I read, it was a lady named June Holland. That was just enemy propaganda. Then suppose you tell us the truth, sweetheart. All right, Sandy. Connie Burton came to this town a year ago from Boston. That's the place that's noted for its beans, isn't it? It has a more recent claim to fame. About 14 months ago, seven men entered a bank messenger company there and waltzed off with a close to a million and a half in cash. Hey, remember that, Fred? Vaguely. Seems to me they never caught the culprits. You ought to know. Why? Because I got a hunch you were the brain behind that operation. Thanks for the compliment. Well, that's all you're going to get out of it. What do you mean? You had a girlfriend named Connie Burton. You slipped her the loot and she was supposed to meet you later so the mob could divvy up. Instead, she took off for Chicago. That's very interesting. It gets better as it goes along, because that's where Richie comes in. What kind of a crack is that? They hired you to find Connie, didn't they? So? So you held out on him. Why? Well, not that it's any of your business, but I went for the girl. Tell me something, Holland. What did she have that got you? I mean, besides all the money. How's that? Well, the money is why you had her killed, wasn't it? Look, Malone, I don't like those kind of... Neither do I, Richie. Somehow I can't say anything funny in murder, but then... I've got no sense of humor. Okay, Lieutenant, he's all yours. All right, Malone, 
on. You've played with that coffee long enough. Let's have it. You mean we have to go through this same routine again? Uh, why should this night be different from all other nights? Well, it's perfectly simple, Lieutenant. Richie Holland killed Connie. He was the one who hired that torpedo. Huh? How do you know? He told you where to find the boy, didn't he? I, uh... Yeah, yeah. It was a guy named Harold Sherman, a philosopher type fella. Yeah, but tell me something, Malone. Why did Holland go back to look up Fontaine? Well, that was just an act. He thought that way he'd remove suspicion from himself, and he did. Uh, how's for a little proof? Well, who else knew where to find Connie? How about your client, Mrs. Holland? No. Nope. Remember, Richie moved Connie from the Beverly right after he met her. Now, well, what about Fontaine and Sandy? Holland never told them. He pretended to pass out. As soon as they left, he called his friend Harold and gave him his orders. Fontaine never would have killed her. Why not? You claim she double-crossed them with that loot. Sure. That's why they had to keep her alive if they wanted to recover it. Uh, what makes you think they didn't? Because they came to me later with an offer of a split. They thought you had all that dough? Uh-huh. But you're sure Holland got it. Well, doesn't he admit it now? No. You mean you haven't recovered that million and a half? And it looks like we never will. What's the matter with that, Holland? Doesn't he know you can't take it with you? You know, I told him that. You know what he said? Why? If he can't take it with him, he ain't going. Let me talk to him, Lieutenant. Oh, no. Oh, no. Because you're just amazing enough to figure out how we could manage it. Good night, Malone. Ever hear the story of the Dixieland band? The boy on trumpet was especially good. He got hot at a party one night and blasted himself clear out of this world. Yeah, he was dynamite. I'll tell you all about him next week, so why not pick me up at my office at the same time? I'll be waiting for you. Good night. George Petrie was starred as John J. Malone with Larry Haynes as Lieutenant Brooks. Our program is written by Eugene Wang and directed by Richard Lewis. The Amazing Mr. Malone is based on a famous character created by Craig Rice and produced by Bernard L. Schubert. The events and characters in the story were entirely fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. Fred Collins speaking. The Amazing Mr. Malone has come to you from New York. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, a man's necktie, a woman's glove, a boy's school cap, all are touched by murder. Now, here's a champagne glass. That's a familiar object. Long stem, delicate curve, shining crystal. This fragile object belongs to New Year's Eve, to weddings and the anniversaries. Funny about things like this, Sergeant? Funny, sir? I'd say that one was loaded. I meant funny in a philosophical sense, Sergeant. Funny how human beings can take an article meant for happiness and use it for tragedy. Now, anyway, that champagne glass can be found today in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Well, here we are, the Black Museum. Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. This place echoes with violent death. Voices are hollow here, whether the hollowness is caused by the high vaulted ceilings or by the reaction of the human mind to the atmosphere of this room. The effect is the same. Everybody who comes here learns a sense of fear. It's natural because here lies death. Death, cruel, unnecessary, vengeful, or greedy. Still the kind of death brought by one man or one woman on another. This is a record to be studied not merely by criminologists, but by every student of man's inhumanity to man. Here's an iron skillet. It's heavy in your hand, the kind of kitchen utensil your grandmother used 
well-balanced, quite suitable for frying eggs or veal chops, or, or for bashing a skull, perhaps. There's little doubt as to the use which brought this particular skillet here. Yes. And here's the champagne glass. Well-designed, graceful. You could place it with a companion on a silver tray, as Colonel Harry Reed did. You could pop a cork and then fill the glasses, as Colonel Harry Reed did. And you might say, as the dapper Colonel did, To you, my dear Elizabeth, to your return and your complete recovery. I wish... I could drink to that wholeheartedly, Harry. Really, I do. Well, why not, my dear? You've been released. You're... Uh... That's it, exactly. I've been released. Not merely sent home from a hospital, so to speak. After all, the hospital I was in had bars on the windows. Oh, I insist, my dear, that you touch glasses with me and drink at once. That's no way to talk. But, Harry, I... Ah, oh, then, no buts, Elizabeth. Many people have had nerve breakdowns, and the vast majority of them have recovered. Very well, Harry, dear. But... Not to me, to you, the most patient of husbands in the world. So they drank the champagne, and all was well. It was very pleasant, very relaxing, reassuring. But the world is always too much with us, and the colonel finally had to say, uh, You rest until dinner, Elizabeth. I will be for my... I won't be long. And the colonel kissed his wife, and the colonel went off to his appointment. It's six months now, Reed. One way or the other, the matter ought to be settled. I assure you, Davis, there's nothing to worry about. These things take time. There's been plenty of time. Look, Reed, if you don't want to complete the deal, return the 500 pounds. But it's not up to me. My client... Your client indicated willingly dispose of the property. My client paid the deposit in good faith. We considered a binder on the contract. We waited six months. Your 500 pounds is quite safe, Davis. You can reassure your client. And on my side, we'll go through with the deal as soon as everything is clear. Well, I certainly hope so. My people want to take possession. And they shall. They shall indeed. And soon. Meanwhile, there's no reason for misunderstanding between us, is there? After all, we live in the same small town. We see each other constantly. You know, John, I've often wondered why we don't see more of each other. Oh, socially, that is. Rather a changeable fellow, the Colonel, isn't he? There were other changes ahead. More serious ones. They first came to somewhat public notice the night our colonel called Dr. Ashley to his home. Ah, Dr. Ashley. Good of you to come so quickly. You made it sound rather urgent, Colonel. Is it really serious? Yes, sir. I'm afraid, Doctor. Really afraid. It's my wife. Has she broken down again? No. She complains of terrible pain in her abdomen. I'd better see her at once. Yeah, this way, please. If, if you can, Doctor. Uh, yes? Uh, she seems to me to be as much frightened as she is in pain. Oh? What exactly do you mean by that? Frightened that, uh, well, that her pain is in her imagination. I see. Oh, very well. I'll bear that in mind, Colonel. Ah, in here. If you'll wait outside, Colonel, please. Oh, must, must I, Doctor? I prefer it. Very well. Now then, Mrs. Reed. Can you hear me, Mrs. Reed? The good colonel waited outside the door. Up and down, back and forth, he paced. Almost as if he were once again on guard duty. Grim-faced, tense. He waited. At long last. You'd better come in, colonel. Quick. Doctor. Is she? I'm uh, afraid so. I've done everything I can. <laughs> A few moments later, Elizabeth Reed was at rest, at last. Tears streamed down the colonel's cheeks, but he was silent. There seemed nothing to say. The doctor led him away and told him gently, It was acute gastritis and her heart. Uh, you want the minister, I assume, and the mortician. I'll send the certificate over. Natural causes. <laughs> There was a well-attended funeral. The flowers were piled high in tribute to the colonel's position in the town as well as to the memory of his wife. And then the colonel resumed his life, somewhat more lonely but still active, 
bearing himself in military fashion as he went about his small real estate business, and time drifted by. One month, two, and then one day on the main street. Uh, good morning, Colonel. Ah, Davis, good to see you. I hesitated discussing this, your recent bereavement and so on, but don't you think we need to close our deal, Reed? Oh, yes, uh, yes, of course. I, um, well, that is, I'm rather by myself these days. Would you care to join me for tea or a bit something stronger one afternoon? You say when, Reed. I'll be glad to. Excellent. Then, uh, shall we say tomorrow? Five-ish? Why not? Your place or mine? Oh, mine, of course. Delighted to have you. Have a scone, old man. Really excellent. My housekeeper has quite the touch. Thank you. I will. <laughs> Almost as if we were a pair of elderly ladies. <laughs> tea and scones. Two gentlemen, somewhat past middle age, enjoying tea and scones and making ready to discuss business. In fact, they did discuss business. A 500-pound deposit and the pending deal. And John Davis went home quite satisfied. John Davis went home and a little later called Dr. Ashley. <laughs> I don't understand you, Doctor. My, my stomach's like, like cast iron. Always has been. Now, suddenly, this. Ah, uh, none of us are quite as young as we used to be. Uh, Even cast iron can wear thin with use. Eat anything out of the ordinary, John? Today? Yesterday? No, no, nothing. Had some scones for tea. The butter may have been a bit rancid, but uh. tasted perfectly fresh. Over Colonel Reed's. Eh? Reed? Yes, that's why. We had a little business to discuss. He asked me over... Seems quite lonely since his wife passed on, uh, so I went, mostly to keep him company. Oh, nice of you. Well, uh, just take the prescription I'm leaving you. Rest a day or two. You'll be all right. What's wrong, Doctor? Oh, nothing. Just a quirk of memory. Oh? How so? Your symptoms and Mrs. Reed's rather the same. Nothing serious about it. Just odd that we should have two similar cases in such close juxtaposition. A town like this, a doctor gets to know most of the illness. As the doctor said, nothing serious. Just an interesting coincidence. And in a day or so, John Davis was up and about. Aside from a slight tenderness in his abdomen, he felt no after effects. All was well. All was quiet. Everyone was his courteous self, including Colonel Reed. Well, now, candy. And from the Colonel. How decent of him. <laughs> Here it is, Doctor. The same wrappings it came in. Nice looking box. Don't you care for candy, John? You haven't eaten much. As a matter of fact, I don't. I did offer a piece to the charwoman at the office. You see, one's missing. The charwoman, eh? <laughs> is that the way you treat a gift? With the hope you are sufficiently recovered to enjoy this, Harry Reed. On the decent of him. So that's what I thought. Until the charwoman was taken with pains and reaching an hour after she ate the candy. Are you suggesting anything, John? That would be slanderous at this stage, wouldn't it? There's nothing to it, John. That couldn't be. The colonel... Well, I inquired at the probate office. He did rather well following his wife's death and her will, you know. He never had any money of his own to speak of. Former military men rarely do. Yes, it might be interesting. I've done practically no laboratory work of my own for some time. But I have a little equipment. Shall I try my hand at a bit of chemical analysis, John? I'm curious about the contents of that box of candy... You seem to be as well as I. The doctor was methodical, to say the least. He took his time setting up his equipment, preparing reagents, making ready for his private little tests. Meanwhile, John Davis ran into his friend, the colonel, on the street. John, good to see you. Well, how are you, Harry? You're looking fit. Well, I try to keep that way. <laughs> Care to join me for another attack of indigestion, Omen? <laughs> well, today, the champagne glass we've been talking about can be seen, as you might expect, among the other exhibits in the Black Museum. The Colonel and John Davis parted quite amicably on the street. Davis watched the smart military walk the ramrod straight back as the colonel paraded into his office. office. And this is head. Somehow it didn't seem quite plausible that this man might... just might be something quite different than what he seemed. The next afternoon, the telephone rang in John Davis's office. Yes? 
that you, John? This is Harry here. Harry? Oh, yes, yes, of course. How are you? Ah, very well. And you? Quite well. <laughs> no more stomach aches? No trace. Well, and how about this evening? Oh, sorry, old man, I, I can't this evening. Ah. But uh, perhaps in a day or so. Oh, too bad. Well, I'll be speaking to you. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> That evening, Davis had a previous appointment with Dr. Ashley in his makeshift laboratory. This little operation here is the Marsh test. Oh? For arsenic. Interesting. Yes, isn't it? Particularly since I found that every piece of candy in your gift box had arsenic in it. Good Lord! Arsenic. You see, is a cumulative poison. Person may have a tolerance for quite a large amount of. But it usually fails to pass through the human system. It accumulates, and bit by bit, the fatal dose is built up until one day the victim dies. Dr. Ashley explained all this to John Davis. Finally, John grasped the significance of the facts. Each piece of candy would never bother the ordinary stomach or the uh, cast iron type, such as you both did you have. Most people could eat a piece or two. Indeed, you'd eaten most of the candy yourself. Well, you follow me, I gather? Follow you? Doctor, I'm a step ahead of you. But exactly what that step is, I'm not sure. I think we need expert help. The local constabulary? I said expert help. Where from? The CID. Scotland Yard. It was a clear, cogent letter reciting the situation as Dr. Ashley and John Davis knew it. It was addressed to the Home Secretary, the gentleman of the British government responsible for the police force in general. In due course, the letter reached the desk of Inspector Charles in Scotland Yard. Following the set routine, Inspector Charles showed the communication to his immediate assistant, Detective Sergeant Hatch. Well, nothing else for it. You and I will have to take a small trip to the country. Frankly, I won't mind. I can use a touch of country air after... They came into the quiet town unobtrusively. Two men on a walking tour, vacationists. They put up at the inn. Toward sundown, they strolled about the town quite casually. They turned in at the gate with its little sign announcing that Dr. Ashley had his dispensary there. Once, however, within the doctor's office. Now then, doctor, perhaps you'd let Sergeant Hatch and I have it from the beginning. Well, my entrance into the situation came shortly after Mrs. Reed returned from the... Uh... Sanitarium. She'd been ill? Mentally ill. Nervous breakdown? Rather more than that. She'd been certified insane. She was discharged as being quite stable once again. And you were called in? In my professional capacity. I found her past help. Acute gastritis. Or so it seemed at the time. But it doesn't seem so now? You understand, Inspector, I have no facts. At least not on that side. I merely analyzed the box of candy received by John Davis shortly after he'd been taken ill. Doctor... Would this Colonel Reed benefit from Mr. From Mr. Davis's death? There'd been something about a, a real estate and a deposit paid. Quite a large sum, I believe. Mr. Davis can give you the details. One final question, sir. Who had Mrs. Reed committed to the uh, institution in the first instance? Why, I believe the husband did. But the records will be available to you, of course. Of course. Oh, well, thank you, Doctor. If we need you... We'll... By the time they left the doctor's office, Inspector Charles and Sergeant Hatch felt they had heard an interesting, if circumstantial, story... Their next stop, naturally, was John Davis's home. You've no idea, gentlemen, what a relief it is to have police officers of your caliber on the job. Thank you. About the candy and the card in the box, do you have any definite reason to believe the colonel wants you, well, out of the way? There's the matter of 500 pounds. He either will not or cannot explain. And um, Dr. Ashley mentioned Mrs. Reed's will. Yes, curious about that. There was one will made out entirely in favor of her children by her first marriage. The will which was accepted and executed was in the colonel's handwriting, but signed by Mrs. Reed and produced subsequent to her death. You find that interesting, I take it, Sergeant? I expect you do as well, sir. Quite. Mr. Davis, do you think it might be possible to exhume Mrs. Reed's body without the matter becoming common knowledge in the whole town? <laughs> The men from Scotland Yard accomplished the almost impossible. Armed with the proper papers, plus tools and dark lanterns, they supervised the removal of the body at night with no one the wiser except the necessary officials. 
This feat completed, they waited quite, quite patiently. The government analyst was called in. The report was brief. Inspector Charles read it to Dr. Ashley. The examination reveals the presence of four grains of arsenic, more than a fatal dose, and the largest amount of the poison I have ever found in human remains. Well, that's it, Doctor. And I didn't recognize the symptoms. Acute gastritis, I call it. Why should you have recognized them, sir? I dare say murder of any kind is hardly a common occurrence in your practice. Well, Sergeant, since our warrant is all in order, it begins to appear that a search of Colonel Reed's premises may be next on the agenda. Now the pretense of the walking tour was completely discarded. It was Saturday and the sleepy little village was just about bestirring itself. The inspector and the sergeant walked for short distance from the end to Colonel Reed's place of business, almost directly opposite Davis's office. The sergeant tried the door. Not locked, sir. A locked door in these parts would arouse more suspicion than not. Let's go in, shall we? One file cabinet, one desk, telephone, chair for visitors. <laughs> Can't do much of a business. I dare say not. Let's get to it. The search was quite thorough. The desk was emptied of its contents. These were replaced in an orderly fashion. Oh, nothing extraordinary here, sir. Oh? What do you make of this, sir? Champagne glass. Rear of the file cabinet. Todd? Shall I hold it aside, sir? Yes, may as well. Interesting, the trace of sediment. Apparently, it was never washed. Not that it was used the last time. Anything else in there, Sergeant? Oh, what's going on in here? Colonel Reed? Yes. More to the point for you to identify yourselves and your business here, if any. Inspector Charles, CID. My identity card. This is Sergeant Hatch. I see. I assume you have a warrant for this search. We do. Right here, Colonel. Oh, oh very well. Go on with your work. May I ask why you were keeping the champagne glass in the file cabinet? A memento to my poor wife. We drank from it. Oh, that is, uh, she did about a week before she uh, passed away. A nice gesture, if I may say so. And still with a trace of the sediment at the bottom. Uh, oh, careful, sir. It'd be a pity to have the glass break after all this time. Oh, sorry. Awkward of me to brush against it like that. Yes, wasn't it? All right, Sergeant, you can open the desk drawer the Colonel just closed and see what he put in it. But you said you'd finish. Your pardon, Colonel. I've had quite enough of this. These paper packets weren't in here a few minutes ago, Inspector. How many? Oh, look here, I wouldn't have twenty of them, sir. Like I'll take one. Thank you. White powder. Well, this wouldn't be arsenic, would it, Colonel? It not only would be, it is. Really? Well, as you can see, I'm wearing my gardening coat. Ordinarily, I do not come into the office on Saturday, but something came up. I've been planning an experiment in my garden, hence the arsenic. A garden, an experiment with 20 packets of arsenic? Yes. My lawn is plagued with dandelions, roughly two dozen of them. I plan to drill a small hole at the root of each weed, pour in the arsenic in each of those packets, and kill each dandelion individually, rather than take the chance of ruining the whole lawn. Sorry, Colonel, it's a good story, but rather far-fetched. Particularly since you tried to rid yourself of the packets before we searched your person. And particularly since the charge pending is willful murder of your wife by a cynical poisoning. But this is ridiculous. Someone is... Sergeant! Keep that champagne glass safe before Colonel Reed succeeds in smashing it. Yes, sir. To Colonel Reed, you are under arrest. The charge is murder. I must warn you that anything you may be say... I will not stand... Hold it, Sergeant. I'll be acquitted. You'll see, and then I'll have to leave here. A trial? That will be quite quite enough, Colonel. You've made several mistakes, not the least of which was your attempt on John Davis and your preservation of this glass. A sentimental gesture, but rather silly. My bet is the sediment in it will turn out to be arsenic. You must have been very sure of yourself, Colonel, to leave this glass unwashed. Very sure of yourself indeed. Bring him along, Sergeant. I think he'll come quietly now. And today, that champagne glass can be seen in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. There was no doubt about one facet of Colonel Reed's character. He was a man of great pride. His behavior at the trial was exemplary. His bearing, military. He repeated his story of the separate packets of arsenic for separate dandelions, and he sounded as if he'd made a good case of it. 
at least for himself. But not as it turned out for the jury. Colonel Reed accepted his sentence as if it were an order from a superior officer. And one morning, at the traditional time of eight o'clock, Colonel Reed marched to the scaffold as if he were on parade. And as for the champagne glass, well, it remains in its customary place, as I told you, in Scotland Yard. Now, until we meet next time, in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Do you have a little unsolved murder in your home? Got some blackmail you want to unload? Are you the victim of some vulgar extortionist? I know a girl you should meet. She may not be the greatest private eye in the world, so what if it does cost you three or four hundred dollars? She sure is sweet. She's Candy Matson. Like to meet her? Hello. Candy Matson? Well, I wasn't sure when I looked in the mirror this morning. Had a rough night, eh? Oh, there have been rougher ones. Look, voice, before you get caught with my receiver down, who are you and what do you want? As to who I am, you'll find out very shortly. What I want is you. How romantic and over the phone yet. Let me finish. What I want is you to lay off that cable car business. Oh, that. Well, I'm afraid I can't. You see, I was sitting beside him when they discovered his transfer had been punched sort of permanently. That's how things happen with me. I get into the craziest routines. You see, I used to be a model. I've been told I have the proper displacement for such a career. But I found there wasn't enough money in it. A girl has to maintain a nice apartment on Telegraph Hill, keep enough clothes to highlight the uh, displacement I mentioned, and also eat, doesn't she? Sure. So I turn private eye. You meet a better class of people, mostly named Rigger or Mortis. Now take this cable car deal. It's positively fantastic. But after all, this is radio, isn't it? Like to hear how the whole thing happened? Leave us trip along to Act One. I wanted to get downtown that morning, but I couldn't take the F car on Stockton. They were ripping up about 87 streets, which is par for the course. So I walked down Telegraph Hill and up to Mason. That's where the Bay and Powell cable car stops. All aboard! Come on, Lana, show that shapely ankle. We gotta make the Fairmont by Whitsuntide. The car was loaded, and so was the character next to me. I tried to budge into the seat between him and a fisherman's wharf dowager, but I couldn't quite make it. I'd forgotten my shoehorn. Say, pardon me, but would you mind reading your Wall Street Journal over that away a bit? I'd like to sit in here. Oh, if you insist. A knight of old. He budged his hips a quarter of an inch, and I slipped in, ready for my rocket ride over the hill and down into town. The trip, as usual, was uneventful. Three smashed fenders and several choice words I'd never heard before, but I wrote them down. By the time our prairie schooner reached the turntable at Market Street, the crowd on the car had thinned out. But, uh, Buster was still beside me, his head buried in common and preferred. Market Street! I started to get down. Hey, lady, take your boyfriend with you. We're heading back up the hill. Boyfriend? I'll sue. He looks like the advance man for Lewis and Clark. How do you like that? He fell asleep over his stocks and bonds. I looked again. Hipsy wasn't asleep. <laughs> Hipsy was stone cold dead on market. <laughs> What a twist. I, who always went on the prowl for a whodunit, get one literally tossed into my lap. He just hadn't gone out of this world serene-like. Oh, no. 
There was a steady slurp, slurp of blood trickling down his vest just north by northeast of the equator. After a half-hour wait full of questioning by homicide leg men, I knew my morning shopping tour was rained out. And after all, I was only going to buy an emerald clip to match the glint in my eye. Well, that would have to wait. I knew the next step. I grabbed a cab home. I wasn't long in waiting. Right on cue. And if it was the right cue, it would be Lieutenant Ray Mallard from headquarters, daintily pressing his cuticles against my apartment buzzer. I was right. What? I've been expecting you. Come on in, Mallard. You've been expecting me. Why, Candy? Naive little rover boy, you. Have a drink? No, no, I'm not in the mood. Uh, just make it a double. Sit down, Mallard. And let's be civilized. Take off your hat. It is off. Oh? <laughs> Candy, for once I'm puzzled. You're just saying that. Yeah, because it's true. I've checked and rechecked. No matter how many loose ends I tie together, I still get no connection between you and Dwight Ellsworth. Dwight Whosworth? Ellsworth. Your extremely limp traveling companion on the cable this morning? Mallard, I can give you an angle on that. Yeah? Yeah. The angle being that I didn't know him from Adam. Level? Straight. Oh, look, honeypot, this mediocre dialogue is getting us nowhere. What did you haul your size 11s in here for? Oh, frankly, I don't know. Uh, here, fill it up, will you? Well, you're not just going around in circles, Mallard. You're going around in doubles. Yeah, yeah. Like I've said before, Candy, you've got a pretty view from here. Oh? Wait till I turn around. I mean from your window. Look at that ship down there, just docking. Hmm? Where? Down there. There's oh. romance for you. Probably just in from the Far East. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. You know, it is sort of romantic. Don't you think it'd be fun to jump on a tramp like that and whisk off to the South Seas? Mm hmm? On a honeymoon? No. That's what I thought. South Seas. Mallard. Don't call me Mallard. Why not? We're just playing for ducks, aren't we? Oh, very crisp. Playing for ducks. No, Candy, we aren't. Not in this case. We've got a dead man in our hands. Rudy Toot Toot shot right through the heart. And you were sitting next to him. Sure, sure. Go on, now. Get out of here. What? You heard me. Lift your hindquarters and get back to headquarters. Candy, I don't like that look. You've got something on your mind. Yeah, yeah, but you wouldn't recognize it if I told you about it. Uh, one word of warning. Don't dabble. You're in deep enough. Got it? Got it. Here's your hat. Grab it. So long, Mallard. See you around a jailhouse sometime. <laughs> Bye, fool fum. Twas then I smelled a big fat fee. That great, big, kind of attractive mallard. He missed the boat. Oh, he saw it, but he missed it. It was that ship he saw docking. That was the first time I came out of the dark since my Tunerville ride down the hill in the morning. I needed help, so I called an old friend of mine, if you can call that help. Rembrandt Watson was his name. He was a photographer and other things. He spent most of his life in the dark room dabbling with bottles. His negatives and prints were sharp. His thought processes, not quite. But he'd given me assistance in the past, so I called him. Rembrandt Watson speaking. Photography, portraits, and camera work. Yes, Rembrandt, I know. Also oh. available for gardening, janitorial service, and babysitting. Rembrandt, it's candy. Especially at the over 21. Who? Candy? Now you're tuned in. Oh, dare you, baggage. I was experimenting with a new type of formula. 90 proof for 100. 100. And candy, it works beautifully. There's a delightful little pixie in a pink ballet skirt in my living room. Well, leave her there and get over here immediately to my place. Take a cab. I'll pay for I'd it. I'd much rather have a handsome carriage with a brace of chestnuts. You've got them in your head. Now just do as I say and get over here. <laughs> Float in, Rembrandt. Gad Fritz. Where's the man to take me cloak, gloves, and topper? You're wearing a sport coat and slacks, and you know I have no man. And therein lies your basic trouble, my dear. You have no man. Now, Rembrandt. Every man should have a woman. Every woman should have a man. It's the incontrovertible law of the universe. Candy, you should have a man. You Sure, I'm no longer a man. I'm a sprite, transcending the world Well, and... stop transcending a moment and come down to Earth. We've got a job to do. How poetic. How idyllic. We've got a job to do. Uh, for money? Eventually. Oh, one of those. Very well, my dear, bring me up to date. Well, I... 
I don't really know if I can or not. Good. And I shall leave and return to me formula. Oh, no. What I mean is the whole story is so fantastic you'd never believe it. I might. Try me, Candy. Well, I get on a cable car and sit next to a character reading the Wall Street Journal. A strange coupling. A cable car and the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. And when we get to the end of the line, my friend next to me is dead. Probably the ride down the hill frightened him to death. Uh Uh-uh. He looked like a used punch board. He had a neat little bullet hole through his heart. Candy, my little ballerina friend in the pink skirt is more believable than what you just told me. I told you it was fantastic, but none of how it happened. Now, sooner or later, Mallard is going to come out of his fog. And when he does, I'm going to be out of a fee. A fee that so far doesn't exist, my pretty. It will, if my hunch is right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Go down to the Chronicle and get all the back files you can on Southern Island Steamship Company. The Chronicle? A pleasure. I have a few questionable companions there who indulge in formulas. Stay away from those companions and just do as I ask. Very well, my dove. I go, but entirely against my will. And... Where will you be? Around town, Rembrandt. I've got to do some legwork. Let me assure you, Candy. You have just the right equipment for it, too. Mm, What a joint. I'll bet they mount slit gullets on the walls instead of deer heads. Well, come on, Candy. Get your tools out and screw up your courage. Yeah, miss, what'll it be? Uh, Nothing right at the moment except information. Information, water, both free. What do you want to know? Well, I'm I'm looking for the purser off the Dwight Sonia. I hear he does his shore duty in here. Uh, That's right. Name Campbell. That head on the table over there belongs to him. Mm, Thanks. Hello, sailor. Hey, Campbell. Wake up. Uh, oh, leave me alone. Come on, snap out of it. Uh, who are you? What do you want? My name is Candy Matson. I want to ask a question. No, I'm only drinking. Go away. Not until I find out what I want to know. Dwight Ellsworth was murdered this morning. For what? I thought that would bring you to. Uh, well, that's the nicest news I've heard since VJ Day. What do you want to know? Where does his brother live? That stooge. He's got about as much spine as a water eel. Never mind. I want to find him. He seems to keep his whereabouts as secret as an atomic stockpile. Uh, The whole family ought to be knocked off. Uh, He lives out in Seacliff, 25 Dashell Road. Good. Uh, Bartender, buy my friend a little reward. And one for yourself, too. Well, so far, so good. Oh, how did I know about Campbell the purser? Well, you see, I have quite a few friends, most of whom my pal Mallard doesn't approve. So I grabbed the cab and navigated the driver out towards Seacliff. It was so foggy I couldn't see the meter. But I paid him anyway, gave him a neutral tip and dismissed him. There it was, 25 Dashell Road. An austere-looking cabana. One that dared you to ring the front doorbell. I dared. I had the awful feeling I should have been around at the side door delivering hand laundry. Good evening. Well, except for the fog, yes. Uh, Is Mr. Ellsworth in? Yes, he is. But I'm afraid I must ask you to leave. There has been a death in the family. I know. That's why I'm here. Come in, please. Thank you. Walk this way, please. Oh, I'm afraid I, I couldn't. Even if I live to be a hundred. Mind your tongue, young lady. You're in the house of an Ellsworth. Oh, hoity toity. The old babe had delusions of grandeur. Well, no need to get uppity with me. I've mingled with royalty. I once played a bit part in a Rita Hayworth picture. But this old gal was really something. She couldn't have been more than 45, yet looked like something out of the Barretts of Wimpole Street. She ushered me into a large ceilinged living room, and there on the divan was my boy. His head lowered into his hands and quite obviously touched. Quite obviously. Roger, this young lady is here to see you. I don't believe you mentioned your name. Uh, Candy Matson. Matson? Are you in shipping, too? Mm, Of a sort. Oh, uh, this is my wife, Miss Matson. You'll pardon me if I don't seem hospitable, but my brother was 
murdered this morning. I know. I was sitting next to him when it happened. You were? Don't talk to her, Roger. I don't trust her. This whole thing is a threat of some kind. No, it's not a threat. It's a business proposition. I'll come right to the point. You see, I'm a private detective. Oh, one of those persons. Put your nose back down, Mrs. Ellsworth. I want to get the show on the road. Yes, I'm a private detective, and I'm in a spot, too. The police think I'm connected with the case in some way, so I'm here for a double purpose. I'm listening, Miss Madison. Roger, I forbid you to speak with this this woman. Too late, Mrs. Ellsworth. Now, this is it. I'm in this business to make money. Give me a check now for $300, and I'll find out who killed your brother. And I'll also clear myself. Roger, I'm warning you. Naturally, you want to see the killer of your brother brought to justice, don't you, Mr. Ellsworth? Don't you? I... Yes, yes. Here, I'll make a check out right now. Thank you. Just make it out to Candy Matson. Payable today. A lovely collection of guns you have, Mr. Ellsworth. You hunt much? Mm. Oh, yes, yes. My wife and I are quite fond of shooting. Uh, She's an excellent shot. Ah, There you are. Thank you. I'll be in touch with you sometime tomorrow. Mr. Reed didn't say a word. She just stood there against the fireplace and shot sparks through me. After I waved the check in the air a few times to dry the ink, she showed me to the door. Very clever, aren't you? Taking advantage of a weak-willed man. I wonder who made him that way. Don't cash that check. I mean it. Don't cash that check. Mrs. Ellsworth, $300. I need the money, badly. I need some new rolls for my player piano. I buzzed back downtown. I wanted to cash that check in a hurry. I knew of only one person who would give me the crisp green at that hour of the night. Uncle Charlie, the honest miller who ran the chase room. Uncle Charlie, in the strict sense of the word, was a gentleman. So with a tender little pat on my cheek, he cashed the check and I went up Telegraph Hill and home. All of a sudden, my eyes did a couple of inverted loops. Oh, my lights were on. Who's in here? All right, speak up. Oh, Candy, the light of my life. Come join our party. Oh, Rembrandt, you gave me a scare. You don't scare easy either, Candy. Got something on your mind? And Mallard. Well, how ducky, a midnight soiree. What goes on here? Well, that chicken you had in the icebox is delicious. Was delicious. Looks like you've done everything but eat the bones. Your vintage is superb, too, Candy. Have a little formula? No. Now, now, come on, what gives? That's my line, Candy. What gives? You're in on something, and I want to know about it. Oh, Mallard, believe me, it, it's nothing. I, I'm, I'm just trying to parley a couple of hunches. Tall hunches. Look at all those clippings on the South Sea Island Steamship Company. What are they for? I meant to tell you, Candy, I had remarkable success down at the Chronicle. There's everything you want on that steamship line. Now, oh, Rembrandt, did you have to tell the whole world? Candy, you chide me unnecessarily. I merely had the clippings on the table when Hawkshaw here walks in on me. Okay, Candy, take it from there. I can't tell you yet, Mallard. Nothing makes sense yet. I, I've got about four loose ends that need tying off. I'd only put two men to following you. I'd save myself a lot of grief. Two days, that's all, Mallard. Just give me two days. I think I'll have it for you. All right. But don't forget, the boys down at Kearney Street headquarters don't love you the way I do. Two days. No more or less. I gotta go. Thanks for the foul, chicken. Ah, very gay. Here, Rembrandt, here's $50 for you. Fifty? My word. What's all this talk about a recession? Go on and take it. Go someplace and stabilize the economy. I whipped through the old newspaper clipping. It was all there. Fire at sea on Ellsworth's ship. Two seamen lost off Ellsworth's ship near Honolulu. South Sea Island line ship loses rudder in storm. On and on it went over a period of three years. I threw the papers back on the table. Helped myself to some of Rembrandt's formula. Turned down the lights and went out on the porch. The bay was dark except for an occasional path of light from a passing freighter. I sat down to think and think. Then, click, click, just like that, two little tumblers in my mind fell into place. Only one thing to do, and that was to do it the hard way. The next morning, just as the ferry building siren was announcing 8 o'clock to downtown San Francisco, I got Rembrandt on the phone. Candy, 
What on earth are you calling me for at this hour? Can't help it. There's work to be done. I did my work last night. So extremely well that I'm just going to bed now. Sorry, you'll just have to delay your sack time. Meet me at the corner of Mason and Union in ten minutes. Right where the cable car stops. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to take a cable car ride. What? One of those bouncing, jerky little contraptions? Not the way I feel this morning. Oh, yes, you are. Union and Mason in ten minutes. All right, Rembrandt, get on. This is the silliest thing you've ever done, Candy. Maybe. We'll see. Dwight Ellsworth was already on the car when I got on here. And alive. How could you tell? He mumbled something when I asked him to move over. Sounds logical. Although I once remember stumbling into a corpse who mumbled for hours after it had been liquidated. Mm, Rembrandt was in one of his rambling moods, so I let him alone. The car pulled over Mason Street, down Washington, and then swung on to Powell and up the hill. Now I watched the buildings and apartments carefully. There was a little red brick building, now a big apartment house, a woman's residence club, and so on. Then over the hill, more apartments, and the possibilities petered out at Bush. Well, only one thing to do. Canvas all those blocks between Washington and Bush. Okay, Rembrandt, off the car. The strangest corpse I ever did see. Uh, what do you say, Candy? Off the car. Come on. Now what? I just want to get to bed. Well, not for a long time, Boy Blue. Now, here's the pitch. You take this building, and I'll take the next. We'll alternate as we go along. Ask if a tall woman with a horsey face and dressed something like Queen Victoria ever lived around here. Oh, Candy. I know it sounds wild, but it's got to be done. A horse with a tall face and dressed something like... Oh, Rembrandt, look at me. Get that smoke out of your brain. A tall woman with a horsey face and dressed something like Queen Victoria. You got it? Got it. Okay, get going. It was slow and tiresome. And the answers I got. A tall gal dressed like Queen Victoria. Oh, sister. That was about par. Nope, nobody like that ever lived here. Are you positive? A dame who fits that description? Yeah, I'm positive. The morning wore on and so did we. We were over on the other side of California Street now, so we stopped and had a bite to eat. I had pickles with mine and Rembrandt had olives on toothpicks in a glass. And again, we picked up the hunt. My heart was suddenly making with a rumba. There, just on the other side of Clay, in front of a three-story red brick house, was a police squad car. There was a little knot of people gathered around. Daintily lifting my crinoline, I did a Mel Patton down the block and up the front steps. I didn't have any trouble finding the room. The door was wide open, and there was a body on the floor. Four representatives of the law were buzzing back and forth. One of the buzzees was Mallard. Well... My little ambassador of violence. Why is it you're always around the extremely dead, Candy? I've got no time to brandy the ad libs, Mallard. Who is it? I don't know yet. No identification. Let me see. (laughs) Ah, a pen pal, maybe. I was right. I knew it. Knew it? Knew what? You're right. He was a pen pal. He wrote me a check last night for $300. His name is Roger Ellsworth. Very interesting. Must be open season on Ellsworth. Okay, Candy, time you filled in in the blanks. Start. Wait a minute. I want to look at the window over here. Mm hmm. Mallard, there are a couple of younger Ellsworths living around town here. I'm sure you'd like to see them stay healthy. Yeah? Get out to 25 Dasho Road and pick up an old crone also named Ellsworth. Five will get you 20. She's the one you're after. Uh, all right. But you get back to your place and stay put, understand? I want to have a more illuminating chat with you. Oh, Mallard, I'm I'm just like putty in your hands. The moon was coming up over Diablo and spraying a path of silver on the bay. Still no Mallard. I wondered what could be wrong. Well, this was it. This was the showdown. Have you seen a tall face with a horsey woman? Oh, Rembrandt. Candy, I'm so mad at you, I could... Oh, what's the use? Now what's the matter? What's the matter, she says. I've been roving all over Powell Street, ringing doorbells. 
Where did you go, you traitor? Oh, and Brad, I'm sorry. And in the excitement, I forgot all about you. What excitement? There's been another murder. In a moment, there's going to be another. I'm looking right at you, Candy. Oh, cool off. Have some formula and stop snorting steam. <gasps> what was that? Your window, Candy. It just shattered. What? Oh, wait a minute. That window didn't shatter by itself. Quick, get the lights, Rembrandt. Now duck down here. What sort of a silly game are we playing now? This isn't a game, believe me. Candy! Candy, are you all right? Yikes, it's the gumshoe. Yes, I'm all right. Where are you, Mallard? Over here. Two houses over. We've got your girlfriend trapped on the roof next to you. Don't move and stay covered. Okay. All right, Mrs. Ellsworth. Are you coming down peacefully, or do we have to play cops and robbers? I'm not coming down until I get that candy match. She did it! She forced me to kill my own brother-in-law! Have it your own way. Okay, loosen her up a bit, boys. Better than the Fourth of July. Keep your head down, Rembrandt. Oh, is that what was up? Ready to come down, Mrs. Ellsworth? No, I'm not! That hateful woman! She's ruined my whole life! All my plans! Just because of her snooping and prying! She's going to die, I tell you! It was a miracle, Candy. You must have moved slightly just as she shot at you. Well, it was too close, I can tell you. She's dead? Oh, decidedly. I think she was dead before she hit the ground. That one shot got her. We went out to her house, and she was just driving off when we got there. We trailed her up to North Beach, lost her for a block, and then spotted her car at the top of the hill here. We arrived just as she was getting on the roof next door. Okay, now you tell me your little dream. Well, it was that ship docking that set my wheels going around. The name Ellsworth started burning in back somewhere. Mm -hmm. You saw the clippings we dug up. Yeah. The South Sea Island steamship lines were slowly being sabotaged. I did some checking, and I, I found that the insurance companies weren't going to renew. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't tie that in sooner. Oh, it's just that you have too many things on your mind, Ma Mallard, dear. <laughs> I went out to the place on Dashiell Road, and when I left, I was pretty sure the old girl had knocked off her brother-in-law. Why? Well, for several reasons. One, she was a venomous old witch. Two, you've never seen such a collection of guns in all your life. And her husband admitted she was a darn good shot. I also saw one little pot gun that was very interesting. It had a silencer on it. Uh-huh. That was the one she used on you tonight. And also the one she used on Dwight Ellsworth from the window of that apartment where you found her husband. How do you know? Go back there. You'll see a nice little bullet hole in the curtain with burned powder all around it. Now, don't tell me that... Yes, I'm telling you that she rented that place knowing that her brother-in-law always went downtown on a certain cable car. She waited that morning until we were riding by, and she plugged him. I have now heard everything. And the reason? Dwight Ellsworth, rather than fighting the insurance companies, had decided to sell his steamship line. But the old gal thought she'd beat him to the punch by knocking him off. The steamship company would then fall into her husband's hands. Yeah. What about her husband? Well, after he gave me the check and I left, they evidently had a fearful row, and she spilled the beans. Somehow she lured him down to that place on Powell and... Gave him some lead poisoning, too. And that's all there is to it. Candy, I wish you'd have told me all these things earlier. We might have been able to save the life of Roger Ellsworth. No, it wouldn't do any good. Because if she hadn't killed him, I was going to. What? Mm-hmm. While I was waiting for you to get here, the phone rang. It was Uncle Charlie, the honest miller. That no good Roger Ellsworth. His check bounced like a brand new golf ball. <laughs> What's so funny, Mallard? <laughs> Listen in again to the further adventures of Candy Matson, Girl Sucker. Well, that's the way it goes. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. In this case, nobody did. Except Rembrandt. He'd stocked his darkroom with $50 worth of formula. And not the kind you use on negatives, either. Let's see... Murder on a cable car, Dwight and Roger Ellsworth done in as well as the old gal. One check that bounced. It really does sound fantastic, doesn't it? But I told you this was radio, didn't I? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I did come out ahead at that. 
On the way out, Mallard leaned down and kissed me. The first time it ever happened. You know, at times, it, it's kind of fun to be in the arms of the law. Listen again next week at the same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were Helen Cleave, Jack K. Hill, and Harry Bechtel, Jack Thomas as Rembrandt, and Henry Leff as Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Here's Ted DeCorsia in the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. your feet propped up on the corner of your desk in your old tilted back and relax. It's your favorite slouch. Not so much because of the load it takes off your spine, but especially because it angles your eyes just right to watch Zelda across the room. Seven o'clock at night and they give me ten pages to do. You give her back a smug grin and make a note about the pretty curve her neck makes rising from her shoulders. You had to get these forms out like I had to dye my hair green. You'd be the saltiest green head on the block. You get salt from slaving in a salt mine. <laughs> now, you just be a nice office wife and the boss will buy you dinner. Now, wait just one second. Is this a strange left-field plan to tap me into getting sick on spaghetti again? What's wrong with Mario's spaghetti? It wiggles on the plate all by itself. So we'll eat someplace else. Now? Carry on, my dear. Caress those cheeks. Oh, Mike. Saved by the bell. Answer it. Answer it yourself. You can. Yeah. Mr. Hammer? Yeah? I don't know you, Mr. Hammer, but we have a mutual friend. Mm, what do you want? Jim Gordon. I'm calling about Jim. You've got to help him. He's got his back up against the wall, and they're going to... Go yeah? On. Hello? 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 <laughs> a big night all planned out just for you and Velda. But the phone call cuts it out before you can even start. You and Velda get on the phone and start checking to see what kind of a gag this is. You try the trucking office where your old friend Jim Gordon runs his freight business, but nobody answers. You call Jim's brother, but he's not around. You run out of phone calls just in time. Hello? Mike, I've been trying to get you all night long, but your lousy phone's been ringing busy. You don't like the sound of Pat Chambers' voice, and when you hear what he's got to say, you like what he says even less. Words around, you've been looking all over for Jim Gordon. Well, I'm looking, but what's that got to do with homicide? Plenty, Mike. I found him. Yeah, where? In his office in the freight terminal. So what has that got to do with me? Nothing. Unless you can tell me why he put a bullet through his head. You know all the answers, all right, but not to a question like that. Because you know Jim Gordon, too. And he just isn't the type. You've crawled in the mud with Jim Gordon and watched him fight. And when he got it hanging on the barbed wire, you saw him grab his last ounce of life and slam away until he came back. Nobody like Jim Gordon turns a gun on himself. And it's going to take a long, cold hunk of proof to try to prove otherwise. You take Velda along with you to see a guy both you and Jim knew. He isn't a mutual friend. That's the way the ball bounces, Hammer. Some guys just don't have it. Craig Lawrence has plenty. But he's the kind of a grabber that never thinks he has enough. His favorite method is to buy up the trucking competition, and if that doesn't work, he forces them out. Look, Hammer, we talked enough. Now, how about you and this dame getting out of my office? Oh, what's your hurry, Lawrence? I'm a busy man. I run a trucking business, not a quiz show. You're really broken up about Jim Gordon, aren't you? Gordon was nothing to me, just a wildcat punk who scrubs the nickels on short hauls. He wants to knock himself off, that's his business. That wasn't what he told me a couple of weeks ago. Which means? You tell me. What's to tell? How about starting with a reason why you wanted to buy him out? So I offered to buy him out. He also told me you were turned down flat. Nobody turns Craig Lawrence down flat. Maybe the police would be interested in that angle. Look, you two, don't go making something out of nothing. It's more than nothing to me. So he was your friend. That's got nothing to do with me. Maybe it hasn't. If it was really suicide. What kind of a crack is that supposed to be? You've got a clear track with Jim Dent. That is, if you can make everybody believe he killed himself. 
But his friends know he wasn't the type. He knew about it. Look, it was suicide up and down. If you'd have been here before when the cops were around, you'd have gotten the story straight. How straight can a story be without witnesses? You could be wrong about that, Hammer. What do you mean? Maybe there was a witness. Who? Henry Bryant, Gordon's dispatcher. And where is he? How should I know? Oh, nice and pat, huh? Just a little too pat. Okay. Suppose you check with the cops. They're satisfied it was suicide. I don't know what kind of a cop would go for that suicide, young. But maybe Captain Chambers will have a different idea. And I'm going down to homicide and talk to him. <laughs> yeah. You do just that, Helen. Because Chambers is just a cop who went for it. Chambers was here. He said it was suicide. <laughs> You drop Belt off on the way down to Pat Chambers' office. You always figured Pat for a smart cop, but his attitude now could go down in history as a guy bucking for stupid. I only know what I see, Mike. I don't read crystal balls. I work right down the back road. You're ready to blow your stack. You just can't figure how Pat can swallow a yarn like that. Now, take it easy, Mike. Take it slow and easy. But I told you, a guy called me about him being in trouble. I told you about Lawrence trying to buy Jim up. You know what kind of a muscle man Lawrence is. He's got a reputation that'd make Bluebeard look like a cream puff. Yeah, I know, I know. Then how can you have the gall to call this a suicide and close the book on it? What else can I do? Oh, I don't get you, Pat. For the first time, I don't read you at all. Well, if you think I'm convinced that Jim Gordon killed himself, you better buy some new bifocals. Well, then why? Give him some string right along. When they think they're getting away with it, we'll catch him off base. Where did you get that badge? My correspondence school? Mike... You've worked the truth out of tougher guys than Lawrence. Why don't you book him on suspicion? Lawrence? A... Ah, not him. It's the other guy I'm worried about. What other guy? Henry Bryant, the Gordon dispatcher. Oh, come on, Pat. You don't suspect Bryant, do you? Why not? The handlers down at the terminal told me that Gordon and Bryant were given to dispatching each other from time to time instead of the freight. Pat, they're like you and me. Just because we level off from time to time doesn't mean we kill each other. Then where is Henry Bryant? Why'd he disappear? I don't know. But we'll have the answer when we find him. We? What do you mean, we? Well, I'm going to help you find him. In a pig's eye, you are. Now, look. I'm I... trying to be a nice guy. I'm asking you politely to stay out of this. No interference, get me? Interference? A friend of mine dies, and you... I'm can't... asking you just once, stay out. We'll find Henry Bryant our own way. The city pays us to do that, not you, understand? Pat, I can't hear a word you're saying. All right, then. I'm through asking you nicely. Now I'm telling you. Lay off. If I find you sticking your nose in this, it goes down to my book as obstruction of the law. In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. Obstruction of the law. You've been as thick with Pat Chambers as frozen glue. And now, when you want to help him get the guy you're both looking for, he tells you to lay off. You lay off, all right. You lay off like a desert rat lays off water in an oasis. You pick Belle up just in time to keep her from going to sleep. Don't let it get you, Mike. She tries to find the words, but everything she says makes the steam bubble inside even more. You can't blame Pat for trying to work things out his own way. Well, that isn't good enough for me. For him, it's just another job, another file in his office. But you know Jim was more than that to me. Yes, I know. But there's nothing you can do now. There's plenty I can do. Sure, plenty. Like getting into trouble, like risking your license. I know, Velda, but I just can't help it. It's a chance i got to take. So you take the chance. The chance of locating Jim Gordon on your own. Zelda finds Henry Bryant's address in a phone book for you, and then you both head up now. You figure maybe somebody in the house can give you a lead. Mike, you're just raking over dead ashes. The police must have been there already. They must have questioned everybody. Sure, but sometimes even the cops don't get all the answers. It's in this block. Now, remember, I'm going to say I'm Bryant's cousin. All right. Hey, hey take it easy. Why try testing your brakes now? Look up the block there, that parked car. What about it? That's Lawrence's Nash convertible. What? Are you sure? Positive. He had it in the loading dock at the freight terminal. Hey, maybe your hunch was right. Hold it, Elder. What now? Look. That guy running down the steps. 
The guy with his hat pulled over his face. Hey, you This car. There they go. We're going to tail him. Who is he, Mike? I couldn't see his face with a hat pulled over it like that. Why do you think he had it pulled down? And I'll bet all the stays in your grandma's court that that guy under that hat was Henry Bryant. <laughs> the car is going, it doesn't waste any time. You break a few speed laws across the town and then follow it across the bridge and out into the country. It slams north onto the main highway for 25 miles and then suddenly cuts over into a side road. That side road turns out to be bad luck for you. Mark, I don't see the car. Honey, I like that for luck. I lost them. Maybe they took the turn at the fork a few miles. Ah, they came this way all right. Oh, this is great. I keep on their tail for over 30 miles, and then I have to lose them out here in the middle of nowhere of all the lousy breaks. Well, at least we know in which direction they were headed. We can notify Pat Chambers. Oh, sure, Pat. You know what he'll say about me cutting in? Obstruction of the law. Mm -hmm. Well, I just have to take the chance and tell him. And your license will go with it. Yeah. And hey, there's a building off the road up ahead. Yeah, the only one. I'll phone Pat from there. While I'm there, I'll take a look around. Wait, there's a sign. Wearing sanitarium. Yeah. Maybe Pat will let you off easy. Well, don't bet on it. You wait here. I'll be out in a minute. May I help you? Uh, the name's Mike Hammer. I want I'm to... Frank Waring, the administrator of this sanitarium. How can I help you? Well, you can help me by letting me use your phone. I have to call the police. Anything wrong? No, I get these crazy impulses from time to time to let them know I'm still alive. The police. Of course, Mr. Hammer. This way, please. I assume it's very important. Yes, yeah, sort of. I, uh, been trying to track down my cousin, Henry Bryant. Henry Bryant? He's your cousin? You mean he's here? Why, uh, yes. Mr. Hammer, how did you know? Oh, I followed him here from the city, and then I lost the car on the way. But I wasn't sure he came to this sanitarium. I got to see him right away. No, I'm sorry. It may not be wise to disturb the patient. Patient? What are you giving me? Mr. Bryant is in a very serious mental state. Now, hold on, Waring. Somebody's giving you a routine. There's nothing wrong with Bryant. The guy he worked for was killed early tonight... And he was there when it happened. Early tonight? Why, that's impossible. You see, Mr. Hammer, Henry Bryant hasn't been out of the sanitarium since he was admitted at 5 o'clock last night. When your jaw stops bouncing off the floor, Waring takes you to his office and shows you the record. The report states that Henry Bryant was admitted to the sanitarium at 5 o'clock the evening before. But you're not satisfied at all. The whole setup reads as phony as a set of aluminum teeth. You're in for a bigger surprise when Waring tells you he has no objections to your seeing the patient. Mr. Bryant is in the room up ahead. He leads you down the corridor to a corner room. This is the door. Now, please remember, do not excite him unduly. Now, here. Uh, Mr. Bryant. Huh? You have a visitor. This gentleman, Mr. Hammer, claims he knows you. <laughs> His name isn't that. He's lying. I never saw him before. Please, don't let him hurt me. Henry, you remember me, Mike Hammer. No. I no. came to see you about Jim Gordon. Jim! You're one of his spies. Jim sent you to... Henry, Henry, Jim's dead. Oh. He's just saying that. Mr. Waring, he's come to kill me. Please don't let him kill me. No, 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 Mr. Bryant. No one is going to harm you. Please don't let him kill me. Please don't let him. I, I don't want to die. Please don't let him do it. You'd better leave now, Mr. Hammer. Well, maybe you'll quiet down a minute, then I can ask I'm him. I'm sorry. I can take no further risk with the patient. Please wait for me in my office. You don't bother to wait. You get back out to your car in Belder. You wait till you get out to the main highway before you fill her in. Sounded like he was insane. Well, uh, Henry Bryant's no crazier than I am. But I'll tell you one thing for sure, he's scared stiff. What do you mean? Well, I just can't put my finger on it, but 
Brian is really frightened. It wasn't part of his act. Would you think he knows something about Jim Gordon's death? Plenty. He was the guy we saw get into Lawrence's convertible. But you told me Mr. Waring said Brian was admitted to the sanitarium last night. Waring was lying. Brian was wearing the same suit that I saw on him when he got into Lawrence's car back in town. Then Waring must be in on it, too. Up to his eyeballs. Henry Bryan is being hidden at that sanitarium for a reason. He's only faking insanity. And Waring's tied up with it. Yeah, I got all the answers, but go prove them. Maybe we can prove them, all of them. Okay, Velda, you tell me how. Okay, I will. Take the next turn to your left. That'll bring us to the village of Glendale. Well, what's Glendale got to do with it? Dr. Harris has his office there. You remember him. Harris? Oh, yeah, the nice old guy we helped out last year. And now Dr. Harris can help us. Come on, come on. What are you getting at? You want to prove that Henry Bryant isn't insane, don't you? Oh? So I figured it'd be a good idea for Dr. Harris to have me admitted to that sanitarium as an emergency patient. Hey, now, wait. Of course, under an assumed name like uh, Jane Barnes. Nothing doing, Bill. Of all the crazy ideas. We're going to talk to Dr. Harris right now. Absolutely not. You're not going to talk me out of this, Mike. If Henry Bryant is as frightened as you say he is, there's a good chance he might confide in a sympathetic fellow patient like... Well, poor Jane Bourne. That hammer guy. You thought you'd be a smart guy and keep Velda late at the office so she'd have to have dinner with you. Instead, you're both on a wild goose chase after a guy who might be a material witness to a friend's murder. Now, to make matters worse, Velda's got the bright idea that she can get the dope you want by having herself committed to the sanitarium where the witness is. Yes, Mr. Waring, that's correct. Uh, Miss Jane Barnes. Yes, I'll bring the patient over immediately. You sit in the corner and stew while Dr. Harris makes all the arrangements. The more you think of the deal, the less you think of it. No, that wasn't so bad, was it? Look, Velda, will you please listen to me? Mike, we've been through it all. Everything is settled. Not as far as I'm concerned. You'll feel much better when we get the facts that will make Captain Chambers thank you for interfering. Listen, I'm going to call Pat right now and tell him everything. Oh, no, you're not. Velda, can't you understand that you're walking right into the middle of a nest of rabbits? I can take care of myself. Don't kid yourself. Craig Lawrence is mixed up in this, and Lawrence plays the game for keeps. What happens if you get stuck in there and need help? Oh, I've thought of that, Mike. You stay right here in Glendale. If I do need help, I'll phone Dr. Harris. I'll say, um, I want my brother to come and visit me. That'll be a signal, all right? And I can't talk you out of this. No. Okay, Velda. Or is it Jane Barnes? Now, you remember the signal for help. I want my brother to come and visit me. And now we'd better have Dr. Harris deliver his patient to the sanitarium. <laughs> You wait. You sit at Dr. Harris's phone and wait, but nothing happens. Every time the phone rings, you jump for it, but it always turns out to be a routine call for the doc. He finally takes off on an emergency case, and you flop down on his operating table to wait some more. The night is almost over when the phone rings again. Hello? Dr. Harris, this is Miss Jane Barnes. It's me, Bella Mike. Yes, Dr. Harris, I know. Well, Dr. Harris was called on on a case an hour ago. I've been standing by in case you're phone. Dr. Harris, I'm very lonely here. I want my brother to come and visit me. Okay, Velda, I'll get Dr. Harris right away and come over and get you. Please hurry, Dr. Harris. Please hurry. <laughs> You don't bother to wait for Dr. Harris. When you swing into the side road leading to the Waring Sanitarium, you change your mind about the direct approach. You leave your car down the road and get to the building from the rear. The basement entrance is open. You come through the lower corridor and head up the stairs. Nobody's around. You head to the door where you saw Henry Bryant and try the door. It swings open. Bryant is lying on the floor, and you have to get down real close to see that he's still alive. Scared. I was scared. You kneel down close to him and beg him to talk. I walked in on Lawrence and Jim. I saw him shoot. Then Jim didn't kill himself. 
Lauren, I saw him. They, they made me come here. Zelda, where's Zelda? Who? The girl that was brought in. They, they, they said they'd kill me. Brian, tell me, where is she? You, me. You know what? What? Hey. You watch Henry Bryan's eyes turn blank as the fear washes away. And it washes over you when you think of what they could have done to Velda. Rather strange visiting ours, brother. You check around to see Waring standing against the door jam, pointing a gun at Don't move abruptly, Mr. Hammer. I hate the sight of blood. Well, you're a pretty sharp guy, aren't you? Sharp enough to know what's going on in my own sanitarium. I'm afraid your girlfriend is in a much more serious condition than I thought. Meaning? Delusions, you know. She said she called Dr. Harris. So? She couldn't have, Hammer. Dr. Harris is dead. What? One of our doctors was called out 20 minutes ago. There was an auto accident down the road, and Dr. Harris was killed in that accident. Now, Mr. Hammer, you will please go down the hall to my study. He handled the gun like it was part of his hand. So you head down the hall and wait as he unlocks the door. Well, young lady, you wanted your brother to come and visit you. Here he is. Hello, Zelda. Micah, I'm sorry. You're going to be sorry, you have Lawrence. I've been waiting for you with open arms. And this Mike. Gun. You two should have kept your noses out of where they don't belong. Mike, why didn't I listen to you? I've made a terrible mess of things. No, no, no. Take it easy, fella. It was a great idea while it lasted. What about the car wearing? It's out in the rear, Mr. Lawrence. First make sure Brian's dead. Then get in and bring it around the side entrance. I'll take care of these two. Right away, Mr. Lawrence. Hey, handy to have a stooge running a plant like this, isn't it? Mike, what are they going to do to us? I'd rather not ask. You don't have to, I'll tell you. You two and me are going for a ride, but you're not coming back. All right, start walking. Oh, after you, Mr. Lawrence. Wise guy. Huh? Just being polite. You'll just be dead if you try any phony moves. All right, get going. Down to the door at the end of the hall. I'm sorry, Valdi. What I wouldn't give for the sight of Captain Chambers right now. You can double that for me and add a million. If I hadn't been so stubborn, if I... Mike! Mike, that shot, I thought you... No, baby, I'm okay, but... How did Lawrence get it? I'm how? Captain Chambers. Pat, where did you come from? I was hiding around the corner of the corridor. I had to clip him because he had his gun on you, and he might have used it on you two if he'd seen me. Where are you? He went to the car. Ah, you just relax. We grabbed him when he came down the hall before. Pam, how the devil do you happen to be here? <laughs> I used a new correspondence school system. Okay, okay, rub it in. Now I had a tail on Lawrence all the time, Mike. When I got word he was on his way out of town, I just made up my mind to see where he was going personally. While I had this sanitarium spotted outside, I uh, happened to see you go in. Huh? You mean, you were outside all the time? Yeah. Right. Well, why didn't you stop me right then and there? Stop you? I figure there's only one sure way of stopping you. Lock you up, say, for uh, obstruction of the law. Oh, Pat, you wouldn't do a thing like that. Oh, would you? I would. If you haven't learned a lesson. Oh, believe me, Pat. I've learned it for the both of us. <laughs> They all knew he was aboard the yacht when it exploded and sank. And everybody called his death an accident. That is, everybody except the corpse himself. He said it was murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And 
now with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Restless Day. It had been a long, hard Saturday night that topped off a long, rugged week. When I finally got to bed dog-tired at 5 a.m. Sunday morning, I was planning to stay there until I'd caught up on all the sleep I'd lost and gained a running head start on the coming week. And by three in the afternoon on the day of rest, I figured that job was only about half done. But whoever it was that started riding my doorbell had a different idea. I held out until the buzzer stopped, but it was only a change of tactics, so I gave up. All right, all right, I know when I'm licked. Just a minute. Thank heaven you're in, Mr. Marlowe. Hmm? I don't know what I'd have done otherwise. <coughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. Here, read this. This story on the front page. What? No, down here. Oh, yacht explosion, death label accident, huh? Yes, yes. Oh. Mystery blast which destroyed the Rollins yacht at Santa Monica Friday night and in which Benjamin Rollins, noted cosmetics manufacturer, was killed was established today by police investigators as accidental. <coughs> sorry, I spoke too yeah, much. It's all right. The explosion which shattered and sank the 50-foot pleasure boat was caused by a leaking fuel line. Rollins, known to be a chain smoker, is believed by witnesses to have continued on page 7. <laughs> Never mind, Marlowe. <laughs> I'll tell the rest. Yeah, think you'll make it? There are two frightening things wrong with that story. Well, go ahead. Frighten me. First, the explosion was no accident. That fuel line was repaired a week ago. Second, Ben Rollins was not killed. You're yeah, shaking my faith in the American press. How do you know all this? Because I am Benjamin Rollins. Yes, well, look, fella, you better dial 116 on the phone and tell the police all about it, oh, huh? No, that's exactly what I can't do. Someone's tried to murder me. If they find out I'm still alive, I'll be a target for a second attempt. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I need two us. things right now. One, a cup of coffee. Would you like some? No, milk, if you please. My doctor insists. Okay, come on. The other's a good, solid explanation of why everybody thinks you were aboard that yacht. Well, first, they believe my body was lost in the explosion. You see, I intended to spend the night there because Lucille, my wife, and I had quarreled. Mm -hmm. But I got a call, and I had to go out of town on business at the last minute. I went out to the boat, but only to pick up some papers. I was in a hurry. I must have left the lights on. I'd lost my hat in the wind on the way back. <laughs> it was found. <laughs> it was found in the water. <laughs> Apparently, I didn't secure the dinghy because that was a drift offshore. Mind you, I read all this in the paper when I got back this morning. Back from where? Phoenix. Arizona. Figures. I came in on the California Limited. You can check on that. Marlowe, I must know who tried to kill me before they know they've failed. Uh-huh. That could be tough. Have you got any ideas? Yes, I have. It might be any one of three people. Three? For instance, Walter Pittman, my ex-partner, threatened to kill me less than a month ago in New York when I won another court decision from him. Mm -hmm. Then there's my business manager, a fellow named Slater. I almost fired him last week, the arrogant fool. <laughs> it's always when I get cross this country. Yeah, I see. So, and I'm sorry to say it, but... Mrs. Rollins Husk would no doubt rather have me dead than alive. <laughs> That's quite a lineup for a mere cosmetics chemist, isn't it? Yes, it is. Look, you haven't been running lipstick experiments with somebody else's live equipment, have you, Rollins? Mm -hmm. Oh, certainly not. I've been working so hard I haven't time for my wife. <coughs> to say nothing of another woman. Oh, Marlowe, I'm frightened. I must get to the bottom of this. I'll pay you double your usual fee. Will you help me? Okay, Rollins, it's a deal. If I hurry, I might get in on your funeral. Under the circumstances, that should make somebody due for a very big surprise. A shave and a shower later, and I checked my wheezing client's credentials, settled him down in my apartment with orders to answer the phone, but not the door, and drove out to Santa Monica where the not very late Ben Rollins had made his home. I had a list of names, addresses, and phone numbers of people close to Rollins. That is, close enough to kill. And I decided that Arthur Slater, the business manager, was my best bet for an opener. He had been described as soft-spoken, efficient, and somewhat arrogant. And after I found his cottage on Seaview Drive and walked up to the door, I heard someone inside yeah, offering a similar it. description, but with more color. Mighty routine, Arthur Slater. If you think for two minutes you can throw little Angie over any time you feel like it, after all the promises you've made, you're wrong. That's just about enough, Angie. Not by half, brother. I know which way the wind is blowing, and it's a nice big wind. Nobody kicks me out, and I mean nobody. So think it over, Mr. Big. Oh, get out of my way. Yes, ma'am. Cute kid. Friend of yours, Slater? Who are you? 
Another insurance investigator? That's right. My name's Marlowe. May I come in? Yes, yeah, certainly. All the others did. Thanks. Who knows? I may be the last. Slater, I've got three reasons for believing that yacht explosion was no accident. Not an accident? What reasons are you talking about? For one, Walter Pittman. Pit- Pittman? You mean Rollins' ex-partner? You know him, huh? Well, only by name. I never met the man. All right, then. Let's talk about reason number two, Lucille Rollins. How do you feel about it, Slater? Well, you must be out of your mind, Marlowe. She and Ben fought constantly, yes. Slater, I asked how you felt about Mrs. Rollins. I don't like her. And now, what or who is reason number three? You are. You had an argument with Rollins last week. He practically fired you. And you think I'd kill him over that? Could be. Look, Marlowe, Ben Rollins drove himself like an overloaded truck. He had a cigarette cough, nervous shakes, and bad dreams. To me, bureau drawer eyelashes and glue-on fingernails simply aren't that important. So we had frequent arguments. Now, do you have any more smart reasons you'd like to discuss, or would you care to leave? Just one thing more. Why does your girlfriend think you're a little stuck up these days? You're becoming a bit too personal, Marlowe. Get out. I'm not compelled to answer any of your questions. There's an established legal procedure... Skip it, Slater. If I need to, I'll be back. And I'm fairly chummy with the boys in blue myself, so I'll get the answers if I want them. Good night, big shot. <laughs> Arthur Slater was like a billiard ball, hard to rub the wrong way. And if he did have an angle, he was playing cagey. So as long as I was in the neighborhood and the trail was hot, I figured I'd have a talk with the Spitfire, Angie. It wasn't hard to trail her. A corner newsboy had heard her get into a cab. The cabbie swore he'd never forget her. Swore again. So finding her apartment was less trouble than unfolding a $5 bill. When I pulled up across the street from her place, I noticed a big car as big as the average garage and older than last year's college graduate parked in front. It was a black Pierce Arrow, and someone with a mouthful of cigar hooked behind the wheel. The cigar was pointed at me as I crossed the street. And when I went up the stairs to Angie's door, it was still pointed at me. But I forgot about that when the apartment door opened. Angie was relaxed. There were little glints of gold in her green eyes. And the warm lights behind her shimmered on soft waves of hair, a shade of burnished copper. Maybe she was a spitfire, but at the moment, her damper was down. Yeah. Well, Buster, you got your mouth open. You might as well say something. Eh. Uh, hmm. Angie, who do you think murdered Ben Rollins? Oh, murdered? My mistake, chum. Good night. Uh, just a minute. This is business, honey. Who are you, anyhow? Philip Marlowe. You ran over me on your way out of Slater's place a few minutes ago and dented my ego. Well, sue me. Who are you working for, Shamus? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. But I will tell you this, sweetheart. The explosion on that yacht was no accident. So I'm checking up on wives that'd rather be widows. Lucille Rawlins? Mm. Not. She was rolling in dough either way. She hated her job, but she sure didn't have to kill to quit. Get your compass fixed, Marlowe. Wrong way, huh? Well, suppose Lucille were in love with, uh, Pittman, maybe. Pittman? Who's he? Shot in the dark. Tell me something, Angie. Your boyfriend Slater has picked up a lot of push lately. How come? Oh, some big deal they've been working on at the plant. And he makes me sick. It's the first sniff of a success, and suddenly all his hats are too small. Especially his old hats, honey. And you can't blame the guy if he's really on his way up now, can you? Listen, Mac, I'll tell you, him, and the whole world something. Nobody is going to put little Angie on the skids. If there's a heave-ho pulled around here, Mr. Hotshot Slater himself will get it. And right in the neck. So if you happen to be snooping for him, Marlowe, you can putter right back and tell him so. Now beat it! That's not a bad idea. Oh, by the way, what's Angie stand for? Angelica? But don't count on it, brother. Don't count on it. As I went down the front steps, the cigar and the black Pierce arrow lined up on me again and followed me as I crossed the street and got into my car. It was still pointing at me as I drove away, but after all, the street was public property and the guy could smoke a cigar if he wanted to. Well, by the time I knocked on the front door of the Rollins' home, I was braced for a deluge of tears and a session of red-eyed hysteria. So I was caught off balance by the handsome blonde woman of 35 with a wry, crisp waistline who was cool, calm, and well-collected in green slacks. She introduced herself as Lucille Rollins. Sit down, Mr. Marlowe. You said you're a friend of Ben's? That's right, Mrs. Rollins. I stopped by to offer my condolences. But apparently condolences aren't much in order today. No tears, huh? 
Not even crocodile tears. I'm not a hypocrite, Mr. Marlowe, that's why. I'm merely stunned and confused over this terrible accident, and I'm not sure yet how I feel. Yeah, it was an accident, all right. Especially since that leaky fuel line that caused it was repaired a week ago. It had been repaired? Oh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Who are you, Marlowe? I'm a private detective, and I know a lot more than that. I know, for instance, that the insurance on the boat alone will keep you and pretty doodads for several years. And that's only a drop in a bucket. Mr. Marlowe, I think you'd better leave. And I think you'd better climb down off that high horse and listen. Because I haven't even started yet. Ben was a hated man by Pittman, by Slater, and maybe by you. And I can prove he didn't die accidentally, baby, so I'd like some nice straight answers, huh? When did you see Pittman last? I've never seen Walter Pittman. I don't even know what he looks like. Ben and I were married two years ago. He broke with Pittman long before that. But you're pretty chummy with Arthur Slater. That's a lie. Why, we hardly spoke until a week ago. You picked a poor time to get friendly, baby. Listen here, Marlo. Arthur, Mr. Slater, I ran into each other purely by accident one afternoon last week. I happened to stop in at a small bar in downtown Los Angeles. Mr. Slater was there at a table talking with some man, a stranger to me. When he saw me, he came over. He seemed upset. So upset. Wait a minute. Is there anyone else here now? I know. My maid went out to the movies. I heard something. A noise. Sounded like it came from the service boys. Come on, let's have a look. Well, I don't know what any... Hey! The lights went off. Somebody turned them off. You better... Lucille, look out! (laughs) Bullets which had been intended for Lucille had only traveled the width of the kitchen, but miraculously both had missed. Whoever had thrown them moved out fast, because when I got through the service porch and into the backyard, nothing stirred except the restless ends of a pepper tree. But a second later, a heavy, clanking motor roared on the side street, and I got to the fence just in time to see a boxcar on rubber tires skid around the corner. It was a black Pierce Arrow. I went back to the house, found the master switch, and turned on the lights. Lucille, her face strained and bloodless, stood in the kitchen door and watched me. A hole had been punched in the back screen door, and on the floor... It was a strange object which had been used to unhook the lock. It looked like an oversized bobby pin wearing rubber pants, which didn't mean a thing to me. But to Lucille, who stared at it like it was a centipede she just found in a cream puff, it meant plenty. Ben. What? It's like Ben himself was here. Like he wasn't killed at all. What are you talking about? What is this thing, anyway? I... I don't know. Part of some new invention he was working on. For the last month, Ben carried two or three of these things with him everywhere. Look, Lucille, where's your phone? Right there. Oh. But, Marlowe, you... You don't suppose... Who are you going to call? Friend of mine. He'd better be in, too. Go. Oh. Marlowe. What's the matter, Marlowe? Busy? Yeah, yeah, busy. He's either talking to someone or he's gone out after leaving the phone off the hook. And either way, Lucy, that makes my friend very busy. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, it may have taken a little detective work finding a much-wanted man last week, but an unprecedented number of listeners seem to have turned Philip Marlowe. For Jack Benny's largest audience this season found him here on his opening show on CBS. Tomorrow night, Jack will be back with Mary, Dennis, Phil, Rochester, and Don for more of the fun that's made the Jack Benny Show the number one comedy in radio. You'll find him right here on CBS every Sunday at 7 Eastern Standard Time. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Restless Day. When I left Lucille Rollins, the feminine target for tonight, I headed for Angie Gordon's where I'd first seen the man with a cigar in his face who I suddenly figured might be Walter Pittman. And as I drove, I felt like my brains had spent the night playing leapfrog in a squirrel cage. Because any way I'd call the dice, every one of my clients suspected of murdering him said somebody else. And just to keep things from making any sense at all, I suspected my client. I pulled up near Angie's and saw the Pierce Arrow parked, lights and a man with cigar out. When I got close to the bungalow door, I knew that the lady was at home. Now look here, and that she was receiving a gentleman here, caller, I'm more or less. Tell me your name is Smith, which incidentally I don't believe. And then you start asking a lot of very personal questions. How cozy. Now, please, you do not understand. 
There are certain things about the death of Ben Hollins that I must know. Things that mean a lot to me. How much a lot? Well, uh, uh, a hundred dollars, maybe. <laughs> what? Now, don't tell me that's all you could stuff into that briefcase there in your hand. Listen, girl, I I must know whether that ins- explosion on the boat was an accident or not. The police let it go as an accident? Never mind that. You are Slater's girl. You must know something about him as well as the other one who was here. Now, you tell me. Oh, Quick. Stay away from me, you big lug. I don't know anything. Let, let me... go of me, Ma. Uh, oh, let go you heard me, the lady, you know. Pittman. Let go. Let uh, go. How do you know my name? I read tea leaves. And while we're all asking questions, do you mind telling me why you were throwing bullets at the chinaware on Mrs. Rollins? I did no such thing. I don't even know Mrs. Rollins. You're a liar, and it's dull as the sauerkraut. The gun in your pocket will prove it. I, I have no gun in my pocket. Here. Here, look for yourself. All right, I will. But if it's all the same to you, I'll start with your briefcase. Well, give me that. Why? So you can get to the gun first? No, because I... Uh, all right. All right, Mr. Smart Man. Go ahead and look. See for yourself that there's absolutely nothing there that concerns you. No! When I get my hands on you, I'll break in two. And don't look so astonished, friend. It's called a gun. Why, you little... Uh, 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 Skip it, Marlo. It isn't my idea of returning a favor, but it, it is good business. You see, baby, little Angie sells out to the highest bidder. And no matter how I add things up, that isn't you. So exit Pittman, huh? Briefcase and... What are you staring at? That. That little gadget there. Must have fallen out of Pittman's briefcase. Uh, what is it? Twin brother of an item I found a little while ago. Rubber pants included. What are you talking about, Marlo? Nothing, baby. Just tell me how long I sit here. <laughs> as long as you like. Now... You see, Marlo, I just can't afford to let you get to Pittman ahead of me. Yeah. That good business you were talking about. Uh Uh-huh. After all, a gal's got to make a living. One way or another, Marlo. Doesn't she? There was room to debate Angie's point, but no time. So I skipped her invitation for a drink. Both promised and threatened to see her again and headed for my car in the only direction left. The residence of the local pivot man, Mr. Arthur Slater. When I got to within a block of the place, I parked and then approached slowly, keeping to the shadows all the way. But the house turned out to be as dark and quiet as the inside of a coffin. I was about to leave when some noise a dozen yards behind me said that I was no longer alone. I turned quietly and got ready for what I figured would be a reunion with my old buddy, Walter Pittman. But I was wrong. Sneaking through a nearby clump of orange trees with all the deftness of an ox with bunion trouble was no one else but my client, Ben Rollins. When I called his name out loud, he ran toward me, arms and legs flailing the wind like a Kansas scarecrow caught in a tornado. Marlowe, Marlowe, I've been looking all over for you. Rollins, why aren't you back in my apartment where you're supposed to be? I couldn't wait any longer. I was afraid something had happened to you. When you didn't call, I was sure of it. I thought you might be here at Slater's. But I did call, and all I got was a busy signal. Oh, about an hour ago. Why, that was a friend of yours. He wanted to know if you'd play cards with him tonight. (laughs) Now, do you believe me? Now, for the time being, yes. Incidentally, Rollins, do these mean anything to you, these oversized bobby pins? (gasps) Good Lord, the curlers. Where did you get those curlers, Marlowe? They should be in my safe. Well, I found one at your house and the other in a briefcase that belonged to Walter Pittman. Pittman? But Marlowe... These are samples of my newest invention, these hair curlers. They can produce a home permanent wave overnight that will last for six months. <laughs> it's, it's worth millions to me. <laughs> if you live. Yes. Now, it should be easy to figure out who wanted to kill me. I'm not so sure. If you didn't even know these were missing, why should someone have to kill you to get hold of them? And second of all, how come the shooting's still going on? What shooting are you talking about? Over at your place. Somebody tried to kill your wife there just before I called you. And that brings us right back to your alibi about talking to Ibarra at the time. It's a little too pat, Rollins. Besides, that curler could very easily have dropped out of your pocket. Why should I shoot at Lucille? For the best reason in the books, you wanted to kill her. And when that yacht business almost boomeranged on you, you still hadn't changed your mind. (laughs) And that led to this whole routine with me double-billed as Patsy and star witness both. You're out of your mind, Marlowe. I couldn't have set that explosion on the yacht as a trap for Lucille. Why not? Because it was on account of me that Lucille wasn't on the yacht herself that night. What? After we argued, we decided not to spend any more time under the same roof. 
The seal said that suited her fine and she'd sleep on the yacht. We let it go at that till about noon on Friday. And you got small about things and said the yacht was yours, maybe? That you'd sleep on it? Uh, yes. I was just bickering. Just I know. a minute, Rawlins. I've heard enough and I think I finally understand this whole screwy deal. I'll know for sure just as soon as I can make one single phone call to your house. We'll get back to Slater. Come on. <laughs> When I got to a telephone and threw to the maid at the Rollins place, I was almost positive that in another minute I'd have both a solid answer for my client and a couple of clumsy customers for the law. But when the shaky voice at the other end of the tube told me that Lucille had just left the house in high gear, after mumbling something about a place called Inspiration Point, I stopped being confident and started to worry. And when I tossed the jackpot question at the maid and got the winning answer, that worry became something worse, and it must have showed. What is it, Marlowe? What did you find out? Too much to explain now. Where's Inspiration Point, Rollins? About a mile south of here, mm -hmm. straight along the shore. Good. What kind of a car does your wife drive? A blue Nash. What's Inspiration Point got to do with Lucille, Marlowe? Everything. Now, look. You call the cops and tell them to get out there as fast as they can. Do you get me? As fast as they can. <laughs> Inspiration Point turned out to be an acre of windswept rock that overlooked the cold January sea. And after I saw Lucille's empty car, I crept, staggered, and fell down the narrow winding trail that led from the road to the promontory itself. I was afraid that I was going to be too late to stop what I was sure was a hastily scheduled murder. But a minute later, when I rounded the last crazy turn in the trail, I felt better. Because standing only a couple of yards away from me, her hair slapping wildly against the upturned collar of her coat, and very much alive was Lucille Rollins. I was about to breathe a sigh of relief when suddenly I caught the expression in her eyes. I turned to follow the line of her unblinking gaze and I knew that I hadn't arrived any too soon because the lady was being held at the point of a gun. A gun held by Arthur Slater. I closed my hand tight around the cold thirty-eight in my pocket and moved closer. When you called me at the house, you said that my husband was alive and with you. Why did you lie to me? Because I knew that would bring you running. I had to be alone with you, Lucille, so I could do what I missed doing last time. Last time? You mean the yacht? You did that? Yes. But somehow or other, Ben was out there instead of you. So that accident was a waste of time. But this one, the bereaved wife who jumped or fell to her death from the edge of Inspiration Point, won't be. But why, Slater? Why do you want to kill me? There's no time to explain, Lucille. And we'll take time, Slater. Marlowe, you! Yeah, me! Don't you! Kill me. Yes, honey, I know. He had to. But why, Marlo? Why? Because he stole your husband's invention to sell the wall of Pittman. He was going to go into business with him. But now when the cops get here, he's going first to a hospital and then to jail. A grand larceny and attempted murder. Attempted murder? What about Ben, Marlo? Ben was a near miss, honey. Nothing more. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Lucille found out that Ben was still alive. There were a lot of tears and promises to be good from both parties. And it wasn't until an hour had gone by and the police had already booked both Slater and Pittman, who was picked up heading back for L.A., that Mr. and Mrs. Rollins were in any condition to sit down and talk things over, even with the help of coffee and cigarettes in the Rollins' home. Then the whole scheme, Marla, was designed by Slater, who, as my business manager, had access to the new curlers. That's right. Knowing how Walter Pittman felt about you... Slater secretly contacted him to handle the manufacturing end, you see? <laughs> yes, I see. Hmm. Well, a few changes in the design, and the whole thing would have been patented and on the market while you and Slater... Who pretended that Pittman was a stranger to him. Uh-huh. Were still laboring away at last-minute changes. And when we learned about Pittman's product, Slater would act as surprised as Ben here. Ah, you're so right, Lucille. That was the plan. <laughs> oh, but it fell apart. See, it fell apart when you accidentally ran into Slater in that small bar in downtown L.A., do you remember? Yes. When he was with Pittman, the man you described to me as the stranger? Yes, of course. All right. Well, he realized then that with Pittman's product a success, you would sooner or later see a picture of Pittman, oh. the newly rich inventor, and recognize him as the man you saw with Slater before Pittman's product was on the market. So that meant that Slater either had to get rid of Lucy or give up his entire plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you got a match, Mr. Mupp? No. No, I'm going to give them up. But Marlowe, was Pittman involved in the murder attempt, too? Oh, no, no. He drew the line at the theft. 
See, when he found out that you had died mysteriously, he turned up here to check on Slater because he couldn't afford to be mixed up in your murder. I see. But how did you figure all this, Marlon? Well, after I had tangled with everybody, I was no place. Angie Gordon was looking for an angle. You, Lucille, were getting shot at, poor darling. Yeah, and Pittman and Slater were not on the same team, at least as far as the business on the yacht was concerned. Nobody seemed to have a clear-cut motive. But when I told you that Lucille herself was supposed to stay on the yacht that night, you had the answer. That was the time. After I called your house and asked the maid the jackpot question, which was, who aside from you, Ben, knew that Lucille was going to sleep on the yacht Friday night? And she said Slater, didn't she? Yeah. Said something else, too. She also said that you had left for Inspiration Point in a big hurry. Yeah. Then Slater tried to kill me first on the yacht, second in the house here, and finally out on the point. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it worked out fine, darling. Because the third time was the charm. Hmm. For us. Well, by the time I was through tying in all the loose ends for my client and his wife, it was three o'clock in the morning, and I was dog-tired all over again. When I got into my car and started away from the place, Ben and Lucille were standing in the doorway waving at me and smiling. So as I drove back toward L.A., I forgot about the sleep I was missing and thought about them. A couple who couldn't get along until one or the other of them had been robbed, dynamited, and shot at. Yeah. I guess it's really so. As the old bromide has it, the path of true love never does run smooth. Uh, smoothly. It's smooth. Hmm. Oh, well. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lorette Philbrandt, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, John Daner, and Jack Moyles. The special music was by Richard Arunt. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... Somewhere in the cold, persistent rain that made the city itself seem a thing of evil, a girl had disappeared, and it was my job to find her. But before I did, I found death and a devil. Rinso. R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. Municipal Tower to Transcontinental Flight 17. Municipal Tower to Transcontinental Flight 17. Over. That's us, Tom. Check it. Check. Transcontinental Flight 17 in Municipal Tower. Flight 17 in Municipal Power. Over. Police instructions. Check and see if you have male passenger occupying seat 24. Passenger occupying seat 24. Wanted by police. Over. I'm just checking my list, Joe. Yep, we got a man in 24. I'll tell him. Municipal Tower. We have a man in seat 24. The name he's traveling under is John J. Jones. John J. Jones. Maybe that's his right name, but the police want him. They know him as Boston Blackie. Maybe you've met Boston Blackie before on your local movie screen. In case some of you haven't, I think you'll soon be fast friends of his. And maybe you've already tried new Soapy Rich Rinso, too. In which case, you don't need me to tell you how good it is. But if you aren't using Rinso now, I can't think of a better time for you to start. Now when summer is here, you certainly don't want to spend hours on wash day scrubbing and boiling clothes. Well, just keep in mind that Rinso gets out the dirt without hard scrubbing or boiling. 
A short soaking in Rinso's lively suds, a few quick finger rubs, and you'll be ready to hang out a Rinso whitewash. Try this on your clothesline and see if you don't start whistling while you wash. And now, meet Boston Blackie. Outside the law is no strange territory to Blackie, but never does he stray for personal reward, although the police, and notably Inspector Faraday, find no solace in his motives and only bewilderment in his ability to remain out of their reach. Meet Chester Morris as Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. You Chicago police have been very cooperative. Thanks a million. Glad to help you, Inspector Faraday. When we send a man to New York, you can return the favor. Glad to. Anytime, Captain. There's the plane now, Inspector. See it? Blackie has got to be on it. We know he was on the plane when it left Detroit, and it hasn't made any stops. Well, Blackie's liable to get out of anything, any time. I remember once I had him in two sets of handcuffs. In the next minute... No handcuffs. No, Blackie. Chances are I couldn't have made the charge stick anyhow. Never have been able to tie anything on him in six years. You'll be able to arrest him now, won't you, Inspector? You're sure Blackie's the man, are you, Miss Moray? Oh, of course I'm sure. I was with my grandfather when he was robbed and the money stolen. The thief wore no mask, and I recognized him from the picture of Boston Blackie that was in the paper last year. Mm. Oh, I'm sure it was Blackie. Mm-hmm. Why do you keep asking me if I'm sure? I just wanted to be certain, that's all. I've been waiting to get a witness to make a positive identification for a long time. Oh, here comes the plane now. Do you think he'll have the money with him? I can't wait until I get my hands on it. There's lots of money in this world, Miss Moray. What I can't wait to get my hands on is Boston Blackie. Go ahead in, Miss Moray. I've been keeping Blackie in my hotel room here until our plane leaves for New York. Talk to him yourself. Mm-hmm. I can't get anything out of him. Go ahead now. Monahan's in there guarding him, and I'll be right here outside the door. All right, Inspector Faraday. Blackie always was a soft touch for a girl. Here's hoping you get something out of him. Oh, Inspector, you'll never know how important it is to me that I do. Uh, hello? Uh, he won't say a word, miss. Just sits there like he did all the time the inspector was questioning him. Oh, I'll try. Blackie? Boston Blackie, would you talk to me? About business or pleasure? Maybe a little of both. Detective Monaghan, could Mr. Blackie and I go over in the corner and talk? Oh, sure. I don't know why not. I'll stroll over to the window. Would you please come over here with me, Blackie? Why, sure. I've been waiting for a chance like this to have a little chat with you, Miss Moray. You identified me as the man who stole $10,000 from your grandfather. Yes, yes, I did. You know, you never saw me before in your life, Miss Moray. I wish I had. I wouldn't be in such desperate trouble now. You're in trouble. You had me arrested because you're in trouble? What is this, a new switch on the share the wealth plan? Oh, please let me explain. From what I've heard of you, Blackie, you're the only man living who can help me. But I had no idea of where or how I could reach you. Oh, so you made up the story of my stealing your grandfather's money, huh? Yes, I did. I knew the police could trace your movements where I couldn't. And I knew you could get away from Inspector Faraday once I'd seen you. (laughs) Well, thanks for the confidence. (sighs) The very worst, I could have said I was mistaken in the identification, and then they would have had to let you go. Only by then it would be too late. Say, so look, uh, let's get organized. Uh, too late for what? To recover the diamond that was stolen from me. Uh-uh, you, you've got the wrong boy, lady. If a diamond was stolen from you, let the police get it back. They're in that business. But that diamond, Blackie, the rest of my life depends on it. I, I must have it back by tomorrow night. Oh, please, please help me. Well, with these handcuffs on and two New York detectives guarding me, I couldn't be of very much help to anybody. But those handcuffs, haven't I heard that you can get out of them whenever you want to? Yes, but I've got to want to first. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm more than sorry. I'm miserable. I knew I had to reach you, and I I just messed up everything. No, I'll never... Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Miss Moray. We'll figure some way out. Here, (laughs) Uh, wipe your eyes with this handkerchief. Thank you. Put your hand. You got all the handcuffs. Shh. Okay, now. There, your eyes are nice and dry. Now blow. <laughs> you feel better now? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then. Let me have your bad time story. Uh, I don't know how I can laugh. Oh, it's easy. You, you just open your mouth and close your eyes and think of Inspector Faraday. <laughs> Never fails. Come on, Miss Moray. Tell me the whole story before Faraday gets restless. Well, I'm engaged to George Atwater. Yes? We're to be married soon, and yesterday he brought me something to look at. The Jonathan Diamond. 
The Jonathan, eh? Oh, that's worth a fortune. Well, oh, George's father has millions. Hey, Miss Murray, you all right over there? Oh, oh yes, officer, thank you. I, I won't be a minute now. Blackie, the diamond belonged to George's father. George brought it over to show me, and then he had a little too much to drink, and I thought it safer if he left it with me. He agreed. And sometime during the night, it must have been stolen from my apartment. I get it. If you don't produce the diamond, there'll be a mess. Uh, the police don't know anything about the diamond? No. That's why I made up the story about my grandfather and the stolen money. Well, when do you have to produce the Jonathan, Miss Moray? Tomorrow night. George gets back from a trip then. He'll want it and... Oh, Blackie. Tomorrow night? Well, it doesn't give me much time to work, but I'll try. Uh, call the detective over here. All right, but why? Shh, don't ask questions. Just get him over. All right. Officer! Officer, would you come over here a minute, please? Sure, Miss Snatcher. Well, did he tell you anything? No, but I've got something to tell you, Monaghan. Indeed, and what's that? This. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that, Blackie. You shouldn't have hit the officer. <laughs> you sure would have disappointed me if you hadn't said that. Now, listen. I'm going out the window and down the fire escape. As soon as I get moving, you scream for Faraday. Tell him what happened, that I socked Monaghan and put the handcuffs on you. <laughs> Here, I'd better do that now. Faraday's got the key. He'll open them later. There. Uh, now, remember, you finally worked this handkerchief from around your mouth and screamed. Have you got that? Yes. Oh, Blackie, please remember that getting back that diamond means my marriage and my whole life's happiness. Okay. Well, I'm going to New York, and I'll do my best. If I get back the diamond, you get married. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be surprised if instead of Boston Blackie, from now on I'm known as Chicago Cupid. <laughs> Shorty, listen, when a piece of ice like the Jonathan Diamond is lifted, somebody's got to know something about it. Look, Blackie, I've been out all night on it. Nobody knows nothing. All I could pick up was that a fellow named Atwater owns it. None of the boys that touch it. That is, except Duke Wardle. I'm telling you, this is Hollis a pistol, but Duke's been bragging that he'll grab it one of these days. Yeah? Well, where can I find him? Well, I, I checked that, too. He's out of town. That's definite. Yeah, he's been gone a week. Now, look, boss, why don't you lay off? Shorty, I promised to get that diamond back. I chartered a plane out of Chicago last night after breaking out of that hotel room. Young Atwater isn't due back in town till tonight, so I still have a little time. I'm going to waste some of it on a visit to the Atwater house. Ain't you a little out of your class up there, Blackie? <laughs> you know they got an awful lot of dough, those Atwaters. <laughs> you know something, Shorty? After the way that Moray girl smiled at me in Chicago, <laughs> I kind of feel like a million dollars myself. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'd like to see Mr. Atwater. Who shall I say is calling, please? Uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. John J. Jones. Uh, Mr. Atwater doesn't know me, but you can say it's about his son. About Mr. George Atwater, Jr.? That's right. Uh, he's in, sir. Would you like to see him? George is in? Well, I certainly would like to see him. When did he get back? A little while ago, sir. He returned earlier than we expected. Uh, come this way. He's in the library right here. Shall I announce you? No, no, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll go right in. Very good, sir. Hello there. Uh, Mr. Atwater? Yes, I'm George Atwater. Who are you? Well, my name is Jones, Mr. Atwater. John J. Jones. I'm a friend of your fiancé's. Oh, a friend of Lee's? That's right. And if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure, go ahead. Well, the night before last, when you left, Miss Moray, you were a little, uh... <laughs> oh, what do you mean, a little? I was uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't mean to be personal, but did you stop off anywhere on your way home? No, I got a cab and came right home. Uh, Mr. Atwater, where do you usually keep the Jonathan Diamond? I don't know what you're driving at, Mr. Jones, uh, but, well, we keep it here in the library, in this wall safe. Only it's not here now. Would you open the safe for me, please? Well, now, Mr. Jones, you're a perfect stranger to me, even though you are a friend of Miss Moray's. Well, you could hardly expect... Oh. So, so, this is a holdup, huh? I'm sorry I had to pull this gun on you, Mr. Atwater, but I want to see that safe. You don't mind if I lock the library door, do you? I do mind, but I don't suppose that matters. <laughs> Not a bit. There we are. So the Jonathan was kept in this safe, huh? Combination, Mr. Atwater, and keep your hands where I can see them. Sorry, Mr. Jones. I seem to have forgotten the combination. Well, I haven't time to make you remember it. Oh, the safe doesn't look too tough. Come over here where I can watch you while I go to work on it. All right. 
There's nothing inside the safe, but go ahead and open Quiet. it. Uh, take that watch off your wrist and put it in your pocket. It's making too much noise. I can't hear the tumblers drop. Come on, come on, take it off. All right. I think I, I've got the first number. Now for the second one. <laughs> this box of yours is pretty simple, Mr. Atwater. In fact, it's about the most unsafe safe I ever saw. There, that's the second number, all right? Do you want to be a good boy and tell me the last number? No? Okay, be a bad boy and watch me find it out for myself. There. Now, that ought to do it. I'll try the handle now. Well, made it. My compliments. Save them. Let's take a look in this jewelry box. Oh, so the Jonathan Diamond wasn't in the safe, huh? Well, what's this, then? That, uh, That's the Jonathan, all oh. right. I... I meant to leave it at Miss Moray's apartment, but uh, but I changed my mind. Open this door! Open it up! Open the door, Mr. Atwater! We're the police! Open up! Faraday, he must have had Shorty watched and trail me here. You don't mind if I close this safe door, do you, Mr. Jones? I want you to be caught with that diamond still in your hand. Well, this seems to be my day for unexpected visitors. Now keep away from that door, Atwater. You don't scare me. I'm going to open it. I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm going. You'll have to hurry. He's going through the window. Quick, he's got the Jonathan Diamond. He must still be in the garden. I've got two men out there. Maybe I can spot him from here. Come on, Monaghan. Blackie! Blackie, stop! Shoot, we've got him. And he's got the Jonathan Diamond. At last, Boston Blackie caught red hand. <laughs> Well, it does look as though Blackie is in for it now, but I have a hunch there's still plenty of action coming up. And uh, shifting from Blackie to Whitey, that is Rinso White, I'd like to tell you about a completely different kind of action, the kind you get with Rinso Suds in your washer. Yes, those Rinso Suds are so peppy and lively, they get your clothes sparkling white and bright with as little as a five-minute run per load. And when I say sparkling white, of course I really mean... (whistles) Exactly, Rinso White. And there's no better way than that whistle to describe the special kind of white Rinso gets your clothes. That's because Rinso gets out more dirt. Simple, isn't it? No wonder Rinso is the only soap recommended by the makers of 33 leading washers. And of course, a short run is not only easy on your washer, it's easy on your clothes. Keeps them new looking longer. So next wash day, do yourself a big favor. Whistle of a Rinso white, Rinso bright wash. And now, back to the adventures of Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. How do you like our cells, Blackie? <laughs> Air conditioning between the bars and everything. Comfortable enough for you? Oh, sure. This one's wonderful. I wish you'd try sleeping on that mattress they have in here. <laughs> I gave up in the middle of the night and slept on the stone floor. It was mm. softer. Oh, come on, Faraday. How about a couple of pillows? Oh, huh? poor Blackie. Too bad I didn't hear you. I've suddenly gotten very deaf. Isn't that terrible? You've suddenly gotten very deaf, and you've always been very dumb. Oh, very funny, Blackie. Yes, I know. New gag writer. Last one have to go back to kindergarten? Yes, and he told me how much all the other children miss you since you stopped going, Faraday. Blackie, we had to grab you on that Moray girl's charge. All right, so you grabbed me. A $10,000 stick-up, Blackie. That isn't important now. We'll talk about that later. But where's the Jonathan Diamond? Jonathan Diamond? What's that? Listen, Blackie, you've had that diamond in your hand. Now you had it when we broke in. Atwater saw it there. Where is it now? Now, you listen, Faraday. You've got to get me out of here in a couple of hours. You haven't a thing to hold me on. No, breaking into the Atwater house. I broke out of the house, not into it. Now, see if that's a crime, Inspector. You opened the safe in the library and you stole the Jonathan diamond. How about that? You sure I did? Mm. Does that safe look forced? Did you find the diamond on me? Uh, No, 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 no to all those things. But we've got George Atwater as a witness. A witness to what? I was calling on him at the suggestion of a mutual friend, Inspector. Hmm. We were having a chat when somebody started to pound on the door. I got scared and jumped through the window. You know, things like that happen, Inspector. People get scared and they jump. Blackie, I'm telling you this man to man, we've got a case against you. Atwater's word against yours that you robbed his safe. And slugging Monaghan in Chicago. The Moray girl's testimony that you robbed a grandfather. That'll add up to ten years at least. Go ahead, Inspector. Uh, all right, I'll be honest, Blackie. Young Atwater screaming about his diamond. Says you had it one minute, and we grabbed you the next minute, so it can't be missing. Only it, it is. All right, you tell us where you hid it, and I'll get him to drop all charges. I'll even talk to the Moray girl to get her to go easy if you return her dough. Now, how's that? I don't know. Oh, you must have it stashed somewhere. Give me your word of honor to deliver it back to me today, and I'll let you out. 
Your word's always been good with me, Blackie. Now, come on. Don't you want to get out of jail? Well, I don't know now, Faraday. It's kind oh. of a nice jail. You know, air conditioning between the Blackies. Blackie, Blackie, be a good guy. Okay, Faraday. As a favor to you, I'll come out. And you'll have your diamond back two hours after I leave you. But I'm not to be bothered during that time by the cops. You understand? Bothered? You'll be protected. And thanks a million, Blackie. <laughs> That's all right, Faraday. I'll get plenty of satisfaction every time I remember you begging me to get out of jail. <laughs> Miss Moray, this is Blackie. Can you talk? Oh, yes, of course. Nobody's here. Did you... Did I get the diamond? Well, yes and no, Miss Moray. Nobody ever stole it from your apartment. What? Atwater says he took it with him when he left you the other night. But that's impossible. He didn't. I know he didn't. I even looked at it after he left. Mm, well, Miss Moray, will you meet me by the shrubbery alongside the library window of the Atwater house in exactly a half an hour? Well, all right, but what are we going to do? We're going to rob a safe, Miss Moray, with police protection. <laughs> Keep that flashlight steady, Miss Moray, please. Mm. If we're lucky, the safe won't be locked. Why not? Because nobody knows I put the diamond back in it when the police pounded on the door. And it was only slammed shut by young Atwater. Well, here it is. There, you see? It's open. And here's the box that holds the Jonathan diamond. Uh, put your flashlight on it. We'll take a quick look. All right. There. But, oh, the box is empty. Uh-oh. Atwater must have seen me put it back and grabbed it. But why is he telling the police that I have it? And see that I'm not disturbed. Uh, quick, that's Atwater now. Put out that flash and get back of these drapes. Hurry. All right. Seven. Six. Nine. What are you doing, Black? I'm counting the clicks on the dial. Seven. Three. Four. Two. Got it. Hello. This is George Atwater. I got your message, but why did you call me here after I... Well, I don't care about that. We made a deal. I don't owe you a dime anymore, and you've got what you want. Well, you have to expect it to be hot for a while. And look, remember this. I'm washed up with you and that crooked roulette wheel of yours. We're all square. And if you call me here again, I'll turn you over to the police. Yes, yes. If I hear of anybody who wants to buy it, I'll let you know. You'll what? Don't be foolish. Who'd believe that? Goodbye. I think I understand everything now, Miss Moray, but I've got to find the man Atwater just called. But how can you? He didn't mention any names. No, but I counted the clicks as he was dialing that number. If my ears haven't let me down, I can call that number, too. Anyhow, I'm going to try. You think that man has a Jonathan Diamond? Yes, I think so. But you don't have to worry about it from now on. You won't be blamed because it was missing from your apartment. But you're in a mess now, aren't you? Well, yes, kind of. You see, I promised Faraday that he'd have his diamond back in two hours, and I can't keep that promise. Well, I hope the OPA hasn't put a ceiling on tempers, because if they have, he'll hit it. <laughs> Police headquarters. Inspector Faraday, please. Just a minute. Faraday speaking. This is Blackie, Faraday. Your time's up, Blackie. Have you got the Jonathan Diamond? Well, no, Inspector, I haven't. You're stalling. Now, Blackie, you've crossed me for the last time. I'm going to have a dragnet out that'll have you down here before you know it, and you're going to stay in jail this time. Yeah, but, Inspector, listen, I... He wouldn't listen, Shorty. I've got to work extra fast now. Gee, Blackie, look, if there's anything Hold I it, can... Shorty. I'm going to try that number Atwater called. Hello, um, Atwater told me to call you. Yeah? Who's this? I've got cash I'd like to trade in for something you've got. Atwater says that... Atwater the... says, huh? Okay. I'm in an old house, 632 West 100th Street. First door on the right as you come in. Get here fast and we'll talk business. Okay. Bye. Worked, eh, Blackie? I don't know. It was a little too easy. Come on, Shorty. We're going up there to get Faraday as diamond. Unless his dragnet gets me first. Blackie, duck down. Duck down this hallway. Okay, what is it, Shorty? Prowl car, just oh. coming this way. I never saw so many cops as we pass on the way up here. Never mind, Shorty. Stay flattened out against this door until it's time for what I told you to do. Yeah, okay, Blackie. But, uh, 
Who really stole the Jonathan diamond? Nobody stole it, Shorty. Atwater left the stone at Lee Moray's apartment and then returned later that night and lifted it so that Miss Moray could report it stolen to the police. Ixnay, Ixnay, boss. Coppers. Okay, now. Uh, look, boss, why did Atwater want the day to report it? So he wouldn't be involved. This guy I called up, the one who lives in this building, has something on Atwater and wanted the diamond as his price for clamming up. Atwater had to get it for him, see? Oh, yeah, I get it. He stashed it in his own safe until he could reach this guy and turn it over to him. Only you opened the safe before he could do it. And he had to figure out a new story, huh, boss? Sure. All he had to tell the cops then is that he was afraid that Jonathan wouldn't be safe at the girl's apartment and that he went back in to get it. Oh. Huh. I thought it was pretty cute when I put the diamond back in the safe. But Atwater must have seen me. Well, wish me luck, Shorty. And don't forget what I told you to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, boss. Uh, quick. Come on, it's okay now. So long. Yeah, who is it? I called you a little while ago. Okay. Open up. Okay. Well, Duke Walton. <laughs> Put that gun down, Duke. You and I can make a deal. Think so? Sure. Lucky you're not as cute as you thought. I called that water back and found your call was a phony. Too bad for you. Now I gotta bump you. Wait a minute, Duke. I'm gonna wait a couple of minutes, Blackie. Some friends of mine are coming over with a car to take you on a little trip. <laughs> now sit down in that chair and put your arms behind your back. Go on, I ain't the patient type. Okay, Duke. How's that? That's yeah, better. Now I'm gonna tie you up nice and pretty like that. How do you like it? Too tight for your pretty hands to be tied? Well, yes, if you really want to know. I don't. I'll give it an extra yank just to make sure. Hey, Duke. Huh? Duke, look under the door. Huh? That's smoke. Where? Hey, that's right. Well, that makes things easier. This joint's a fire trap. I'll scram out of here and leave you tied up, Blackie. <laughs> lucky, I guess I was just born under a lucky star. Eh? Maybe. But don't forget, Duke, sometimes stars have a habit of falling. Yeah, okay, so I'm ducking right out of here. Fire! Fire! The whole building on fire! Come on, get out of here! That does it. So long, Blackie. Me and the Jonathan Diamond are getting out of here, and both of us are nice and safe, which is more than I can say for you, pal. Now, wait a minute, Duke. I've got a proposition. Sure, but I got a date. No use trying to bust him ropes, boy. Maybe the fire will bring him through for you, huh? <laughs> hey, you did it. How'd you get out of them ropes? Never mind, ain't gonna do you any good. Oh, yes, it is, Duke. This place is on fire. Go on, try and get out. I don't have to try. I'm getting. Take a look at the door, Duke. It's locked. Sure, it's locked, and I'm gonna open it right now. Hey, hey where'd the key go to? I've got it, Duke, right here. I locked the door and removed the key when I had my back huh? to the door after you got the drop on me. Come on, give it to me, give it to me. We'll both be burned to death. Sure, Duke, here it is. Catch. Hey, hey, don't, don't throw it like... Hey, where'd it go? I gotta get it. Sure, you're gonna get it, but good. Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> you missed me, sucker. I'll, I'll sucker you out. Get you for this bloody if it's a... Take a million... Oh, oh, hey, hey, you're breaking my wrist. Drop that gun. Okay. Now, where's the diamond? Never mind the diamond, Blackie. The fire will both be trapped. Well, there's no fire, sucker. Huh? My pal Shorty burned some papers in the hall and pounded on the door. But you... Now, give her that diamond. You must have it on you. When you thought there was a fire, you'd have never left without it. I ain't got it, Blackie. When I found your phone call was a phony, I'd give it to a guy to hold for You're me. lying, Duke. I'm going to search you. Now, turn around with your back to me and keep your hands in the air. Yeah, okay, but I tell you, I ain't got it on me. Well, we'll see. It's not here. Not here. It's not here. Yeah. It's me, boss. Everything all right? Okay, Shorty, I'll let you in. Well, I pick up the key. Now, don't move, you. Well, it worked, huh, boss? Yeah, it worked, but... Do you recognize this guy, Shorty? Sure, sure. That's Duke Walton, the guy I was telling you about. It was bragged he'd have the Jonathan Diamond. Well, he hasn't got it. I've searched him. He's clean, Shorty. Ah, uh, he's holding out the dirty heel. Yes, the dirty... Heel. Heel, huh? <laughs> you know, Shorty, I think I've got something there. It's the one place I didn't look. Take off your shoes, Duke. Come on, take them off. Yeah. yeah, you win, Blackie. The ice is in my right shoe. There's a slide in the heel. The diamond's inside. Now, that's being very sensible, Duke. Yeah. I'll just take the diamond out of that slot it's in and at the same time pull myself and Inspector Faraday out of a great big hole. Well, it's... It's bargain day, Faraday. You've got your diamond, and I've got Miss Moray. Right, honey? Well, for a while, Blackie. Then I've got to go back home to Wisconsin. Oh, well, can we go now, Inspector? Okay, Blackie. Go ahead, beat it. You're in the clear. Only remember this. You make one slip, Blackie, and as sure as my name is Faraday, I'll be on your neck. You'll be on my neck, mm. huh? 
Okay, Inspector, but before Miss Moray leaves for Wisconsin, I... I hope I'll have her there for a little while first. Oh, say, uh, one more thing about Rinso. That same Rinso that's such a big help on wash day. I'd just like to add that it's also a mighty big help three times every day at dishwashing time. Even your greasiest roaster is a cinch to wash in those rich Rinso suds. And, of course, Rinso's grand for all the soap and water jobs around the house. Walls, floors, woodwork, windows, tiles. They all come sparkling bright and clean with Rinso on the job. So get Rinso tomorrow for dishwashing, for housework, and for a wash that's... Now, a glimpse at next week's adventure of Boston Blackie. I won't do it, I tell you. I, I can't do it. Mr. Manletter, it's the only way your business can be saved. I don't care about that. If the only way it can be saved is by risking the life of my friend Boston Blackie. Well, I'd rather it were lost. I won't ask Blackie to keep that appointment. I don't even want to know about it. All right, Mr. Manletter, if that's the way you want it. I'm going out and try to raise the money. You'll hear from me later, and remember, I don't want Blackie to hear about this. Hello, Mary. Get me Boston Blackie. Be sure to listen at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris with Richard Lane as Inspector Faraday. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Original music for this program by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for the makers of Rinso and wishing you all a very pleasant good night. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petrie family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. It began on a, on a, on a summer evening in 1906. I'd been for a long walk in the park. I remember when I returned to Baker Street and entered our rooms. Holmes looked up at me with a twinkle and, uh, and spoke. You look positively glowing with health, Watson. Well, I had a splendid walk, my dear fellow. You should have come with me. The park was looking particularly beautiful. The well, chap, during our absence, I've decided to write another monograph. Oh, well, what's the subject this time? Occupational liability to murder. For instance... The mortality rate is naturally high among policemen and detectives. Physicians are murdered with fair regularity, but the murder of a dentist is rare. And who ever heard of a murdered veterinary surgeon? It's quite true, but what's the occasion for this little homily? I've been browsing over my newspaper clippings. Yeah? You recall ever hearing of a murdered tobacconist, Watson? No, no, I can't say that I do. Oh, I. And yet my clippings inform me that no less than three tobacconists have been murdered in the past six months, and all the murders have occurred... In the same small shop at the East End of London. <laughs> now, why do you suppose three tobacconists would be murdered in the same shop? Come now, old fellow. Give me a logical solution to the problem, will you? Well, uh, let me see. You say that the shop's in the in the East End? Yes. Is it near the river? As it happens, it's on the water's edge. Then supposing the tobacconist's shop was the headquarters of a smuggling ring. Perhaps boxes of cigars were unloaded from the dock and mm -hmm. brought to the shop. Cigars? Containing pearls or opium or something. Watson, my dear fellow, you're doing splendidly. Oh, you must walk in the park more frequently. You're positively scintillating. Oh, no, no you're, you're making fun of me. I assure you I'm not. You're expecting anyone home? No, no, probably a visitor from Mrs. Hudson. Go on with your fascinating theory. Now, why are three tobacconists murdered? Well, because they they know too much. Perhaps they demand a share and the profits, so the head of the ring decides to kill them. Plausible enough, Watson. I fully really must congratulate you. Oh, I can see that I'm very lucky in having a biographer with such a lively oh, imagination. Thanks very much. Come in. That's very nice for you. Imagination. Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Don, I'm glad to see you. Uh, I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, my dear fellow. 
Come along, sit down. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Anything uh, remarkable on hand? No, no, Mr. Holmes. Nothing very uh, particular. Ah. Then tell me all about it, Mr. Stroud. <laughs> Can't hide anything from you, can I, sir? Yes, there is something on my mind and no mistake. And it concerns the three murdered tobacconists, I see. Splendid. Now, how the blazes did you know that? Yes, Holmes, that's pure magic. Not at all, my dear Watson. It's simple deduction. deduction. Observe the five Why? cigars peering out of Lestrade's breast mm-hmm. pocket. They are of a far superior quality to his usual brand. Obviously, the scene of his latest investigation has profited certain, well, should we say, uh, professional perquisites. Am I right, Lestrade? Well, of course you are. Careful one, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Lord. I'll stick to my pipe. Well, how about you, Doctor? Oh, thank you, Lestrade. Thank oh, you. Coronas. And now, Inspector, tell me about the murdered tobacconists. Well... How much do you know about the case? Oh, just what I've read in the papers. Well, curiously enough, we were discussing the affair as you walked in, Lestrade. Eh, it's a strange business, gentlemen. I only got hold of the old story today when I had a long talk to young Jack Longworth. Now, he's the owner of the show. Oh, in relation to what, Gerald Longworth, the taller member of Parliament who battled so successfully against the slum clearance bill? His son, Mr. Holmes. Oh, what's a nice young fellow, too. Uh, when his father died, he inherited this shop along with a lot of other property in the East End. Well, uh, how big a shop is it, Mr. Oh, just old in the wall, Doctor. Like all the other shops in that part of London. Young Mr. Longworth tells me he first rents it to a man by the name of George Grillet. He lives there with his daughter, Lily, and made it quite a nice go out of the shop. Six months ago, when Jack Longworth was abroad, George Grillet has a stroke and nearly kicks the bucket. Kicks the, uh, kicks the bucket? He nearly dies, Doctor. Oh, Picks a bucket. <laughs> I don't remember that. And then what happened to Stroud? <laughs> well, while he's in the hospital, his daughter gives up the lease on the shop. A few days later, an Italian takes it over, and a couple of weeks later, he's found with his throat cut. Did you investigate that first murder yourself? No, Mr. Holmes. It seemed like any of a dozen killings we get in that part of London. A shopkeeper cut up, his till emptied, no clues. Well, who was the next tenant? A Scotchman. bloke by the name of Mackintosh. A few weeks after he moved in, the same thing happened to him. That time, I did go down there. But I couldn't find out nothing. Was robbery again the apparent motive? Yes, sir. But the killing wasn't the same. He was strangled with a silk scarf. Silk scarf, eh? And who was the third tenant? The man who was murdered yesterday? A Hindu fellow. A man by the name of Mukherjee. He takes it over a week last Friday, and yesterday we find him knife through the back and his money gone. Of course, I was down there eh, before you could say Crystal Palace. But once again, I didn't find out nothing. No knife, no fingerprints on the till, no footprints. Just a very dead Hindu. Was young Mr. Longworth a landlord in England when these murders occurred? Yeah, that's the funny thing about it, Mr. Holmes. He docked at Tilbury yesterday morning. He didn't know nothing about what had been going on. Well, I imagine he'd have difficulty in renting the shop after three murders. Well, that's just it, Doctor. That's why he comes to me at the yard. George Grillet, his first tenant of the shop, moved back there today with his daughter, Lily. And young Mr. Longworth's worried about them. <laughs> well, if you ask me, he's more worried about the daughter than he is about old man Grillet. So the original tenants of the shop are back in residence again, eh? And, um, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, I thought perhaps you'd be interested enough to come along with me and look at the shop, Mr. Evans. I should be very glad to, my dear fellow. Get your coat and hat, Watson. Oh, that's your... Oh, dear, that wretched instrument. I'll answer it. Hello? Mike Grant, how are you? What? Yes. Yes, he... He's here now. Why, of course. I'll do everything I can, certainly. Let's have dinner together soon, shall we? Splendid idea. All right, goodbye. Well, is that your brother home? Yes. Mr. Stroud, I do think you might have told me the whole truth. Well, how do you mean, sir? I thought your visit was prompted by a... Need for friendly assistance. I didn't realize that you came here virtually on a government order. Well, it wasn't just quite like that, Mr. Owen. What's the government got to do with the case? And how does your brother Mycroft fit into the picture? Not eh? sure yet. But of one thing we may be certain, there's obviously a great deal more in this case than Lestrade would have us believe. Why do you say that, Holmes? You must bear in mind, old fellow, that occasionally Mycroft is the British government. <laughs> part of London take a walk in on a foggy night, ain't it, gentlemen? <laughs> All our policemen work down here in pairs, you know. Yes, I don't blame them. 
It's a vile neighborhood. Uh, there's the shop just ahead of us, with a sign hanging out. Hello, hello, there he is again. Oh. See that bearded Hindu skulking off around the corner there? Oh, yes. He's been haunting the place ever since I came down here. Hmm. So a bearded Hindu haunts the place, eh? Yes, and yesterday, home, the Hindu proprietor of the shop was murdered. Exactly. Well, here we are. I'll go in first. Pressing look in place, huh? I'll be out in Jiffy. That's Lily, George Grillet's daughter. Helps him with the shop. Sorry to keep you wet. Oh. Oh, it's you, Inspector Lestrade. Yes, Miss Lee. Uh, I brought some gentlemen to see your father. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. How do you do, Miss Grillet? Uh, how do you do, young lady? Is your dad home? No, Inspector. He won't be in till after dinner. Went down at the docks, he did, to see about some cigar shipments. Mr. Longworth's here. If you want to see him, we were just having some tea in the back room. Yes, uh, I'd like these gentlemen to meet him. Jack, come out in the shop, Jack. What is it, Lily? Oh, Inspector Lestrade. And this must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I'm sure. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Longworth? I'm very glad the inspector was able to persuade you to come down here, Mr. Holmes. I'm dreadfully worried about this business, particularly since Lily's father insisted on coming back here. I'm afraid they're in great danger, but I can't make Mr. Grillet see it. Young lady, I wonder if I might ask you a few questions. Well, of course, Mr. Holmes. Before your father had his stroke, did he receive any threats concerning his occupancy of the shop? Well, if he did, he never told me about him. But it wouldn't surprise me. I often told him his biggest enemy is himself, if you know what I mean. Yes, I think I do, Miss Grillet. When your father had his illness, who decided to give up the lease on the shop? I did. No money was coming in, and, well, it looked like Dad might be an invalid for life. Mm. Of course, I couldn't run the shop by myself. Anyhow, I never did like this part of London. It wasn't the right business for Father. Uh, what was his reaction when you told him... Uh... You've given up the lease. Oh, he was awful angry with me. Said I'd no right to do it without asking him. Uh, by the way, yeah, we saw that bearded Hindu again as we walked up just now. He's been hanging around ever since we came back here, Inspector. Well, has he actually come into the shop, Miss Grillet? No, but he keeps walking by and looking in the window. I'm sure if we both went into the back room or left the shop for a little while, well, he'd come right in. Then I suggest we give him the opportunity he's seeking. Miss Grillet, I wonder if you and Mr. Longworth would mind leaving the shop for a while. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. Make your departure rather ostentatious, shall we say, so that he can't help noticing it. Give us half an hour or so and then come back. Perhaps you wouldn't mind going with him, Mr. Rudd. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, this is my case. I know, I know, but um, in a situation like this, Watson and I work much better alone. We may have to go a little outside the law, and your presence might embarrass us. <laughs> You'd never think I was a detective, too, would you? Very well, we'll be Mr. back in half an hour. <laughs> poor, poor old Lestrade. He gets very touchy as the years roll by. Yeah, I blame him. I'm leaving him completely in the dark. Come on, Watson. Behind the counter. No, 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 my oh. dear fellow. Not under it. Not under it, old chap. We lift the flap. So, ah, now I suggest we crouch down behind here. Come on, that's it. Have you got your revolver, Watson? Yes, it's in my pocket. Good. In the meantime, make yourself as comfortable as these cramped quarters will permit. We may have uh, quite a wait ahead of us. I got you covered with this revolver. Now, my man, what are you doing here? Who? Who are you? Never mind who I am. Just answer my question. I do not speak very good English. Do you understand about Bolin sector? Ah, sector high. Because you are in the air. Let me go ask you. You are my home. Who come here? You are my home. You are my home. You are my home. Salam. No, no, no. You don't, my man. Just you stay where you are. It's all right, Watson. Let him go. He's on our side. I wish you'd tell me what in thunder's going on, who that man was, and why you let him go. He's an investigator from the foreign office, old chap. Given his instructions by my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? Yes, old fellow. My brother, 
fails to tell me all the facts concerning this case, I begin to think these triple murders have far greater ramifications than we ever dreamed of. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. Just about time enough for me to mention that any meal becomes a better meal when you serve it with Petri wine. And say, you'll find that Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne are just made to go with food. That Petri Burgundy is a rich red wine that's bosom pals with any meat or meat dish. Boy, what a flavor. And that Petri Sauterne is the delicate white wine that's just perfect with chicken or with fish. Yes, sir, with food, you just can't beat a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. A puzzling case is occupying the attentions of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Three murders have taken place in a small tobacconist shop in the east end of London. As we rejoin our story, it's late at night, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, accompanied by Inspector Lestrade, are once again walking toward the ill-fated shop. Well, I don't see that you've accomplished much, Mr. Holmes, except that you just bought me a nice dinner. Oh, I'm making progress, Lestrade. It's only by the elimination of obvious suspects. But there's a pattern to this case, and that should give us a clue. Well, how do you mean, Holmes? My dear fellow, consider the obvious motive of these murders, and particularly observe the results they've obtained. Well, the motive was the same in all three killings. Robbery. Oh, no, Lestrade. Not only for theft of a few pounds from the till. Blind you to the real motive. Look, 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 look. Here's Miss Credit now, coming out of the shop. Good evening, Miss Credit. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Is your father home yet? Yes, he is, Mr. Holmes. Well, I can't tell you how anxious I am for you to talk to him. I'm going to meet Mr. Longwear. He's taken me to the music hall. I should be home just after ten. I hope you'll be able to stay with Dad until then. Well, don't you worry, Miss Grit. We'll keep an eye on him. Oh, thanks ever so much. Oh, um... Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Miss Grit? Please don't go into our rooms in the back, will you? I've left things in a frightful mess. I quite understand, Miss Grit. Well, ta-ta all. See you later. Let's go into the shop. Who oh, is it? Oh, oh, it's you, Inspector. Here, these gentlemen, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do, sir? Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Did you meet young Lily just now? Yes, she uh, told us she was going out to the music hall with Mr. Longworth. Yes. I'm afraid we had quite a set to about that. A uh, very strong-willed girl, Lily, very strong-willed. I'd to assume that uh, you disapprove of your daughter's association with Mr. Longworth? Oh, yes, of course I do. He's a top. He's got lots of money. Lily's so blind she can't see that he's up to no good. Hmm. I'm pretty sure he's afraid I might find out what's really at the back of these here murders. And what is your theory, sir? Well, I'll tell you this in confidence. Got nothing to back it up now, you understand. There's been talk of widening the docks around here. That'd make property values go up, you see, of course. Well, young Longworth's been trying to buy up all the other shops along the waterfront here, but they wouldn't sell. If you ask me, he's had these murders done just to frighten people away so that they, he could buy cheap. Now, I'm not saying that he did the murders himself, you understand, but he planned them. Why, in these parts, it's easy enough any night to get a throat cut for a couple of quid. Yeah. That's why I'm glad you're here, gents. You see, I... Uh, I just got another warning. Warning? What do you mean, it's a warning? Found this note slipped under that door there not three quarters of an hour ago. Let me see, please. Huh. What does it say, Holmes? I shall call on you at 8.30 tonight. You know what's good for you. You'll be waiting for me alone. If you try any funny tricks, you'll go where I sent the rest of them. Well, that's obviously from the killer. Possibly. What's the time now? Mm, look, it's, uh, very past eight. I uh, was hoping you gentlemen would wait in our rooms back of the shop. You can hear what's going on in here, and if he tries any rough stuff, you can pop in and nab him. Just what I was about to suggest myself, Mr. Grillis. Either way, will you? Oh, yes. Just step behind the counter, gents. Now, through here. Ah, here we are. Ain't exactly Buckingham Palace back here, but you can make yourselves comfortable, can't you, gents? Oh, don't you worry about us, Grillis. Oh, I better turn up the gas. If this bloke spots a light under the door in here, he might smell a rat. Uh, now, as soon as I see him coming in the shop, I'll knock twice on the door. Like this. 
That'll give you the signal that he's here. Is that right? Right, you are, Grit. All right, now keep your ears open, gents. I may need your help. Where are you, Holmes? I can't see a thing. Over here, Watson. You know, I've, I've got another theory why Jack Longworth might be at the back of all this. You listening, Holmes? I'm listening, Lord Fellow. What is your theory? Longworth knows that Grillet doesn't approve of his having anything to do with Lily. So when he goes abroad, he leaves instructions to murder the tobacconist. The assassins don't know about Grillet having a stroke, of course, so they keep murdering the, uh, the wrong fellow. Well, that makes very good sense, Doctor. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Holmes. Holmes. Where are you? That's my silly. He's disappeared. No, I haven't. I was just exploring. Shh. That's the signal. There goes the front door. Somebody's come in. We'd better go in. We've got to get in there at once. Open the door. Well, it's locked. Never mind that. Get your soldiers into it. Come on, come on, help me. Come on, one more. Poor devil. He's been slashed with a knife. Brillet. Brillet. What, the killer got away? I'm going to... No, no, Lestrade can save your energy. Your murderer lies there. But that's Grillet. Of course it is. Search his pockets, Watson. I think you'll find a bloodstained knife. Uh, Let's have a look. Uh, good Lord. He has a razor in his pocket. It's covered with blood. You mean to say that he slashed himself? Let's oh, step the handcuffs on him, Lestrade. While he's still play-acting, he may be more difficult to handle when he realizes the game's up. Take your hands off quick, of me. Come on, quick. Come on, quick. Uh, come on yes. Hey. Come on. Oh, yeah. Very neat, Lestrade. Yeah. Well, now that I've knocked a wounded man out cold, perhaps you'll tell me what's going on, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I'm completely in the dark, too. Oh, it's very simple, really. Willett has just staged a fake attack on himself. Who us into believing that someone else is the murderer? Yeah, but the threatening note he received... Composed by himself for the occasion. Yes, yeah, but we heard voices. We heard the shop door open. We heard Grillet talking to himself. As for the shop door... That's how he gave himself away. Well, how do you mean, Mr. Holmes? Whenever the shop door opens, there's a bell that jangles. You will notice, uh... So. Yeah, that's right, there is. There's no bell jangle when we were in the back room. But it got us in there, locked the door on us unobtrusively, and staged his little drama. Yes, but we heard the door creak open and close, Mr. Holmes. The creak of this flap in the counter would sound exactly the same, my dear fellow. Now listen. Yes, but why, Holmes? How did you spot that Grillet was a man? It was obvious from the beginning that since nothing had changed about the shop except the ownership, that the attackers were directed against any tobacconist who was not Grillet himself. Of course, his daughter, Lily, obviously knew what was going on. Well, I don't see how you figure that one out, Mr. Holmes. Every remark that she made showed that although she loved her father, she knew his failings. In any case, she gave me the final clue. Well, what clue was that? In very pointedly asking me not to go into the back room of the shop. Of course, she meant the reverse of what she said. I followed her advice when you were explaining our theory to Miss Card. Well, what did you find, Mr. Holmes? Miss Grillet had obligingly left a secret door open, a door leading to a passageway that seemed uh, to go down to the waterfront. We'll examine it more thoroughly in a minute. Yes, but I still don't understand Grillet's motive, Holmes. Neither do I, old chap. No, I suspect that from uh, the interest of the foreign office in the case, this shop has been the headquarters of, a, of an espionage ring. I'm afraid the final answer to that question will have to be given by someone else. Oh, who, Holmes? By my uh, elder brother, Mycroft. Humiliating, isn't it, Watson? And what was the final answer to the question, Dr. Watson? Well, Holmes is right as usual, Mr. Foreman. The shop had been the headquarters of a spy ring operated by Grillet. And many international criminals had been smuggled in England or foreign ships moored up the river. And did Mr. Grillet hang for his crime? No, 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 he didn't, my boy. Before that he came to trial, he, he had another stroke and he died. Probably just as well for his daughter's sake. Oh, his daughter. <laughs> a lovely girl. Did she marry Longworth? <laughs> Indeed she did. As a matter of fact, I, I danced at her wedding. It was a very wonderful wedding reception. <laughs> See, you would have been there yourself, Mr. Foreman. In fact, you'd have liked it very much. They, they served a 
pretty good wine. <laughs> was it a Petri wine by any chance? Hmm? Oh, well, it was so good it easy it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> you mean because Petri wine is the kind of a wine you can't forget. That's exactly what I do well, mean. Well, that's because the Petri that's family the really knows here. all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. You see, the Petri family's been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And they've been able to hand on down in the family from father to son, from father to son, every bit of their skill and experience. That's why Petri wine is so good today. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take a moment yourself and send for your free recipe calendar. Remember, send to Petri wine. Petri wine, San Francisco 26, San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Doctor, do you feel like giving us a hint about next week's story? Yes, I do. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that happened to Holmes and me in the West End of London. It concerns the death of a famous actor who was portraying the part of an equally famous man, Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Doctor. See you next week. And say, from the news we've had so far today... Maybe by next week at this time, we'll hear some really good news from Europe. I certainly hope so, Mr. Foreman. But let us remember, the war won't be over when Germany quits. We've still got to lick Japan. That's going to take a long time. So instead of celebrating when VE Day comes along, let's just strengthen our resolve to support the war more than ever here at home. Keep that war job. Don't leave it till you're released. Keep on buying more and more and more war bonds and, and keep them. Don't turn them in. Help all you can with all home front activities and observe all our wartime regulations such as price ceiling. That's the real way to celebrate a victory in Europe, by working harder to end the war in the Pacific. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleons. Mr. Rathbone appears with the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce with the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting Company presents I, Deal in Crime, starring William Gargan as Ross Dolan. This is Ross Dolan speaking about a woman named Abigail Murray. And if you can draw a picture from the name Abigail, your mental photography is probably correct. She's tall, skinny, with a prim mouth and a primmer figure. She and Forty became acquainted quite some time back, and she dresses in solid black. I met Abigail Murray in quite the conventional manner. Uh, how do you do? All right, young man, if you're ready to take your feet off your desk and sit up like a gentleman, I'm ready to discuss a business matter with you. Oh, I'm so sorry, madam. Uh, I was so interested in your entrance that I forgot my manners. Hmm, well, I can see that. you mind if I sit down? No, no, not at all. Uh, please do. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. You are Mr. Dolan? Yep. I'm Abigail Murray. I live in Norwalk, and I'm here in the city on a visit. I see. Also, I happen to be a school teacher. I thought so, uh, Miss Murray. Please, call me Miss Abigail. I'm used to that. Been used to it for 30 years. Okay, Miss Abigail it is. Now, I want to employ you, Mr. Dolan. You are to be my escort. Are you willing to be that? Well, <laughs> that depends. Now, we're not going out to nightclubs and places of that nature. If that's what bothers you, I'm not the type. No, 
No, I'm afraid you're not. Uh... I merely want you to drive me across the city this evening. I'm visiting an old pupil of mine, and I dislike driving in the dark. Uh, that's all, huh? Just uh, drive you around tonight? Certainly. Miss Abigail, uh, there must be more than that. If, if you just wanted to go across town, you could have taken a taxi cab or the uh, streetcar. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. All on account of the letter. Letter? Of course, the letter. The one I have in my purse. Oh, oh Miss Abigail, you didn't tell me about the letter. Well, naturally not. I haven't come to it yet. Well, this letter, uh, what does it say? It merely says that I'm going to be murdered tonight. I took a long look at Abigail Murray, and believe me, she wasn't kidding. Also, in her prim New England manner, she wasn't particularly worried about the threatening letter either. She handed it to me, and uh, I read it. Abigail Murray, you should have stayed in Norwalk. Now it's too late, because tonight you are going to die. How did you get this letter, Miss Abigail? It came to the hotel where I'm residing, by special delivery. But uh, uh, who could have sent this letter? Uh, do you have any enemies? Well, I've been a school teacher for 25 years. What do you think? Well, I, I think the police station is a good spot for you. Come on. Mr. Dolan, I wish you would dispel the notion that you can order me around like a simpleton. I've never gone to the police, and I'm not going to go now. But, Miss Abigail, Now, do you I... wish to escort me across town tonight, or shall I find someone else? Okay, you win. I'll be your escort. Fine. I'm staying at the plaza. Pick me up at seven. Oh, no. If you want me to guard you, I'm starting in right now. But I'm going to the beauty parlor. <laughs> Having my hair waved. Well, I'll be glad to come along uh, to make sure the curl isn't too permanent. <laughs> Abigail Murray picked up her bag, stuffed a threatening letter in it, and left my office with me right behind she really did have a date with a hairdresser, and uh, I spent an interesting three hours in the outer room uh, playing handies with a manicurist. Then we had dinner. I had a steak fried while Miss Abigail stayed in New England and had hers boiled. At eight that evening, we were driving along in her car. You know, Mr. Dolan, this is the first time I've driven my car in the city at night. I know, I can... Hey, look out! <laughs> hey! Didn't you see that truck? Of course I saw it, but I had the right of way. Oh, fine. After all, it was his duty to get out of my way. Uh -huh. They always get out of my way in Norwalk. Yeah, yeah, I don't blame them. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, just where are we going? To visit an old pupil of mine at 327 Kendall. His name is Richard Way. He's been seriously ill. When he heard I was going to visit the city, he invited me to come and see him. Would uh, he be the person who sent you that letter? Richard? Oh, hardly. He has the general courage of a field mouse. Hmm. Well, we'll turn here and take a shortcut to the park. I enjoy parks at night. I would never have believed it. Oh, uh, Miss Abigail, uh, slow down a little. Hmm, why? Slow down, that's all. Well, but why? There's a car in back of us. You think there's something wrong? Uh, motion him to go around it. He's been trailing us the last few blocks. Very well. <laughs> The guy had fired three shots at us. Abigail let go of the steering wheel, and our car made a sharp right turn into a convenient tree. By the time I untangled myself and got out, the would-be killer had disappeared in a cloud of blue smoke. Those shots. They came right through the back window. He was shooting at us. Uh, not us, Miss Abigail. He was shooting at you. Now, let me see if the car is all right, and then you and I are going to the police. We should have done that in the first place. I want to visit Richard Way. Later. Now, let's see. Banged up the front of the car. Is everything all right, Mr. Dolan? Yeah, yeah. You didn't do any damage. Just uh, dented one fender of the... Uh-oh. Now, what's wrong? The tire, it's flat. Is the repair in back? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, hand me the keys, will you? Uh, we'll have to change that tire before we go any further. Here they are. Now, you just take it easy, and I'll have this beauty switched in a hurry. Perhaps I could help, Mr. Dolan. Okay, come along. Now, we'll just take this wrench, find the jack, and get back, Miss Abigail. Why? What's wrong, Mr. Dolan? What's that bundle in there? That's no bundle. That's the body of a man. A man? Well, tell him to come out immediately. I don't believe it would do any good. He's dead. The dead man was tucked into the back of the car like a sack of potatoes. 
We got a flashlight out of the glove compartment of Abigail Murray's car and looked him over. He'd been shot once. I could see that right away. Then Miss Abigail gave out with a startled exclamation. Mr. Dolan, that's Richard. Richard? Richard Way, the man I was going to visit this evening. We've got to get to a telephone right away, Miss Abigail. The police will have to be notified. They'll ask a lot of questions. Oh, murder always brings out the bump of curiosity on a policeman's head. Oh, of course, he could have committed suicide. Oh, sure, sure. This would look like suicide to anyone. The man shoots himself through the heart, then he climbs into the back of your car, pulls down the door, and locks it from the outside. Try again, Miss Abigail. I've got it. That's how I was going to be murdered. You mean they mistook Richard Way for you? No, no, no. Don't you see? The person who wrote me that letter killed Richard Way. They put his body in my car. They knew it'd be found back there. I'd be accused of murder. I don't know. That sounds like a long way around to arrange a murder frame. Well, let's lock this back and get out of here. We're quite a ways into the park, Mr. Dolan. You think it's safe to walk? It is, if we walk where there isn't a road. I don't think our friend would leave his car. Uh-oh. A car. He's come back. Out of sight, quick. Is it the same man? I don't know. I can't see good enough. Oh, come on, Miss Abigail. We've got nothing to worry about now. But the man in that car, he'll see us. I want him to see us. That car happens to be a prowl car. All right, you two. What are you doing back there? Is this your car? That happens to be my car, officer. Oh, it happens to be your car, eh? Don't you know it's against the law to park off this road? Uh, we had a flat tire, officer. Flat tire, eh? And you were looking for your spare back there, huh? In the bushes. Officer, uh, I'm Ross Dolan, the private investigator. So what? Somebody fired a gun at us while we were driving through here. You can see the bullet holes in the back window. Go on. I got out and opened the back to get at the spare tire. There's a dead man in there. So you looked inside and found it. Did you say dead man? Yeah. I'll oh, never look in the back of your car. Come on, both of you. But, Mr. Officer... Come on, I said. Now unlock that turtle bag. Okay. You didn't touch him, take anything out of his pocket. Naturally not. Do I look like the sort of person who would touch a dead man? You look like the sort of person who's coming down to headquarters and have a little chat. Headquarters? Why, this is disgraceful. Miss Abigail, if you only let me... One expect... might think that Mr. Dolan and I were murderers. Yeah, one might think you were. Carter was one of those coldly efficient cops. He had me drive his police car to headquarters while Abigail Murray fumed, fussed, sputtered and threatened. But it was like knocking down stone fences with a handful of sponges because Carter just sat back with no further comment. When we got to HQ, he herded us into a room for questioning. I shall certainly telegraph the mayor of Norwalk. I've never before been treated in such degrading fashion. Now, don't take it so hard, Miss Abby. All we've got to do is prove that we didn't kill Richard Way and then let us go. But why do we have to prove it? I always thought a person, uh, well, was presumed innocent. Until they were proved guilty. And so far, no one has proved anything. I know, I know. And that officer, that Carter person. Did I hear somebody mention my name? You certainly did. And it was I. I thought so. Now then, I want to ask you both some questions. After that, we'll decide what's to be done. You, Dolan, I looked over your identification. Yeah? What's your story? Well, uh, Miss Murray employed me to drive her across town. I took the job. We were driving through the park. Somebody took a shot at us and blew out a tire. And that's when we found Richard. I mean the body. Miss Murray, I was talking to Mr. Dolan. When I finish with him, there are some matters you and I shall discuss. I was just trying to help. You'll get your chance. Oh. Now, uh, you found the body, eh? Yeah, when I opened the turtle back on the car to get at the spare tire. Then what? Then I started looking around for a cop. In the bushes, off the road. What kind of a cop were you looking for? All right, Carter, you're having your little fun, but you forget. Some guy with a gun had just fired three shots at us. Did you expect me to parade around like a big, fat target? Go on. Well, when we heard your car approaching, we ducked. When I saw the PD label on the door, we came out, period. Okay. Now, Miss Murray, you employed Dolan because you were afraid you'd received a threatening letter. I substantiated that statement with proof, Mr. Carter. I gave you the letter I received. So you did, and that's why I'm asking all these questions. You see, the dead man, Richard Way, had some notes in his own handwriting in his pockets. Is there something unusual about that? There is in this case, Miss Murray. Comparing the handwriting on the notes with the letter you received, we came to the conclusion that they were both the same. What? The man who threatened you by mail was the man you found dead in your car. (laughs) 
There was a lot of similar chit-chat which took place at police headquarters, but Carter finally let us go. He warned us not to leave town, which was a little ridiculous because I have an office here. And Miss Abigail told Carter she wouldn't miss the fun at this point for a carton of eggs. I took her back to the plaza and went home to my apartment, wondering what would happen next. An hour later, it turned out to be a blonde. I'm St. Murray. You're off Dolan. And this is pretty late at night. What's on your mind, little lady? Don't little lady me, Dolan. Where's my aunt, Abby? Abby? Oh, you mean Miss Abigail. Yes, I mean Miss Abigail. Where is she? Well, the last I saw of her, she was digging a flannel nightgown out of her telescope bag down at the Plaza Hotel. Get out of the way. I'm going to search your apartment. You're going to what? Move, I said. Now, just a second. You can't come Shut fussing up. and... Shut up. Where is she? Try my refrigerator. She's probably hiding behind an ice cube. I'm not going to waste time on you, Dolan. I came here to find my aunt. And if you don't turn her up in 30 seconds, I'll phone the police. I wish you would. And while you're calling, enter a complaint for me, too. I know all about you. You're one of those ruthless private detectives. You're one degree removed from a crook. You... You take money under tables and under false pretenses. And I'm going to turn you over my knee and spank you if you don't stop that. Now, what's this all about? You mean you don't know where Aunt Abby is? The last time I saw her, she was ready to hit the sheets for a full complement of slumber. What gave you the idea she was here? But I called her at the hotel. She didn't answer. How'd you get up here? A man answered Auntie's room. He said that she'd come up here, that you'd forced her to come with you. Me? Force Miss Abigail to do anything she didn't want to? Why, that little old gal has a mind all of her own. But then, who was the man in her hotel room? That's what we're going to find out. He's at the plaza. Uh, I just told you that. Oh. Dolan, are you sure you took her home? I certainly am. I wonder what could have happened to her. Plaza Hotel? Miss Abigail Murray, please. One moment. Did she answer? Give her a chance, will you? Well? Well? No answer yet. I'm sorry, sir, but Miss Murray is not in her room. You wish to leave a message? Yeah, yeah. Have her call Ross Dolan when she comes in. Yes, sir. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, did you see Miss Murray a little earlier this evening with a man? A man? Uh, let me think. Oh, yes. I saw her earlier. She came in with a big, beefy character wearing a wrinkled gray suit and a brown hat. Would you know him, sir? I would. It happens to be me. Oh, no, sir. You mean it was I. It was me, and don't you forget it. She's not there, is she? No. And the clerk doesn't seem to remember her going out. Hmm. Well, in that case, Mr. Dolan, I'm sorry I bothered you. Good night. Boy, he certainly was in a hurry. I wonder. Hey, Miss Murray, Miss Murray, I want to ask you if... I never did find out what hit me, but from the size of the bump on my noggin when I woke up, I figured it was at least the Santa Fe Chief or a Constellation full speed ahead. The first thing that greeted my sight when I opened my eyes was a pair of black shoes. I let my eyes travel upwards. All right, Dolan, what did you do with her? Do with whom? Abigail Murray. She's disappeared. That's what I like about you, Carter. You always bring out the news when it's a day old. Get on your feet. I want to ask you some questions. You've just got no mercy at all. Hey, let me shake the ache out of my gray matter. Well, what happened up here? Somebody slugged you? No, 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 no. I, I just butted my head against the wall. I, I do it all the time. Now then, what happened to Abigail Murray? You know as much as I do, Carter. You know about the car disappearing? Her car? Well, you took care of that. I sent the wagon out to pick up the body. They brought in the body, and the garage man sent a truck out after the car. When he got there, it was gone. Well, you got me. This is the first I've heard about that. I called Miss Murray at her hotel. She had gone. No one had seen her leave. Now, Dolan, just what goes on around here? What's the gag? I told you, I don't know. I called her, too. Her niece was up here looking for her. Her what? Her niece, uh, Faye Murray. Niece, huh? Well, what's wrong with that? We checked on Abigail Murray at Norwalk, and she hasn't got a father, a mother, no brothers, and no sisters. So obviously, she couldn't have a niece. Mm. So what are you trying to give me? A little information on what happened after I took Abigail Murray to the Plaza Hotel. I came home, was here an hour, when her niece showed up. I'm trying to tell you Abigail Murray doesn't have a niece. So the girl just said she was her niece. Give me a description on the way downtown. I'll get out a call on her. On the way downtown? Where am I going now? I'm going to the morgue. I want you to take another look at Richard Way. It uh, couldn't wait for morning. Huh? I want you to see that body before it disappears, too. I 
I began to think about a number of things regarding Abigail Murray. Also, Faye Murray, the niece who wasn't a niece. Who was she? And why was she looking for Miss Abigail? Then we pulled up in front of the morgue, got out of the car, and went in. Did you take anything out of the dead man's pocket, Dolan? The first thing I learned as a private detective was to leave that strictly alone. Why? I just wondered. In here. Say, hey, uh, who's the guy over there? You'll find out in due time. Okay, take a look. Is this the man you found in the back of your car? Yep. Sure? You can make a positive identification? Yep. I remember where the bullet struck. Also his face. Uh-huh. Mr. Way, would you mind stepping this way, please? Uh, yes. I must be seeing double. This can't be. Well, Dolan, what do you say now? Well, this guy must be the dead man's twin brother. I've never seen such a resemblance before. That's right. This is John Way, Richard Way's twin brother, Ross Dolan. Dolan? Now, well, then, Mr. Way, uh, mind telling me again? When did you see your brother last? About 7 o'clock. He said he had an errand and left the apartment. Did he mention his appointment with Miss Murray? No, he didn't. You have no idea how your brother's body got in the back of Miss Murray's car? None whatsoever. Okay, thanks, Mr. Way. We'll call you if we need you. Thank you. Say, you want any more from me, Carter? No, just be around where I can find you. Well, I'll be home. Say, by the way, uh, have you checked the bullet holes in Miss Murray's car to see if they match with the bullet in the dead man? I'd love to, but we haven't found the car yet. Say, uh, when you do, Carter, I've got a little bet for you. Yes? I'll give you two to one, they match. I walked out of the morgue onto the street, leaving a very puzzled Carter standing there. But no more puzzled than a private eye named Dolan. The street was dark and forbidding. The lights in that district were black with age, and the buildings were dark and gloomy. I wondered how one twin felt when the other one died, because I'd read stories about the invisible threads which bound such people together. Then I felt a hand on my arm. Dolan, wait. Well, Miss Faye Murray, or uh, have you switched to another name by this time? Dolan, I've come to ask a favor, a big one. And I'm going to ask one of you. Just turn around and walk back into that morgue. There's a cop there named Carter who'd just love to meet please, you. Please, please, Dolan, listen to me. Forget all about Miss Abigail. You mean your aunt? Or uh, aren't you the niece who isn't the niece? I can't explain anything to you right now, but if you'll promise me something, I'll tell you the whole story in a few days. Well, that's so kind of you. I get shot at, hit over the head, dragged around by the police, lose sight of my client, and you want me to wait. What for? This is a matter of life and death, Dolan. I'm asking you to forget about everything that's happened. So? Because if you don't, Somebody else will die, too. Faye Murray, if she was Faye Murray, had one great trick. She could disappear like nothing I've ever seen before. By the time I opened my mouth to ask another question, she'd melted away like a bonbon on a hot rock. I went down towards the lighted corner, and ten minutes later was in a taxi cab. I retraced the same route I'd taken earlier with Miss Abigail... When the cab got to the spot where the shooting had occurred, I got out and looked around. But there was nothing to look at, so I got going again. I remembered Miss Abigail mentioning the address of Richard Way. It was 327 Kendall on the other side of the park. I got out a block away. I stood there until the blinking red taillight had disappeared around the corner. I wanted to be sure no one had followed me. Then I made my way inside the apartment building and got the apartment number off the mailbox. I didn't care to announce my presence, so I took it very easy going up the stairs. The apartment building was as quiet as a grave, and the word grave reminded me of the dead man lying down in the morgue. When I got to the door of the apartment I was looking for, I could hear voices. John Way and Faye Murray, but they were too low to make out. So I looked for another method of getting in on the no. The apartment was one of those two-bedroom and bath affairs with a separate door for the kitchen. I moved inside through the kitchen. The two voices grew in intensity as I moved towards the living room door. John, John, you promised. Of course I did, my dear. Of course I did. To get you back here. But you told me if I got rid of Dolan, you'd take care of everything. You'd let Miss Abigail go. Oh, and so I am, my dear. 
I'm going to take care of everything. You know, I could go to the police. I could tell them the whole story. In your present condition, I hardly think so. In that case, I'll scream. I'll yell as loud as I can. You will make one sound or I'll kill you right now. I took a chance and moved closer. What I saw surprised me because the girl was tied in her chair, hand and foot, while John Way held his hand over her mouth. I started inside, but he was quicker than I was. Put up your hand. One move and I shoot. Dolan, I told you. You, come here. Sure. So, you just couldn't take Faye's advice. You had to come around here snooping. Huh? I'm beginning to figure a lot of things, Way. You killed your brother. Well, you're very observing. Where's Abigail Murray? What'd you do with her? Oh? Oh. You want to know where Abigail Murray is, dear? Yeah. You know, I think I'll arrange for you to find out. I'll go a step further. I'll arrange for you to go with her. Well, she's still alive then, huh? Where is she? In the turtle back of a car. I put her there. Say, hey, what's the matter with this guy, Say, Is he off his crunk? He's... He, Say, he... if you say I'm insane, I'll kill you right here. So... That's the way it is. You think I'm insane, too, don't you? That's I am. All my life, it's rich at this, rich at that, rich at the other thing. Well, I killed him. Now, you're in pretty deep, mister. Better hand me that gun. Oh, you think you're sly, don't you? You think I'm going to just hand it over like that? But I'm not. No? No. No, I've got it all set up. You, Faye, and Abigail are taking a little drive with me. Only I'm coming back alone. You stole the car, huh? Before the cops came back. Of course. That was very clever of me, don't you think? You uh, answered the phone in Abigail Murray's room when Faye called her, didn't you? <laughs> of course. I dropped in to see my old teacher. We were such pals, you know. She always gave me such good marks. <laughs> You're quite a clever guy. Uh, how'd you get her out of the hotel? Down the back way, servant center. No. Quite deserted. I arranged that, too. Then you came over and conked me on the head, huh? Yes. Yes, after I locked up Miss Abigail in the car. Well, you get around, Mr. Way. You see, I followed, say, I thought she might do something silly like employing you. But I prevailed upon her to forget it, didn't I, my dear? You lied to me. You told me that if I got rid of Dolan, you'd let Miss Abigail go free. Oh, no. No. What I said was that I'd see that Miss Abigail was free. And she shall be. Because one is free when one is dead. What are you going to do? Drive the car in the river. They'll never find it buried in the mud. They won't find us either. Naturally not. You'll be in the car from now on. You say and Abigail. And uh, what happens when you try to get me out of here? I could start a rocket. <laughs> I have that plan, too. Turn around. What for? I said turn. Okay. Now what happens? I'm going to hit you over the head. Not too hard, but just hard enough to keep you quiet for a while like this. No, no, no. You fool! You can make me! I think I can! I... lucky enough to catch John Way with a fast chop to the chin. Then I phoned Carter, who came out with a squad and took John Way down to the clink. At his trial, a group of doctors testified that he was violently and incurably insane. Later, I had a meeting with Miss Abigail and, of course, Faye at the Flamingo. My, my, Mr. Dolan. When I asked you to drive with me that night, I never dreamed that we would become involved in such an adventure. Well, neither did I. What puzzles me is, how did John get hold of my car long enough to put Richard's body in it? Well, he told the doctors at the trial that he saw you take it into a filling station to have it greased. He represented himself as your brother, took the car, put his brother's body in it, and returned it to your hotel. Oh, think of that. Uh, why did he hate you so much, Miss Abby? And, and why uh, hate his brother? You know, I can't understand that. Richard was gay, a good student, well-liked. John was exactly the opposite. Moody, a bad student with violent dislike. It uh, probably gnawed away at his mind until he made it up to get rid of the two people he hated. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, now, let's talk about Faye here. 
Why the pose is Miss Abigail's niece? Say, you're merely an old friend. Why did you say you were my niece? Only because I thought it might carry weight with Mr. Dolan. Only I was weighed and found wanting. Oh, purely in a business sense. Uh, try me on the uh, social time sometime. Tonight? Uh, the sooner, the better. And of course, I'm coming along, too. You know, I've never been to a nightclub. <laughs> I've never even done the, uh, the rumba. Now, 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 take it easy, Miss Abby. Uh, how do you know you like it? Oh, I shall. After all, a girl my age can get into trouble, too. Yeah, you can say that again. Good night, folks. Don't forget to listen again next week, same time, over most of these ABC stations, when you will hear William Gargan say, I deal in crime. I deal in crime. Starring William Gargan as Ross Dolan is a special presentation of the American Broadcasting Company. It is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Special music is arranged and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Now here's a special program note. International intrigue. That's what David Harding finds himself involved in on tomorrow's thrilling counterspy case. Don't miss David Harding counterspy tomorrow afternoon over the same ABC station. Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. private eye. That's your business. Anything else, that's for laughs. You're strolling along Fifth Avenue on a beautiful spring afternoon and you stop at the window of Fitch's department store for a peek at the styles. And then suddenly, she's there beside you. A tall blonde with curves, an electric blonde with voltage. She looks undecided, seems as though she wants to say something and... Well, maybe spring has gotten into you. So you start the ball rolling with a deckless piece of dialogue. Beautiful day, isn't it? Yes, lovely. And, uh, and the weather, the weather, it's, uh, perfect for strolling. Yes. Um, may we stroll? Yes. Yes, of course. My name is Angela Wentworth. I'm uh, Peter Chambers. We're going to call on my uncle, Mr. Chambers. We'll go there directly, if you don't mind. Uncle, she says. We're going to call on my uncle. Well, it's springtime in Manhattan and the squirrels are out. But if that's the way she wants it, she's far too beautiful to argue with. So you accompany her to Madison... And in the elegant hotel, you ride up to the tower apartment, and she nibbles with delicate knuckles on a thickly impressive door. My uncle isn't well. I don't want to wake him if he's sleeping. Uh, do you have a key? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Well, then let's use it, huh? Oh, yes. Yes, I shall. Inside, you get a back view of an old guy snoozing by an open window. You can't see his hands. They're in his lap. Angela taps you, and you tiptoe behind her into another room. She sits down and crosses her legs, and you've got trouble keeping your eyes away from her knees. But you manage. Well, do you have it? Uh, 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 I beg your pardon? Did you bring it? Bring what? The earring. Earring? What? Oh, where's my handbag? Handbag. Well, here it is. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Here. Read this. A clipping which I tore from the personal column of the Times. Please read it. Out loud. All right. Let me see now. Uh, 
If the lady who lost an earring at the art student's ball Friday evening will meet me in front of Fitch's department store Tuesday afternoon between 2 and 2.30, I shall be happy to return... <laughs> now, do you understand? Yes, yes, I do, and I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Sorry? But why? You... Look, look, Miss Wentworth, I didn't insert that ad. You didn't, but... No, no, you... I just happened to be there, and, well, you were there, and, well, a conversation sprang up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yes. Really funny. But I do think you ought to go now. She sort of starts you on your way, but on your way, you get another look at the old man, and suddenly you don't like it. He hasn't moved, and there's a white waxiness behind his ears, and you go near. What? What is it, Mr. Chambers? He's dead. <sighs> she passes out in a faint, and you let her lie. You go around to the front of the old man, and you take a look. He's got a gun in his hand and two bullet holes in his stomach. You're working at your trade now, and you work quickly and carefully. The room's in perfect order, absolutely no sign of a tussle. The old man's still warm, hasn't been dead an hour. Then, toward the middle of the room, you see it. A round red spot that sort of blends in with the russet color of the rug. You touch it. It's blood. Then you go back to the old man. You dig around in his pockets. You come up with a beautiful triangular emerald earring. And just then, Angela Wentworth starts stirring. Oh. Oh. Easy, easy does it, Miss Wentworth. Come on, come on. Let me help you up. Oh. There. there you are. Oh, my uncle. Uncle. He's dead. He appears to have shot himself. Oh, no. Now, look, look, look. Let's go back to the other room, huh? Come on. Now there, will you sit down? Thank you. I'll use the phone. Operator. Police headquarters. Emergency. I only left him perhaps an hour ago. Hello? Hello, I want to report a death. That's right, a death. 598 Madison Avenue, a hotel. The Tower Apartment. All right, now, Miss Wentworth. There's nothing we can do but wait for the police. Oh, it's terrible, terrible. Look, I uh, found this this earring in your uncle's pocket. Oh, thank you. It's the maid of the one I lost. Well, what was it doing in your uncle's pocket? That clipping. The person said they would return the lost one if I could identify it. So I brought the maid here to uncle. Left it with him and intended to bring the finder here with me. Show him the mate to the earring, which would be perfect identification. Is it valuable? Each earring is insured for $20,000, but... Oh, look, Mr. Chambers, may I... May I please call somebody? Well, sure. Who do you want to call? Oliver Hartford, my brother-in-law. He's married to my sister. He came here with my uncle. They live way up in New Hampshire, all of them. Mm, what about you? Well, I live here in the city. May I call Oliver? All right. Where is he staying? Right here, this hotel. One of the downstairs suites. Well, let's call him. Would you connect me with Mr. Hartford, please? There you are. Oh, thank you. Hello, Ollie. Come up to Uncle Sweet. Quickly, please. The guy shows. Oliver Hartford, big, young, and brawny. He sort of takes over in the comfort department for a sister-in-law. And presently, there's an onslaught of cops, medical examiner, fingerprint men, and the works. And boss man of the works, your good friend, Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Looking a little harassed today, but working with his usual competence. And then, after they're all done, and the medical examiner has made his report, and the body has been taken out, Parker takes you aside, and you fill him in on your end of the deal. Well, they got me working today. I got three unfinished cases, now this thing pops up. Well, it never rains. Medical examiner says suicide. The girls identified the gun as the old man's. Emmy says time of death, two o'clock. Door was locked. Who else had keys? Nobody but the old man. He lent his to the girl, and she was with you when the thing happened. Check. Suicide, period. Boy, I am busy today. Now, let me go in and talk to those two, the relatives, and then I'll beat it out of here. Sure, Louis. Let me go talk to them. All right, then, Miss uh, Wentworth, Mr. Hartford. Oh, by the way, Mr. Chambers here is a private detective. and One of the best. Oh. So, just in case either of you are not satisfied with the way the police may be handling Oh, well, we're, we're perfectly satisfied, Lieutenant, of course. All right, then. Let's get some of the facts out of the way. 
Name a deceased Robert Wentworth, the rich man, ex-oil man worth many millions, retired widower. Yes, his only two living relatives, his nieces. Uh, Miss Angela Wentworth, of course, my wife, Marie Wentworth Hartford. Where's your wife now? Why, uh, she's at home up in New Hampshire. See, I came in with Uncle Robert last week. Okay. Medical examiner says suicide, and every external item points to suicide. Time, two o'clock. Now, where were you at two o'clock, Mr. Hutt? In my room, napping. And you, Miss Wentworth? With Mr. Chambers on Fifth Avenue near Fitch's department. I'll corroborate that, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. You're very welcome, Mr. Yeah, Chambers. All, all right. All right. Huh? Sorry, lost my head. <clears throat> now, this suicide thing, would Mr. Wentworth be disposed to suicide? Oh, oh yes. yes. No well, one at a time. That. Now, please, one at a time. Huh? You, Miss Wentworth. Well, Lieutenant, my uncle was very ill. He was here for an operation. The doctors gave him very little chance. Did he know that he had this very little chance? Yes, of course he knew it. Better than any of us. Yeah. Seems to be clean cut. No loose ends. Mr. Hartford. Yes, sir. Would you accompany me downtown? I need a member of the family. Many little items of routine. Why, yes, of course, Lieutenant. Of course. And so you're alone again with Miss Angela Wentworth. You take her home to a cute little apartment on East 34th, and there... Thank you, Mr. Chambers. You've been very kind. Not at all. Uh, look, Angela, ours was a, well, a chance acquaintance, but there's no reason why it should end there. No. No reason at all. I... I like you very much, Mr. Chambers. And, uh, I like you. Look... A uh, lawyer was mentioned back there. Was that the only person your uncle would want to see to arrange his affairs? No, there was another, and much more important. Algernon Sacco, his business advisor. Sacco? He has an office down on Pine Street. Bye now, Miss Wentworth. I'll be in touch with you. Yes, please do. Now, here's a brand new wrinkle. Algernon Sacco, crooked as a country road. A big operator and a shrewd one. You tangled with him a few times, but that was way back before he acquired respectability and a few rich clients. An old cackle voice guy, but smart as a brand new whip. So you're down on Pine Street, old stone and steel. No pines. No pines at all. Yeah. Who do you wish to see? Mr. Sacco, and tell him I'm in a hurry. Nobody's in a hurry with Mr. Sacco. I'm in a hurry. Use that little intercom of yours and tell him Peter Chambers. Just a minute. Yes? Mr. Sacco, a gentleman here to see you. Says he's in a hurry. A Mr. Peter Chambers. Oh, who, who did you say? A Mr. Peter Chambers. Oh, of course. Send him in at once. See what I mean, baby? I'm a real VIP. That's all to your right, Mr. Chambers. Well, 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 good to see you again, my dear private operator. Now, Jimmy boy, I shall not mince, as they say, words. To the point, then, Peter. Robert Wentworth. Oh, excellent client. Loaded? Twenty million dollars. Oh, boy, are you going to be sad to hear this. Yeah, what? He's dead. Dead? You're kidding. I never kid when it has to do with death. Now, look, I want the rundown on this guy, and I want it fast, and I want it all. Did he have a will? Uh, yes. Well, come on, come on, let's hear it. The, the will left his entire estate to his two nieces, Angela and Marie. Wow. Ten million dollars each, huh? And who was the executor to this will? Me, Algernon Sacco. Pretty piece of change involved for uh, Algernon Sacco. Yes, now that he's dead before he changed his will, I'll earn that pretty piece of change. Fees and commissions, it bounces up, it bounces up. Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, yes. wait a minute. You just said before he changed his will. Did he have any intention of changing it? Well, uh, well, I... Come on, look, pal, there might be a motive here for murder. Oh, you mean I... It's got its angles, but if it gets to the cops, it gets to the newspapers, and all your background gets washed up. Now, you can't use that algae, not the new, respectable Algernon Sacco. Uh, but, uh, what do you want to know? Well, you know what the man says all the time. The facts, pal, the facts. Well, he came in late last week and discussed changing his will. 
He felt that his nieces were well provided for. He was making up his mind to leave his entire estate to medical research. Did you like that? No, I did not. So what did you do about yeah, it? So I got in touch with Oliver Hartford. After all, a change of will meant a loss to Mr. Hartford's wife of $10 million. And when your wife loses, you lose. What did his Hartford do about it? I don't know. But he was going to tackle the old man and see if he couldn't talk him out of it. Okay, Algie, thanks for the information. Keep respectable, uh, pal. Uh, Peter Chambers! You're working now. You're beginning to smell what you suspected. Murder. You get up to Angela Wentworth's place and she opens the door for you and your eyes pop. She's wearing blue silk lounging pajamas and she has a pony of brandy in her hand. Blue silk lounging pajamas. They were born to be worn by Angela Wentworth. It's good to see you again, Mr. Chambers. Likewise, Miss Wentworth. You, uh... Seemed to be rolling with the blow. Well, I've been thinking about it. Uncle Robert was an old man and very ill. Perhaps it was for the best. Look, at the ball you attended when you lost your earring... Would you like some brandy, Mr. James? Well, I'll take a rain check on it. Now, that ball you attended, who went with you? I mean, uh, who was your escort? Oliver, my brother-in-law. Uncle insisted. I think I had one cocktail too many at that ball. That earring was gone before I realized it. Mr. Chambers? Mr. Chambers, where are you going? You're going to pay a social call on Oliver Hartford. You knock on his door and he opens and you pull your way in. Hey, what's the meaning of this? What's the matter with nothing, you? Nothing, nothing. Just got no manners, I suppose. Get out of here. I'm going, but you're coming with me. I'm going with you? Where? Downtown, police headquarters. And just what are we going to do there? I'm going to accuse you of murder. Oliver swings, you duck. You swing, Oliver ducks. But he doesn't duck good enough. He goes down and out. And as you finish the pivot of your swing, there stands Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker in the doorway. Real nice form, Pete. You're starting to get your shoulders into it. Huh? Thanks, Louis. Incidentally, uh, apologies to the private eye. From whom? From me. I'm not busy anymore. So? So the old guy was murdered. He wasn't a suicide. That's my Louis. Got finished with the press of business. Had time to think. There's a spot of blood in the middle of the room. How come we find the old guy in the rocker by the window? Exactly. He was shot in the middle of the room. Yeah. Then he was pulled over to the rocker. The gun was wiped and put into his hand. Furthermore, downtown, a paraffin test shows the old guy never fired the gun, and that clinches it. That figures. Where have you been till now, Louis? Backtracking after you. Saw that Sacco guy, saw that Angela, read that newspaper clipping. Mm. He took it to the ball, Oliver did. Sure, and he stuffs her full of cocktails and clips the earring. And sticks that phony ad in the paper. So he can get her out of the way. Mm. Then he goes in to see the old man, bumps him with his own gun, fixes it for suicide and leaves. And the door locks on the clicker, so we got a, a locked room in the bargain. Well, what's our next step, Louis? Well, we take this bum downtown. Let's get him back to consciousness. We take him downtown and see how he acts under a bright white light. Oliver Hartford at headquarters gets closeted with Detective Parker and a host of excellent interrogators. You wait across the street in Luke McCool's Lonesome Bar and Grill. You sip on a stinger and you ponder. It figures for about two hours. Brother, when cops know you've done it and you're an amateur, you're a blustering wise guy for part of the way, but pretty soon you break wide open. Unless you're very smart or very stubborn. And you've got a feeling that Oliver may be very stubborn. So you're off and running and you're making tracks again for Angela Wentworth's place. Come in, come in, Mr. Chambers. You're becoming quite a regular visitor. And I like it. You like it, too, but you don't have the time. I offer brandy. Again, Mr. Chambers. And again, I've got to refuse. Double rain check this time, Miss Wentworth. Now, look, look. That earring, may I have it? The earring? Angela, look, may I call you Angela? Oh, please do. Well, you can trust me with it. I had it once and I give it back to you, remember? Yes, but why... Please, please, let me have it and I'll return it to you. And when I do, I've got a hunch I'll have the time for, um, uh, perhaps a brandy or two. All right, Mr. Chambers. Here it is. And 
And so you're back in Luke McCool's lonesome bar and grill across the street from headquarters, and you're trifling with stingers again when Parker shows up. And he hangs a face in front of you that's longer than a lover's kiss. Pete, boy, we've got us a Tartar. Meaning who? Meaning that Oliver Hartford. Tough boy. That's tough. The guy killed Uncle Robert so that his wife could pick up 10 million solid simoleons. I know. There's no one else, Louie. No one else could possibly have done it. Nobody with motive. You're so right, boy. Angela, she was with you. Sacco, no question. He was in his office all day. The other niece, Oliver's wife, we've checked it. She's in New Hampshire. No question, we've got the right pigeon. We've got him right up to the breaking point, but he won't break. Pete, all I need is a gimmick, one little thing to shove him over. And I've got it for you, Lieutenant. Got what? A crowbar that'll topple the rock. Only this crowbar is green, it's shiny, and it's worth 20,000 bucks. Here. Look. Hey, that's a beauty. Where'd you get that? Out of Oliver Hartford Suite. No. Yep. So, Louis, my lad, take this earring and shove it down his throat. Give me, pal. So you're alone once more, and you've got your fingers crossed. Psychologically, it fits. But if it blows up, you're going to be in the middle of the explosion. If it blows, it'll blow all over you. But 20 minutes later, Park is back and he's beaming. He returns the earring and he claps you on the back. And a clap on the back from Parker is like a jolt of the jaw from Marciano. Got him, got him, got him good. Full confession, the works broke him down completely. Oh, and now he's up the other alley pleading for leniency. Uh, you tricked him, Louis. I tricked him? No, not me. That's my pride. I'm a straight cop. I tricked nobody. I know, I know. So I had to trick you into tricking him. Well, what are you talking about? The emerald earring. What about it? It's the wrong one. It's the one out of Uncle's pocket. The mate to the one that disappeared. The wrong one? Well, then where's the right one? Well, it must be where uh, psychologically it ought to be. Now, you had the guy on the brink, Louie. There wasn't time to go looking for the right one, so I used the wrong earring for the right purpose, and it worked. So now... <laughs> Let's go find the right one. You accompany Parker and five of his best boys to Oliver's suite, and they give it a professional going over, and they come up with the earring inside a cake of soap. <laughs> Amateurs are all alike. They think they discovered a brand new hiding place just because they thought of it. Parker gives them to you, the pair. Go ahead, kiddo. You return them. You may as well get something out of this. Glory, at least. And so the private eye, in proper tradition, is back where he belongs, in the beautiful lady's apartment. He partakes of a bit of brandy, and then he presents her with a complete set of emerald earrings. Oh, Mr. Chambers, I... I don't know how to thank you. Think nothing of it, ma'am? A fee. Would you perhaps accept a fee? No, thanks. Nothing as mundane as a fee. But I... I just don't know how to thank you. Well, you think about it, Angela. Just sip your brandy and think. Come here, Mr. Chambers. Oh, I'm coming, ma'am. I think I know what you mean. Something like this? Mmm. Oh, Mr. Chambers... And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Joyce Gordon as Angela, and Bernard Grant as Oliver. It was directed by Fred Way. And this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. I have another story to tell you today. 
This one is about a crime in which a murderer is trapped by one of the most powerful forces of nature. Do you want to hear it? Now starring Paul Fries as your teller of tales, another story from The Black Book. Yes, from the world's most fabulous collection of strange and unusual stories, The Black Book, I have selected a story called The Vagabond Murder. Eric Patterson was growing desperate. He'd been there for over two hours, waiting. Waiting with less and less patience for the door in front of him to open. He listened intently for the warning sound of the key in the door. Eric needed to be warned because when the man he was waiting for entered the room, Eric was going to kill him. As the seconds ticked past in the darkness, Eric thought back to the beginning of all this. It was in New York. He had taken his wife, Karen, along on a business trip. It had been quite successful, and one of the best contacts he'd made was Henry Drucker. Drucker, the richest, most influential man in the whole investment business. And he seemed to like Eric from the start. And with Karen, they made a gay trio the last few days. Rounds of cocktail parties, the theater, endless nightclubs. And then on the last evening of all, Drucker had said, Look, Eric, why not join me on the Bermuda trip? The best thing in the world for you and Karen. My yacht sails tomorrow. What do you say? At first, Eric thought it was just talk, but he was wrong. And the next day, they sailed for Bermuda on Drucker's yacht, the Vagabond. It wasn't until the return trip that Eric began to suspect that it wasn't him Drucker was really interested in, but Karen. And then the night before they were to dock in New York, it happened. The three of them were sitting at the small bar after dinner when Karen got up, said she wanted some fresh air, and went out on deck. A few minutes later, Drucker excused himself. I think I'll go to my cabin, Eric. But I won't be long. Uh, wait here for me, will you? Well, yes, if you like. Good. Then we'll have a nightcap together. And so Eric was left alone. As he sat there, disturbing images began to form in Eric's mind. Pictures of Drucker, handsome, virile, wealthy. And of Karen, young, beautiful, and oh, so impressionable. With a suddenness that overturned the bar stool, Eric was on his feet, and half running, he crossed the room and went down the corridor to Drucker's stateroom. Drucker! Drucker, open the door! Drucker, do you hear me? Open this door, or I'll break it down! Just a minute, Eric. I'll be right there. Just take it easy. I'll take it easy till I count to five, then I'm coming in. One, two... Three. All right, Eric. Where's, where's my wife? Well, you must be drunk, Eric. Karen isn't in here. Was she in here, Drucker? Tell me the truth. Don't be a fool, Eric. Of course she wasn't. Then why was your door... Oh. Oh, I... I guess I have made a fool of myself. I'm sorry, Drucker. Uh, forget it. I'll tell you why I locked the door. You see, Eric, I'm diabetic. and have to give myself an insulin shot about this time every night. Naturally, I don't talk about it, nor do I like anyone barging in while I'm at it. Eric stood there feeling like a fool while Drucker washed the hypodermic needle and put it away in a box. Eric watched him place the box next to a packet of insulin capsules in the drawer of the night table by his bunk. I can understand your jealousy, old man, with a wife as lovely as Karen. But I know women, Eric, and Karen is in love with you. She always will be. Look, I, I'm terribly sorry about this, Drucker. Oh, now, let's just forget all about it. Matter of fact, I've been wanting to talk to you about something I've already told Karen. It should prove how I feel about you, Eric. Here, pour yourself a drink. Thanks, I need it. Um, you know anything about uranium? That's well, expensive. Know anything about Peru? <coughs> what are you driving at? Uranium in Peru, Eric. Big, really big. 
And the payoff is so big that I was going to put in $750,000 on my own. But I'll let you have 250000 of it if you want it. Hmm. Huh. That's a lot of money. Mm. So is a return of 23%. Yeah. But I haven't got that much. I'd have to borrow on everything. 180 days should see the first dividends. You'll have a certified check within two weeks. Back in New York, Eric and Drucker spent hours poring over graphs, reports, charts, surveys to make certain their investment was sound and they could find no flaw. But six months later, Eric learned that even the most gilt-edged promotion can fail. Uranium in Peru didn't make him a millionaire. It ruined him. It took his entire personal fortune. And because he'd borrowed so heavily, his business and his credit were ruined. Eric suddenly found himself without a single capital asset. In desperation, he went to see Drucker. So that's the picture, Eric. There isn't a thing I can do. Yes, of course. I understand your position. All my cash assets went, too, and everything else of mine is tied up. You can't touch it for years. Well, we took a chance, and we both lost. Thanks again, Drucker. Um, Eric, do you have any plans? Well, I've had an offer from the coast. Oh, Small investment house in Oakland. Well, I'm sure it'll work out fine. Uh, tell me about Karen. How is she taking all this? Karen? Oh, she's... She's really great, Drucker. Now she decided to go back to modeling in New York for six months or so. Just while I'm getting started, you understand. She's a fine girl, Eric. You're very lucky. Yes, I know I am. Well, goodbye and thanks again. Out in California, Eric thought often of Drucker. After all, it was part of the game. They'd miss this time, but maybe the next. More often, however, he thought about Karen in New York. He'd heard from her regularly at first, and then the letters stopped. For six weeks, he heard nothing. He phoned long distance again and again, but nothing was able to find her. And he was beginning to be beside himself with worry and fear. Then one night, his phone rang. Yes, hello? Uh, Mr. Patterson? Yes? Uh, this is Oliver Fay. I do a little gossip column here for the Herald. I hope you read me. No, I don't. Uh, well, anyway, perhaps you'd like to make a statement. Statement? What are you talking about? Well, it's about the marriage of Karen, your perfectly lovely ex-wife and Henry Drucker. Where'd you hear this? <laughs> I never reveal my sources, Mr. Patterson. But they're driving Mr. Drucker's Nash Healy out from Reno tomorrow... They'll be married aboard the Vagabond. Oh, it'll be terribly romantic, sailing off to the seven seas in search of happiness, nursing their newfound love under the Southern Cross. Oh. And... At first, Eric thought it was all a lie, that perhaps he was the victim of a cruel prank. But he had to find out. And an hour later, he was standing on a fog-wet pier, looking at the sleek white outline of the vagabond. And suddenly, as waves of nausea swept through him, he understood everything. Drucker had deliberately ruined him, and undoubtedly with Karen's knowledge. These last six weeks, Karen had been in Reno, divorcing him by default. Everything had been taken from him. His money, his wife, his pride, and he hated them for it. Derek stood there raging, his eyes fixed on the porthole he knew to be that of Drucker's own cabin. And suddenly he realized that he was going to kill Drucker. And a second later he knew how he was going to kill him. He returned to his rooms and dialed the number of the Herald, asking for Oliver Fay. Fay speaking. Mr. Fay, uh, this is Eric Patterson. Oh, yes. Uh... Look, I, I want to apologize for my rudeness earlier this evening. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Patterson. People are often harsh. Yes, well, I'm sorry. I would like to give you a statement now. It's simply that Henry Drucker and I are close friends, and, well, there's no ill feeling between any of us. You understand. I certainly wish them the best of everything. Well, good. I'll print that, and I'll show it to them tomorrow night. You know, there's a pre-wedding party aboard the Vagabond. Oh, what time are they sailing? I might want to send them a wire. Well, I have my little...
little notes right here. Let me see now. Cocktails at 5.30, then dinner at about 8, and finally the sailing uh, around 2 a.m., I think. You know, it's going to be such fun. I'm the only one of the literary crowd they've included. Oliver Faye gushed on, There's but so Eric wasn't listening there, now. He had all the information he needed. Henry Drucker was as good as dead right now. About 6.30 next evening, Eric stood in the shadows of the pier and watched the last of the guests arrive and board the vagabond. Then he walked quickly across the open area directly to the porthole of Drucker's cabin. He was unobserved. The porthole was on a level with the pier, and Eric had to lie on his stomach in order to crawl through it. A moment later, he was safely inside. He closed the porthole and waited for his eyes to become accustomed to the darkness. Then he found the night table by Drucker's bunk and removed the hypodermic needle and insulin. Quickly, he filled the syringe with more than enough insulin to kill a man and placed it carefully on top of the table. Next, he found a towel and rolled it lengthwise. With it, he could choke Drucker into unconsciousness without leaving a mark. Now he was ready. An hour passed. Then two. And a third, more slowly than ever. And for the first time, Eric grew nervous. Another hour and the towel in his hands was wet with perspiration. What had happened? Had Drucker, in the excitement of the evening, forgotten his injection? Panic began to rise in Eric, and he fought it back desperately. And then suddenly, he heard a key in the door. He stood back and waited. The door opened, and Drucker, a black figure against the light of the corridor, entered the cabin. Eric waited until he'd blocked the door behind him. Then he moved. The towel went around Drucker's neck, and Eric twisted it with a frenzied strength. After a moment or two, Drucker ceased to struggle, and Eric finally released him. He might have been dead already, but to be sure and to make it look like suicide or an accident, he injected the overdose of insulin. Then it was over. Perfect. Eric sighed deeply with relief and satisfaction. Mr. Drucker? Uh, Mr. Drucker? Oh, come now, I know you're in there. You promised me an interview, you know. Terror-stricken Eric moved to the portal. His hands trembled as he opened it and prepared to climb through. But something was wrong. The portal was open, but he couldn't get out. Blocking it six inches from his hands was a solid wall of pilings, great timbers side by side. The floor of the pier was now two feet above him. For a moment he was dazed. And then he knew. The tide... The tide was going out, and the ship had dropped a few feet with it. The tide had cut off Eric's only escape. He was hopelessly trapped. He sat down heavily, almost ready to cry. I'm still here, Mr. Drucker, and I'll wait right here all night if necessary. <laughs> uh, do you hear me? <laughs> The Black Book stars Paul Fries as your teller of tales, assisted today by the noted Hollywood actor John Daner. The Vagabond Murder was written by Norman MacDonald and John Meston and directed by Mr. MacDonald. The special music is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Every Monday night, a top Hollywood star plays the leading role in a thrill-packed story on suspense on most of these same CBS radio stations. Clarence Cassell speaking. Remember, Broadway Playhouse brings you top stars and top stories Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Rhyme does not pay. <laughs> Sylvie, I'm going out. This time of night? What for? The fire is near here. You and your fires. What are you, a little boy? Stop chasing fire engines. Grow up. That was my mistake, growing up. Of all the silly things to say. Silly? That 
What else is there to do for excitement? I could mention a few things, like taking your wife out, for instance. I mean real excitement. Action! Like the ladders going up, the horses dragged up the fire escapes, people jumping into nets, all the bells, the sirens. Oh, what's the use? They're coming back already. A small fire. Someday, someday there's going to be a real fire in this neighborhood. A real fire. Nick, stop it. When you talk like that, you frighten me. In the interest of good citizenship and law enforcement, we present Crime Does Not Pay based on the famous Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer series of short subjects. In just a moment, you will hear Gasoline Cocktail, starring Bela Lugosi. Now, Crime Does Not Pay, starring Bela Lugosi as Nick Segadon in Gasoline Cocktail. Sometimes the trouble begins out of sheer frustration. The need for excitement, the need to blow off steam, can cause a man's mind to work in devious ways. There's the thrill holdup. The beating administered more to the world at large than to the immediate victim. The theft for the sake of the dare it represents. With Nick Segadon, it was the lighted match, the licking flame, and of course the roar and scream of the fire engines racing through the city streets. Two lines, two lines in the front door. Line up 74 and 56 engines, then pipe standing by. Third floor, strong, chief. All right. Pull out the men from 25 truck. Denny, Denny, turn in this second. This one's too hot for us to handle without help. Yes, sir. Chief, the 6th Battalion ordered me to report to you, sir. We're 22 truck. 22 truck. When did you get here? First two on the second. All right, I'm releasing you. Go back to quarters. Yes, sir. Driver... Notify dispatcher. All second alarm equipment released and sent back to quarters. Well, Chief, uh, you almost had yourself a nasty one, didn't you? Oh, Warren. Well, how's the fire marshal's business? Still doing things with magnifying glasses? <laughs> <laughs> Microscopes these days. I see you had three boys hurt. Uh, nothing too bad. Punctured hand, cut cheek. And we were lucky this time. The stairwell was like a chimney. Fire mushroomed up onto the third floor. Took six women down the ladders. A... Uh, you find anything yet? Uh, looks like the usual. Baby carriage full of trash under the stairs. Cigarette, match, boom. I'll see you around, Chief. Right, Warren. Chances are you will. I, uh, I beg your pardon, sir. Hmm? You are the fire marshal? Yes. yes. How'd you know? I've seen the car in which you came to the fire. Since I was a boy in Hungary, I've I followed the fires. I guess boys are boys all over the world. Yes, all over. But I wish to know, have you found out how this started? You found out where it started? Why do you want to know? Oh, it's uh, just uh, that I'm interested in these things. And this is a bad one. Uh, bad isn't the word for it. We're just lucky no life was lost. Yes, very lucky indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. If people only were more careful where they throw matches. Sylvie, I'm going out. This time of night? What for? The fire is near here. You and your fires. What are you, a little boy? Stop chasing fire engines. Grow up. That was my mistake, growing up. Of all the silly things to say. Silly, is it? What else is there to do for excitement? I could mention a few things, like taking your wife out, for instance. In the old days in Budapest, 
You run after the engines with me. No, I wish I hadn't. There was excitement then. Now what? A job to go to with men I would not care to look at. Then back to this, this house, day after day, night after night. No, Nick, not night after night. And even though you don't care to look at the men, you look at a girl, all right. Sylvia, this is... I know her name, Edna Hall, and her address, 5546 Erie Street. Yes, I know. But if you think, Nicholas Sagerden, that I let go of you, you are wrong. Wrong. But don't you see this is all in your mind? In my mind? I have walked past her house. Of course there is a house in your mind. This, uh, all this is like myself and the engines. You wish for excitement, and there is none. So, my poor Sylvie, you make it up. Out of your head. That I, your Nicholas, go for rides in a car with another woman. Tonight, my dear Edna. Tonight, you are more lovely than I ever seen you. Oh, Nick, you're teasing me again. Listen. What's the matter, darling? You hear them? The fire engines? Oh, that, yes. I will go to the fire, too. Nick, you're like a little boy. You do not mind this? No, I don't. But a cop would mind the way you're passing red lights. Oh, for a moment, I think I'm really driving the big truck. But you're not. Oh, Nick, there they are. See all the red lights up there? I see them. Edna, you're excited, too. Oh, who wouldn't be? Ah, it's nothing. They haven't even taken the hose out of the hose truck. There's nothing to watch. Why, Nick, shouldn't you be glad it wasn't much? Uh, perhaps it was discovered too soon. Oh, oh, oh yes, 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 I, I'm glad. Now, let's stop here, near the park. It's a good place to stop, huh, Edna? Oh, yes, darling. Oh, Nick, I wish I could bring you home with me. But you know how Dad is. He thinks you're too middle-aged for me. Mm, perhaps I am. No. Oh, oh you. Nick. Nick, you're wonderful. And you. You are more than wonderful. I cannot be without you. Is this a proposal, Nick? Are you asking me to marry you? I... I cannot ask that, my beloved. She... she's not... well... Uh, there cannot be a divorce. I'm sorry, Nick. I guess you'd better take me home. So, you... you too are like all the others. Nick! The rides, the kisses, but always we must be married. Is love nothing in this country without marriage? Nothing? Nick, people will hear you. Oh, so let it be. I'll take you home. Again, I'm rejected. But there will be a day. A day for Nicholas Sagadin will come. Soon. <laughs> heaven's name are you doing in that closet? Looking for something. Why didn't you ask me first? All right. I ask you second. The glass jug in which came the wine from your father. Where is it? Right up there on the shelf. I straightened the closet yesterday. Thank you. You need this rag, Sylvia? No. What do you want with it? Oh, always questions. Oh, Nick. You've been like your old self these past few days. You've been home at night. I told you once I'm not changed. What do you want with the jug? I am uh, cleaning the seats in the car. So I will draw gasoline from the tank into the jug, and with that rug, I, I will wipe. Uh, very simple, isn't it? Oh, be careful, won't you, dear? Careful. Yes. Gasoline burns and explodes. Be careful. <laughs> yes. I will be careful, very careful. But like everything in this world, if the gasoline explodes in the proper place, it is all right. Explodes? Where, Nick? Where? Where else but in the motor of the car. Where else? <laughs> 
Almost ready to turn out the light, Jane? Yes, I am ready, Edna. All right, hop her to bed. Oh, your bed is softer than mine. Uh, that's one reason why I like to spend the night at your house. What's the other reason? Uh, I like to talk in the dark like this. What about Jen? <laughs> oh, just anything. It's easy to talk in the dark. That's why I come over. You know, Edna, you're only a few years older than I am, but you know so much more. I'm flattered. I wish it were true. <laughs> Jen! Through the window. Somebody threw something. It, it's burning. Well, I am in Denny, truck 25 reporting, Chief. We found a couple of roasts on the first floor. Whereabouts, Denny? Room where the fire started. So it seems to have been a bedroom, sir. The metal frame of the bed is still recognizable. Mm. Anything on the man in the other bedroom? Yeah, doctor says it's smoke poisoning and shock. He'll be all right. Okay. There's a public ambulance coming down from City Hospital. I have to take the bodies to the morgue. But don't bring them out on the street until the ambulance is here. Yes, sir. And notify the dispatcher I'm releasing 22 truck and 74 engine. Well, if it weren't for those two deaths, this might not have been as bad as it looks. In just a moment, Crime Does Not Pay will continue with Gasoline Cocktail. Now, we continue with Crime Does Not Pay, starring Bela Lugosi as Nick Sagadon in Gasoline Cocktail. Whenever death has been caused by fire, even under the least suspicious circumstances, the fire marshal is joined in his investigation by the district attorney's office and the police. Therefore, the day following the death of Edna Hall and her guest Janice, three men checked over the wreckage of what had been the girls' bedroom. Fire Marshal Warren, Assistant District Attorney Morrison, and Detective Stein. The girls must have been sleeping soundly for it to get so much headway. A neighbor who pulled the box said he heard what sounded like an explosion. Seen anything of a gas heater or an oil stove? The building steam heated. Oh, the uh, men on the first truck to respond said it looked like a, an oil fire to them. Hello. Uh -huh. Find something, Marshal? What's this look like to you, Marson? Piece of glass. Too heavy for a light bulb, but... What do you think, Stein? Oh, perfume bottle, maybe. One of those things girls like to have on dressing tables. It's a mighty big bottle. Look at the curvature of the glass. Yeah, I see what you mean. Oh, wouldn't the heat of the fire have melted it? Not without blackening it some. Anyhow, I found this in a corner behind the fire. Behind it? In this oven? Yeah. Notice that corner near where the window was? Barely a smoke mark. Something forced the fire away from there and tossed this glass fragment in there. Explosion is right, then. Hey, wait a minute. How about this? <sighs> Looks like the neck and the handle of a, a, a gallon jug. I saw it a minute ago and passed it up. It's the same glass as the Marshall's fragment. The microscopes will prove that for us. Now, hold it up to light a minute. Yeah, sure. Here. There. See those bits of, well, lint, I guess, on the inside of the bottleneck? Yeah. They look like it. One will get you ten there. That's how it started, all right. A jug of gasoline with a lighted rag in its neck tossed through the window. Boom. Molotov cocktail. What's that, Stan? I said Molotov cocktail. We use beer bottles against Nazi tanks in the bulge. Same principle. And pretty much the same effect. <laughs> Try not to be too long, Mr. Hall. In fact, I'm sure the doctors won't permit us to stay more than a few minutes. That's all right, Mr. Morrison. Anything I can do to help. Um, 
We're convinced, Mr. Hall, from various bits of physical and chemical evidence that the fire in your daughter's room began with a gasoline explosion. Yes, we think it came from outside, Mr. Hall. A gasoline grenade through the window. From outside? Oh. Then you think it was murder, too? Do you, Mr. Hall? It's a grim charge on just my personal dislike of a man. As someone who had cause to, well, want your daughter out of the way? Yes. She thought she was in love with him. I refused to let him in the house. And she was meeting him outside. I knew it. Then she found out he was married. She broke it off with him. He was... Uh... Well, I, I didn't like him, that's all. Do you know his name, Mr. Hall? Yes, it's Nick Zegadin. He worked where Edna did. You can get his address there. Yes? Mrs. Segadon? I am she. I'm from the district attorney's office. <gasps> My name is Morrison. This is Fire Marshal Warren, Detective Stein. May we come in, please? You can see our credentials if you wish. Oh, no, no. Come in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, sit down. We'd like to see your husband. We understand he hasn't been to work for three days. I'd like to see him, too. When did you see him last, Mrs. Segadon? Three... Yes, three nights ago. He, he went out. He did not come back. Did he, uh... Did he do anything funny that night, ma'am? No, nothing. Just he went out to clean the seats of the car. Uh, with what, Mrs. Segadon? Oh, with gasoline. Where'd he get it? Uh, the gasoline, I mean. Oh, from the car. In a glass jug in which glass we had jug. wine. Well, that makes some sense. What? What do you think he has done? We think he killed someone. A girl named Edna Hall. And we think he used the gasoline. <laughs> you better tell us where he's gone, ma'am. I don't know. I don't know. I... I knew she was dead. I saw it in the paper. I don't know where he went. One question, ma'am. Does your husband have any family anywhere in this country? Yes. An uncle, Joseph, in Miami. But he wouldn't go there. Thank you, Mrs. Segadin. He might not go there, and then again, he just might. All right, Stein. It looks as if you're going south this year. If only for a day or two. <laughs> Nice place you've got here, Mr. Sagadin. Bet you do a swell business during the season, eh? <laughs> good. Not so good. We get along. You see what you like? You betcha. Five pounds assorted. Five pounds? We must make up. It's not ready. Not many five-pound customers this time of year in Miami, yeah, huh? Not many. You do not mind waiting? Oh, no, no, no. Go to it. From what I hear at the hotel, sweet spy Sagadin are worth waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> you try a truffle while you wait, yes? Hey, thanks. Damn. That's good. Very good. A service like this we don't get in New York. Huh. You live in New York? Yeah. My hometown. I have nephew in New York. That's so? What's his name? Maybe I know him. <laughs> if you do, you know my name. He is Nicholas Segadin. And that is a name nobody forgets. Besides, he moved just last week. That's so? Where to? Uh, not far. He write me postal cards, say he is tired of New York City. He moved to East Orange, New Jersey, street with very funny name, uh, <laughs> Porter Street, 118 Porter Street. Like maybe the street carry his suitcase for him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very funny name, funny joke. <laughs> you got a phone booth here? Yes, sir, right behind. Thanks. While you're finishing up that box, I think I'll make a call. I just remembered. I've got to warn someone about a fellow I know. A fellow who likes to play with matches. <laughs> You like you like the fire in the fireplace, Nicholas. Very much. Why? You stare at it so. All day as you watch the fire. I'm lucky, Lena. When I rented the room from your mother, <laughs> I didn't expect that her daughter and the parlor, fireplace and all were included. Nicholas, you make fun of me. I should say not. But of course not. <gasps> oh. oh, 
Then the log falls, so it always makes me jump. Time for another log, oh, isn't it? No, it is too warm in here, Nicholas. You do not need another log. The fire will be too high. Fires are never too high, Lena. Watch the flames. See? It's like a dance. So light, so graceful. But such power, such strength in the flame, Lena. Even from a little match. A whole house sometimes. From a single little match. Nicholas, you must not talk like this. What then? Must I talk about your eyes, your hair, your pink cheeks? You do make fun of me, Nicholas. I don't know about flames, but I know when someone makes fun of me. You are a silly one. <laughs> Come back here. No, I will go upstairs. I don't like you, Nicholas. I thought I did, but I don't. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Lena, my dear. I don't know. I don't know. Inside, maybe something is wrong. No, Nicholas. I do not want to sit and talk with you anymore. They all run away like rabbits. And they don't know why. Tomorrow I find another room. I cannot live with rabbits. But this, this rabbit... You'll feel my anger. This she will know before very long. Miss Korsky? Yes? Your mother in, Miss Korsky? Uh, no, officer. She is downtown. Well, may we come in? This is Mr. Morrison, New York District Attorney and you Fire Marshal Warren. A fire? Uh, yes, yes, you may come in. All right, you. gentlemen. All right, Mr. Morrison, uh, you can take it from here. Thank you. Miss Korsky, is there a rumor here by the name of Nick Segedin? Nick? Y yes, sir. Is he at home? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that is, I think so. He has the front room, second floor. You ever noticed anything, well, peculiar about this man, miss? Uh, peculiar? Uh, no, only... He likes big fires in the fireplace. Sounds like your man, Yes. Gentlemen. Let's drop in on him. Right. Which way, miss? Up. Upstairs. First door on the right. Thanks, miss. I wouldn't come any further, gentlemen, if I were you. All right, second in. We're here to take you in for arson and the murder of Edna and Janice Hall. This is easy to say. I have a bottle, a beer bottle, gentlemen, filled with gasoline, corked with a piece of rag. I have intended it as a parting gift for my landlady and her daughter. The house is full of mice. I find this a very effective means. No use, Sagerton. We've got you dead to rights, and you know it. One step more, gentlemen. Parson, Warren, Warren. Look out! Oh, get that bottle, Marcy. All right, I've got it. Nice shooting, officer. Oh. All right, it doesn't hurt that much, Segadin. It's only through your shoulder. It'll be fixed up good as new long before you burn for what you've done. Crime does not pay. Bela Lugosi, who was starred as Nick Segadin in Gasoline Cocktail, will be back with you in just a moment. Now, here in person is Bela Lugosi. It is perfectly possible that Nick Segadin is more to be pitied than censored. Legally, Nick was sane, and he paid the penalty exacted by society. But society itself bears a large part of Nick's guilt. Nick never found proper training and education. Nick never found the opportunity to release his energies in the right direction. So you see, as always... It comes back to us, the responsible citizens of our community. If we see to it that the roots of crime, the social conditions which breed gangsters and warped people like Nick are removed, 
we will have taken a long step on the way to a better world. For ourselves, as well as the criminals, crime does not pay. Thank you, Bela Lugosi. Crime Does Not Pay is written by Ira Marion and directed by Marx B. Lowe, with music composed and conducted by John Gart. Technical advisor is Burton B. Turkus. The events, characters, and names used in the story you've just heard are fictitious. Any similarity is purely coincidental. And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable John J. Sullivan, former Chief of Detectives and Deputy Police Commissioner, City of New York, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the supersonic safe crackers. Chief Sullivan. I know the criminals in tonight's case certainly presented a problem to detectives of the New York City Police Department. A tremendous problem, Don Gardner. But they gave the investigating detectives an idea of what their successors may have to face in the future. Well, it sounds like you've got an interesting case, Chief Sullivan. Why don't you go right ahead? All right, Don. On the west side of New York, a little uptown from Times Square, there was a cheap restaurant, a chili parlor, in the basement of an old brownstone house. Miguel, the Mexican proprietor, on occasion prepared his peppery native dishes for special customers. One such customer was Russ Enfield, who, on a particular night about a year and a half ago, sat at a corner table with his girl, Myra, as Miguel took up their order. And then I fix you some nice enchiladas, which we follow up with some nice cheese tacos, see? Fine, fine. That's the stuff, Miguel. Can't you make something simple, like ham and eggs? Ham and eggs? This is poison, ham and eggs. Go on, Miguel. Go on, go on. Whip the stuff up. Whip this stuff up? Well, this cannot be whipped up like, like, like ham and eggs. Ross? Now, look, Myra, it's all settled. You got enough clothes. You can't have it. You know, huh? You know what I need. Yeah, I know what you need. Now, let's forget about it. Russ, I swear I'm not going to stand for this pushing around. There's certain things a girl's entitled to. You don't keep quiet about it. I'll give you what you're entitled to. Now, don't let's start it. Uh-oh. Here comes Jonesy and the guy. Ray. Where's this turtleneck sweater? All right, all right. Now, keep quiet. Well, here we are, Russ. Hello, Jonesy. He looks sweet tonight. Yeah. Oh, I just got a haircut. Okay, okay. You're Preble, huh? That's right. Uh, Joe Preble, Russ Come on, Jonesy. Right. Let's go over to the bar and have a drink. Is it okay, Russ? Sure, sure. Go ahead. I want to talk to Preble. Take care of my enchiladas. Yeah, I'll see. They don't get cold. Come on, Mary. Those enchiladas couldn't get cold inside. There he is. Have a chair, Preble. Thanks. You're a kid. She's just like the rest of them. No, Preble? Sounds okay to me, Russ, the way Jonesy explained it. Jonesy's not the best explainer in the world. Have any questions? What kind of questions? Safe cracking and safe cracking. With a few improvements, yeah. For instance, you don't have to carry that gun anymore. Who told you I'm carrying a gun? Nobody told me. I just found out now. You carry it in a shoulder holster under your left arm. Right? Whose mind you been reading? I haven't been reading any minds. Just a dial on uh, this little gimmick. 
It's a funny-looking watch. What is it, anyway? Well, just a little gimmick I picked up. They used them in the war. Metal detective. Oh, cute. Cute as it come. But how does it open a safe? Might come in handy, just like everything we use. The walkie-talkies, the supersonic stuff, everything. You got to show me that it beats the old way. You've been on ice too long, Preble, and you got a sing-sing complex. <laughs> now, remember what I tell you about the gadgets we work with. The scientific stuff can only go so far. Can't even go that far without a little head work. Okay, just lay it out. Now, hold it, hold it. Senor Ross, you would like the tortillas plain or toasted? A toasted, I think. Yeah, anything, it. Miguel. Just get it out here. Hey, uh, see, toasted. A toasted would be more better tonight because it's yesterday's tortillas. He should drown in a barrel of tequila. Well, Preble, you think you could come along and do what I tell you without giving me any argument? Look, I've been knocking the knobs off safes 15 years now. I can use your experience, but my methods are a little different. What do you come to be such an expert in this science stuff? The Navy, pal. The Navy taught me the works before they gave me the bounce. Oh, another blue ticket, boy. Yeah. After a hitch in Portsmouth Naval Prison... I've got my hands on every electronic device in the book, and I know how to run them. Hmm? I can open up any tin can of a vault in this town without straining a muscle. I'll show you what I mean. I heard there was fortunes being made out of government surplus. The surplus anybody can get, Preble. It still takes a guy to run it. Hmm, here comes Agua Caliente with your grub. Good. Good. Let's see. All right, it's very hot stuff, senor. She don't put your feet. Well, you think you could crack this safe the old-fashioned way, Preble? I might, I might. Come on, come on, Russ. How long does it take to get that junk rigged up? Yeah, plug this in the wall sack. There. The old-fashioned way ain't good enough. Now you got to crack a safe with gadgets. Think of the combination, Preble. Yeah, now you're talking. Okay, hold it. One tumbler dropped. Did not. I didn't hear it drop. I got the best ears in the business. It dropped, I tell you. The gadget told me it did. No kidding. I'll run the dial back the other way. Yeah, easy. Yes, hey, what's that? Shut up. What is it, Jonesy? Keep the light lower, Russ. I got a glimmer of her from the wind just now. Right. Keep that light lower, Preble. Yeah. Any radio cars around, Jonesy? Not a sign of one, Russ. How you doing? Okay, but we won't get it open if I talk to you all night. You just stay in the car, keep your eyes out for cops. Okay. Hey, that's all right. The walkie-talkie's okay. I know it. Well, go on, get to work in that combination. Sure. Want to grab that dough and get out of here. Five feet deep. Look, Captain Hanson, I hate to break in a mechanic like this. The sergeant, what's up? Just hit a call from the 32nd Squad. Face the left, Captain. They got into the ball at the finance company office at 124th and Lexington last night. Got away with over 3,000. Does it look like the same boy, Sergeant? No telling. Come on, let's get up there. All right. Ryan from identification found the way up there now. Dust the place over for Prince. Good. Walk off the way you came on. Go ahead, Sergeant. Yeah. Uh, car is parked outside, Captain. We can... Oh, Sergeant. Yes, sir? You say they fingered this safe open? That's what the 32nd Squad says. Oh. One of those boys must have awfully tender fingers. Probably took them all night manipulating that combination, just like that one last week, Captain. They could have blown the door off in an hour. I don't know, Sergeant. Maybe these boys have a way. A way? What do you mean, a way? Oh, we'll see. Let's get up there and look that ball over. Hey, Russ, I... Well, hello, Jonesy. Oh, hi, Myra. Is uh, Russ around? Sure, he's in there sleeping. He's got a night job, remember? Hmm. I guess I'll come back later. What's your rush, Hanson? You can wait, and you don't have to wait standing up. Okay. Thanks, Myra. Not over there. Sit down here. Over there? 
okay, if you don't mind. <sighs> Jonesy. Huh? Yeah, ma'am? Remember at the bar last night I was telling you about that dress? Yeah, yeah, it sounds nice. You couldn't let me have another 200, could you? Well... I know I owe you so much already, but you'll get it back, every cent. Well, it's not the dough, my You've got the 200, haven't you? Sure, I, I got it, but... But what? Look, I, I told you before, Russ wouldn't like me giving you money. You know he oh, wouldn't. Oh, you don't have to be afraid of Russ. I wouldn't tell him anything about you and me. I'd like to get that dress today, Jonesy. Okay. You can have your 200. Ah, oh, <laughs> Jonesy. I knew you wouldn't let me down. I just knew it. Myra, you... You belong to Russ. Now, Russ is a good-looking guy. He can talk and... And what? Skip it. You got the papers around any place? Maybe they got something in about the job. Oh, no, don't. Don't you think... Oh. No, Jonesy. All right. Hi, Russ. Well, what's on your mind, Jonesy? Uh, nothing important, Russ. I just want to tell you 8, eight o'clock is okay with Preble. He'll meet us at the chili parlor. 8 o'clock's fine. Oh, good. Uh, did he say anything about last night's job? <laughs> did he? He's really sold on this scientific stuff. Really sold. I uh, think I'd better run along. What's your hurry? Why, I've got something to do. You got some coffee brewing, Jonesy. No, thanks. Uh, see you tonight at the chili parlor. So long, Jonesy. Bye. Well, did you have a nice nap? Lay off Jonesy, will you, Myra? What are you talking about? Well, anybody can see the guy goes for you like a ton of bricks. You've been taking dough off him again. So what? You won't give it to me. I'm entitled to go look. Look all you want, baby, but just stay away from my boys. Want them to keep their mind on business. What do you think you are giving me orders? I'll show you who I think I am. Let go. Now stop playing with Jonesy. I'll start on you, and I won't be playing. Captain Hanson talking. Hello, Captain. Sergeant Keel. Look, I'm with the chief engineer of the Euclid Safe Manufacturing. Well, what does he have to say? Nobody, he says. Nobody could open that new safe of theirs without blowing the door off. Did you tell him he was wrong? Did I? And I showed him the pictures, too. He still says that new model safe combination has silent tumblers and nobody could hear them drop. He says it looks like an inside job. And I'm about ready to believe him. Is there any way at all to open that safe without the combination? Yeah, just a minute, I'll ask him. Is there any way to open that safe without the combination? The captain wants to know. Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, he says they tested it, Captain, and the only way it could be done was you could hear the tumblers drop if you had a supersonic listening device. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, Captain, but what kind of a burglar carries a supersonic, whatever you call it? I don't know, Sergeant, but come on back to the office. We'll see if we can find out. So, Don, as the gang of criminals led by Russ Enfield prepared to extend their scientific safe-cracking venture still farther... New York City detectives had obtained their first inkling to their method of operation. It was the beginning of a long trail that didn't end until the threat of death lurked on both sides of a skyscraper skylight. Now, back to gangbusters. You were telling us, Chief Sullivan, that the uh, criminal Russ Enfield led his gang in a number of successful safe crackings by using such modern instruments as supersonic listing devices and walkie-talkie apparatus to warn of approaching trouble. That's right, Don. And New York City detectives had an idea of what was going on and were proceeding with their investigation. One night shortly before starting on a safe burglar they had planned, Russ Enfield had just finished dinner with his confederates and the girl Myra at the chili parlor the gang patronized. Listen, Russ, boss or no boss, is the last time I go for this Mexican food can kill you. Yeah, it's like olives. you got to learn to like this stuff. And you will if you got a stomach left. Well, what's the matter with Mexican food? I like it. Okay, Jonesy, it's getting late. Drive Myra home, will you? Yeah, Russ, right, sure. Yeah, I thought you were taking me on this one. A dame's place is home. Who asked you? One home, will you? Come on, Myra. Now hurry back here, Jonesy. Preble and I will have the whole thing gone over. Well, yeah. uh, have a good time, boys. Let's go, Jonesy. Yeah, sure. Hello. I'll see you later, Jonesy. Yeah. I, uh... 
Got the car parked right outside, man. That's sweet of you, Jim. Look, my I want to talk to you. Now, about... wait, wait, wait. Wait till we get outside. Okay. I'll get the door. Hey, when I'm not Night, Miguel. Mm. Got warmer. Yeah. Where's the car? It's right there. Look, my right. Yeah. Your new dress looks nice on. Uh, does it? Glad you like it. Oh, wait a minute, Myra. When is the payoff going to be? Junkie, I told you you'd get it back every cent. Eight hundred, isn't it? When a guy gives dough to a dame, she means something to him, Myra. Oh, Jones, you mean something to me, too, but I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared of Russ. Well, I'm not scared. Come here. Oh, Jones, please. If Russ ever thought... Come on, kids. You're having a good time? Yeah, Russ. An awful good time. What's the idea? No, wait a minute, Russ. Don't get thinking anything. We Shut don't... up. Come on, Russ. If you want to argue about it, I'm willing to argue. You think I ought to get socked? Try it. You're not going to get hit, Jonesy. Not you. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait, nothing, Mara. I told you to cut this out. Russ, no, don't shut up. You had not have done that, Russ. She had it coming. Did I? I said you had not have done that, Russ. Come on, Mara. Grab a cab and get home. I'll take her home. You do what I tell you. Juan Myra, start walking. Don't you ever lay a hand on me again. You didn't have to hit her, Russ. You listen to me, Jonesy. Myra's no dame for you. If you want a girl, go get somebody else. Ain't that up to Myra? It's up to me. I came out to tell you to pick up an extra 20-foot extension cord for that job tonight. Now get it before we start something that we can't finish. Yeah. An extra 20-foot extension cord. Well, get going. We haven't got all night. Don't worry about Myra. I'll take care of her. Let me get this straight, Commander. You say these are all the types of supersonic listening devices that are Navy equipment? That's right, Captain Hanson. There are two or three other types, later developments, but they're still secret. They all look pretty bulky. Except this one portable job. The Army had some types of their own, you know. Yes, I know. I checked with the Army. Uh. That one's sensitive enough to enable a man using it to hear the tumblers in a safe combination drop. I've heard of instances where it was used during the war by the OSS and intelligence on certain missions in occupied territory, and quite successfully, too. I don't suppose these devices have too many industrial uses? No, Captain, not too many. Wouldn't be too difficult to trace all sales of them through the War Assets Administration. Well, when I leave here, Commander, that's exactly where I'm going. Come on, Myra, come on, open up this door. Right. Open up or I'll push it in. Okay. You're all right. I'm going to be bothered by... All right, what do you want? What are you packing for? Where are you going? I decided a long time ago. No guy's going to slug me in and have me sit around to take his abuse. You sit around as long as I want you around. Hand me that pair of shoes. They go in too. Listen to me. <laughs> you hang that stuff back in the closet or I'll give you going over. You'll never forget. Don't you have something to say about that? I told you to stay away from Jonesy. Right, you stop. You'll do what I tell you. <laughs> you'll stay away from Jonesy. Get that through that head of yours. Now go on, hang that stuff up. All right. Put it that way. Yes, sir. Step right in. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I understand you handle a lot of war surplus. He understands I handle a lot of war surplus. Mister, this store handles so much war surplus, I'm thinking of stopping my own army. <laughs> what would you like? We got pup tents, jeep tents, barrack tents, sailor suits, soldier suits, diver suits. Oh, uh, okay, okay. If you got any portable supersonic listening devices. If we got any portable supersonic listening devices, sure we got them. Right this way. Thanks, Telling you we got a portable supersonic listening device that likes it, which you've never seen. And they've been going like hotcakes, too. Everybody wants one, everyone. Yeah? Uh, sure. We run them in, run them out by the carload. Hey, take a look at this little number. My name is Sergeant Keel, safe and loft squad. Oh, well, you don't say. It's a sergeant, huh? That's right. How many of these things did you buy from the War Assets Administration? Let me see. Ten, I think. They came with a job lot of other merchandise. Ten, yeah, ten. And they've been going like hotcakes? Well, 
Not exactly. I saw one. One. Do you remember who bought it? Do I remember who bought it? I never forget a customer. Maybe sometimes I can't remember the face, but I never forget a customer. We got a record someplace. Uh, I'm going back and see what I can find out. Now, if you want to look around some of our fine merchandise for your own use, go ahead. Don't touch nothing over there. No, thanks. I think I'll just go in back and help you look. And then he hit you again. Huh? Yeah. But that's not the worst part of it, Jones. He's... Like now, I can't even go to the beauty parlor without an escort. I'd like to help you, Myra, but what's the use? Nothing in it for me. You just run back to Russ. I hate him, Joe. You don't know how much I hate him. Then what are you sticking with him for? I'm scared. I'm scared to death he'll kill me. Jonesy. Hmm? There is a way. A way for what? For you and me. I thought you were scared of Russ. I suppose there was no Russ to be scared of. Now, wait a minute. Listen to me, Jonesy. That's safe tonight. There ought to be twelve, fifteen thousand 15,000 in it. So? You and I could do a lot with 15,000, Jonesy. An awful lot. Yeah, maybe we could. Russ told me he's taking both of you and Preble up into the place with him. I'm going to stay in the car. What about Preble? He don't mean nothing to you, does he? Not much, no. Okay, then. Okay, what? When the safe gets open and you've got the money, that's the time. Both of them, I, I don't know. Well, you I... don't have to, you know, if you can do without me. Well, now, look, Myra. But it's... if you don't kill him, Jonesy, we'll never get a chance, you and me. Never. Think of it. Fifteen thousand. Yeah, Myra. Yeah, I want that chance. Captain Hanson. Oh, Captain. Sergeant Keel. Oh, yes, Sergeant. How'd you make out? Well, it looks like this Russ Enfield's the guy, Captain. Got a pair of hoodlums for sidekicks. One of them is Joe Preble. Just finished 7 to 12 in Sing Sing. Good. I want them tailed, Sergeant. I want the man tailing each one of them every minute. Let's get him in the act of committing one of these safe burglaries. How about it, Sergeant? Been able to raise the captain? They're ringing now. Sergeant Keel, Captain. I'm talking from a call box on the corner of 93rd and 2nd. Russ Enfield and both his sidekicks just now broke into a building here. Oh, what about the girl? She's waiting in a car. And look, Captain, there's a finance company on the top floor of that building. That's probably what they're after. They got help on the way? Yes, sir, plenty. Okay, grab us to come out. Right, sir. And I'm on my way. I'll be there as soon as I can. So long. Captain's on his way, Riley. Good, good. Now, look. That office is on the top floor. As I remember, most of these buildings around here have got skylights. Want to go up and have a look? Yeah, the watchman at that loft next door let us up and we can cut over his roof. Okay. We'll tell Gordon to get the men posted as soon as they get here. Let's go. Come on, Jonesy. We've been here long enough. Come on, let's get packed up and going. Cabo? I'm set. You know, Russ, I wouldn't be surprised if that adds up to 15 grand. Yeah, we'll see what it adds up to when we count it. Now, come on, get that stuff together. Russ. What? Myra told me you hit her again. What business is that of yours? It's my business, all right. Is it? I told you, you hadn't ought to go around hitting people, especially Myra. Oh, forget it. Get that stuff together. Sorry, Russ, but Myra said okay. you don't move, Russ. Hey, what's the idea? You too, Preble. Up, up. Put that gun up, you dope, before I... Get... Okay. All right, hands up. Both. Okay, don't shoot. Drop that gun. Okay, don't shoot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not me, you don't get. Stop, you hog. Not me, you don't right. get. No. Not me, you rotten. Right. 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 No, it's rotten. Now, look, Copper, look. Just take it easy. I got it, Sergeant. All right. All right. There wasn't any sense running, Russ. All right. You've gotten yourself killed. A scientific mind like yours had a reason we'd have every exit covered. Okay, turn around and walk back to the safe. I want to look that job over. That dawn was how Russ Enfield and his gang learned that not even a clever application of up-to-date scientific instruments can beat the law. They were all sentenced to long terms, which they are now serving in various New York state penitentiaries.
Well, I was amazed, Chief Sullivan, that such equipment as supersonic listening devices could be purchased by burglars. Well, they can't anymore, Don. Because of requests by law enforcement officials and for other reasons, the sale of supersonic equipment was frozen by the War Assets Administration several months ago. Well, thank you, Chief Sullivan, for this extraordinary case history. And congratulations to all the New York City detectives who had a hand in breaking up this dangerous gang of safe burglars. There he goes, into the drugstore. He's stepping on the stairs. Weight, 241 pounds. Fortune, danger. Who is the fat man? best is a sucker's fat time. And the schmo who makes a steady diet of it ought to take a course in simple mathematics. He's got a better chance of striking oil in his own backyard than he has of winning a sweepstakes. And if he thinks he can outguess a roulette ball, he's a real dreamer. But the gent who gambles with someone else's life is the biggest chump of all. Because his high OUs are never marked paid in full until he gets the chair for... Murder. That's the Fat Man. A fast-moving criminologist who dips the scales at 241 pounds. Brought to you by the Norwich Pharmacal Company, makers of Pepto, the Fat Man, starring J. Scott Smart. In tonight's adventure, Murder Wins the Draw. Happy tourist goes to Central America, he usually runs into nothing more dangerous than a good cup of coffee and a fried banana. But with me, it's different. If there's trouble around, it always walks right up and pokes me in the eye. However, this particular form of trouble wasn't hard to look at. She had the kind of legs you see in the hosiery ads, and a profile to match. But when she grabbed my arm in the airport at married a Yucatan... I had a hunch that although the mistake was hers, I was the one who lived to regret it. Darling. What? Oh, Angel, I was so worried you'd miss our plane. Have your bags checked, Alan. We don't have too much time. The name happens to be Runyon. Oh, Porter. Porter, those suitcases. Wave them in at counter seven. The plane for Guatemala City. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to New Orleans. You're going to Guatemala City, dearest, with me. And here's your ticket. She pushed something into my hand and led me to a counter. When I opened my palm, I saw it was a roll of $50 bills. But it was the anguished look of terror on her face that stopped me from brushing her off. Twenty minutes later, I was heading south to Guatemala City and wondering why. Okay. Okay, what? Let's have the gimmick. I'm afraid I owe you an apology. I've made a slight mistake. Well, don't let it worry you. I'm used to boarding planes that fly in the wrong direction. I like to take the long way home. How can you ever forgive me, Mr. Runyon? Let's dispense with the syrup, sweetheart. I'd prefer an explanation. I made a mistake. We'll let it go at that. You've been paid for your trouble. There was over $500 in that roll. I have nothing more to say, so leave me alone. She wasn't kidding. All the way to Guatemala, she kept staring out the window, and I could have gotten more conversation from a dummy. She was the first one out of her seat when we landed at the airport, and she'd finished with her baggage inspection by the time I reached the customs counter. But as the porter put my suitcase on the counter next to her, she suddenly grabbed my arm again and went into the old refrain. Darling! This is where I came in. Oh, darling, we'll be late. 
Ask that customs agent to look at your suitcase. They were in a hurry. Once is enough, sweetheart. No encore. But, dearest, we have an appointment at the hotel. Please, don't be Helen, difficult. I'm looking for you. Oh, hello. Who's the fat guy, Helen? He's here to protect me. Don't hand me that. Get your bag. Helen, don't. You're hurting my arm. Your bag. Just a second, Miss. You'll keep out of this. Helen, please. Please don't start any trouble. I'll come with you. All right, Porter, grab that suitcase and let's get out of here. Uh-huh. I reserve the room at the hotel grand for you, Helen. All right, all right. Senor? Uh, huh? Customs Inspector Senor, you will please open your suitcase. Oh, oh sure. Uh, nothing in here but my personal things. <laughs> Is that so, Senor? <laughs> What's so funny? The next time you buy a girdle, Senor, you might try a larger size. Now, wait a minute. Put your silk night gowns are exquisite. <laughs> this is not my suitcase. <laughs> there are no apologies necessary, Senor. I'm happy to see you are wearing the new look. Stop <laughs> killing yourself and give me an exit stamp, Chico. I'm taking those nylons back where they belong. <laughs> I checked into the Hotel Grand about half an hour later and gave the desk clerk a description of the gal who grabbed me at the airport and who was now in possession of my shirt and shorts. He gave me a room number and a little bellhop escorted me upstairs with a running account of the natural wonders of Guatemala City. And the girls, senor. Ah, we have so many beautiful girls. And Pedro can arrange for you to meet the best. Who's Pedro? At your service. At this way. Uh, let's go in the other direction. But your room is 65. Right now, I'm looking for 78. Well, that room is already occupied, senor. And hey, look, Pedro, don't argue. Lug that bag to 78. Whatever you say, senor. Now, there it is, right across the hall. See. Si. There is no one inside, Senor. You got a pass key, haven't you? But this is very irregular. Uh, how about this? <laughs> For a slight fee, Senor, almost anything is regular. I have a key, of course. There you are, Senor. The room, as I told you, is occupied. You're right, Pedro. It's occupied by a corpse. Thank you. <laughs> The corpse was a woman I'd never seen before, quietly dressed and about 40 years of age. She was sitting in a rocker, pinned against the back by the blade of a three-foot machete. The security police identified the woman by her tourist card. Her name was Alice Vinson, and her home was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The motive wasn't petty theft because her cash was in her handbag. And one look at a prematurely aged, not too attractive face convinced me it couldn't have been a crime of jealousy. Along about 11, I tried to get some sleep. But I hadn't even got my shoes off when my phone started ringing. Yes? Mr. Runyon? You were speaking to him. I hope I didn't wake you. No, no, not at all, sweetheart. Well, this is Helen. You remember, don't you? Oh, sure, I remember. You're one little number I'll never forget. I'm afraid there was a mix-up at the airport. Yeah, a little switcheroo. You've got my suitcase, Mr. Runyon, and I've got yours. I only wish I had your nerve. What? Did you check into room 78 at the Hotel Grand tonight? Why, uh, I know. They've got you listed on the register, baby, and so the Guatemalan cop. Well, I haven't done anything. Anyway, I've called you about something more important. Really? I want my suitcase back. Well, come over and get it. Well, that's, that's rather difficult right now. Can you come to me? It'll be a pleasure. What's the address? I'm calling from a public booth. I'll pick you up on the corner of 12th and Avenida Marcos in 15 minutes. Is that convenient? Very. And you have the suitcase with you? Tucked right under my chubby little arm. Oh, and then I'll see you in 15 minutes, Mr. Runyon. And thank you ever so much for being so obliging. All right, all right, keep the shirt on. Well. Senor Ronnie? Yes? I would like to talk to you, senor. Alone. She couldn't have been more than five feet tall with the delicate features of a doll. Her voice was like sugar cane, and when she smiled, it reminded you of a Caribbean moon. A nickel-plated short barrel thirty-eight revolver in one of her neatly manicured hands completed the picture. Sit down, senor. Thanks. And please don't move. 
It would be rude of me to blow your brains out, no? To say nothing of the inconvenience. Where is the suitcase? What suitcase? The one you will produce for me before I kill you? Oh, oh, that one. I have no time for the stall, senor. The suitcase, por favor. In that closet. Gracias. And now, senor, if you will turn around and face the wall. What are we playing? Push in the corner? Turn, senor. Gracias. No. As I said before, she couldn't have been over five feet tall, and she was as delicate as a doll. But when she brought the butt of that rod down on the back of my skull, it was like playing patty cake with a pile driver. I must have been out for half an hour, and when I started to come around, my head seemed to be rattling like a couple of dice cubes. But as my eyes slowly came into focus, the dice cube changed the footsteps, and I realized that someone was casing my room. When I opened one eye, I could spot his number 12 shoes as they passed back and forth six inches from my nose. I bided my time until my strength started flowing back. Then, as he passed me once more, I reached out and grabbed his ankle. Hey, easy, Nurse. Just as soon as I check your pocket. Don't be just stupid ears. Oh, quiet, sweetheart. What do you think you're doing? I said quiet. Hey, that's better. Now, get up and talk this thing over. Making a big mistake. Yeah, sure, I know. Everybody seems to be making mistakes in this part of the world. Where's Helen? I don't know who you mean. You're the man who met her at the airport, the guy she called Alan. My name is Runyon, and I'm in a very bad mood, so start making some sense. Okay, okay. I only came here to get our suitcase. She said you delivered, you never showed up. Well, I'm all ready to keep that appointment now. Where's the bag? Don't tell me you didn't find it. Stop calling me, Runyon. This is no laughing matter. Alice Vincent would have testified to that along about the time someone stuck a machete in her chest. What? You didn't know? Not what I know. Look, Runyon, is that suitcase really gone? How do you think I collected this lump on my skull? She got here ahead of you. Like a lying little tramp, she crossed me again. What makes that suitcase so valuable, Alan? That's my business. But if you want to play ball, I'll make it worth your while. Are you open to a proposition? We'll talk it over on the way to the security police. I'll be a sap running. You got nothing on me. The only thing you can hold me for is room breaking. Is that all that interests you? Frankly, no. I'm looking for bigger fish to fry. All right, here's your chance. I played along with that double crossing female once too often. If she's open for a murder rap, I don't want any part of her. What's your proposition, mister? It involves a quarter of a million bucks. Mm, a lot of zeros. A hundred and twenty five grand for each of us, Runyon. Do I deal in, pal? Start shuffling the cards. Okay. Then follow me. Well, this is a mighty peculiar fat man, Kate. Now let's catch up with the fat man. Guatemala City at night is one of the quietest places in the world. The streets are dark and lonely, and you can count the strollers, if any, on the fingers of one hand. I didn't trust this loudmouth Allen guy any further than I could see him, and when he stepped into the shadows of an open doorway, I almost jumped him. But then I saw him bend over a figure huddled on the step. Lo siento, señor. No ha regresado todavía. Gracias. The old woman says Helen hasn't come back yet. You suppose she ran out on you? No, she's got to come back. I got her passport and tourist cards. She can't leave this country without it. You still haven't told me what's inside that suitcase. Why should I tell you? You can grab hold of it yourself and cross me, too. You'll work with me and we'll split 50-50. That's the deal. Okay, what's next on the list? Well, I'm waiting here for Helen. I got a room on the second floor. I thought you stopped at the Grand. Well, sometimes it doesn't hurt to have more than one address. Tell you what, Ronnie, you go back to your hotel room and I'll call you when she gets here. I can handle this gal alone. And let you run out on me? Well, you shouldn't be so suspicious. Would I have told you this much if I wasn't on the level? When will I hear from you? 
The minute Helen showed. Okay, Alan. I'll be waiting for your call. I could almost feel his wiseacre grin on the nape of my neck as I turned and walked away. But that grin would have turned a little sour if he could have read my mind. The lobby was empty when I reached the hotel. But I found the boy I was looking for asleep in a chair near the vacant bar. Pedro. Hmm? Pedro, Pedro, Hello. wake up. Oh, oh, senor, what can I do for you? I'm looking for company. Oh, a girl to talk to, senor, to dance with, perhaps? What do you got to offer? Guatemala is full of lovely women, senor. Lolita, Conchita, Chiquita, Malita, I know them all, senor. The gal I'm looking for is about five feet tall. She wears her hair in a bun on the back of her neck, and she's very easy on the eyes. Ah, you all the girls are easy on the eyes, senor. This one's got a small birthmark on her cheek. Looks like a triangle. Well, that would be Lolita. You have picked the most beautiful in the city. Uh, can I meet her? Si, sí, senor. Where? At the Club Cantale. A nightclub? It's a place where you can dance for ten centavos. Oh. She works there, huh? Si, sí, Lolita is very popular with the boys. Yes, yeah, she would be with her lovely disposition. You know where is the Club Cantale? No. Suppose you trot along with me, Pedro, and introduce us. Uh... Club Cantale was a tough little joint in the seedier part of town. The kind of place that supplied dance hostesses for the customers. Half a dozen girls were lined up at the bar when Pedro and I walked in, and I recognized the cutie and clipped me. I turned my back and sat down at a table as Pedro went over to talk to her. He said a few words, then brought her over to where I was sitting. I turned around just as she reached the table... And you could have knocked her over with an eyebrow pencil. Hello, Lolita. Oh, don't you recognize me? No. Take a look at this lump on my head. It might refresh your memory. You know each other, senor? And how? You can go back to your snooze now, Pedro. I'll carry on from here. Uh, senor, before I leave, I have some lottery tickets. All very good numbers, senor. I sell them as a sideline, no? So does everyone else in Central America. No, I'm not playing the lottery, a lottery, Pedro. Take this five and beat it. And Lolita, this is number. Get out of here, stupid. Hey, wait a minute, Pedro. Leave that ticket on the table. Here, uh, keep the change. Gracias, señor. Muchas gracias. What's the matter, Lolita? Nothing. This lottery ticket bother you? What do you want? I want to know where the suitcase is and why you grabbed it. I don't know what you're talking about. Lolita, I understand the tourist trade is appreciated here in Guatemala. I don't think the cops would like it if I told them you ran around slugging their better customers with revolver butts. Oh, and there's also a little matter of murder, Lolita. Murder? Now, it's funny how that word gets a double take from everyone. Were you an innocent bystander, too? Senor, I will make you a proposition. Go right ahead. I've been getting them all night long. How would you like to share a fortune with Lolita? Between you and this Alan character, I'm getting to be a wealthy guy. Alan? Skip it and keep talking. Do you know what was in that suitcase I took from your room? I didn't up to now, but I think I can guess it. Uh, was it a lottery ticket, Lolita? The winning number for the Grand National. 250,000 quetzales. The Grand, she stole it. Helen? Si. Who owned the ticket first? This I do not know. Then how did you find out about it? In the hotel lobby. I hear that blonde girl on the tall gringo talk. She squeezed her arm and she said the ticket is in her suitcase. Then she finds out the suitcase is not hers. The one she has is missing. Oh, then what? Well, they both leave the hotel to go back to the airport for the bag. Five minutes later, you walk in. I see you have a bag that looks like the other one. And I hear her say something about a fat man. So you decided to climb on the bandwagon yourself? This is the truth, Senor Ronnie. Where's the suitcase now? In my dressing room. But something is wrong. I, I search for an hour and I do not find the ticket. Maybe you didn't look for it in the right places. Well, this time you'll get some help from me. <laughs> If her story was straight, I was beginning to get an idea of how the late Alice Vincent was mixed up in it. All I had to do now was to make sure I didn't walk right into what Alice did. Lolita's dressing room was in back of the club, and when we stepped inside, we ran into an unexpected guest. It was Helen, the girl with the taking ways. And she was bending over the leather suitcase with a pin knife in her hand. What are you doing in my room? I was just waiting to talk to you. You have no right to search my suitcase. Your suitcase? 
It happens to belong to me, you little tree. Don't you tell me Take it thing. easy, girls. Take it easy. The party's young yet. Oh, I should have known you were working with her. You're as big a crook as she is. You mind if I see what you just cut out of that suitcase lining? I don't know what you mean. Uh, she has a ticket. It was in the lining and she has it in her hand. Turn it over, Alan. Not a chance. You stole that winning ticket from Alice Vincent. Well, she can't prove it. It's not registered in her name. Whoever turns it in collects the money, and I'm the one who's turning it in. You're right about one thing. Alice Vincent can't prove it. She's dead. Huh? Dead? And if you try to turn that ticket in, baby, you'll get the squeeze for her murder. Oh, you're just bluffing me. I didn't kill her. She took me on as a traveling companion in New York. When I left her a couple of days ago in Merida, she was alive. You were in hot water right up to your pretty neck, Helen, and it's beginning to boil. All right. So then I'll... I'll make you a proposition, Runyon. Hold your hat, boys. We'll split on this ticket 50 50. We don't have to fight about it. We can both be rich. And what about me? You. You can drop dead. I. I yeah, well, I'll spit in your face. In my way. Have a good time, girls, and remember no fighting in the kitchen. <laughs> They were scratching their initials in each other's skin as I closed the door behind me, holding the lottery ticket Helen had dropped when Lolita opened with her first right cross. Fifteen minutes later, I was climbing the stairs to Alan's furnished room, where I found him pacing the floor like a hungry coyote. You didn't come back yet, Runyon. It's all right, sweetheart, I found her. You did? Yeah, and I've got the lottery ticket you were so cagey about. Let me have it. Not so fast. I'm entitled to a little explanation in as much as I'm an active partner. What kind of an explanation do you want? Helen stole that ticket. She was supposed to split with me, but she ducked out the Yucatan. That's why she grabbed me at the airport. She thought you might follow her. I wasn't even there when she left. I know that. You'd left for Guatemala on Alice Vincent's trail. She was going back to collect on her winning ticket, and she probably never even knew your girlfriend, Helen, had grabbed it until she got to Guatemala City. You need that ticket running, you're wasting time. I'm in no hurry. Listen to the rest of my story. Before. Interesting. You didn't know that Helen had stolen the ticket either until you maneuvered Alice Vincent into that hotel room and jabbed her with a machete. Wait a second. Then you caught on, and you decided to wait at the airport to grab your ex-partner. You knew she had to get here sometime to collect her dough. You must be nuts, Runyon. I didn't murder Vincent. No? No. Then who did? Helen. Naturally. But she couldn't have. She never even came up to her hotel room. You both found out she had the long suitcase in the lobby and you went back to the airport. I found the body before she could have returned. And what does that add up to? It adds up to this, honey. Alice Vincent was murdered before your gal friend even landed here. She was stabbed in a room which you reserved in Helen's name. Helen didn't have to kill for that ticket, mister. She already had it. But you didn't know that, so you knocked off Alice Vincent and then found out you only wasted a lot of time. What are you trying to do? Grab that money for yourself? I'm turning that lottery ticket over to the government, sweetheart. And from there, it goes to Alice Vincent's estate. Are you crazy? I thought you said we were partners. I don't hold hands with a guy who's three feet from a Guatemalan firing squad. You're the last one who's going to cross me, (laughs) Runyon. You ought to know better than to draw on a man with his hand in his pocket. But you were never too lucky when it came to a draw in any case, mister. The number you picked on the last one is up. Thanks for everything, boss. Maybe I can repay the favor sometime. Maybe I can do something for you, like cutting your throat. W.O.R. presents the distinguished American actor, Walter Hamden, in The Adventures of Leonidas Witherall. Tonight's adventure, The Corpse Meets the Deadline. Leonidas Witherall is the New England schoolmaster who looks like Shakespeare and is always getting mixed up in murders. At the moment... Mr. Witherall has gone to the city desk of the Dalton Herald. It's a very urgent mission on behalf of his housekeeper, Mrs. Mullet. And Leonidas, along with Mrs. M., is explaining it to the Herald's editor, Mr. Forrest. Uh, you see, Forrest... Uh, yes, Leonidas? Uh, Mrs. Mullet here is... Uh, uh, what's your title, Mrs. Mullet? I'm director of public relations for the Dalton's Ladies' Aid and Get-Together Society. Early Wednesday afternoon group, Section 2. Leaving on track 7? 
And our group's holding a special meeting tomorrow. They're having a guest lecturer, Forrest. Oh, really? Who is it? We're having Mrs. Hildegard Fish, who wrote South American Question Mark and Balkan Riddle. She's going to speak on Russia, Russia, what does it mean? Completely baffled, isn't she? And you want us to mention it in the Herald, huh? Mention it? Well, if you could uh, eliminate the news about General Eisenhower and General Patton and just turn, say, uh, ten columns over to Mrs. Mullet's group, Forrest. Uh... Aside from Mrs. Fish, we're having an election and our spring tea dance. Going to be a big day. All right, Mrs. Mullet. We'll see that you get all the space you deserve. Mm. How's that, Mrs. Mullet? I told you we could persuade Mr. Forrest. Persuade him? Why, he should be glad. I'm giving him a scoop. Oh, I am, Mrs. Mullet. We don't often get a break like this. There you are, Forrest. Mr. Bennett. Hello, Mr. Bennett. Hello, Mr. Forrest, Bennett. you're a stupid, irresponsible, cheap, yellow journalist. Now, look, Bennett, all I did... Look at this paper of yours. Look at that picture. On the front page, too. I told you not to print that horrible picture of my daughter. There's no harm in that. Running this picture of that rotten gambling den with all those crooks there at the table, my daughter. I can't help it if your daughter visits gambling joints, Bennett. The girl's just 18 years old. She went out on a date. She's no idea where they were going. Just the same, she was there. She wanted to leave the minute they got to that... That evil, iniquitous place. But she didn't leave. The cops came in and our man got the picture. It's not our fault that she's in it. Well, Forrest, I told you yesterday not to print it. Sorry, Bennett. It was the only shot we had, and a good one, too. Oh, you've ruined my daughter's reputation. You've disgraced her. Oh, don't be such a blue nose, Bennett. Now, if you don't mind, I'm busy. I've got an addition to get out. I ought to thrash you, Forrest. I oh. ought to treat you the way my grandfather handled a smart aleck newspaper man out west. He got a horse whip, and he whipped that editor within an inch of his life. If you don't watch your tongue, Bennett... I'll have you thrown out of this office. Oh, you wouldn't dare. Uh, no, 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 Mr. Bennett. I, I don't want to interfere, but uh, perhaps if you'd uh, cool off... You keep your beard out of this, with Witherall. And you mind your tongue, Mr. Bennett. Forrest, you filthy... Get away from this desk, Bennett. Just let me get my hands on you... your throat, Forrest. Mr. Mr. Bennett, the I'm going voice. to show you. Uh, let go of me, brother. Mr. Bennett, uh, take your hands off. I will... Don't you let go of him, Mr. Bennett. Oh, come I on, Mr. Bennett, or I'll... All right. All right. All right. You crazy fool. Get out of here. I warn you. All right, Forrest, I'm getting out now. But this isn't the end of it. Go on. I'll yes. see that justice is done, Forrest. I'll see that you're taken care of no matter how far I have to go. Hmm. Looks as though Mr. Bennett's going to be a very serious problem, Forrest. Oh, him, Leonidas? No, I'm... I'm used to that. He seems to be extremely excitable. No, you've got him all wrong. Sure, he'll <laughs> rave and rant for a while, write letters, and then he'll calm down. Well, I hope so. It doesn't seem as trivial as that, though. I know Bennett. He's a very headstrong old gentleman. And your printing that picture has defiled his little child's good name. Oh, forget it, Leonidas. Oh, come on. I, I don't often have you down here. Suppose I show you and Mrs. Mullet around the place. Uh, feel like uh, touring the plant? Oh, I'd love to. Lead uh, on, MacDuff. I'd like to see the room where the news tickers are. Mr. Mullet knew a lot about news, you know. He had a definition of news, Mr. Witherall. Uh, was it by any chance about uh, a dog? Well, that's right. He said that when a dog bites a man, that's not news. But when a man bites a dog... Uh, tell me. Yes? Anyone ever take a good bite out of Mr. Mullet? Well, how did you know? Uh, these are the linotype machines, Leonidas. Oh, well, quite a formidable array of them, Forrest. Yeah. Could we go over to one of them and get a closer look? Oh, sure. Come on. Uh, Pat Welch over there will explain his machine to you. Uh, Pat. Yes, Mr. Forrest? Uh, let up a second, Pat. We have visitors. This is Mr. Witherall and, um, Mrs. Mullet. How do you well, do? How do you do? Uh, Pat here was once a publisher himself. No, really? Yes, but... I don't talk about it much. Uh, Pat had an unpleasant experience. Uh, lost his paper. It was very sad, Leonidas. Uh, terribly sad. The machines worked like a big typewriter, you see. You push the keys and they cut letters on what we call lead slugs. Yes, uh, Pat had big ideas once, but he, um, he had to learn. The lead isn't wasted. After we print the paper, it's melted down again. Of course, uh, lots of us have to learn. We all make mistakes. It's evident, Forrest, that Pat would rather not talk about his old career. Now, uh, where do you melt down the lead? Oh, we have it in those big cauldrons. Uh, you see them on the platform up there? Uh, they're right over your head. Oh, yes. You see the steam coming off? Well, that's piping hot lead in that cauldron, boiling like a noodle soup. Ah, noodle soup. Get that, Mrs. <laughs> yes. Mother? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, the slugs are melted right in there, you see, and then we cool it and feed it down to the machine. Oh, where are the presses? That's another thing I want to see. Oh, we'll go there now. We're running an edition, so you'll see the whole works. Running an edition? 
Well, shouldn't we do something first about my story, the ladies' literary group? Oh, yes, Forrest. Mrs. Mullet would like you to stop the presses for it. Oh, we'll get it in the next edition, Mrs. Mullet. I put our top reporter on the job. Uh, Jackie Bigelow, the minute I get back upstairs. Oh. Jackie's our best man, you know. You'll do your story for You sent for me, Mr. Forrest? Yes, Jackie. I just left Leandis with her all. He had some woman with him. And Mrs. Mullins. Mullins, yeah, I know her. Sort of a neighborhood housekeeper up around the Birch Hill section. Yes, well, she's having a taffy pull for a ladies' club. Get one of the kids out front to call it Witheralls. Get the whole story. Write a couple of sticks for the three star. All right. That's all, Jackie. You can go. That's all as far as you're concerned, Forrest, yes, but... I want to do a little talking. This is just as good a time as any. Well, hurry up. I've got a desk full of copy here. Uh Uh-huh. You know what it's about? about a phone conversation you had with Cosmopolitan Syndicate. Oh, that wasn't anything. Oh, that wasn't anything, huh? I worked for six months to get Cosmopolitan to make me that offer. You wouldn't have enjoyed being a foreign correspondent, Jackie, especially in Chungking. It's tough grind. Thank you. I wouldn't, huh? That just happens to be why I got into this newspaper racket. All my life I've wanted to be a foreign correspondent. You knew that. They asked me for a frank opinion, Jackie. I told them I thought you were a pretty fair reporter. Don't lie to me, Forrest. You told them I was a punk reporter. I found out. You did that for one reason. Because you're naturally a louse. What an imagination you've got, Jackie. You didn't want to lose a good man yourself. These days, that's tough, isn't it? Well, you cut it. I couldn't get into this man's war the regular way. The army turned me down. You knew that, too. You knew I'd been eating my heart out covering this small town junk. Or just Mm -hmm. a little way down the railroad tracks, the whole bloody world's on fire. Still the velocity. You killed my chance, Forrest. I'll never get out of this town now. It might be a year, two years, maybe forever. That was my one big chance, and you fixed it, so I'd miss the boat. Lay off, Jackie. I'm going to... You heard me. Lay off. City desk, Forrest. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. Get into that jalopy of yours and beat it over to the Perkins shipyards. Burning up. Three alarms have gone out. Okay, I'm on my way. And thanks, Forrest. Thanks for everything. Maybe I can do something for you sometime. Like cutting your throat. <laughs> What can I do for you, Mr. Bennett? Well, I've come here to your place, Mr. Witherall, to apologize for my behavior this morning at the Herald office. It uh, was uh, deplorable, Mr. Bennett. But, of course, uh, you felt printing that picture of your daughter was very embarrassing. That's just the point. I wanted to apologize to you, but I certainly don't intend to retract anything I said to Forrest. In fact, I want your help. Really, Mr. Bennett? Isn't this uh, much ado about nothing? As the poet said, you have too much respect upon the world... They lose it to buy it with much care. Mr. Witherall, I realize that legally I haven't a leg to stand on. So I decided the best thing to do is to blacklist that newspaper. Mr. Bennett, I hardly think your personal grudge against Mr. Forrest justifies organizing a huge boycott. Oh, but it does. That man has to learn that tactics like his won't be tolerated in Dalton. Here's your coffee, Mr. Witherall. And yours, Mr. Bennett. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Martin. Thank you. Now, Mr. Witherall, about blacklisting the Herald, if a group of prominent citizens of Dalton, led by you Children, and me... Children, what... listen to those uh, fire engines huh? go. See them through the window? Uh, you'll have to excuse Mrs. Mullet, the season enthusiast. Oh. Engine number five, that paint for Garfield. Number three, well, that's Jimmy. Gracious, they're all out. I'll bet it's three alarms and me. Oh, dear, I wish I was gone. Get your number two hose out! Move the ladder over! It's too close to the other building! Come on, come on, get the lid out of your pants! Well, well, if it ain't the hell star reporter, hi, you, Jackie. Hello, Chief. Well, it's a nice little blaze you got. Yeah, it's only, Jackie. But we'll have it licked soon. Anybody got any idea about how it started? That's what has us wondering, Jackie. It looks phony. You mean it wasn't an accident? Well, now I don't want to be quoted as saying I'm positive. But I wouldn't be surprised if this shipyard's burning because of saboteurs. No kidding. Saboteurs. Uh, I said I'm not positive, Jackie. But we suspect it. Thanks, Chief. I gotta go call the desk. Brother, sabotage in a little old Dalton. Me for that telephone. Well, what is this today, Pat? Everybody's after me for something. Now, what do you want? Forrest... Yes. This morning, when you brought Witherall down to the linotype department, you sort of went out of your way to take a couple of pot shots at me. Oh, about the way you once owned a paper, Pat? Well, that struck me as a funny story. little sidelight on one of my employees. You like that idea, don't you, that I'm just one of your employees now? Pat, in San Francisco ten years ago, when you started a paper that you said would put mine out of business, I warned you, 
I said not to try it. Because you wanted to be the boss of the whole show, huh? You weren't making enough money. You had to squeeze the life out of any paper that tried to get started in the same town. I was just meeting competition, Pan. Yeah, by having my delivery boys beaten up in dark alleys. By sideswiping my trucks so the two of my drivers spent a year in the hospital. By knocking over any stand that carried my papers. And by breaking that poor Italian peddler's neck. That was just an accident, Pan. Sure, that's what the police called it. But I've got another version. I know you've got blood on your hands, Forrest. And you wrecked me. I lost every penny I had trying to buck you. I told you then, don't try it. Remember? All I remember is that you're a crooked chiseler who ruined my business. You're a gangster and a killer and I'd like... Yes? Forrest, this is Jackie Biglow. I'm at the Perkins shipyard. Yeah, what have you got? Better hold the three-star for a replace. This ain't no ordinary fire. Looks like sabotage. Sabotage? What's he saying? Sabotage at the shipyard? You stay there, Jackie. Get busy. Dig up everything you can. Don't lose touch with me. Now, give me the details of what you know. City desk, Forrest. Boss, this is the press room. Number three and four presses just broke down. Broke down? Now? Oh, me with a replay on that sabotage story of all the condemned... Why can't you guys fix it? Well, nobody down here, boss. They're all out for lunch. Wow. Besides, it's something very screwy. Usually, I can fix it myself, but I... Can't figure out what's wrong this time. That would happen now. Ye gods, what kind of a day is this? Everything's going wrong. You better hurry, boss. Sorry, but I'm afraid you'll have to take a look at it yourself. Okay, I'm on my way down. This business will drive me nuts. Nuts! What's wrong with these presses? Where is everybody? What do I pay people for? The presses are bollocked up and there's nobody here of all that... Hey... Hey, what are you doing up there? Come down off that platform. Get away from those cauldrons. There's hot lead in there. Are you crazy? Don't push them over. Don't, 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 don't. I'll answer it, Mr. Witherall. Mrs. Bullard, is Mr. Witherall in? Why, yes, Mr. Bennett. Ah, another visit, Mr. Bennett? You're quite determined about the Herald, aren't you? Mr. Witherall, something's happened, something horrifying. Oh, what is it? It's Forrest. Oh, has the editor printed another inflammatory picture? No, no, it isn't that. Forrest is dead. Really? He's been murdered. It's all over town. It is, and I didn't know it. Hmm, You must be slipping, Mrs. Muller. Of course, since he's dead, well, you know the consequences. Sure, they'll have to turn in his ration book to the OPA. How did he die, uh, Mr. Bennett? Well, in a pretty gruesome way. Hmm? He, He was evidently trapped. He was alone in the press room when the killer dumped one of those huge kettles of boiling lead over him. Say, that's a new one. And uh, the body was found in the press room? No. The murderer took the body and dumped it down a chute, the chute where the papers come off the press and roll out onto the delivery trucks. And just a little while ago, the body came rolling down the chute along with the newspapers. Uh, Mr. Bennett, um, why have you come here to tell me about this? Well, I know you've been mixed up in murders, Mr. Witherall, and that you've been rather successful at solving them. Yes, and I heard you threatening Forrest. You weren't by any chance near the Herald building at the time of the murder. Heaven help me, I was in the building. But you know nothing about the murder, of course. Absolutely. I've never been in the Herald press room in my life. I don't know a thing about kettles of hot lead or delivery chutes. Mm, You'd have a little difficulty, Mr. Bennett, proving that. I realize that. That's why I'm here, Mr. Witherall. Would you represent me? Well, frankly, Mr. Bennett, I don't uh, represent anyone. If you uh, think my looking into the story might clarify it or speed the solution... That's all I ask. I want you to come to the Herald office now and get at the truth. We're going to look into the murder, huh? I'll get to the bottom of this. Where's my hat? Where's my coat? Yes, and don't forget your bloodhound. So, uh, you see, Sergeant McCobble, Mr. Bennett claims he knows nothing about Mr. Forrest's death. Mr. Bennett? Yes, Sergeant? You admit that you were here in the Herald building at 3.30, huh? When Forrest's body came down that chute? That's right, Sergeant. But I had nothing to do with it. What were you doing here, Mr. Bennett? Well, I I was on the street floor. I decided to come back and demand that Forrest print an explanation, an apology for printing my daughter's picture. But you never got up here to the city desk, uh, Mr. Bennett? No, Mr. Witherall. I changed my mind and I left. Now, you see, Shakespeare, you can't expect me to believe stories like that, can you? Wait till you hear the fairy tale that Lila Typer's got. Hey, boy, it's a dilly. 
Don't mind Sergeant McCobble, Mr. Bennett. They figured, figured morale in the police force was too high, so they took him in. Ah, Mrs. Mullinson again. She's the only overage destroyer that never got to Britain. What's that? Tut, 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 tut. Now, isn't that the liner type of coming now, Sergeant McCobble? That's the guy, Shakespeare. Name's Pat Welch. Uh, over here, Pat. Sergeant, I told you my story once. I want Mr. Witherall to hear it, Pat. <clears throat> Get this, Shakespeare. It's a honey. Well, I work in the liner type department. I came up here to Forrest's office to talk about the next edition. Then Jackie Biglow, the reporter, telephoned from the shipyard while I was in Forrest's room. Then I left him and went downstairs. That was, oh, about 3.15, I think. You're rather definite <clears throat> about the time, Pat. Yes, I looked at the clock when I got back to the linotype department. Then I got a telephone call saying my mother was sick. You see what I mean, Shakespeare? About fairy tales? Why didn't you go the whole hog, Pat, and say that you had to leave because your grandmother died? Or did you pull that one to get to a ball game? That's the truth, Sergeant. I swear it. That your whole story, Pat? No. As soon as I heard about my mother, I ran to the elevator to get home. But I got stuck inside. I presume the elevator operator can confirm that. No. It's a self-starting elevator. There isn't any operator. But it's stuck. The superintendent will swear to that. It hasn't been fixed yet. I've got a little nephew, Pat. He's four years old. The kid could make up a better story than you've got. Pretty sure of yourself, ain't you, Sarge? Now, look, Mrs. Mother. It's time for spring cleaning. Why don't you go home and rearrange the dirt? Why, no, no, I no, no. Do. Suppose we that. save the second-hand wit for amateur night and <clears throat> get on with finding the sparrow that killed Cock Robin. Pat, um, uh, where's the main switchboard? Downstairs. Going down there, Shakespeare? If you'll excuse me, Sergeant, yes. It's possible that the phone girl can confirm whether or not Pat received a call after three this afternoon. Okay, go on, I'll wait here. Look, Mr. Witherall, you said you'd help me. Now you're wandering off to corroborate this man Welch's story. Mr. Bennett, our objective was the truth. Remember? <laughs> Dalton Harold, good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Forrest is out. He's getting a fitting for a wooden suit. Yes, yeah, somebody didn't like his face, so they pushed I, him uh, into that. I beg your pardon. I understand your name is Ruth. That's and... right. Jesus, if you don't look like what's his name, um, Shakespeare. Mm, if I could only write like him, too. But my name is only Witherall, uh, Ruth. Oh, that's it. You're from Meredith Academy. Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, curious about what happened earlier this afternoon to, uh, what's his name, Forrest. Oh, oh, that. Gee, Pat Welch is in a fix, huh? Everybody knows him and Forrest hated each other's guts, if you'll let. Pardon the expression. Uh, Ruth, uh, was there a phone call for Pat this afternoon? Oh, yeah, yeah, about uh, three o'clock. I don't know who it was from. I only ask who's calling when they ask for an executive. Oh, ain't it a shame. Patty's such a sweet guy. And Forrest, if you'll pardon the expression was a high-class stinker. Hmm. We must have you address our English literature classes at Meredith sometime, Ruth. The uh, tragedy of illiteracy might be the subject. Oh, gee, I'd be only too happy. Uh, with you as Exhibit A. Hiya, Mr. Willerow. Well, what are you doing here? Hiya, Ruthie, baby. Man, oh, man, what a fire I've been to. I'm knocked out. Oh, get ready for a Lulu, Jackie boy. Why, what's up? Well, while you were at the fire, somebody gave Forrest a bath with a bucket of that lead in the press room and then sent the corpse roller coastering down the delivery chute. <laughs> Cute, ain't it? No kidding. That's it, Jack. The police are upstairs now. Hallelujah. Forrest knocked off? Boy, this is my lucky day. I get a terrific story, and on top of that, somebody puts Forrest where he belongs. Who did it, huh? They know? Uh, Sergeant McCobble's upstairs now with Pat Welsh and Mr. Bennett. They're the most uh, likely candidates for the honor at the moment. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go on up there. This well, I gotta see. All right, Jack, we can... No, no, wait a minute. Not that way, Mr. Witherall. Up the stairs. The elevator's broken. See ya, Ruthie. Okay. Bye, Mr. Witherall. A uh, toodle you, Ruthie. Uh, come out to Meredith sometime. As the students say, you'll be hotter than a two-dollar pistol, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> Jack, you say Forrest cheated Pat here out of a newspaper, huh? Put him out of business? Yeah, that was the deal, McCobble. It was in Frisco about ten years ago. 
I'm sorry, Pat, but the fact's a fact. I'm not worried, Jackie. Man that's innocent doesn't have anything to worry about. Yes, as the bard wrote, truth is truth to the end of reckoning. Sergeant, aside from the fact that I happen to be in the building, you haven't a scrap of tangible evidence against me. But when it comes to motive, Mr. Bennett, you did have a violent argument with Mr. Forrest about that picture of your daughter. Since when do you convict people on that kind of evidence? We'll get all the evidence soon enough. Give the sergeant a chance, Mr. Bennett. He'll learn. Won't you, squeaky shoes? Mrs. Mullet, don't stand there with your teeth in your mouth. Why don't you... Easy, easy, easy. Uh, talking about motives, Jack, I happen to know that Forrest cut you out of the job you wanted, working for that syndicate in Chung King, and I also know what it meant to you. Sure, that's right. Oh, I'm not sorry he's dead. I'll bet everybody in the building had a motive for wiping out that lug. Oh, uh, what happened to your wrist, Jack? Huh? Oh, oh, the bandage? I burned myself at the fire. Now, the chief will back me up on that. I was poking in the ruins for sabotage evidence. Mm, you've been at the fire since that first call came in Came in about it, Jack? Yeah, I've been there all the time. I telephoned for us from there. Anybody will tell you that. You left the moment the news flash came in? Mm-hmm, yeah, about three o'clock it was. Pat, um, you saw Mr. Forrest alive in his office when Jack telephoned? I did. After Jack called about the sabotage development, Pat, uh, you went back to the liner type, as I understand it. That's right. When you did, you looked at the clock, and it was 3.15. Uh-huh. Then you received a call from your that your mother was ill. You dashed for the elevator, but it broke down while you were inside. I told you the super will confirm that. Therefore, the elevator broke down roughly about uh, 3.20. And that's about it. Hmm. Very interesting. What's the angle, Shakespeare? Now, Jack, uh, you say you've been at the fire since a few minutes past three, and we know that the elevator broke down about 3.20. Get to the point, Mr. Witherall. Yeah, what's this all about? Uh, Jack, it's about the fact you're supposed to have been at the fire since shortly after three, long before the elevator broke down. Yet when I met you downstairs with Ruth, you remarked quite casually that uh, we should take the stairway because the elevator didn't work. How did you know that, uh, Jack? Why, I, uh... Sounds like a payoff question to me, Jack. One of the truckmen outside on my way in, he told me. Just before I found you at the switchboard. Really, Jack? Hmm. I suppose you'd be willing also to submit your wrist to a medical examination? My wrist? Wrist? Why, certainly I will. Why? Why? Because, Jack, I think you burned your wrist while dumping the cauldron of hot lead over forest. As you know, a medical examination will reveal whether that burn was caused by flames or um, if there are traces of lead in it. I'll uh, have another cup of coffee, Shakespeare. Then I'll be meandering home. You figure Jack went straight to the fire, huh? Yes, Macabo. He stayed there long enough to establish his presence. Uh, then he raced back unseen to the neighborhood of the Herald. Uh-huh. He called up Forrest uh, from downstairs with the sabotage story, uh, creating the impression that he was still at the fire. I get it. Then he buzzed Pat Welch, probably using a phony voice to tell him the lie about his mother being sick. Yes, uh, that got uh-huh. Welch out of the way. Yeah. And gave Welch a very weak excuse, too. Then uh, Jack uh, Monkey wrenched the presses, uh, forcing Forrest to go down to the press room where he was killed. The whole affair couldn't have taken more than a few minutes. Then Jack went dashing back to the fire. He'd gotten away with it, too. They hadn't pulled that boner in front of you about the elevator. Yes, there was that. And the wrist burn. Shakespeare, how did you know the wrist burn could be analyzed for traces of hot lead? I never knew that. Um, Sergeant, um, shall I confess something to you? Uh, neither did I. What? It uh, sounded like such a good idea at the time. Oh, you faker. <laughs> Rather neat, eh? Worked beautifully, too. Jack might never have confessed. You know, I think my students at Meredith have given me a superb training in the art of, um, of what they call manufacturing applesauce. Yeah, well, applesauce or not, Shakespeare, we caught that killer. And that's what counts. Those murderers can't get to the chair fast enough for me. As a matter of fact, Considering what kind of a man that newspaper editor was, he deserved to get wiped out, too. Probably, Sergeant. There's no doubt that uh, society's transgressors must be punished. Yet uh, we mustn't make quick, violent judgments. We must always remember what the gentleman I'm supposed to resemble once wrote about mercy when he said, It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes is mightiest in the mightiest. 
It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute of awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute of God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. W.O.R. has presented the distinguished American actor Walter Hamden in The Adventures of Leonidas Witherall. Mrs. Mullet is played by Ethel Ramey, Sergeant McCobble by Jack McBride. The character of Leonidas Witherall is from the mystery novels by Alice Tilton. The radio script is written by Howard Merrill, and the program is under the direction of Roger Bauer. Next week, Leonidas meets a very interesting hitchhiker, doesn't he, Mr. Hamden? Oh, yes. Leonidas is driving along the highway when he meets a young lady who asks him for a hitch. And a very informative young lady she is, too. In fact, uh, before long, Leonidas is receiving a very practical lesson in how to win friends and influence homicidal maniacs. We hope you'll be listening next Sunday at 7, and until then, good night. Listen again next Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern War Time for The Adventures of Leonidas Witherall. This program came to you from the studios of WOR in New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig. Confidential Investigator. Spotting a murderer isn't easy. They don't help. They can be anyone, any age, either sex, rich, poor, or in between. They've got one difference, though. They kill people. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Lots of people shy away from going to a privatized office. I guess they figure it isn't respectable. I guess when you spend a couple of minutes thinking about it, they're right. It isn't respectable. Because it's a confession that something's wrong with their lives. And what's wrong is rarely a bookkeeping error or a mistake in spelling. You don't care for the hamburger, Craig? Huh? Oh, the hamburger's fine, Willie. Then stop looking at it like it was still alive. I wouldn't worry about it. No? No. Even if it was still struggling, your coffee would kill it. What's the matter with the coffee you get at Willie's Wagon? Nothing. I'm sure you use only the finest grade of sulfuric acid in it. You got a tender stomach? I doubt it. Uh, I'm still alive. Yeah, fine type of customer I get here. Wise guys. Wise guys? Hmm? This is your hamburger. She ain't in your price class. Who? Oh, oh, see. You could be right. That fur she's dragging around was contributed by only the highest type minx. You'd better wait on her. She might get impatient. I can't. Huh? I ain't had a manicure in weeks. You are Mr. Craig. I am. I waited outside the building in which you have your office until you left. I followed you here. You're allergic to offices? Well, I couldn't... Uh, do you mind talking business here? Would you like something to eat or drink? No. Willie... Go polish your coffee iron. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, it don't need it. You're... Uh... Viola Henning. Mrs. Viola Henning. Uh-huh. And the business you wanted to talk about was... My husband is... is keeping an appointment tonight, and I want you to... 
Well, to... An appointment with whom? A business associate? No. With a girl. A girl named Muriel. I see. Where? The Grammont Hotel. She works there? No. She's taking a room there. I overheard my husband making the appointment. I don't especially go for divorce cases. Oh, no. It isn't for that. I'd never divorce Dan. I just want to know. What time's the appointment? Eight. And all you want to know is if your husband, in fact, does keep this appointment. Yes. Would a hundred dollars be enough? Oh, more than enough. Then here you are. Thanks. You won't tell anyone. Investigators with loose mouths don't last very long, Mrs. Henning. I suppose not. I'll phone you in the morning. Fine. Good night. Good night. Yeah. For that, you need a license? Huh? The babe in the minx. Just a case, Willie, on the face of it. The face wasn't bad. No, but what's underneath? I killed some time with Willie. His feeling is he's a very good gin player. I want enough hamburger for half a dozen cases of acute indigestion and then went on to the hotel grandma. I let the clerk in and my little secret. I told him I was looking for a maiden aunt. For five dollars, he believed me. I found a Muriel who'd booked a room at eight o'clock. The full name was Muriel Jones. <laughs> Jones. room number was 807. The time was 20 minutes after 8. I decided I'd be the boy bringing the ice water. Maybe they hadn't ordered ice water. That would be all right. I didn't have any with me. I lifted my hand to knock and I... I didn't get around to it. The door was locked. Nothing happened after the shot, so I knocked after all. Maybe I was naive, but kicking the door in didn't seem practical. I turned out to be right. Mr. Craig! Hello, Mrs. Henning. Mind if I come in? No. No. There was a girl lying on the floor. Her eyes were open, and they stared up at the ceiling of the room. It wasn't a very interesting ceiling, but that didn't matter. She wasn't seeing it. Dead. Who was she? Muriel. The girl I told you. Yeah. Except you didn't mention you were also planning on showing up here. I couldn't help it. I had to see her. She isn't much worth looking at right now. Two-room suite. That the back door? I don't know. Yeah. Back door and fire stairs. What else couldn't you help, Mrs. Henning? You don't have to be so indirect, Mr. Craig. That means what? I killed her. Uh-huh. What's her name? Muriel. Muriel Jones. No. Why do you say no? That dress she's wearing. Too good for a hotel like this. That's the only name I knew her by. Those gloves you're wearing. They're for driving. Well, that is, I wore them so that I wouldn't leave fingerprints. Hmm. It doesn't explain why you didn't use that back door to get out of here after you shot her. I changed my mind about hiding my guilt. Tell me how you killed her. Start outside in the hallway. You came to the door, you knocked. Yes. She opened the door. And and... I came in. She shut the door. She didn't know who I was. I told her. She liked that? It didn't seem to matter to her. I accused her of taking my husband from me. She laughed at me. So I shot her. You had a gun? Yes. You shot her. She fell down and died. You heard me knock. You hesitated. Then you opened the door. Yes. I've had time to look around the room. I've looked. What difference does that make? You say you shot her. I did. What did you do with the gun? Eat it? Mrs. Henning didn't have any answers. I found a phone and let her notify Homicide that she'd been out hunting. I left her in that hotel room with a dead girl. Both of them would wait. The butler at the Henning home didn't seem delighted to see me. I think it was my tie bothered him most. I figured if I ever wanted to visit again, I'd get it hand-painted. Johns tells me your name is Craig. Johns tells you the truth, Mr. Henning. Yes. Well, what... I'm I... a confidential investigator. I could show you credentials. Oh, there's no reason to waste them on me. What can I do for you? Is your wife in? My wife? 
Why, uh, yes, yes, she's upstairs asleep. Asleep? It's a little early for that, isn't it? I don't see how that's any of your concern. I guess you don't. Would you mind asking her to come downstairs? I most certainly would. I'm afraid you'll have to anyway. Well, I don't see why. You're not curious enough about why a private detective is calling? I'm merely assuming that you'll inform me sooner or later. Let's say for the time being that it's because your wife hired me to do a job for her. What job? The information is confidential. I refuse to believe That's it. silly. All you have to do is ask your wife. Well, yes, but... Uh... Or are you afraid to? I resent Don't you. bother resenting. Check with your wife. If she doesn't want to come down, you can throw me out. Well, all right. I didn't know exactly what made him go through with it. Maybe it was because his tie was already hand-painted. Mr. Craig? Yeah? My, uh, my wife isn't feeling very well. She, she can't come down. Uh-huh. When did you see Muriel Jones last? Jones? Let's just leave it at Muriel. We'll discuss last name some other time. We won't discuss it at all. You're not very big. I could push you aside and go upstairs. You wouldn't do that. Oh, you're not sure of that. So when did you see Muriel last? Well, why not ask the lady? Oh, there's a technical difficulty. She's dead. She's what? Dead. You're quite serious? It's not a good subject to joke about. Well, how, how did she... She was murdered. Oh. Well, who would want to kill that her? That might depend on who she really was. Her name was Muriel Carter. She sang at the Bright Star. Her voice was very beautiful. She's still dead. I, I, I find that hard to believe. She... She had such such a rare quality. It didn't stop the murderer. She was, in her way and in our time, a lovely princess. I've heard of the Bright Star. It's run by a man named Thompson. He's short, fat, and greedy. As far as I know, he doesn't hire princesses. Now, what do you mean by that? She sang for Thompson, that's all. And what did she do for you? I think you'd better get out. I'd like to, except I've got a client. I'm in the middle, whether I like it or not. I could say I don't like it, but what good would that do? Did you keep your appointment at the Grammont Hotel tonight? That's none of your... I had no appointment tonight. It might pay you to keep in touch with your wife. Good night, Henning. Good night. Your wife, uh, who's upstairs and not very well. Yes. By this time, she's also downtown having a conversation with the district attorney. Did I say good night? Mr. Henning's face over the hand-painted tie wasn't very nice to look at. I stopped looking at it, climbed into my car, and got away from there. It took me a while to notice the black coupe on my tail. When I did, I decided I didn't like it. Halfway down a block, I swung my car across the road and got out. The car tailing me burned brake lining and managed to pull up. Hey, get that car out of my way. What was that? I said, get that car out of my way. Maybe you'd better help me. Get out. You're a wise guy something, you're blocking traffic. What traffic? Okay, wise guy, I'll get out. That's better. Hey, you're don't... looking for me? Let go my arm. Who do you think you are? Who do you think I am? Okay. <clears throat> now, maybe you won't be so smart. Hmm, that's a nice gun. Got a license for it? You in the license business? No, but... Hey! I'll borrow it. Thanks. You can't. Who put you on my tail? I don't know what you're talking about. Who put you on my tail? You'd like to know, wouldn't you? Hey, you can't get away with beating me up. Am I going to beat you up? Then let go. Actually, I don't know. I could. Look, it won't get you no place. I'm not going any place. I've got lots of time for you. Let go of me, will you? How can I? I'm trying to decide. Decide what? Whether to beat you up or not. You've got my gun. You're bigger than I am. That's right. So maybe you better tell me. Who put you on me? Mac Thompson. Thompson. The gentleman who runs the Bright Star, huh? Pull your car over to the curb. We ride in mine. I kind of need a star in my life. Especially a Bright Star. His name was Lester. He wasn't very brave without a gun. Gunmen rarely are. He pulled his car over to the curb, got into mine, and we went to the Bright Star. We didn't disturb the customers. We used a back entrance, the kind of entrance I was accustomed to. Private investigators don't rate socially. This here's Mr. Thompson's office. Don't knock. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Lester. What are you doing here? He's trailing me. He trailed me right into your office, Thompson. I, I had a little trouble with him. He's got my gun. Indeed. And you'd be, uh... Craig. 
Barry Craig. Oh, a boy with a license. I might mention that Lester has a license for that gun of his, too. Makes it nice for the city taxes. You, uh, could get into trouble taking his gun, Craig. He could get into worse trouble pointing it at people. Well, he threw his weight around, Mr. Thompson. All right, get out, Lester. Okay, only you ain't sore at me, Mr. Thompson. I couldn't help get it. Get out. Yeah, Mr. Thompson. Yeah. Lester isn't a very strong character. I wasn't a character analysis of Lester that brought you here, Craig. No. Now, I don't want any trouble with you. I don't think you want any with me. I have a friend or two in the department. That's nice. That license you own uh, has to be renewed every year. Now you're frightening me. <laughs> I have no intention to. Merely making things clear. Thanks. Now, would you make it clear why you put Lester on my tail? I didn't. He uh, misunderstood his instructions. Uh-huh. How was Muriel's act tonight? Muriel? Muriel Carter. Well, she didn't appear tonight. Why not? Well, you know how these things are. I don't. Thompson, where were you around uh, 8.15 tonight? Here, reading a good book. How many witnesses? Mm, four, eight. How many would you like? You've got a large payroll. Thank you. Now that you've stopped imitating a detective, what happened at 8.15 tonight? Muriel Carter quit the Bright Star. You practicing to be a theatrical agent? Two bullets hit her. Oh? Now, so did. Not to mention fatal. You know something? I'd like to have the gun those bullets came out of. At 8.15 uh, tonight, I was here reading a good book. Eight witnesses, Craig. That ought to be enough. Thompson. Yes? Yeah? I don't believe the performance. I beg your pardon? You're playing it too tough, too straight. Which means? I think you went for her. That may be true. It's a habit of mine. I've seen her. More than habit, Thompson. She was worth a gross of your ordinary stock. Possibly. So I'm all broken up inside by the news. It wasn't news. Why was Lester staked out at the Henning home? Good night, Mr. Craig. I'm still looking for that gun. Good night. The hallway outside Thompson's office had run out of lights. It was dark, and I headed for the floor quick, but halfway down, I found out it wasn't entirely my own idea. <laughs> you get knocked unconscious, and it's dull for a while. Because you're unconscious. But after a while, things change. Something began to pound. It must have taken me 20 minutes to discover it was my own head. I lifted it off the ground, and the air smelled good, which meant I traveled. There were trees around in the sky, from which handful of facts I deduced I was out in the country. The gun someone had been careful to put in my hand was still warm. I got to my feet and crossed over to him. He was lying a dozen feet away. Dying hadn't improved his looks any. Lester was very dead. It wasn't a frame-up especially. It wouldn't stick. But it did help use up time. Time? For what? Headquarters had a nice green lamp burning outside. Trouble with hanging around police headquarters is you can't ever lock the front door. Hello, Lieutenant Rogers. Anybody comes in. Even... Hold on a minute while I look around and whisper. Even private detectives. Some fun. Barry, you're not your usual blithe and buxom self. No background. Uh, if you start dragging in my college degree... Hide your Phi Beta Kappa key and send a couple of your boys out to my car. There's something different about your car tonight? Yeah. I've got a corpse in it. Oh, a ducky. Anybody I know? I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, say, Trav, I'd, I'd like to talk to Mrs. Henning. Mm -hmm. I've seen her. I'd like to talk to her, too. What? The uh, district attorney didn't care for her confession. She didn't have a gun to go with it. So he threw her out. How long ago? An hour, maybe. Why? I want to talk to her. You're keeping it on a very high moral plane. Barry, why do you think she confessed to the killing? Maybe because she loved her husband. I understand it happened. It must be something special. Sure. Wears hand-painted ties. So long, Tram. Uh, would you like company? I talk very politely. Forget it. I'll be back later. Maybe I'll even tell you about the corpse you've got.
my head didn't feel too good. Maybe I was wrong. I'd find out. The Henning house was dark when I got to it. I didn't worry about the butler much. It turned out that I didn't have to. The front door was open. The skating rink they used for a foyer was dark. But a line of light under the door down the hall told me where I wanted to go. Nobody noticed my low bow as I went through the door. Oh, oh, Mr. Craig. Which way? The window. Caught a taillight going around the corner outside. There's nothing special about a taillight. I was late. This is Henning. She fainted. It was a break for her. She could stop looking at her husband. As for him, maybe he was looking at something, but it wasn't anything a pair of living eyes could see. Lieutenant Rogers, homicide. Trav? Barry? I'm at Mrs. Henning's home. Yeah. It also used to be Mr. Henning's home, but he won't be living here anymore. He's moving into smaller quarters. Underground. Take it easy, Mrs. Henning. You've got lots of time to settle down with your husband's death. It isn't possible. It's possible. It happens all the time. But who could have done it? That's for later. You wouldn't want to confess to this murder, too, would you? How can you say things like that? Practice. I need a little information quick. The truth, maybe. What happened at the Grammont Hotel, for real? The hotel? I got there after Dan did. From the hallway, I could hear him and that girl calling. And then the shots. I wanted to run, but I went in. Dan wasn't there, but... Oh, I can't go on with this. You don't have to. Just hang around and greet the cops, huh? No matter how many times you've seen the dead, they still don't appeal to you, even with hand-painted ties. I concentrated on the furnishings. They were nice. They weren't the kind of stuff you buy if you're a private investigator. I stopped being morbid and just waited for the cops. They came. I uh, brought a few friends along, Barry. Do you mind? I don't mind, Trav. I was worried. Where's the object of our affections? Over near the window. I uh, hope he hasn't left. Hmm. He hasn't left. Ah, uh, boys, make with the routine, huh? Wouldn't he uh, cash a check for you? I'm not killing people this week. Mrs. Henning? No. Henning was shot from outside the window. Mrs. Henning was in the room when I arrived and heard the shots. That's nice. Maybe it's the perfect crime. Maybe. Mrs. Henning's in her bedroom. I imagine she'll wake up if you knock. So long. And uh, where, if I'm not too inquisitive, would you be going? You're too inquisitive. Barry! Don't worry about it. All I'm doing is looking for a star to hitch a wagon to. A death wagon. I figured Mr. Thompson wouldn't be expecting action very quick. I'd been lucky, or maybe it was just because my head was so hard. I'd come to after the sapping in a hurry. I'd been in a hurry since then. I was still in a hurry. Who is it? I didn't build that door very strong. Craig. Craig. Hello, Thompson. You wrecked that door. I'm too stupid to knock. Hold it where you are. What a nice big gun you've got, Grandma. I said stop. Okay. I'm up against your desk anyway. Nice hunk of mahogany. What do you want? You. Look, I'm in no mood This isn't comedy. I want you for murder, Thompson. Why don't you come and get me? I will if I have to. You under the impression you're bulletproof? I'm glad you reminded me. Nice hunk of mahogany. Pity you'd gotten your way. I hadn't hit him very hard. He came to after a while, and we went down to headquarters. Barry, where... Did I go after Henning died? I went to collect Mr. Thompson here. He's going to stay for a while. 
You might mention a few charges. Sure. Murder. Murder of a man named Lester. Murder of a man named Dan Henning. Good enough? Very good. Any objections, Thompson? No objections. I killed Lester. He was a weak character. Craig made a point of it. He was tying me in too tightly. The boy's got good grammar. I'm appreciating it. How about Henning? Why kill him? Because he murdered Muriel. You didn't know her, did you? He murdered Muriel. And even now, with me where I am, I can almost figure it's worth it. You see, I did know her. I left Thompson with Lieutenant Rogers. Maybe, according to his own bookkeeping, he'd been right. I'd seen Muriel Carter and was willing to give him an outside doubt. My job wasn't finished, though. I had a final report to make to my client. Mr. Craig. Yeah. Mind if I come in? I don't think I'll ever mind anything anymore. Come in. Thank you. The police are gone. They took Dan. You better sit down. Yes, hadn't I? You hired me. I've got to finish things up. Things? What things? I didn't know there was anything left. Oh, nothing important, but... uh... Mrs. Henning, did your husband ever wear driving gloves? No. Or any other kind? No, he didn't. Hmm. Thompson's been arrested. Thompson's the man who killed your husband. Who? Well, that won't help Dan, will it? No. Thompson was in love with Muriel Carter. (laughs) He had company. The only thing is, uh, Thompson wasn't the one who killed Muriel. I know. My husband... What does it matter? That confession you handed me at the hotel didn't make very much sense without the gun. That's what the district attorney said. The cops found the gun. Did they? It belonged to your husband. They found his prints on it. Very clear prints. Why bother? Too clear. Too clear, Mr. Craig? That's right. But... A man fires a gun. The prints tend to be smudged a bit from handling. But suppose a gun is wiped clean... Then the man's fingers are carefully pressed on the handle. Then you'd have his prints, but they'd be too clear. I never knew that. I guess you didn't. Why are you telling all this to me? You're my client. Your husband didn't wear gloves. The police give a murder suspect the paraffin test. Matter of routine. You see, when a man fires a gun, small powder particles are embedded in the skin. Oh? Your husband hadn't fired a gun recently. Well, but... Look, I'm tired. I'm not sure what you're trying to say. With Dan dead, they've got his murderer. Why did they make all these tests? Well, I suggested it. Because Muriel Carter was registered at the Grammont Hotel as Muriel Jones. She was ashamed. A club singer? Working for a man like Thompson? She was going to meet Dan. She... No. She didn't take that room for romance. She took it for a meeting with you. This is so confusing. Uh Uh-uh. You were jealous. You hated Muriel Carter. You arranged that meeting at the Grammont Hotel. You suggested she register under an assumed name. It would look uh, shadier that way. Shadier? To who? Me, the private detective you hired in good faith. Oh. You let your husband know about the meeting. That's why he was there. That's why he took the gun away with him. That's why he lied to me later, said you were upstairs sleeping. That isn't why I... Excuse me, I... I should have said how. The why was because he may have loved you once. You made your confession, nobody believed. Thompson figured your husband for the killer and killed him in turn. But there was something wrong. The paraffin test showed your husband hadn't killed Muriel Carter. Then who did? I'm a funny kind of investigator, Mrs. Henning. Most guys in my business get cynical. They wouldn't believe you if you told them the time, unless you had 39 witnesses and a testimonial from your neighborhood church. And you? Oh, I'm different. I always believe a client. That's why we better get started, Mrs. Henning. We're going... Downtown, headquarters, where they'll put you under arrest for murder. One way or another, the evidence is all there. You see, when you made that confession in the hotel room, I believed you. Good night, folks. See you next week.
been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Fatal Appointment, was written by Lou Vittis. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Deadly Fight, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I meet a widow who can't find tears, an obituary notice in search of a corpse, and a boxing champ whose biggest win is a fight strictly off the record. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Viola was Joan Alexander. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Are you still there? I believe that interpolation is hardly rhetorical, Mr. Spade. To what have you been up, if you'll pardon the expression? And has that girl regained her facilities? I uh, wouldn't know, but her uh, faculties are as good as ever, if you'll pardon the expression. Mr. Spade, sometimes I think you're a regular philanthropist. Don't you mean philanderer? How much money did you make out of that case? Well, I uh, broke even anyway. That's what I mean. You're a philanthropist. Well, you know best, Bernadine. By the way, was that man really murdered with the bus door, or was that just publicity? He really was, Bernadine. Why? There just happened to be one lying around. Oh, I don't mean that. Why was he killed? For the wheel of life. Oh. You're not going to ask what that is? Some curio, no doubt. Listen, Bernadine, the wheel of life is, uh... Oh, well. I suppose I don't have to tell you to stay where you are. Just sit quietly with your book in your hand... And I'll be right down to dictate my report on the Wheel of Life caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Come on, mister, give the gals a break. Treat them to a look-see at a really handsome head of hair. Neat, well-groomed hair, the way yours is going to look when you spruce up with Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Famous Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, how about it, men? Why hold off any longer when now's the time to get Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic? Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I went down to St. James and Fulmer. Ready, Bernadine, little flower? I'm way ahead of you. Keep it clean. No more than three erasures per page. Okie dokie. Oak. I mean doak. I mean date. Oh, I'd love to. July 11, 1948. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco police. Subject, the uh, wheel of life caper. Now, don't go away, Bernadine. I don't know why these things always have to happen to me. Under private detectives in the San Francisco Classified Directory, they're listed somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 agencies, several with large display ads. But somehow she managed to find me. It's all so strange, Mr. Spade. I hardly know where to begin. Well, the beginning is always a pretty good place to start, Miss O'Farrell. Uh, yes, the beginning. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. 
Everything seemed out of proportion. Even the buildings along the street seemed to be leaning at a crazy angle. And then I realized I was traveling down a hill. I looked wildly around for something to help me get my bearings. And there was a street sign, O'Farrell, stuck in my mind, so I gave it to your secretary when she asked for my name. Uh-huh. And uh, what's your real name? I don't know. I don't know who I am, where I came from, or where I'm going. Mr. Spade, I'm so frightened. Uh, now, wait a minute. A lot of people suffer from uh, temporary loss of memory. Uh, most of them recover. But amnesia is a sickness, and I am not a doctor. Oh. And you won't even try to help me? Well, I can give you the name of a good head doctor right here in the building. There's also uh, missing persons. Oh, but I'm not a missing person. I'm right here. Yeah, I mean, where you aren't, somebody might be missing you. That's fine. But the police... Oh, I'd rather not. I, I might be wanted for some crime. How do I know? You sure you want to find out? Oh, yes, I do. I do. It's terrible not knowing. But I want to find out for myself. Can't you understand that? What do you think I can do for you? You might save my life. From what? I'll try to tell you exactly how it happened. First, I looked at my watch. It was three minutes past ten. The cable car stopped at the corner and a man got on. I, I couldn't remember ever having seen him before, but then I couldn't remember anything. He sat down beside me and he caught hold of my arm. I tried to pull away. Well, you can see the marks where he... Yeah. Well, who was he? He acted as if I was... I think I know what you mean. Did you uh, find out who he was? No, no, I was too frightened to speak. What did he say? He sort of growled it out of the side of his mouth, but it sounded as if he said, Lathrop wants to see you. Mm-hmm. You remember anybody named Lathrop? I can't remember anything before three minutes past ten this morning. Well, let's go on with since then. The guy grabbed you, said somebody named Lathrop wanted to see you, and then what? I went into a panic, I managed to jerk away from him, and I jumped off the moving car, and then I looked in the classified section, and I found you. Why me? I don't know. The name, I guess. A spade to dig up my past. Please, Miss O'Farrell. <laughs> Do you think I'm very silly? No, I think you're very beautiful. I wish you could remember whether you're married or not. Oh, no. Well, at least I have no wedding ring. Uh, what have you got? I mean, besides what's visible. Well, I couldn't find much of anything. I went over my clothing. There don't seem to be any, seem to be any marks of any kind. Mm-hmm. Well, you got any money? Well, a little over $300. Let's have it. The purse, too. All right. Uh-huh. Lipstick, aspirin, bobby pins, Kleenex. Uh, nothing here. They couldn't have been bought in any drugstore. <sighs> powder. <clears throat> hey, what kind of powder is it? Uh, then there was this in my coat pocket. A match folder. Sailor's Rest Bar, Hotel Calcutta, 1100 Embarcadero. Little number written inside. 120. What's that, a room number? I don't know. My purse, you have to destroy it. Here's $10 of your own money. Buy a new one. Wow. Did you find something? Coin. Chinese bit. Good luck piece. Probably sewn in by whoever made it. Maybe in China. That uh, ring any bells? Mm, no. No, I'm afraid not. Shoe. What? Your right shoe. Let's see it. Take it off. Uh, you aren't going to tear it up the way you did the purse, are you? Uh, dust. Plaster dust. Is that a clue? I don't know, is it? I'm not a detective. Well, you are in this case, baby. If it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything. Well, it doesn't. That's everything. What am I going to do? Well, let me see. First, we better give you a name. Oh, well, Farrell's all right. You look like, uh... Well, uh Lana would do, but... Oh, that's in use. Uh, how about uh, Poppy for forgetfulness? Poppy O'Farrell. <laughs> that's a funny name. Yeah, you think so? Huh? Uh, I think I like it. You do? I think I like you, too. I liked her, too. There may have been blanks in her brain, but the rest of her figured... In the elevator, I started adding it up, and by the time we reached the street floor, it came to quite a tidy sum. Where are we going, Sam? Far, I hope. But uh, first, we're going to find you a place to stay. Oh, yes, we must be practical. No use overdoing it, huh? Oh, no, Sam, I didn't mean... <gasps> Wait. What's the matter? You remember something? That man, the one who followed me this morning, he's standing right out there waiting. The one in the straw hat leaning against the newsstand? Yes. Where are you going, Sam? You stay here. I just remembered something I hoped I could forget. Hello, Shuggy. What brings you back to town? Do I know you? That doesn't matter. I know you. The name you were using when you blew this town was Shuggy Bellows. You wouldn't take the risk of showing your face here again unless the caper was worth it. You've got a big nose. Keep it clean. You've been tailing that girl all day. Why? Damn what damn? Who's Lathrop? 
I don't remember. Okay, I'll give you a chance to think it over. Hey, officer! You dirty hey, shamash yelling down. No, no, you don't care. Here, don't you out of here, break it up. Oh, oh, Mr. Spade. Is this fella giving you trouble now? Yeah, what kind of a beat are you piling here, Clancy? Letting a cheap grifter like this walk around with an arm kept full of gun? Or are they handing out permits to characters like these this day? These well, days? no, uh, how about that, son? Uh, have you a permit now? And a goop, copper. Oh, so, one of them clever lads he is. What? Come along, me bucko, before I lose me temper and give you your lumps now. Stop okay, off. I'm coming. That's better now. Uh, much obliged, Mr. Spade. I'll pay you for this, Thomas. And I goop to you, too. I was sure he would, but I was also sure that I wouldn't have to worry about him for the rest of the night. I checked Poppy O'Farrell in at the Belvedere, locked her in the room, and told Tiny Stover, the house dick, to keep an eye on her. When I left him, he was, and uh, he seemed to be enjoying his work. Then I headed for the Embarcadero. I found the Hotel Calcutta, but I couldn't find the lobby. There wasn't any. It had been squeezed out by the sailor's rest bar. So I tried the bosun-type bartender. Howdy, mate. You, you got business aboard? Yeah, where do I find the purser? He went ashore. All the officers went ashore except the janitor. He's passed out in his bunk. Oh, how about the passengers? Uh, you're in the thick of them right now. They spend most of their time and their money right here. Uh, which one belongs to 120? You a dick. Yeah, but I got ten bucks. Well, what I can tell you ain't worth it, but thanks anyway. He stayed in his cabin. I only saw him at once. That's when he went ashore. I says to the deck steward, that's room clerk to you, who's a general. He says, name of Coralenko. I noticed him because he was a real creep, see? Six foot four of solid brass. His head stuck up in the air and he didn't move nothing from his stern to his shoulders. A real Frankenstein. Hey, do I keep it then? Yeah. Do I get a look at his room? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Who's stopping you? So I went. Nobody stopped me until I opened the door to 120. Then I stopped myself. It was an inside room with one small window and an air shaft. But it looked as if a flurry of snow had blown in. The floor and the rest of the flat surfaces were sprinkled with a fine, dirty white powder. It wasn't snow, it was dust. Plaster dust. Like the stuff I'd found in Poppy's handbag and on her shoes. I shook the place down, not expecting to find anything. I didn't until I opened the wardrobe. It was the body of a well-dressed ship surgeon. But his uniform was rumpled, torn, and bloodstained. From the look of him, his throat had been cut. I wondered if Poppy would be able to jog her memory that far back. When I found the murder weapon, I hoped she couldn't. I really did. It was not a knife. It was not even a razor. It was an electric buzz saw. That tore it. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more... Non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Wheel of Life caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Time.
names being what they are, I could use a little publicity. And so could you, Lieutenant Dundee, what with the elections coming up and you with no promotion all these years. This one time, I got it instead of you and wished I hadn't. The morning papers called it the buzzsaw murder and went on shamelessly from there. Horror killing related by private eye. Stan Slade, ex-Pinkerton man, mum on Mystery Woman. Elderly sleuth, dodges photographers, denies hotel visit, was in bed with Apple and Good Book, says Peeper. There wasn't a word of truth in it, mainly because nobody could get at the facts. I wasted most of the day down at headquarters trying to find out what name Shuggy Bellows had been booked under. Then I dropped in at the Belvedere. Poppy had checked out. I decided to go back to my office and drink poison. I hardly got the desk drawer open when a sobering influence walked in. It was a Mr. Six Feet Four of Solid Brass. The Frankenstein who had been described to me by the bartender as the occupant of room 120. Excuse me. I am Korlenko. Please, I shall sit down. I am so heavy. Make yourself at home. Oh. Mr. Swade. Uh, Swade. Uh, uh, excuse me. I am so heavy. I, I am Korlenko. So you told me. I am really Spade myself. So. Why are she hiding from me? Who? That girl, Miss Paget. Her, I am paying one month in advance, $300 American. Me, she have dessert. I am not rich, only moderately wealthy. But you understand, it's not question for modest alone. That ship's doctor, he was most kind to me. He cared to me even after I arrived. Now he are dead for his pains, his dirty trick. Yeah, 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 I know how you feel. Now, if you'll uh, take it a little easy, I think we'll get farther. You say this girl's name is uh, Paget, and she traveled with you. Uh, from Macau, da. Uh, where she is the Florence Nightingale for Portuguese hospitals, forcing me to employ her, all others being Chinese nuns. That figures. You were uh, sick? No, only I am so heavy, they are breaking my back in traffic accident, a rickshaw collusion. You're uh, wearing a plastic cast? Yes, like a turtle, I am close with my neck sticking out. Look, see? Now it is better as before. The ship's doctor trimmed the rough edges with buzz saw. Buzz, buzz, buzz. I can walk. But it's like suit from armor, for which I alive. Look. I looked again where he opened his shirt front, exposing the gray-white shell of plaster that surrounded his trunk from collarbone to hips. In a six-inch circle over the left side of his chest, I counted four bullet gouges. I dug one of the slugs out and examined it. It was 32 caliber. The plastic cast, which was molded to the shape of his body, was no more than an inch thick. I didn't see how it had stopped the slugs, but it had. About then, the parts of Korolenko that were not held rigid in the cast began to tremble violently. Why are they doing this? Why? To a virtually helpless man. Why, Mr. Spade? Why? 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 Uh, where did you have that cast put on? Don't I said Macau? The Portuguese hospital there? The same. They are hanging me up with the neck and plastering me. Comes a great pain, they put me to sleep from anesthetic. I, I are waking up in ambulance arriving at shipboard. Why you wish I should tell you my operation? More important things we should be discussing. Uh, I think so, too. I think Miss Paget and her friends had something they wanted to smuggle out of Macau and into San Francisco, and you're it. Oh, excuse me. I, I am not comprehensible. Look, I mean, while you were out with the anesthetic... They uh, planted the goods, whatever they are, in or under your cast. Oh, oh, that is why I am so heavy. The wheel, the wheel. The what? The wheel. Look, I'll show you. He hauled a manila envelope out of his overcoat pocket and waved it on my face. I took it over to my desk and fished out the contents. It was a set of X-ray films. Three of his spine showing the fractures, four of the skull, three I couldn't figure out, and one of his rib cage... Only something new had been added. In silhouette, it looked like the wheel off of a child's wagon. What is it, this wheel? What to do? What to do? Six months, I must remain in this straight jacket. If I remove it, I die. If I keep it on, it, they kill me to get their smuggled. Well, you look to me like the luckiest man alive. That wheel or whatever it is saved your life by stopping four slugs. But still, I shall die. How shall I die? When shall I die? Your best advices, please. Korolenko, 
I think you'd better die right now. Excuse me? It's the only safe place for you. The morgue. I called my friend Maxie the morgue man, gave him pitch number 137596. He agreed to play along. An hour later, I stood on the curb, head bowed, hat in hand, as the morgue wagon drove away into the gathering mist. Fair facing the way, uh... What do you want, Shuggy? I want to blast this gun straight through you, and I will if you give me any excuse at all. You sound like you mean that, Shuggy. You're getting smart, Shamus. I get going. Where to? Mr. Lathrop wants to see you. Shuggy, dear boy, you've not failed me this time. This will be the fabled Mr. Spade, eh? Come in, come in, come in. Ah, sit down, Mr. Spade. We'll talk. Tell your guns will get that pistol out of my ribs. Oh, yes, indeed, Sugar. You mustn't overdo it. And get him out of here. I'm tired and nervous, and my price goes up a thousand bucks every minute he's in this room. When I get to ten thousand, I kill him. Then the price jumps to a hundred to take care of me on a murder rap. I should ought to plug you downstairs. Come, come, Sugar. Don't be ungracious. You wait in the other room now. Okay, it's your party. I get mine later. <laughs> oh, dear. His bite's much worse than his bark, Mr. Spade. Don't start boring me so early in the evening. I came here to talk about the wheel. Oh, so you know about the wheel. I do better than that. I've got it. That may well be, but uh, do you know what to do with it? I got two possibilities. I can turn it over to the cops and you with it, or I can sit on it until it hatches. <laughs> A quaint conceit, sir. Round and round the little wheel goes, and where it shall stop, nobody knows. That's where you're wrong. It stops right here. So you better start placing your bets. Yeah, just what do you mean by that, sir? There's part of it. What is it? It's one of the slugs your guns will throw at Korolenko. I got three more just like it that I dug out of him before he was carried to the morgue. Well, huh. an advantage, I'll admit. But uh, hardly worth your while to take advantage of. Don't be too sure of that. Just uh, how much do you know about the wheel? So far, it's been worth two human lives to you at the risk of your own. That tells me all I need to know. Oh, no, not quite. Men have been killed in holdups for a few paltry sovereigns, but the wheel oh, is a horse of another color. Well, let's not change wheel horses in midstream, Mr. Lather. <laughs> yes. You must understand that the wheel has no absolute finitive value. Uh, monetarily speaking, the British Museum might pay close on to 5,000 pounds, hot as it is for the privilege of returning it. <laughs> Occidentals aren't the puka sides that they once were in the Orient. The theft of the wheel, if countenanced by the Western powers, would have most grave consequences. Most grave. Uh, are you attending, sir? <sighs> Wake me up when you get to the point. Ah, oh, the point, sir, is this. That little wheel, that little wheel of gold, is the wheel of life, which the Buddha himself is said to have received into his hands from paradise. Now, given such a relic, a few old Buddhist monks can set up a shrine which even in the most miserable surroundings can attract enough pilgrims to outgross Radio City, Madison Square Garden, and Miami Beach in season. To say nothing of Hialeah. Uh, yes, quite. In short. We propose to act as booking agents for the wheel on a royalty basis with the percentage of the house. Mm -hmm. Why did you bring it to San Francisco? But, oh, Gad, sir, were we to bargain in the Orient, we should be hacked to pieces in our beds. I'll settle for a lump sum and let you do the bargaining. Uh, and uh, your price, sir? We can talk money later. First, I've got to give the cops somebody for the doctor's murder and for Korolenko. Uh -huh. Well, that ought not to be too difficult. Uh, when may I expect delivery? I'll check on it. I went out to St. James Infirmary. <laughs> City Mark. Maxie, Sam Spade. Yeah, Sammy. Uh, deal's okay. Send it up. The address is... Sam, the... Sam, wait. Yeah? Sam, he ain't here no more. What happened? Somebody claimed him. A girl. Eh, uh, said she's his daughter. What did he do? Well, I'm playing dead like you told him to. Maxie, where did she send him? Uh, Avalon Mortuary, Corner Lynch and Height. Okay, uh, uh, by the way. Uh, yes, Sammy? Uh, Maxie, put some clean sheets in that morgue wagon, size 16. I may be your next passenger. <laughs> At the Avalon Mortuary, the night watchman let me in. He said Mr. Korolenko's daughter had brought an overnight bag and was keeping a vigil by his beer in slumber room number seven. 
I approached on tiptoe. Just as I reached the door, I heard the most terrible sound I've ever heard. It was a buzzsaw biting into plaster. How deep, I didn't like to think. I did the first thing that popped into my head. I grabbed up a lamp from a console, smashed the bulb, and plunged it into a vase of flowers. As luck would have it, slumber room number seven was on the same fuse box. As luck would not have it, I was facing a desperate woman in the dark. I hugged the carpet while she emptied her gun. I hoped she didn't have a spare. I forgot about the buzzsaw. The room lighted up momentarily from the lights inside my head, and I staggered back against the wall. I waited for her to get her bearings again. There was no hope of me getting mine. Then I heard a big, hollow thud. The whole room shook, and the lights went on. Poppy O'Farrell and or Paget lay on the floor under the stony weight of Coralenko plus 60 pounds of plastic. Get up! Get up! You're crushing me! I can't. I'm so heavy. You, uh, you comfortable there, Coralenko? Comfortable in such situation? Do you ask the turtle? Are he comfortable? His faker on bed of nails? He's equally here as elsewhere. Yeah, okay, okay. Just, just hold her there until I get a statement. And he did. Item, statement by the aforesaid. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. That was her story, and I had to admire the way she stuck to it. But if you keep trying, I'm sure she'll get back enough of her memory to confess that she planted the wheel of life in Coralenko's turtle shell when she decided to double-cross Shuggy and Lathrop. They never tumbled to her hiding place. They were gunning for Coralenko because they thought Poppy was working with him. Which was true in a way, but not the way that they thought. That's why they tortured the doctor in an effort to learn Kay's whereabouts. I understand your boys have picked up the rest of the trio, and they can tell you everything except why I conceived the brilliant idea of having Coralenko play dead. Between you and me, uh, amnesia's a handy little gadget to have around, Dundee. I'm trying to draw a few strategic blanks myself. Period. End of report. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. Yes. There are just a few little coincidentals that I do not find entirely reprehensible. Such, uh, such as? Well, I don't want to appear lucid or anything of that type. Believe but... me, you doesn't. I mean, don't it? Oh, you say the sweetest thing. Mm. Uh, but it's about the wheel. Oh, yes, the wheel. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You type that up. I've got to call in about that now. <laughs> Tonight, when you're making out your must-do list for tomorrow, why not include a reminder to get Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair? Honestly, man, you'll be delighted with the neat, natural way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair. The way it relieves that annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Just try it and see if I'm not giving you a good steer. Make a note right now to call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, did you assert the low down on the wheel of life? I certainly didn't. No, we won't know about that for six months. <laughs> because definitively, I mean definitely, that plastic cast has to stay on them. Doctor's orders, you know. Oh, but I won't be here six months from now. You can say that again. But I won't be here six months from now. Stop repeating yourself. But you just said you can say that again. Yeah, mm -hmm. Just as distinctly as if I was sitting here. Uh huh. That's what I like about you, Bernadine. A, a woman of distinction. That's what you are. Well, if you want to take me dancing, why don't you just say so? Bernadine. It's leap year, and I always say discrimination is the better part of value. You are absolutely corrupt. Well, I'm glad I'm right about something. Good night, Mr. Spade. Good night, and I'll say that it kills me, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Granger. This is Granger. The place, my apartment. 
On the Davenport opposite me sits a woman, white-faced and tense. Midnight, this waiting Granger, I can't stand it any longer. I told you it wouldn't be easy, Mrs. Milroy. You should have taken a sleeping tablet and got some rest. I can't. There's always a chance for something might go wrong at the last minute. I hardly think so. That's it, Granger. The telephone. I know. <coughs> Hello? Yes, this is Steve Granger. Of course. He's been here since 10 o'clock. I see. That's it, huh? Yes, I'll tell her. Well? Well? It's over, Mrs. Milroy. Your husband went to the electric chair exactly 11.45 p.m. The attending doctor has just pronounced him dead. This is Steve Granger, private detective, with a story about a man who believed he could get away with murder, and very nearly did. In just a moment, I'll take you back to one of my most interesting cases. The story began the day Mrs. Elwood Milroy walked into my office. She was tall, slim, and beautiful, with red hair and brown eyes, which looked even browner because they were circled with worry. Mr. Granger, I've come to you because there's something terrible and unbelievable taking place. I don't know how to start telling you. Well, the beginning is always a good place. It concerns my husband. Elwood Milroy? Hey, he's a well-known criminologist, right? Yes. And he intends to kill somebody. No kidding. Who's the intended victim? A very good friend of mine named Newman. Peter Newman. Boyfriend? Mr. Granger, I might as well be frank with you. I've been married to Elwood Milroy for 15 years. I realized after it was too late that I should never have married Elwood. I've known Peter for many years. So this isn't just a summer romance, if that's what you're thinking. I don't handle divorce cases, Mrs. Milroy. That's not what I want you to do. The divorce does come into it. My husband's been quite agreeable about one until lately. He saw me lunching with Peter Newman. He was waiting when I arrived home. There was a scene. He changed his mind, said there could never be a separation. Mrs. Milroy, I told you I don't meddle in divorce cases. I know that. What I want you to do is to stop my husband from committing a murder. Why don't you go to the police? You think they believe me? I can't even tell whether you do. Okay, I'll take your case, Mrs. Milroy. How and when do I start? My husband is delivering a lecture this evening at an uptown auditorium. I'm going, and I have an extra ticket. I thought you might like to attend. It might give you something to work on. Yes, it might have that. I'll be there, Mrs. Milroy. One thing, Mr. Granger. My husband is to know nothing of our conversation. At 8 o'clock that night, I was seated near Mrs. Milroy in an auditorium on Upper Broadway. A husband wound up his lecture at exactly 10 p.m. Old-fashioned methods of crime detection are no longer usable when one deals with a modern criminal. As science has advanced, the criminal has also advanced. And you, who are specialists in the field of criminology, must anticipate these advances. I thank you. Well, Edith, my dear, I hardly expected you to attend another one of my lectures. Surely you've heard them so often, you must know them by heart. I always attend your lectures, Elwood. Yes, of course. Oh, you do. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Milroy. I uh, wanted to come over and tell you how much I enjoyed your lecture. Thank you. <laughs> In a small way, uh, I'm in the same business you are. Oh, really? Uh, my name's Granger, Steve Granger. Of course, uh, a private eye, isn't that the phrase? Oh, my dear, permit me, Steve Granger, my wife, Edith. Hello. How do you do? Oh, you enjoyed my lecture, did you? Thoroughly. Well, that's rather strange, Granger. I understand that you were one of the old school type. If you mean I chase them until I catch them, you're right. That's what I'd heard about you. It's too bad that men of your type don't realize that progress is here, even in the criminal field. You'll run into one of the new crop of criminals, Granger, and when you do, where will your old-fashioned methods take you? You'll be as outmoded as a horseless carriage. Now, don't get me wrong. I go in for the scientific stuff, too. The fingerprints, ballistics, all that stuff. <laughs> you use them because you hope the criminal made a blunder. But uh, in the final analysis, it's the old-fashioned bloodhound with its nose to the ground who comes up with the net result. Yes, yes, I've heard all that. And you've confirmed what I've heard about you. Oh, uh, there's someone I must have a word with. Excuse me, won't you? Nice guy. What's the idea of little pills? He popped about three of them in his mouth in as many minutes. What's wrong with him? Is he sick? 
No, but he's a confirmed hypochondriac. Oh, well. Granger, he knows I've spoken to you. You mean you've told him? Of course not. But he sensed it. I'm sure he has. Take it easy now. That's just nerves. No, it isn't. He knows, I tell you. He knows. I hung around the auditorium for a while, then wandered outside. When Elwood Milroy and his wife left the place, I followed them home. Then I loitered around a few minutes and went back to my apartment. I was just putting the key in my door when I got a surprise. Granger, one moment, please. <laughs> Mr. Milroy, well, well, I didn't know you lived in this building. I don't. You know it. I came to see you. Oh, why? I don't like talking in corridors. Can we go in? <laughs> of course. After you, Mr. Milroy. Granger, I'm not going to beat around the bush with you. You followed me home tonight. Did I? Stop evading me. You were in a cream-colored taxi. The number was 673. You dismissed the cab half a block down the street. You loitered around for a while, and then you left. <laughs> How do you know all this, Milroy? You were waiting for me when I walked into this building. That was simple. I slipped out the back door of my place, watched you for a moment, got a cab, and anticipated your next move. I was right. You came here. Nice going. Simple deduction. Now then, Granger... Why were you following me? I'm not at liberty to tell you. Was it my wife? I told you I'm not at liberty to tell you. Oh, it was my wife. Granger, I'm going to tell you something. Edith suffers from a persecution complex. She seems to be under the impression that I'm going to kill her. If you know all this, why come up here? Because I will not be trailed around. I'm not a criminal. I've done nothing wrong. Oh, so if my wife is your client, and I'm reasonably sure she is, I'll tell you something more. I intend to give her the divorce she wants. Have you told her all this? I shall in good time. So, Granger, let me repeat. Leave me alone or I shall take steps. Okay. And until tomorrow, you can take steps right the second through that door, Mr. Crime Expert. <laughs> Suppose I choose not to leave right this now. This is my home. You're an intruder, an insulting intruder, I might say. I'd be justified in throwing you out on your face. You might be justified, but could you do it? Milroy, I've taken all I'm going to from you. You've slung a lot of fancy phrases around, made a lot of nasty cracks. So have you forgotten what you said at the auditorium? I remember every word. Now get out of here. I'll toss you right out. I'd like to see that. Okay, you will. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, that was the scientific little move taken from the book of Judah, Granger. They want some more? <laughs> yes, I think I do. <laughs> really, I'd better leave a little note with you explaining what that was. We call it a rabbit punch. I'll continue with this interesting story in a minute. When I came to, I felt like somebody had played the fight of the bumblebee on the back of my neck with a mallet. I staggered to my feet, sloshed water over my skull, and weaved back into the living room. Milroy had gone. I went to bed. The following morning at the office, an early visitor made an appearance. Mr. Granger, did my husband come to see you last night? He did. I was afraid of that. He's terrible. He looked at me this morning and said it was all set. All set? What do you mean? Let me tell you what happened. It was about nine this morning. I tried to avoid him, but he called me. Edith, come in here, please. I want to have a talk with you. I'd rather not listen if it means another scene. I think you'll hear what I have to say, or there'll be unpleasant consequences. Sit down. Very well. What is it? Why did you employ a private detective to follow me? I... Don't attempt to lie, please. You hired Steve Granger. Why? Because of the way you've been acting, Elwood. How else can a husband act who is about to be... Discarded. Elward, I don't want to go over it again. You're grossly jealous of Peter Newman. You don't want to stay married to me, and you also don't want me to marry anybody else. I don't want you marrying Peter Newman. He's a fool. I refuse to let you make a stupid blunder. It may seem a blunder to you, but it'll seem like paradise to I'm me. I'm asking you once more to reconsider. I know that you've consulted an attorney. You'll try to sue me if I don't go ahead with our original agreement. That is correct. You forced me to be plain, Edith. I'll get the divorce, not you. And I'll get it when, where, and if I want it. If you start any action against me, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. That is the gist of what was said, Mr. Granger. 
What can I do? Mrs. Milroy, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a private investigator. And the more I hear about this fight between you and your husband, the less I want any part of it. You, you mean you don't want to go ahead and work for me? Frankly, it doesn't make sense. You think your husband is going to kill your friend. Have you any proof of that at all? Any evidence besides your imagination? Mr. Granger, when my husband called on you, he intimated that I was unbalanced, didn't he? I wouldn't say that. He said something of the kind. I know he did. That's why you're acting the way you are. I'm sorry, Mrs. Milroy, but I don't think there's anything to this idea you've got. Very well, I leave. But when you remember this conversation, you'll be sorry. Edith Milroy swept out the door, gave me a curt nod, and disappeared down the hall. It was pleasant to forget her and get into something that had less of an odor about it. I got engrossed in some other work. At five that afternoon, the phone rang. Steve Ranger speaking. Mr. Granger, this is Edith Milroy. What is it now, Mrs. Milroy? Is anybody up there looking for me? No. Why would anybody look for you up here? Have you read the latest edition of the paper? No. Why? Peter Newman was found dead in his apartment early this afternoon. He'd been shot. Where are you, Mrs. Milroy? I, I'm in hiding. Why? I'm afraid. You think your husband did the killing? I know he did. Mrs. Milroy, maybe you'd better come up here right now. I'll take you down to police headquarters. You can hand your ideas to Harmison. No, no, I can't do that. He'll work for two away with me, too. Mrs. Milroy, listen to reason. No. Mrs. Milroy, where have you been all afternoon? Were you at Peter Newman's apartment? I'll call you later. Mrs. Milroy. <laughs> that dame is a little off a rocker. <laughs> Wouldn't you think the same? But even so, there was a kind of funny nagging feeling at the back of my head. It might have been just the echo of the rabbit punch delivered by friend Milroy. And again, it might be the feeling that Mrs. Milroy had been right all along. In just a moment, I'll bring you the climax of the case. After Mrs. Milroy's mysterious phone call, I was curious enough to go downstairs and pick up a late afternoon edition. I was still carrying it when the door of Cal Hendricks' apartment shut behind me. The newspaper man wasn't surprised to see me. Well, Steve, what's the good word today? What do you know about Elwood Milroy? He's a criminologist, one of the best in the business. What else do you know about him? Personally, I mean. Not much. Has an accurate disposition, not the type who fondles children. Hey, why the interest in Mr. Milroy? You're thinking of taking a short course in scientific crime detection? I might. So, you are here. Well, Jake, uh, you know Lieutenant Rankin, Cal. I know him, but I can't say it's a pleasure. That's the comedy news, boy. Granger, I want a word with you. When you weren't at your office, I figured you'd be here. What's up, Lieutenant? Seen the papers? Read about a man named Peter Newman getting shot earlier today? I might have noticed that little item. Why? Did a Mrs. Milroy retain you, Granger? Mrs. Milroy? We have information that Mrs. Milroy came to you. Why? Why does anyone come to a private investigator? Come on, come on. Stop stalling, Granger. Why did she employ you? Was it because she was afraid of her husband? Did she have an idea that her husband was going to kill Newman? Maybe. You know where Mrs. Milroy is now? Nope. You see, Granger... She's involved in this killing. Up to her ears. The gun that did the killing belonged to her husband. It was by the door. How do you tie in uh, Mrs. Milroy? An informant told us that she was at Peter Newman's apartment about the time the killing took place. Oh. And speaking of fingerprints, they were a woman's. We'd like to have a little chat with Mrs. Milroy. They were hers. Uh huh. Knowing that you cooperate to the fullest extent with the police department, we wouldn't like to entertain a notion that you might be hiding the suspect. Dear boy, I wouldn't dream of it. I'm glad to hear you say that, Granger. Mr. Granger, I I've been looking all over for you. I went to your office and the man next door told me you might be here. I am? So what? I've got to talk to you privately. The police have identified the gun that killed Peter. Granger. Yeah? Do you mind if I enter this charming little group? I'd like to meet this lady. Oh, so glad to oblige. Mrs. Milroy, let me present Lieutenant Rankin of Homicide. You're a police officer? I am, Mrs. Milroy. And you and I are going downtown for a little chat. But I haven't done anything. I'm I'm not guilty. I... I... Stranger, help me, please. If he does, he'll be obstructing justice. And if he does that, he'll occupy a cell, too. Come on, Mrs. Milroy. 
Interesting little scene, Steve. Yeah, wasn't it? Going to help Mrs. Milroy out? Why should I? Because you're the Galahad type kid. Yeah, I guess I am at that. I got on the phone and tried to trace Elwood Milroy. But I was out of luck. Then I went down to police headquarters and had a few words with Lieutenant Rankin. As a result, I was granted an interview with Mrs. Milroy in her cell. Mr. Granger, please help me. I'm not guilty of murder. I'm not guilty of anything. You sure, Mrs. Milroy? You were seen going into the building where Peter Newman lived. That doesn't mean I killed him. Now, tell me something. Why were your fingerprints on that murder weapon? It must have been my husband's gun. He had it out a few days ago. There'd been prowlers in the neighborhood, he said, and he wanted me to be able to use it if necessary. He showed me how to handle it. Mm -hmm. Well, don't you see? Elbert killed Peter and made it look like I did it. Well, Granger? I don't know, Jake. It looks ungood for her, Granger. She was seen going into Newman's place about the time he was killed. And what about her husband? Elwood Milroy is working like a soldier. For her? Of course. When did you see him? Before you came down. Has he got an alibi? An unbreakable one, Granger. He was at his club for lunch. Twenty members saw him. He went to an early movie. The usher remembers him. Sounds almost too perfect. There's no almost about it, Granger. Jake, how about letting me examine the apartment where Peter Newman was killed? With pleasure, pal. I love watching you squirm. As a matter of fact, I'll go along with you. A sort of, uh, guided... Oh, thanks. This is his apartment, Granger. Hey, how come it isn't sealed? I forgot to tell you. Her husband is up here working. The great Milroy himself, huh? Okay, come on. Now give me a breakdown on what you found. Peter Newman was lying over there, alongside the Davenport. The gun was here by the door. So he didn't shoot himself and throw the gun away. Got it out. I thought I heard... Oh, hello, Lieutenant. And it's Mr. Granger, isn't it? Yeah. You two know each other? Quite well, don't we, Granger? I've got a good notion. Yeah, cut that out, Granger. What's the matter with you? Oh, Granger is a trifle annoyed. We played a little game last night. He lost. What's this? Forget it. If you'll excuse me, I'll get back to my work. Wise guy. Now, what happened? Well, he came up to my place. I tried to throw him out. You what? He's one of the country's foremost exponents of judo. Don't worry. I found it out. Let's go. There's nothing here. Okay. Hey, do they have a doorman in this building? They do. He's got a little office just inside the door. Good. This it? Yeah. Yes? I want to ask you some questions about Peter Newman. Oh, I don't know about That's that. That's all right, Smith. You can answer them. Uh, I didn't see you there, Lieutenant. What is it, sir? Were you on duty when uh, Peter Newman was shot? I was. Now, uh, how many people came to see him? He, he had only one visitor. That Mrs. Melroy, she came to see him. Nobody else, huh? No, sir. How about deliveries of one kind or another, like laundry or groceries? Well, now that you mention it, there was one delivery made. A messenger, he was. Had a box of candy. A messenger? What did he look like? Oh, rather old, I'd say. His hair was very gray. Had kind of a stoop. Was this his usual delivery? Never saw him before. Well, thanks a lot. Franken, let's go back to Newman's apartment. I want to find that box of candy. <laughs> Peter Newman's apartment yielded the box of candy. One piece was gone. Gave me an idea. One that took me back downtown to police headquarters. And another quick visit with Mrs. Edith Milroy. Mr. Granger. Mrs. Milroy, how well did you know Peter Newman's habits? What habits, Mr. Granger? Well, for instance, if he chewed gum or if he had candy. I don't think that Peter was very fond of candy. Mm Mm-hmm. Would he be the type of person to have a box of candy sent to his apartment rather than go out and pick it up in person? That's a strange question. I I wouldn't know. One more thing. When you were in Newman's apartment, did you notice a freshly opened box of candy? No. And what's the box of candy got to do with it? It probably uh, spells the difference between life and death for you, Mrs. Milroy. 
I went back to Rankin's office and found him working like a beaver with a leak in his dam. The request I made was barely out of the ordinary. But, Granger, we've gone through his things. What makes you think you'll find something? Lieutenant, this is a routine request. I want to look over his clothes. All right, all right, but you're wasting my time. Which is paid for with the taxpayer's money. Which is my money because I'm a taxpayer. So come on, servant, show me Peter Newman's stuff. Rankin took me down to the morgue where I poured over Peter Newman's belongings. There was the usual wallet, with the usual identification cards and whatnot. I went over his suit with great care, even pinching the buttons. When I got to the cuffs on his trousers, I found a little something. A little something that sent me on an errand that took me first to a druggist. Why, yes, sir, I can identify this pill. It's a prescription for one of my customers. Are you at liberty to tell me who this customer is? I'm not sure if I can divulge that information or not. If it's a matter of police business, could you? Oh, in that event, I'm sure I could. The druggist gave me the first solid clue. Then I headed for a certain movie house. The cashier at the theater, bright-eyed and sharp, gave me the second. When I'd finished with her, I got Rankin to meet me at a certain address. So this is where the Milroys live, huh? Right. You're not trying to tell me that Elwood Milroy killed Peter Newman. Wait and find out. Well, how do you do, gentlemen? Come in. Thanks. To what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? Elwood Milroy, you shot and killed Peter Newman and framed your wife. <laughs> Please, Granger, don't be silly. Excuse me a second. If you're thinking of getting a gun, I'd forget it. I know what he's looking for, Jake. His pills. What's the matter, Milroy? Nervous? Need a couple of your pills to steady you down? They're a prescription. My doctor told me to take them. I know. Your druggist told me about them. Druggist? That's where you made your first mistake, Milroy. That and one other place, the theater. The cashier saw you go in. But nobody saw you leave. Obviously. There was a crowd leaving with me. The picture was over. You left before the end of the picture. Really? Then how is it I can recite the movie's entire plot? Because you went to the same theater the day before. The cashier remembers that visit. But that wasn't your biggest mistake, Milroy. No, Meth? When did you see Peter Newman last? Two weeks ago. Oh, no. It was much more recently. Today, in fact. You walked into his apartment disguised as a messenger. And I know you were there, Mr. Crime, come judo expert. Because you keep flipping those pills of yours, and I found one of those pills in the dead man's trouser cuff. You must have been a bit nervous and dropped one. Funny how often a little thing will fall into a guy's trouser cuff. How does that prove I saw him today? Might have happened two weeks ago. Bad luck, Milroy. Human had had his suit cleaned the day before. Yet, Milroy, you laughed at me because I'm the type who runs around with his nose to the ground. But if I hadn't, I would never have found the clue that busted your perfect crime. And that'll send you to the chair. You, you dirty sloop! I'll kill you! I can look out! You get away! <laughs> well, friends, that's the story. I'll be back to wrap up the case. In just a minute. Elwood Milroy went to hospital with a bullet through the arm. With evidence piling up against him, he was accused of killing Peter Newman. Ultimately, he was convicted. I paid a call on my friend Lieutenant Jake Rankin at his office. Well, Granger, you might be interested. Elwood Milroy was sentenced to the chair this morning. So much for his too perfect alibi, huh, Jake? And, uh, for old-fashioned detective method. Yeah. Have you seen Mrs. Milroy? Saw her just an hour ago. She saw me, too. With a neat check, complete with numbers. You know, you were lucky finding that pill. How'd you ever dream it up? Because I'm no great hand at criminology. I just run around with my nose to the ground. Would you do that in here? Hardly. <laughs> this joint's got sawdust on the floor. In that case, you won't mind if I pick up that $5 bill down there. What? Hey, hey, that's mine. 
I've been meaning to have that hole in my pocket sewn up. Too bad, Gumshoe. I had my nose to the ground that time. Well, that's one for the books. The Flatfoot was his own bloodhound. Steve Granger again. You've just heard one of the most interesting cases in my files. And I'll have another one for you. So be around next time. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak, for hire. You gotta put it in block letters because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, there's a price tag on everything. You gotta do that or marry a rich widow. I don't like to work that hard, so I rent boats and do anything else that's cash and carry. Oh, it's all right. You don't mind trouble because that's one thing you can't duck. It's like trying to dance the minuet and skis. And the best trouble always looks good from the outside. You're all smiles, and you feel like a kid opening a hand grenade under the Christmas tree. I found that out Tuesday night. It was around 7 o'clock, and I was getting ready to close the office when this little guy showed up. He was about the size of a golf bag with arms. If he had a cigar box, he could see over a pool table. He walked up to the desk and started talking in a voice that made you think he was trying to put Lily Pons out of work. Hello, you know back? You're doing all right so far. What's on your mind? I'm Jackie Gregg. You heard of me, huh? You're the shy type, I know. I'm Jackie Gregg, the jockey. You heard of me, huh? All right, now I heard of you. Put the show on the road. I'm looking for a horse. You want to find me a horse? Yeah, I breed him in the back room. What color you want? You're so tough, I got to take that from you? Calm down before you wind up in a boys' choir. If you got anything to sell, put it on the line or beat it. I'm riding the horse tomorrow called Fleet Lady. She's disappeared. Well, she's not here. I'm supposed to ride the sixth race with her tomorrow. The Bonanza handicap, and she's gone. All right, she's gone. Maybe your horse likes to go out at night. I haven't seen her. Get to the point. I'll give you 200 bucks to find that horse. Somebody took her in a van. I trailed him down here at the waterfront. But you lost him up at the ferry building. That's right. Something funny's going on. My mount disappeared, and you gotta find her. This is a big waterfront, and where's the 200 bucks? You'll get that, all right. Found by Pier 19, they turned in. You think you can find Fleet Lady? I don't know. Who owns her? Woman named Sybil Thornton. She's, um, mixed up, I think. Yeah. Why steal your own horse? I don't know. Run a ringer, maybe. That's a tough trick. This woman's got some good ones. You want the 200 bucks? Yeah. How are the odds? What's the difference? You gonna open a book? You better take the 200 bucks now. Yeah. The dole keep. You sound frightened, Junior. And you sound nosy. Here's the 200. I want you to find the horse. You let me know at the Kingston Hotel, huh? Sure. If you don't find anything around the waterfront, maybe you better try the track. Ask around there. Yeah, by the way, how do you fit in? How come you got $200 interest in that horse? Maybe I love horses. What do you care if maybe I love horses? I don't. A guy like you's got to love something. Oh, it was a real sweet proposition. A jockey in search of a horse. Uh, there was something phony about the whole thing. I had the 200 bucks, but I didn't feel good. It was like a guy stealing a murder gun to help out on a scrap metal drive. Well, after the little guy left, I closed the office and started to hit the docks, but it didn't work out. You can buy good whiskey these days, so you feel funny walking up to some guy on the pier and asking, Have you seen a racehorse around here, mister? Well, by nine, I was sure that horse wasn't around, so I borrowed a car and drove out to the track. I found out where Sybil Thornton's horses were quartered and headed down that way. 
was pretty dark. So when I bumped into her, all I got was a vague outline. She had a good-looking, vague outline. Oh. I'm very sorry. Yeah, I'm full of regrets, too. Should we try it again? Aren't you a little mixed up in your animals? They keep horses here. You don't seem to mind. No, you lean nicely. But you'd probably feel safer with a platform. Well, we'll try this again when I've had three good meals. That's a horse. Yes, I know. In fact, I own it. I see. That'd make you Sybil Thornton. Yes, what would that make you? A guy named Pat Novak looking for your horse. I was hired in the waterfront to find her. Why, they grow big on the waterfront. You must get a lot of sun. By the way, is Fleet Lady missing? Your jockey says she is. That's why I'm snooping around. Didn't know he had any friends. He's got a checkbook. How about Fleet Lady? Is she tucked in bed? Yeah. Let's take a look. You'd find it very dull, Mr. Novak. Yeah, that's what they said to Anthony. Let's see the horse, huh? Suit yourself. She's down this way. Okay. I'm doing this out of the bigness of my heart. I think you're wasting my generosity, Mr. Novak. Don't use it all this trip. It's from in the stable. Come on. All right. Down about here. Sweet lady's stall. Here. There's a flashlight on the wall. Okay. Poor thing. Do your horses die broke, too? Who is it, Fleet Lady? Yes, are you satisfied? No, I'm going to ring up headquarters. Are you crazy? Then I'm going to call Jackie Gregg and tell him his hunch paid off. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Novak. Stop kidding me, sweetheart. She didn't get killed in a fight with another horse. Gregg figured somebody was tilting the machine. That's why Fleet Lady's dead. That's why I'm going to call headquarters. Shoot yourself, but remember what happened to Fleet Lady. You getting tough, Angel? No. You just wouldn't look good with a saddle, Mr. Novak. <laughs> I watched her as she turned and walked out of there. It was the kind of a walk that makes you flip the calendar and find out how far away spring is. Well, I looked around a while, but it didn't do any good. The place was full of doors, so whoever killed Fleet Lady got out easy like a rumor at a church picnic. I closed the door and went down the line to call headquarters. As I stood in there talking, I saw Sybil Thornton drive by. It was a long convertible with red asbestos seat covers. After I called headquarters, I went back and waited near the stable. About a half hour later, a police car pulled up, and when I saw who got out, I began to get unhappy like a three-legged man in a ballet school. It was Hellman from Homicide, and he had a squad with him. All right, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. Hello, Novak. Where's your trainer? Your boys get paid to laugh at you, Hellman. I don't. Yeah. Where's the horse? What are you doing on the case? I came for the ride. You mind, Novak? No, I just wondered if they wised up downtown. Yeah. Because you could find a dead horse, Hellman. If they staked it out in the middle of Market Street, you'd find it before long. I'll try this time. Where is it? Stall 18 over there. Yeah. Keep an eye on him, boys. I'll be back in a minute. In here, Novak? Yeah, the one with the teeth like yours. You better shut up, Novak. Don't get jumpy. You haven't seen the horse. Just shut up, huh? Yeah, wasn't going to be much of a conversation anyway. What color horse was that, Novak? What do you mean? Take a look. Yeah, I did. I just took a look. It's a smart horse, Novak. Huh? That's right. That dead horse in there is wearing a double-breasted suit. Hellman got the message straight. I walked in and took a look. Jackie Gregg was lying there on the floor as dead as last year's love. The sickness didn't show until we rolled him over on his stomach. Somebody had gone duck hunting in the middle of his back. I began to feel a little sick myself and was ready to send out for the same gun when Hellman started to talk. You forgot to mention the guy when you phoned headquarters. He wasn't there. I was in here before and the guy wasn't around. What was he doing out of the horse? I don't know. Hellman maybe crawled out of a crack. I don't know. There were two shots. I came in and found the horse. Yeah? Check the horse. You're trying to tell me the horse shot back? Who is he? A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg. He gave me 200 bucks to find a missing horse. Yeah? A horse called Fleet Lady running into Mars Handicap. This is the end of the line. How do you know it's the same one? I don't. Maybe you gotta be a horse to tell. Why don't you ask one of your boys? <laughs> yeah. Your boy's real tough. Call him off, Hellman. He's nasty. We all hate him, Novak. It's all right. 
I'll put it on your bill, Hellman. That's good. You can write it up at headquarters. Hellman, you ought to run an idiot. The heavy thinking's too much for you. I can piece this together. We come out here and find a dead man with you kicking up dust 40 feet away. Look, Hellman, I didn't kill the guy and then call up headquarters. I know they're bad in homicide, but I'm not that big-hearted. We got a spare hook for you, Novak. That's where you stay until somebody gets you off. Well, you can start out with Sybil Thornton. Another horse? She's got the speed for it. Look her up. She owns Fleet Lady, and she was dashing around here in the dark, playing easy to get. I'll look her up. You better leave the boys behind. After all, she's only a woman. When you see her... Ask about that van down on the waterfront and ask what she was doing before I made that phone call. I'll tag all the bases. Don't worry, Junior. And if things fit together, you'll both be in the jug. I'll see you later. I got work to do. Yeah, it's getting late. You better put the boys back in the cage. I began to worry after Hellman left. There was no murder gun and he didn't have too much to go on, but... Because no one else wanted my job. I knew the girl was going to have an alibi, and I was the last guy that Jackie Gregg had seen. I had about as much chance as a fat girl at a Princeton prom. Hellman didn't like me, and he was a smart cop with a disposition like a ton of rhubarb. I had to start right from scratch. I felt like Adam the first morning he woke up. So I looked up a guy named Jocko Madigan an ex-doctor and a boozer who will give you a lift if you show him where the stirrups are. Oh, a good guy, but he thinks all food makes a gurgle. I hit all the bars and finally found him up at Maggie Nielsen's apartment. She's a good-looking voice that lives up on the hill, and Jocko was working his way into her liquor supply. Hello, Patsy. You're just in time to join me for my first drink of the evening, uh, or one of my first, at least. Yeah, I see. Maggie's not here, but I found her whiskey. It was in plain sight, locked in the closet under some newspapers. All right, Jocko, when are you going to sober up? I plan to do it briefly on April 1st, when the rest of the world plays the fool also. I'm in trouble, Jocko. you got to help me. Good. I've got a special bottle I use to forget your troubles. Stop caressing that jug and listen to me. I'm in a jam. Patsy, there's nothing in nature so sad as a half-empty bottle. It's like a broken vow or an unfulfilled promise in the skies. A falling star, almost. All right, Jocko. A falling star, and you shrug it off, never realizing that a whole world has ended at that moment. A hundred million dreams, maybe, and you watch it fall and make an asinine wish, and that's all the good it does a star to fall. It gives some kid a chance to wish for a bicycle. You finished now, Jocko? Yes. What kind of trouble? Anything I could aggravate? I'm mixed up out at the track. A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg is dead, and I don't look good. Uh, Hellman? Yeah. The guy's a jockey, and he hired me to find a horse named Fleet Lady. Did you? Uh, the horse and the jockey ran a dead heat. But there's something funny about the whole deal. Did you talk to the jockey? Not enough. Well, Patsy, you've got to break yourself of the habit of waiting until people are dead before you think of a question. Jocko, I want you to hit all the horse rooms. Find out what you can about the sixth race tomorrow. It's the Bonanza Handicap and hurry up, will you? Well, if it's the sixth race, why can't we wait a while? Start now. Get everything you can and call me. I'll leave a message at your place. Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe up to see the girl. Patsy, you're going to be waving at the hangman's wife when they spring the trap door. I gotta see her. She owns Fleet Lady. Why don't I see her? She's got a stake somewhere. I got a lot of questions. What could you do up there? Uh, yes, if it weren't an academic question, I'd argue the point. Looked like a bum deal right from the start. Oh, Patsy, you have the instinct for recognizing trouble, but not the intelligence to duck it. Jocko, will you get out to those horse parlors? I need facts, not fables. Now give me a hand. All right. Give my love to a fleet lady. Her name's Sybil Thornton. Well, I'll bet I'm not far wrong. Good night, lover. <laughs> After I left Jocko, I went to the Chronicle morgue and looked up Paul Stangle. We pulled out the clips on Sybil Thornton. We were nice and fat because she'd been to Reno four times and hadn't broke training for years. She'd been traded around more than a Red Sox pitcher. The clipping said that she was 32. There were a lot of pictures, and from her eyes, you got the idea that she was around 35. But there were arguments the other way, too. There weren't any stories on her for the last few months, just a few items from the columns. They all said the same thing. She was hitting the night spots with a gambler named Rudy Hauser. There were pictures of him, too. Oh, he would have looked real good in a cave with heavy curtains. 
I asked Paul. He said Hauser had a gambling place out on Geary, so I took a cab out there. For ten bucks, the guy at the door said Sybil Thorne had left the place an hour ago. That made me feel good. When Hauser opened the door to his office, I lost the glow. Yeah? What's with you? I got a problem. You got the wrong door. Well, you can't get any tougher, so I'm coming in. Hmm. Suit yourself. I never throw anybody out until I'm sure they've lost all their money. What's on your mind? A horse named Fleet Lady. She disappeared at 7 o'clock tonight. Hey, you check under the rug. I'll try the cabin. She got back just in time to greet somebody's gunsel. If I say no, will you go out and lose your money like a good boy? Fleet Lady was owned by a gal named Sybil Thornton. The columns say you're number five on her list. And they never lie. The whiskey's too good. Also, a little bird says she was in your office an hour ago. That's right. She said your name's Novak. Oh. The next time you got a bombshell, give it a test run. With Fleet Lady dead, your money's going to look good in the sixth tomorrow. What makes you think that gal would throw a race? For the same reason she goes out with you. Huh? When a gal takes a great dane like you out in public, it generally means the guy's a few bucks ahead of her. <coughs> you want to fight the team now, Novak? Oh. Just remember. Sometimes you can't be right in the gentleman, too. Yeah, I hope that's the way you feel when they pick you up for Jackie Gregg's murder. Huh? Oh, you do a real nice double take, mister. The jockey checked out with a horse. I didn't know that, Novak. Yeah, with no brains, you built this gambling club. I didn't know that he was dead. I told you that, Novak, and I meant it. It was all right for a little punk. I'm sorry he's dead. So is he. I'll see you later, Hauser. I got to nose around and find out where you were tonight. Yeah. You see him all right, Novak. So I'll tell you. If you got any dough left when you leave my table, it's better than a horse named Fleet Lady in the sixth race tomorrow. You always bet on a dead horse? You got the tip. Use it or bury it, but don't loan it out. Oh, the case was a regular grab bag when I walked out of Hauser's office. I began to tick off the things that didn't add up. First on the list was that van down on the waterfront. If it was Fleet Lady, who got shot in the stable? If it was the ringer, that meant Fleet Lady had run tomorrow. I couldn't figure out why Hauser was so sure she'd win. An idea kept racing around in the back of my mind like an ant in a cookie factory. Jackie Gregg lied about that van down on the waterfront, but why? Not to bail me out of the poorhouse with 200 bucks. I got part of the answer when I stopped with the pay telephone and called Hellman. Yeah, Hellman talking. This is Novak. I got some news. You'll have to put it on the back page. What do you got? Your friend Jackie Gregg had some love life. Well, there's a chance for you, Hellman. Who's the girl? Sybil Thornton? Yeah, we found her picture in his wallet. The gooey kind. I'll bet you stole it for long train rides. What time did he die? The right fit for you between 9 and 10 o'clock. Two shots from a 32 caliber pistol. How about the horse? 45 caliber. Two people? It's getting involved. Maybe, maybe not. You got two hands, Novak. Look up a guy named Rudy Hauser. He's got a joint out on Geary Street. I got enough friends. You look him up. I did. He's still talking about Fleet Lady in tomorrow's race. All right, maybe he's sentimental. Look, Novak, I'll pick out my own work. I don't need free help from you. Jackie Gregg paid 200 bucks, and look what he got. Suit yourself, but Rudy Hauser and that gal are close friends. Yeah? Like two-part harmony in a telephone booth. Now, get off the dime, Hellman. Hauser's got that gal in his hip pocket. She owns Fleet Lady, and he's betting her to win. You're trying hard, Novak. It's got to be a slow field to lose to a dead horse. Wake up, Hellman. You couldn't smell a rat in a basement full of cheese. I did all right in your apartment. Huh? That thirty-two caliber pistol. We found it up at your place. See you later. Well, I wasn't too worried about that. Hellman's smart enough to know a phony plan. I began to think about that thirty-two caliber pistol. It's a woman's weapon, but that doesn't prove anything. So is a bread knife if she's in a bad mood. Must have been about midnight when I got to Sybil Thornton's place. She was wearing black lounging pajamas, tied tight around a slim waist. She looked like a wasp with a nice sting, and she had company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Mr. Novak, this is Ronnie Stark. Hello, Novak. Oh. Well, he's not very friendly, Sybil. He's just pouting because they're going to arrest him for Jackie's murder. How do you like Hellman? You've known him longer. Yeah. Somebody left the murder gun up at my place. Where you been all night? Please, Mr. Novak. You're embarrassing Ronnie. That's right. I'm blushing, and it's not the whiskey, Novak. I see. You must stay longer, Ronnie. <sighs> he's persuasive, huh, Novak? 
I'll see you tomorrow. You won't forget, Ronnie. No, I won't forget. Oh, I'm betting on you, Novak. What won't he forget? Mr. Novak, I hope nobody ever asks you that question. Hmm. You don't want to talk about putting that gun in my apartment? No. Let's talk about Rudy Hauser, then. Hmm? Your meat grinder friend. We just had a good talk, and he opened up a new road. What'd you tell him? Don't break a spring. He's all right. Will you do me a favor, Patsy? Like not talking to Hauser anymore, huh? That's right. Won't do you any good, Patsy, and it'll do me a lot of good. How's he going to know which horse got killed? I'll bet you lied to him, Angel. It's my apple cart, Patsy. Leave it alone. Sure. But play your hand right, baby, because I'm going to watch your cards. And if you got one that says Jackie Gregg, I'm going to call you the hard way, too. Patsy, you're a nice beast. I really think you would. Sit down. Yeah. Drink? No. Do you good? Not right now. Well, you've read the book. Just a couple of chapters. You bet they're the right ones. You better watch out, baby. I may be a long shot. Well, you care as long as I bet. I don't. Yeah, it's good. I didn't think you'd mind. All right, Angel. It's time to wire the folks. You to know that. Just wait till you know me better. That's for me. I left the number. It's your fault, then. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. What'd you find out, Jocko? Not much. Nobody seems to care about the six race. I care about it. Well, that's because you killed one of the jockeys. The rest of the people have a more casual interest. How do the odds run? No heavy favorites. Vin Air and Sleepy Time Gal figure to be the best at around five to one. What about Fleet Lady? Down the line somewhere. I talked to one fellow. He says she's a dog and couldn't beat a paralytic goose over a hundred yards. Yeah, what else? That's all. What do you mean, that's all? Start digging, Jocko. We're not getting any place. Not even at your end? Huh? I counted on you to do better than that. Right, lover? On the way home, I bought the morning papers. There was a story on Jackie Gregg. No details. Most of the story was a statement by Hellman on Hellman. There was no mention of Fleet Lady. And at one o'clock in the morning, there was nothing I could do but roll into bed. I woke up about nine and called Jocko. It was like sending a message out to the Farallones by Indian Runner. He just muttered and said he'd meet me out at the track. Well, I had to have some more dope, so I called Ira Snow. He calls the races and bets on them. The way he does it, a horse is a real beast of burden. He was playing elf when I got him on the wire. Yeah. Ira, this is Novak. What do you know about the Bonanza handicap? It's a horse race. Oh, you're funny. What about the field? Are the horses any good? Uh, for hamburgers, maybe. Nothing else. How about Fleet Lady? Uh, Eastern track. Nobody knows. Would she be worth a heavy plunge? If you want to be a monk. What's this all about? Ira, I'm in trouble. How about a fix? Could they run in a ringer on Fleet Lady? It's been done before, but it ain't easy. That's what I figured. How's Rudy Hauser on horses? He ain't. He got burned a long time ago. He never bets. I think you're wrong. Look, Novak, I know every guy in town that's got the itch. Rudy Hauser, no. You know a guy named Ronnie Stark? Sure, runs a book. Why? Nothing. I may see you at the track. I'm going to make a bet. Yeah, I'll tell the horses. Well, that left me in a hole. If Ira was right, Rudy Hauser on Fleet Lady didn't make a bit of sense. I got out to the track about 2.30. Jocko was there, and Hellman was wandering around up in the grandstand where they couldn't push him into a starting gate. Sybil Thornton waved from her box as I moved over to get a better shot at the starting line for the sixth. They were almost at the post when Jocko came back from the betting window. Well, Patsy, I bet two dollars on a horse called Scotch Victory. It seemed like a good omen. Yeah. I saw your friend Rudy Hauser at the window. Huh? He was pouring money down on the favorites to win. Well, that's why the odds have gone down on Venere and Sleepy Time Gal. Look at that board. Yes, Fleet Lady's gone all the way up to 12 to 1. Yeah, from 8 to 1, all the way up. Maybe the word got around she's dead. No, that's the funny part. She's down there, number three on the rail, see? Not a peep out of anybody. Yeah. They are up and running. Hot weather is going to the front by one. Sleepy time gal by ahead. 
Fleet Lady Between Horses is running third by one length. On the outside, it's Benair and Old Soldier by two lengths. Going into the clubhouse turn, it's Hot Weather by two lengths. Sleepy Time Gal by a half length. Fleet Lady is moving up on the outside. It's Benair fourth by one length. Fleet Lady and runs soldier. well for a ghost. Yeah. Yeah, Rudy Howes had better hurry or he won't see much, huh? He better hurry. He left the track ten minutes ago. Huh, are you sure, Jocko? Yes, I heard him tell someone he had to make a phone call just before the betting closed. Well, Jocko, you're a sweetheart. Oh, I like to Let's go to the stable. That, well, the race isn't over. It was over five minutes ago. Well, how about my two dollars? Come on, will you? There's only one person who won't try to fix a horse race. That's a horse. <laughs> I knew there was going to be trouble fast. The horses were just coming under the wire when I waved the helmet and started for the stable. When we got there, Sybil Thornton was clearing out like a fire sale. I'm in a hurry, Patsy, darling. Let me by. No, you made a bad play, Angel. Stick around. Let me by, Patsy. You heard him, lady. Stick around. Thanks, copper. I'll take charge. That's a big gun, Hauser. I got up big deep. You let me drop a hundred grand, Sybil. Was your idea, Rudy? Not this way. You let me drop a hundred grand because you ran Fleet Lady. The program said Fleet Lady, and that's who ran. I brought those odds in the line at the window. My other 80 looked bad on Fleet Lady. You didn't stay to watch her trail the field. All right, I didn't stay. You lost your hundred grand. You killed the ringer. You were a smart big shot who was going to sew up the race. You ran Fleet Lady and cost me a hundred grand. All right, copper, move away from her. Over this way, Sybil. No. Don't let him do it, Patsy. I want to see how tough you are. Come on, Sybil. Let's you and me move over against the stall. Watch out, Hauser. You're backing into the horse. Grab the horse, no back. He's going to trample him. You grab him. It's your idea. Is he dead? Yeah. Should have learned the first time. You can't beat the horses. That's a bum joke, Novak. I guess it is. Now that we're all here, who do we book for Jackie Gregg's murder? I'll answer that one, friend. Who's this guy? One you missed, Hellman. Hello, Stark. Hi, Novak. Well, what are you waiting for, Sybil? Tell the man you killed Jackie Gregg. I've had enough trouble today, Ronnie. You got more coming. You figured it out yet, Novak? Hauser dumped his 80 grand on you. That's right. It's a lot of spending money. Wait a minute. Ronnie, I don't like this. Now you get your half, baby. I'm going to write out an I.O.U. And when they book you for murder and the vote's in, you can't use it. You wouldn't do a thing like that, Ronnie. A dead girl can't spend 40 grand. She killed your guy, Copper, and tried to palm it off on Novak. I was there, so I'll testify. Ronnie, you're a no-good guy. Don't be silly. I love justice. Well, book her for murder, Copper. I want to tear up that I.O.U. <laughs> finally worked it out. Started out as a fixed race, and when they were all through, it was up to the horse. Rudy Hauser put the squeeze on Sybil for some dough. She offered to run a fast ringer in place of Fleet Lady, so Hauser could pick up a bag full. Rudy just wanted to make sure, so he sent one of his boys around to knock off Fleet Lady. Only the guy killed the ringer instead. It was a break for Sybil. She made a deal with a bookie named Ronnie Stark to take all of Hauser's bets and guaranteed him that Fleet Lady couldn't win because she wasn't that good a horse. It panned out that way. She let Hauser think Fleet Lady was dead. He spent 20 grand at the window pushing up the odds on Fleet Lady and dumped another 80 on her to win. A moving van? It was a phony story Greg used to get me to scare Sybil. He wanted in on the deal. He went back to the stable that night, got in a beef, and she killed him. She had him out in her car. When I went to make that phone call, she figured it was a good way to pass the buck. Well, Hellman asked only one question. Why would a nice, tame horse go crazy and 
trample a man to death. Jocko had the answer. The horse that killed Hauser was a filly. The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You want Mr. Wolf to what? Mr. Wolf will do nothing of the sort, Archie. Mr. Wolf is thirsty. Hold on for a moment. Uh, the bottle opener is in the left hand drawer of your desk. Thank you, Archie. Mr. Wolf, I've got a man named Denby on the phone. He wants you to umpire a card game. The man is insane. He's offering a fee. The answer is no. I know nothing of card games, nor do I wish to learn. Okay. Well, the answer's no, Mr. Denby. Sure, I'll ask him again. After he finishes the beer he's working on. Goodbye. People appall me. The fantasies they indulge in. Bah, what on earth made that maniac think I might consent to preside at a card game? Well, seems he expects one of the players to be death. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Wolf would not attend, but the card game went on anyway. At the home of a Mr. Stephen Denby. Well. Gene? Yes? The custom? Mr. Piper? Mm-hmm. I think we're ready to begin, eh? I'm ready. Yes, Gene. You always are. How I like that remark. I'll have to decide later on. Yeah, please do. The custom? It's all right with me. And Mr. Piper? I, uh, I brought a deck. No, as host, I shall supply the card. Uh, before we play, I examine them, yes? Of course. Here you are. Chuck. Yeah, Mr. Denby. You will remain outside the door until called. No one is to enter this room under any circumstances. Got it. Lucasta? The cards look all right. Thank you. Now then... Shall we make things absolutely clear? You mean, should you make a speech? I don't mind. But uh, make it short, huh? I shall. The four of us seated at this table are joint owners of the Candy Club, a rather successful institution devoted to the sale of food, liquor, entertainment... And the gambling. And games of chance. For some time now, we have all resented sharing the profits. Some of us have attempted to buy out the others. Again, you needn't babble on. No one wants to sell. We know that. True, true, Mr. Piper. Which is the reason for this little game of cards? One hand shall be dealt to each of us. A hand at poker. Whoever wins, gets the club. The others, retire as gracefully as they can. Agreed? That's why we... Agreed. Very well. The cards are shuffled. I'll place them in the center of the table. 
Bacasto, would you like to... I cut. Good. If nobody minds, I'll cut them too. After Mr. Bacasto. Nobody minds. Happy now, Mr. Piper? Let's get going, huh? Very well. Unless Jean would care to... Oh, We're all crooks here, which sort of cancels out any funny business with a card. Very well. We shall all draw a card in turn until five cards are drawn by each player. Shall we start, Jean? Sure. Lucasto? Okay. Mr. Piper? Yes, of course. And myself. We just keep going in rotation. This is fun. Fun? No, no. There's too much money which rides on these cards. That's what makes it fun. Uh, would you mind keeping quiet? I'm nervous. We all are, one way or another. I think we all have our five cards now. We all got them. Very well, then. In the same order that the cards were dealt. Jean? A pair of threes. Lucasto? Nothing. Mr. Piper? Kings. Two. The light! Piper. No, well, what? Hey, hey, I don't like the same stuff, eh, Mr. Will you take your elbow out of my back? I'd be delighted to, Mr. Goodwin, but it's not my elbow. I don't care if it's your tibia maximus, just take it away. Chuck wouldn't like that. Well, we have company. Mind if I look around? Keep uh, right on walking, pal. Well, that would be Chuck behind me, huh? And you are... Uh, my name is Denby. You may remember it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you phoned a couple of hours ago about, about a card game. Now, look, just what is your boy poking in my back? I think it's a 38. You're not sure? It might be a 45. Chuck, is it loaded? Make a funny move, pal, and you'll find out the hard way. Yo, wait a minute. It's just a passing curiosity. Uh, where are we going? My car. Get in. If you insist. I guess you do. Okay. I'll drive, Chuck. Car bulletproof? No, that's hardly necessary. Chuck shoots first. Well, it's a saving, I guess. The only thing is, I uh, I hadn't figured on taking a ride. I told Mr. Wolf I was going for a walk. He disapproved. You're but... going for a ride. Isn't that a little corny? Now, there's a minor difference. Usually, the uh, guest, shall we say, is killed at the conclusion of the ride. In this Let's case, let's not make the difference too minor. Huh? You will survive the ride. It's what comes afterwards that might kill you. You see, Mr. Goodwin, my friends and I have a little mystery to solve. You want me to solve it? No. We want Mr. Wolf to solve it. In order to do so, he must leave his house and come to mine. He has to in order to find the solution quickly. Why? Neither my friends nor myself have any desire to improve our acquaintance with the police. Therefore, we want the mystery solved before the police are even called in. Hence our need for Mr. Wolf. Hence our detaining you. Detaining is a pretty word in the circumstances. Now, this is my home, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, well, I don't like the architecture. I think I'll stay out. Get going, pal. On second thought... Mr. Denby, what makes you think Mr. Wolf is going to leave his house and come here? You. Unless he does so, he will lose you. Forever. The door, Chuck. Okay. Mr. Goodwin, may I introduce you to my associates in business and in poker? To your right, Mr. Lacasto. A charming but impulsive fellow. Hello. He's only the stooge. Where's the fat fellow? In time, Lucasto. The lovely lady whose back is to you is Jean. Jean something or other. She's always changing her name. Hello. Hello. And the gentleman facing you is Mr. Piper. How do you do? Uh, is he exclusive or just... Hey, he's wearing his red carnation a little low, isn't he? Over his heart. Except that's no carnation. That, Mr. Goodwin, is blood. Lifeblood. Oh, 
Archie. Oh, bah, he's always taking walks. Come in, the door is unlocked. Are you? Yeah, you're wolf. Having made a magnificent discovery, suppose you remove your hat? No, nope, come on. I beg your pardon? Mr. Denby wants to see you. Mr. Danby can see me here. Here ain't where he wants to see you. Here, at the risk of minor monotony, is where he'll have to see me. Don't you want your boy Goodwin to keep on living? No one has ever been able to discourage him. Mr. Denby will. Ah, Archie's in custody? No, in Mr. Denby's house under a gun. I don't have to believe that. Take a look at this. Hmm, a wallet. Archie's wallet. I shall accompany you. And permit me to warn you that if Mr. Goodwin has been harmed, nothing short of murder will satisfy me. It's getting late. Wolf isn't here yet. Maybe he doesn't worry about you, Goodwin. Well, he could have been delayed. Maybe an orchid needed a pollen transfusion or something. <laughs> Besides, only the good die young. Then you must be very, very good, Archie. That remark I didn't care for. We sit here and wait for the fat one, but in the meanwhile, the police... The police will come when we notify them. But they will not like the delay we make to notify them. I say we waste time. I say the fat one will not risk coming. You say entirely too much. Is that so? Maybe I kill you myself. Picasso, put that gun away. Yes, darling Archie should have a chance to live. Not long if Wolf doesn't come. Stop looking so pleased. Are you afraid to die, Archie? Yeah, well, I'm not looking forward to it. It's so final. <laughs> Besides, I didn't eat a hearty dinner. And it... Oh, the Marines have landed. Who is it? Chuck, with Merrill Wolf. Let him in. Shut the door, Chuck. Stay outside. Archie? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Oh, am I glad to see you. I regret I cannot say the same thing. Last year, why couldn't you stay at home instead of taking those confounded walks? I warned you it would be dangerous. Yeah, but Mr. Wolf, it wasn't the fresh air that got me. It was Denby. Mr. Wolf, I knew you wouldn't come here without some sort of pressure. I thought the method I used would be most effective. Would you really have killed Archie if I hadn't come? I would have had no choice. I would have been stuck with a witness to an unsolved murder. Suppose I cannot solve it. I should be forced to apply the same logic to two witnesses. Mm-hmm. Mr. Wolf, you really came here to save my life, huh? Nonsense. I came here for a fee, Mr. Denby. I have a check for $1,000 already made out. Clear it up. You forget. I left my home. I traveled unprotected through the streets of this city, exposed to motor accidents, to fresh air, too. You offer me $1,000. Will $2,500 do? Barely. Archie, will you take the check? Now... I presume you want me to find who killed the gentleman at the table, the one facing me, huh? His name is Mr. Piper. The name is no importance. Will you all sit at the table in the same position you were at the time of the shooting? Of course. Jean? Picasso? Good. Now for a look at the wound. Hmm. The lights, I should imagine, went out for a while when the shooting occurred. They went out. Yes. Of the three of you at the table, which one had the best motive for the murder? We all have the same motive. The club. Helpful. There was no one else in the room at the time? No one. The door? Locked. With Chuck on guard outside of it. So much for that. The windows, I notice, are closed. They were closed when the murder took place? They were closed. The window panes are all unbroken, which eliminates the possibility of the shot being fired from outside of them, unless one of them was raised and lowered. That wouldn't have been possible. The windows are secured by catches. Archie, will you check that? Okay, Mr. Wolf. I shall for the moment assume that the windows are neither lying nor untrustworthy. Does anyone remember anything unusual occurring at the time of the shooting? Well, someone whispered Piper just before the shot. Indeed. You all heard that whisper? We heard it. Man's voice or woman? Well, I... I can't say. A whisper doesn't reveal much of anything. The windows weren't open, Mr. Wolf. Which leads to... The uh, fact that it had to be one of us in this room. But which one, Mr. Wolf? The murder weapon. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. Has it been moved? Nobody touched it. It's laying on the floor where it was dropped. Interesting. 
If you look closely, you would observe two oil spots staining the rug between the revolver and the lady's chair, indicating... Uh, who sat at the right of Mr. Piper? I did. Why? Mr. Danby. Yes? If I were you, I would turn Mr. Lacaster over to the police. You are a liar. I, I warned you about that gun, Lacaster. <laughs> Was it necessary to shoot Mr. Lacaster? In the arm, yes. He was reaching for a gun. He'll live, however, till the police take him away. What do I tell them? You could point out the angle of the wound. As you notice, Mr. Denby, the bullet entered Mr. Piper's heart from the right. Yes, so it did. Therefore, whoever sat to his right, well, that was Lacaster. Archie, you have the check? I have it. We may as well leave. Uh, Mr. Wolf. You're sure Lacasto shot Piper? I have indicated the evidence. The rest will be up to the jury. Come, Archie. Uh-huh. Uh, Jean. Yes, Archie? Now that my life expectancy has increased, what are you doing tomorrow night? Archie? I got a scram. Right. Lancaster 7583. I'll be ringing your bell. Oh, Mr. Denby, you better do something about Lucasto's arm or he won't live to be executed. You see, the executioner likes them warm before he chills them. Homestead looks very nice, Mr. Wolf. Yes, Archie. You should stay in it more often. Yeah, but you never get to meet babes like Jean that way. You never get kidnapped either. Nor would I have had to leave my home in order to rescue you. Yeah, well, you earned a nice fee, fast. Indeed? You seem doubtful about it. Positive, Archie. I know. I have not as yet earned my fee. Huh? You mean Denby might not turn Lucasto over to the cops? Of course he will. The trouble is, you see, Lacasto did not murder Piper. No? <laughs> he just thought a bullet in the heart might be good for Piper's rheumatism, huh? As it happens, Piper suffered from asthma. <laughs> That's beside the point. Fine. Mr. Wolf, I'm going to take it for granted that you know who did kill Piper. I'm also going to take it for granted that you won't tell me until you're ready. But why turn Lucasto over to the police? Two reasons, Archie. First, I had no proof against the real killer. Secondly... We had to supply a scapegoat in order to be permitted to leave the Danby home. You were unarmed, helpless. Go ahead, rub it in. Nonsense. It was an interesting problem. I enjoyed it. It was, huh? Well, to me, it's still in the present tenses. Which reminds me, as old Dr. Tidmouse said, there's always a future tense. And in that future tense, Jean. No, Archie. Oh, Mr. Wolf, stop. That girl's got a love for blood that appeals to the ghoul in me. Besides, did you notice what she does to her dress? Archie, I was merely about to say that I have no objections to your dallying with the girl. Oh, I don't believe it. My ears need overhauling. I objected only to the future tense. Why not call her now? Yeah, well, I won't pretend I understand this sudden enthusiasm on your part about my love life. Probably there's some foul scheming motive at the bottom of it. But who am I to look a gift horse in the mouth? Now, let's see. Her number was, um... Lancaster, 7583, of course. <laughs> this is the most beautiful bar and grill I've ever seen, Archie. Drank, you mean? What? Uh, never mind, never mind. All right. Archie, did anybody tell you you were beautiful, too? Well, a girl here and there has mentioned it. Oh, were they liars? Now, tell me, Jean, how did you ever get into the gambling den racket? Because I'm a crook. Well, I suspected that, but... Uh, I want another drink. You've had enough. I want another drink, and when Jean wants another drink, no gentleman who is a gentleman... Jean, get down! Oh, let me go. I don't want to climb under the table. Don't stay on the here until the barrage stops. Ah, I guess the war's over. All right, Jean, get up. No, now I'm here. I like it. I'm going to stay here for months and months. Jean, do you realize that somebody just tried to kill you? And I thought you had such a nice, honest face. No, 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 not me. Somebody out in the street. I don't know why, but Mr. Wolf will. Come on, pour yourself together and let's go see him. The nice fat man? All right, I like him. You do? Why? Because he'd make such a big corpse. Is that you, Archie? 
plus Jean. What made you think I wanted her here? Well, she's one of your fans. <laughs> she thinks you'd make a lovely corpse. What was the reason for bringing her here? She was shot at. Did you expect her to be? I expected her to be killed. That's why I sent you to her. It didn't occur to you I might be killed, too? It did. I was willing to take the chance. You were willing? <laughs> oh, Mr. Wolf, Jean's a little under the weather. Splendid. In vino veritas. Watch your language. I mean the people in their cups often tell the truth, a proverb of some antiquity. Who shot at you tonight, Jean? Oh, I don't know. I, I didn't see. Has it occurred to you that you might just as easily have murdered Piper as not? But Lucasto killed Piper. You said so yourself. I lied. Furthermore, why the attack on you if Lucasto was the murderer? Well, I, I... I don't know. Did you also not know that Lucasto escaped from jail earlier this evening? You're making that up. Why should I? Mr. Denby turned him over to the police... But Lacoste managed to get away before being jailed. That's not cricket. Incidentally, Mr. Denby will be joining us at any moment. I expected you to bring Jean Archie. Therefore, with the exception of Mr. Piper, who is resting in the morgue, and Mr. Lacoste, who is at large, we shall have all the participants in the card game. With them, perhaps, we can deal a new hand, hmm? Archie? Okay. Maybe it's the morgue to tell us Piper escaped. Oh, wrong again. Come in, Mr. Denby. Mr. Wolf, I'm upset. I heard over the radio about Lucasto's escape. He'll try to kill us all. Why? Well, because we can testify that he murdered Piper. Truly. I beg your pardon? Lucasto did not kill Piper. But you said that he did. The only evidence against Lucasto was the angle of the entrance of the bullet that lodged in his heart. May I remind you of the whisper you all heard in the darkness preceding Piper's death? The whisper that said Piper? Precisely. We must assume, then, that Piper turned his body in the direction of the whisper. Therefore, the angle of the wound would be wrong for Lacasto. But the correct one for... Whoever sat opposite Piper. I sat opposite him. But that doesn't mean I killed him. Wait, you must have. Once he turned, the bullet must have come from opposite him. Only possible way. That means you, Jean. No. No, it's a frame. May I interrupt for a moment? Mr. Denby... If our present analysis is correct, it must have been you who whispered to Piper. Did you? I... I hadn't thought about it before, but... I... Denby, you're lying. No, he's not lying. Continue, Mr. Denby. Well, when the lights went out, I wanted to tell Piper something. He, he turned to me, and that's when he was shot. Archie, you've taken all this down. In my prettiest shorthand, Mr. Wolf. Good. I, I don't know why you're doing this, Denby. Maybe you think if I take the rap, you'll get the club. But remember, Lacasto's still free. He's gunning for all of us. But it'll be you. Especially you he'll want. Maybe you can talk a jury into sending me up for something I didn't do, but you won't live to gloat about Go it. Go shut up, Jean. You killed Piper and... Who, who's that? This is, of course, the murderer of Mr. Piper. No comments? Archie, the door, if you please. But you said I was the one who... What kind of idiocy is this? Archie, I said the door. Okay, but shall I ask him in or sock him? You will act as the situation demands. Yes, sir. But for once, I'd like to know what the situation is. Raise him, Goodwin, and keep him that way. Now back up into the living room. I don't back up, Good. My gears... You want it here? Uh, never mind, I'll strip a gear. Archie, what are you doing? Just what the situation demands, backing up. In case your knowledge of armaments has failed you, our little friend Chuck here is pointing a thirty-eight revolver at me. Won't save him from the chair. Maybe not. But it could give me quite a pain in the stomach. Chuck, what do you think you're doing? You double-crossing louse. Gentlemen, if you So please. you thought you'd run to the fat dick and pin it all on me, huh, Denby? You don't know what you're talking about. We haven't even mentioned you. You're sure of that, huh? Then why did Wolf phone me and tell me you were about to sing? Wolf phoned you? Yeah. Said you were getting ready to feed me to the electrician up the river. Oh, he was making a stab in the dark, Chuck. Trying to start something. That's so, Wolf. Archie, will you read Chuck your notes about Mr. Denby's statement regarding the whisper? Well, that doesn't mean... It, it could be misunderstood. Read me the notes, Goodwin. Here it is, I quote. When the lights went out, I wanted to tell Piper something. He turned to That's me That's and... all I need to hear. Chuck, you were selling me out after hiring me to knock off Piper. You dumb gunman. Now you've given Wolf what he wants, a confession. 
I was trying to pin it on Gene. That's what you say now. It's kind of late, though. Too late no, for you. No, no, oh, oh, oh. Goodbye, Mr. Denby. Nice shooting, Chuck. Stay put, Goodwin. The rest of you, I'm leaving. The police wouldn't approve. Better let me have your gun. Huh? Wise guy. You know something? I've been thinking. Can you think? If I was to knock off you and Goodwin, me and Gene could split the club between us and nobody would ever know who killed Piper. Very whimsical, Chuck, but if you don't mind... Ah, gee, don't be an idiot. Well, if I have to get shot, I prefer it to happen when I'm moving forward. Ah, gee. Okay, come and get it, Goodwin. March right up nice and easy and take it. I'm coming. (laughs) Would somebody mind telling me why I don't fall down? I've been shot. Well, that's not the way to talk to a man who's just been... Hey, Chuck is lying down. He... Is he dead? Well, there's been a mistake. I didn't shoot him. He shot me. Archie, stop blabbering. Neither of you shot the other. As a matter of fact... I shot the Chuck. Lucasto. Lucasto, Archie? Well, I thought he escaped. No, I'm not crazy. I do not escape. The fat one, he phones the police to tell them how I'm innocent. Yes, I had the police announce the escape, however, for reasons of, uh, should I say, strategy? <laughs> Well, on account of there are no bullet holes in me, you can say whatever you like, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Archie. That announcement helped heighten the tension our murderers were under. And then they explode. The fat one, he says to me, Locasto, wait in the next room. Watch careful. Maybe there's trouble. I watch. And now? <laughs> now there's no more trouble. <laughs> Well, the place looks a lot tidier now with all those bodies removed, huh? Indeed. Okay, I'll get I... you the bottle of beer. But first, make with an explanation. The case was crystal clear, Archie. Maybe, but I'm no crystal gazer. Sure, I know. Denby had things arranged in advance with Chuck in case anybody held a better hand than his own. Piper did. So Denby whispered to Piper after kicking the light switch and set him up for a shot by Chuck from the doorway. The angle would provide evidence against Lucasto. True. However, we had only Denby's word for it and Chuck's that the door was locked. All right. We know, but you knew before Denby and Chuck blew up, how? The oil spots on the rug, Archie? Well, they only showed the gun had bounced when the murderer threw it away. Spatted oil, very well-kept gun. They showed more than that. Where were those spots in relation to the gun? Think back, Archie. Spots in relation... Oh, sure, They were between the gun and the door. Therefore, the gun must have been thrown from the door. Bounced twice, staining the rug before reaching its final destination. Ah, I get it now. That told you who'd fired the gun. But there wasn't proof enough, so you set up a nice atmosphere of suspicion and had the boys give each other away. (laughs) All right, Mr. Wolf, you're a genius, and uh, you may have your beer. Thank you, Archie. As for me, I'm not a genius, but I remember a phone number. <laughs> so if you'll excuse me, Mr. Wolf. You're excused, Archie. Thanks. But before you call that number, may I remind you that Jean is a girl of macabre tastes who appeals to the goo in you. <laughs> sure you may, but why bother? In order to be able to warn you that uh, <laughs> a ghoul and his money are soon parted. <laughs> Good night, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Danger, Dr. Danfield. The human mind is like a cave. Beyond the light, there are dark passageways and mysterious recesses. I, Dr. Daniel Danfield, have explored those unknown retreats and know their secrets. Dr. Daniel Danfield, authority on crime psychology, has an unhappy faculty for getting himself mixed up in hazardous predicaments because of his astonishing revelations regarding the workings of the criminal mind. As our story opens, we find Dr. Danfield in his office dictating to his pretty young secretary, Rusty Fairfax. Uh, period paragraph. And, uh, 
And naturally, I was glad to avail myself of the opportunity and excitement of studying a criminal mind when the criminal believed that he was completely free from suspicion. It was four weeks ago today that my secretary, Miss Fairfax, arrived five minutes late for work. Good morning, Miss Fairfax. Is that uh, package for me? The postman just gave it to me. Mind if I open it? Oh, why not, Miss Fairfax? Does the return address indicate from whom it was sent? There isn't any return address. No. <laughs> well, in that event, we'll open... Is there something wrong, Miss Fairfax? There certainly is something wrong. Look. By George. The package seems to contain some excellent samples of United States currency. It sure does. They're $1,000 bills. How many are there? Seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten thousand dollars. Dan, who do you suppose sent them and why? Well, possibly some counterfeiter wanted me to see an example of his work. These bills aren't counterfeit. Wait a minute. Here's a note addressed to you. Dean, let me have it, Miss Fairfax. Probably it contains the answer to the riddle. Wow. Very extraordinary. Well, what does it say? Say? Oh, here, I'll read it to you, Miss Fairfax. Danfield, be smart and forget where you were on August 31st. Most unusual. Who signed it? There's no signature, Miss Fairfax. Well? Well, what? Where were you on August 31st? Don't be ridiculous, Miss Fairfax. I haven't the faintest idea where I was on August 31st. Have you? Of course. Where were you? With you. Let's not be facetious, Miss Fairfax. The fact that someone has mailed me this money is highly significant. Now, let me see. Dan, I know. No, no what, Miss Fairfax? August 31st was the Saturday of Labor Day weekend. You didn't give your usual lecture at the university, and I went up to Connecticut to visit my folks. That's right, Miss Fairfax, and that proves you're wrong, doesn't it? You weren't with me, after all. As a matter of fact, no one was with me. I spent the day... By George! Think of something? Indeed I have, Miss Fairfax. There was a telephone call from a man named... Uh, well, what was his name? Are you asking me? Yes, you see, it's very important... Perhaps that's your mysterious friend calling again. I doubt it. Hello, Danfield speaking. Oh, yes, Captain Otis. Captain Otis. That means another case, I suppose. Yes, Captain? I see. Well, what's unusual about the circumstances? Indeed. What's the gentleman's name? Norman My Miles. That's it. That's the man's name. What? Oh, yes, yes, I know you just said it was. I'm sorry, Captain. Yes, indeed I will. Miss Fairfax and I will be out to the Miles' home in less than an hour. Goodbye. Well, what's it all about? A gentleman named Norman Miles was found dead in his bed this morning. He was murdered, Miss Fairfax. What's that got to do with us? It was Norman Miles who called me on the phone August 31st and asked me to investigate three relatives, one of whom he believed was planning to murder him. But you're not a detective. You've said so a hundred times. But I suppose you've got to have your fun. Yes, you're quite right, Miss Fairfax. That's why I kept Mr. Miles' offer in the back of my mind. And the details that Captain Otis has just given me have put an entirely different light on the matter. Oh, they have. Well, whatever Captain Otis told you doesn't prove it was Norman Miles who sent you this money. I think it does, Miss Fairfax. In fact, I know it does. Norman Miles knew he was going to be murdered. And he wants me to apprehend the man who murdered him. I seriously doubt that statement. Oh, well, then I shall prove it to you. If you get your notebook and come along with me, I'll introduce you to one of the most interesting cases we've ever investigated. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to Danger Dr. Danfield, but first... Now for the second act of... Danger Dr. Danfield. I still think we should have Mario along. Do you, Miss Fairfax? Yes. If all three of the relatives are at the Norman Miles house now, and one of them is a murderer, we need protection. That's certainly extraordinary. Dan, what are you thinking about? Things, Rusty, just things. Yes, I believe we're going to find an unusual situation. I hope you brought along your notebook. Of course I brought my notebook. Is this the house? Yes, and uh, there's an officer on guard at the door. Otis is a man of his word. I don't see why Captain Otis has to call you every time he gets himself in a jam. Captain Otis is not in a jam, my dear. It was very kind of him to give me this opportunity. Hello, officer. I'm Dr. Danfield. Oh, okay, Doc. Go, go on in. They're waiting for you. Thank you. Well, I 
to judge by the pretentiousness of Mr. Miles' home that he was well able to advance us $10,000, wouldn't you, Rusty? And for the same reason, I can see why his relatives would want him dead. Well, there they are. Yes, and by their expressions, I should say they were a rather unhappy trio. I suppose you're Danfield. Now, look here, Danfield. We're sick and tired of the way we're being treated. I'll say we are. Who does this Captain Otis think he is, anyhow? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you two. Perhaps this isn't Danfield. Give the guy a chance to introduce himself. Thank you. Yes, I'm Danfield. Now, suppose you tell me who you are. If you're Danfield, then get us out of here. Why, I was never so humiliated oh, shut in up, my... Judith. Stop crabbing. I couldn't let us out of here even if he wanted to. There are cops all over the place. You're quite right. I have absolutely no authority. Oh, this is my secretary, Miss Fairfax. I presume that uh, you three are Norman Miles' relatives? That's right. I'm Vincent Warren. The old man was my uncle. And I'm Larry Kent, another nephew. This young lady is Judith Nelson, a niece. The idea of saying one of us murdered Uncle Norman. One of you did murder him, Miss Nelson. What do you mean? Nonsense. You're jumping to conclusions pretty fast, aren't you, Danfield? Not at all. One of you three murdered him. All of my evidence points to that fact. What evidence? You haven't been here five minutes. How could you have picked up any evidence? It came by mail. Ten thousand dollars worth. That's enough, Miss Fairfax. For the time being, I'll have to ask you people to accept my statement and cooperate. Cooperate? <laughs> How, by signing a confession? I could hardly hope for that, Miss Nelson. In fact, I'd be disappointed if one of you did sign a confession. Why? Because my purpose in being here is to study the guilty person's mind while he or she believes himself or herself free from detection. Do you mean that merely by talking with the three of us, you can tell which one of us is guilty? Assuming, of course, that one of us is guilty? Precisely, Mr. Warren. Consider the facts. One of you is a murderer. To a man who has made a lifelong study of the human mind, it will be quite easy to determine the identity of the guilty party. Well, how do you like that? Well, wait a minute now. I always say every man to his own profession. Danfield, I understand, has one of those mixed master minds. Maybe his ideal work. Okay, what difference does it make? You haven't any alternative anyhow. That's the point exactly, Mr. Warren. You haven't. I merely wanted to point out to you that I know one of you is guilty. You're all fairly warned. Well, what do you want us to do? First of all, I'd like to have someone tell me exactly what happened last night. I understand that uh, when Mr. Miles' body was discovered, all the doors and windows of his room were locked on the inside. Yes, that's right, they were. Uncle Norman had a phobia against an unlocked door or window. Couldn't go to sleep unless he had checked all the locks himself. Then how did you know he got into the room this morning? By breaking the door down. Well, why did he do that? Well, Uncle Norman was a victim of habit. He did everything by the clock. Went to bed, got up, ate meals, everything. I see. This morning he didn't appear at breakfast at the regular hour. Yes, that's it. We'd all come down to breakfast and we're sitting waiting. Judith, you have to keep yawning. You're making me sleepy. Oh, sorry, darling. I can't help it. I'm not used to getting up in the middle of the night. Neither am I. Sometimes I wonder if all this is worth it. Well, it's worth it to me. The way things are going in my business, I could use one-third of a million bucks very nicely. Well, who couldn't? That's what I tell myself every time I'm ordered down here for a weekend. Finney, I say, one-third of a cool million dollars is a lot of dough. Quit beefing and go earn your money. Well, what killed me is that he picked a weekend to order us to come and see him. I had a party planned up in the mountains. Oh, well, it's worth it, I guess. <laughs> sure it is. Uncle Norman can't live forever. I'm beginning to doubt that. How old is he, anyhow? Seventy-three, his last birthday. You say, wouldn't it be a joke on us if he left his dough to a home for stunted ducks or something? No, 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 he wouldn't do that. He's told us enough times that we're his kids. Say, what time is it, anyway? Time? Right. 8.15, why? Why? Uncle Norman would die rather than be late for breakfast. He told us last night that breakfast was to be at 7.45. Well, maybe he did die in his sleep. Oh, well, why worry about it? He'll be alive. I think one of us ought to go up and see if he's all right. What good would it do? He always keeps his doors locked. Oh, we could wake him up by knocking. Are you kidding? Uncle Norman wouldn't wake up if a bomb exploded under his bed. He's that deaf. And I think Judith's right. We ought to do something. I'll go up. No, wait a minute. We'll all go. What's the matter, darling? Afraid to let me have a few minutes alone, my dear uncle? You bet I am, you little sneak. I don't trust you as far as I can throw an anvil. Why, you rat, you just... Quit it, you two. Let's get going. You know how Uncle Norman feels about us quarreling? Now, come on. The least we can do is respect his wishes while we're in his house. Oh, don't set yourself up as a model, Larry. You're no paragon. Well, at least I've got the decency oh, to... Oh, cut it out. We're all putting on an axe, so why not lay off till we get away from here? You started it. Now, here's Uncle Norman's room. Now, shut up, both of you. Listen to that guy, will you? Try it again, Larry, and loud it. Uncle Norman! Uncle Norman! 
Maybe you suppose something's happened to the old boy? He's not that deaf. What are we going to do? We've got to do something. You try the knob. That's nice locked. He always locks his door. He's had another heart attack. I just know he has. Uncle Norman! Uncle Norman! Well, we'll never hear you. Well, what are we going to do? Well, why don't you force the door? We've got to find out what's wrong. And raise the old Harry if nothing's wrong. Well, we can't just stand around here all day waiting for him to wake up. Something's happened to him or he'd be awake before now. Come on, Vinny, put your shoulder to the door. Well, okay, only don't forget it's your idea. Right <laughs> Once more now. <laughs> Give me that. Yeah, that does it. Come on. Oh, thank heavens. There's Uncle Norman in bed, sound asleep. Now open a window, someone. It's hot as blazes in here. I'll do it. Hey, Vinny, come over here. What's the matter? Look. Good heavens, he... He's dead. He's not only dead, he's been strangled. Murdered. <laughs> Well, that's a very interesting story, Mr. Kent. I think it answers my question all right. What do you mean it answers your question? Why, it tells me who murdered Norman Miles. You're crazy. And if you know who murdered him, why don't you tell us? For several reasons, Mr. Kent. In the first place, my purpose in being here is to study the criminal and his reactions while he still believes himself unsuspected. Now that I know his identity, my task is going to be much more interesting. Why, the man's crazy. Now look here, Danfield. If you really think you know who it is who murdered Uncle Norman, it's your duty to point out the guilty party. No, Mr. Warren, I don't think it is. I'm not a policeman or even a private detective. If I pointed out the guilty party, I would only make things more difficult for the police. Why? Because I have none of the concrete evidence that the police require in order to establish the murderer's guilt. In other words, you can prove nothing. Does that relieve your mind, Miss Nelson? Miss Fairfax, have you your notebook handy? I'm all set. Fine. I'm going to ask three questions. I'd like to have you jot down the answers verbatim. I think the nature of the answers will determine at what point in our investigation we should ask Officer Moriarty on guard outside the house to step inside and make an arrest. Well, how do you like that? This guy kills me. He's going to ask three questions, and bingo, he can prove who the murderer is. Well, I'm not answering any questions. Neither am I. I think you will, because the one who refuses will immediately be taken into custody. Let me see now. Mr. Kent. I believe I'll start with you. Are you quite positive that all the windows and doors in Mr. Miles' bedroom are locked on the inside? Yes, I've already told you that. I checked them myself. You mean you checked all but the window that Miss Nelson opened when the three of you came through the broken down door? Listen, Hawkshaw, if you think that I... Miss Nelson, I'll now ask you your question. Was the window locked when you went to open it? Sure, it was locked. I unlocked it. And if you don't believe me, you can look for my fingerprints. You'll find them. Very well. Mr. Warren, have the three of you been separated at any time since you discovered the body? Well, since the others came through with answers, I suppose I'd better. No, we all came downstairs, called a doctor, and then the police. We stayed in this room until they arrived. Excellent. Miss Fairfax, have you got all that down? Verbatim, Dr. Danfield. Thank you. Now, will you please step to the door and ask Officer Moriarty to come inside, please? <laughs> In a moment, we'll return for the third act of Danger, Dr. Dan Peel, but first... Now for the third act of... Danger, Dr. Dan Peel. Here we are, Miss Fairfax. Well, they certainly demolished the door to Mr. Miles' bedroom, didn't they? Dan, you annoy me. Yes, the lock is wrong. That means the door was locked when the two men broke it down. Giving that big build-up about asking three questions and then not paying at all. Oh, careful when you step into the room, Rusty. You might throw a stocking on one of those sputters. Never mind my stockings. There we were, waiting for Officer Moriarty to make the arrest. And then all you did was borrow his flashlight. These windows are locked exactly as described. Now let's examine the open window. Do you realize what those people downstairs think of you now? They're laughing at you. When this story gets out, your reputation will be ruined. Indeed. Possibly we'd better check the fingerprints on this window lock just to make sure that Miss Nelson was telling us the truth. What's your opinion, Miss Fairfax? My opinion is that we'd better get out of here before we make bigger fools of ourselves than we already have. Well, look here. Look where? Never mind. No lack of interest in this case surprises me, Rusty. Come along now. No, Dan, wait. I am interested in the case, only... Only what? It's you I'm interested in. You've got such a good reputation. 
I, I don't want to see it ruined, that's all. Rusty, you're really a very nice person. Come on now, in less than 15 minutes, we'll have found what we're looking for. I promise it. Dan, it's awfully dark out here. I wish Mario were with us. You're not frightened, are you? Is there something to be frightened of? Oh, yes, yes. I have no doubt that someone will attempt to take our lives in a very few minutes. That's a pleasant thought. What's the matter? Look there. Two depressions in the soft earth beneath the window of Mr. Ma's bedroom. Dan, those marks were made by a ladder. Quite right. Then that means that someone put a ladder here last night and climbed up to the... Dan, that window up there is the one that Judith Nelson said she opened. So it is. However, no one climbed up the ladder. What do you mean, no one climbed up the ladder? The marks on the ground, Rusty. They indicate that the ladder was only three feet from the house. If anyone attempted to climb up it, he or she would have fallen over backwards. I guess you're right. Then why was the ladder placed against the house at all? Because someone wanted the police to investigate and discover what we've just discovered. But why? Well, because that would lead investigators to think that admission to Mr. Miles' room was not gained via the window above. That doesn't make sense to me. The window was locked anyway. Does it? Well, well, look here. Now what are you looking at? A tree. You notice how that branch extends over the ledge just below the bedroom window? What about it? The window was locked. Dan, what are you going to do? I'm going to climb the tree. You stay here. Dan, no, I'm coming too. Don't be ridiculous. Women aren't supposed to climb trees. Dan, Dan, feel him. You come back here. That limb won't hold you. Don't shout so, Miss Fairfax. I don't want to be caught up in this tree. Oh, you don't? Well, how do you think that I... Oh. What was that? Rusty! Rusty! Hey, this limb is breaking. Come on, and I'm falling. Rusty! Rusty! Hey! Now, just a minute, just a minute, Mr. Officer of the Law. I got to see Dr. Dunfield. Well, Never mind, don't say it. I'm going to see him just the same. Well, I guess you don't know who I am, eh? Me, I'm a Mario Consoletti. You ever hear of me, eh? Well, no. <laughs> you very funny fellow, Mr. Officer of the Law. All you say is, well, well, what's the matter? You know, speak English like me? Well, there you go again. Well, 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 let us... Doc must have get himself in another pickle man. No, no. You stay here, Mr. Officer of the Law. I'll speak some of Hey, Doc! Doc, is that you? This is me, Mario, Doc. Mario, Doc. over here. Hey, what is What's going on around here? Who chopped down to that tree? Mario, Dan's under that tree. What's that? The Doc are hiding under the tree? What's this all about? Mario, Mario, get me out of here. The doctor. Okay, doctor, don't worry. I'll fix you up. Be a little careful, Mario. That's all right. It all didn't do me any good. Yeah. You, you fell out of the tree, eh, doctor? Yeah, <laughs> very funny. Hey, maybe you got a shot, too. No, 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 I didn't get shot. The branch started to break and he missed. There, I'm all right. Where's Rusty? Dan, over here. Rusty, you all right? Oh, sure, she's all right, Doc. <laughs> when a woman can talk, she's all right. <laughs> now, let's not try to be funny at a time like this, Mario. Is me funny? What happened, Rusty? Somebody came up behind me and hit me. I went out like a light. Yes, and then he shot at me. Well, I saw where he went. Rusty, you go back to the house now. No, like... I'm going with you. Oh, Rusty, sometimes you try me. Well, this is no time to argue. Mario, will you pick up the flashlight? Pick up with the flashlight. Yeah. I got him. Where we go now? Over to that small building behind the garage. Our attacker was heading in that direction. Well, frankly, Mario, I'm glad you happened along. Me happen along? <laughs> That's a very funny. I've been looking for you all day. You should not go off without the Mario Doc, no? <laughs> Perhaps you're right. Shouldn't we be a little less noisy if the person we're after is building... He isn't he'll... in the building, Miss Fairfax, and I'm sure of it. Well, here we are. Hold that flashlight on the door, Mario. Okay, Doc. Well, that was easy. Throw your flashlight around inside, Mario, will you please? That's fine. Now, follow me. Uh, no, no, no. You better let me go first, Doc. If that fellow is here... He isn't here, Mario. I've already told you that. The place is empty, all right. Not quite, Rusty. What do you mean it isn't? This is nothing but a tool shed. Hey, maybe somebody's hiding behind those boxes, huh? There's no one hiding behind the boxes. Well, just as I thought. <laughs> that doc, he's always a thinking. Yes, that settles it. Come along. We can return to the house now, and this time we can identify our murderer without asking any questions. <laughs> Well, 
Well, Judith, where have you been? Out. Looking for a man who fell out of a tree. Oh, so you heard it too, huh? You should have seen the expression on Anfield's face when he hit the ground. I did see it. And I saw the expression on your face when you sawed the limb halfway through this afternoon. Snooping again, huh, Judy? Yes, snooping again. And so were you. And so was Larry. By the way, where is Larry? Right here, darling. Did you think I'd try to escape? I would be a sucker to do that, wouldn't I? This is really very amusing. We're all actually suspicious of each other, aren't we? And if you're asking me, that's just what Dan Field wants. He thinks the guilty party will break down under the strain of wondering which one of us he's going to put the finger on. You sound worried, Vincent. I suppose by that crack you mean I've got something to worry about. Well, have you? Oh, stop it. None of us killed Uncle Norman. If we keep this up, we'll beat each other's throat. She... She's right, Larry. Sorry I went off the deep end. Sure, okay. Let's forget... Oh, here comes the great man now. Remember, whatever he says, we stick together. Oh, so you're back again, are you, Danfield? What's it going to be this time, a spelling bee? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's thought up three more questions to ask us. What I want to know is, who's the character you've brought along with you? Uh, she means you, Mario. She means me? Hey, lady, what do you mean by this character, uh, this, this name you call Mario? Never mind, Mario. Now, if you have all finished with your remarks, I'll ask Officer Moriarty to arrest the guilty party, and we'll be on our way. Listen to it. What are you going to do this time? Borrow the cop's gun? How about the three questions? Don't we get to answer questions this time? No, Mr. Kent. I can prove you killed your uncle without asking you any more questions. I killed him? Certainly, Mr. Kent. You killed him. I've known it all along, but it's been only within the past five minutes that I've been able to secure enough evidence to establish your guilt definitely. I killed him. <laughs> Vinny, did you hear what that guy said? Yes. I heard him, Larry. Too bad, isn't it, Larry? Why, you... I don't think you'll get much sympathy from your two cousins, Mr. Kent. You see, they've known all along that you were guilty, but they were afraid to... Mario! Don't worry about me, Doc. I'm all ready. You are, eh? Well, how do you like this? <laughs> Funny fellow. <laughs> Why, you want not... to know how, how Mario likes this? <laughs> get you. It's very funny. I like this... In a moment, we return for the conclusion of our story, but first... Now for the conclusion of... Danger, Dr. Dan. Um, new paragraph. I wish to mention that it uh, was through the courtesy of Captain Otis of the police department and the able assistance of Miss Fairfax and Mario that I was availed this opportunity of studying the criminal mind under these circumstances, which... Miss Fairfax, I'm not through. I'll say you're not. And if you don't tell that lecture class of yours how you knew how the murderer got into Norman Miles' room, I'll write it in myself. Miss Fairfax. I mean it. I believe you do. Well, the murderer climbed the tree to the ledge and got in through the window. How could he? The window was locked. Judith Nelson swears she unlocked it when she opened it that morning. Miss Nelson only thought she unlocked the window. What? Yes, you see, Larry Kent had loosened the hasp earlier in the day so that when Mr. Miles locked his window at night, the lever slid over the catch instead of under it. Dan. Then, of course, Mr. Miles didn't lock his window, but thought he had. That's right. Kent later entered the room through the window and strangled his uncle. However, the next day, he had the problem of tightening the hasp without detection. But but you established that all three of the suspects had been together all day. Yes, which meant that Mr. Kent had to wait until nightfall to tighten the hasp back into place and to remove his fingerprints. And it was Kent who shot at you and then ran toward the tool house. Yes, he wanted to return the screwdriver. He didn't want anyone to find out that uh, he tightened the hasp. But how did you know it was Larry Kent? I saw him when I was falling out of the tree. Oh, then you didn't Oh, know. yes, yes, I did, Miss Fairfax. I knew he was guilty all the time because of my knowledge regarding the workings of the human mind. I see. Uh, Dan. Yes, Rusty? Do you, uh, by any chance, know what I'm thinking of right now? Indeed I do, Rusty. Uh, lift your chin a little higher, please. <laughs> Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That's a chicken. She's a fat one. 
She's doing practically all the things a chicken can do. And besides all this cleverness, she's about to perform her primary function. She's going to be a dinner. The lady who carries the bird in her left hand is named Abby Durfee Borden, stepmother to Emma and Lizzie Borden. Mrs. Borden weighs over 200 pounds. The curved-handled axe she holds in her right hand is her favorite when she goes out amongst the chickens. Her favorite because with it she does such a neat job. Which is more than I can say for the person who murdered Mrs. Borden and her husband, Mr. Borden. So tonight, my report to you on the bloody, bloody banks of Fall River. Crime Classics. A new series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land. From every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The place is Fall River, Massachusetts, at the start of a hot August in 1892. In that era, it was a town whose dominant color was brown, the color of sun-dried lawns, of rain-stippled brick and board, of ladies' dresses that reached from neck to pavement. Next in popularity, as far as color went, was black. It was a stern time and a stern place, and bleak, where certain types of smiles were suspect, and where women only dared to stretch in the privacy of kitchen or boudoir. It was a time, too, when 18 was the age of marriage, and a single woman of 32 had to find surcease in this way. Breaking saloon's windows. Knitting. Secretly tearing from the newspaper the latest picture of John L. Sullivan. Also, Jim Corbett, who was rumored to be more of a gentleman. Or this way. Till death thy endless mercies seal. Lizzie Borden's way. And make the sacrifice complete. Amen. Amen. There now, how did you like that hymn? Oh, very much, Reverend Job. And then I shall write my brother to send me the rest of the new ones from New York. I trust your judgment, Miss Borden, implicitly. How is your brother? Oh, he's getting married. Married? Didn't I tell you? No. No, you didn't. I'm sorry. I think, Reverend, you might have let me know in another way. Less blunt. But you don't even know my brother. I hope he'll be very happy. I'm sure you do. Reverend. Yes, Miss Lizzie. And how much longer will you grieve? Dear Miss Lizzie. Your wife is gone now for four years. Dear, dear Miss Lizzie. How kind is your concern. Still let me prove thy perfect will. My acts of faith Faith and and love love repeat. repeat. Till Till death thy endless mercy see. Your father likes chicken, Lizzie. Chicken he shall get. 
Glad you came out to the backyard. You could do something for me besides picking pears from the tree. You're just jealous because you can't eat pears, Mrs. Borden, because you break out. Where you been, Lizzie? With the Reverend Mr. Jubb. He got some new hymns from New York. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Oh, if I was a true mother to you instead of a stepmother, I'd tell you right out you're never going to get married, Lizzie. New hymns from New York. Your work with the fruit and flower mission. None of these are going to help. If I was a true mother to you, I'd tell you all of those things, but tenderly. Yes, Mrs. Borden. And it eats inside you, doesn't it, stepdaughter? Yes, Mrs. Borden. You and your sister Emma, old maids. They say that about you. Did you know that? Yes. Yes, Mrs. Borden. Here. Least you can do is some work. You can pluck a chicken as well as anyone. Yeah, well, I do the other. Get used to being useful. That's a way to live, too. Take it. All right. Mrs. Borden? What is it? Aren't you concerned about yesterday? What about yesterday? About the barns being broken into. Some children, probably. Why should they break into the barn? Looking for iron for sinkers so they could fish. Not so delicate, Lizzie. You do it this way. This way. I told Mr. Jubb about the milk. What are you talking about? About the milk. What about it? You've been in this sun too long, Mrs. Borden. Burned your memory away. About the milk. It's being poisoned. <gasps> poisoned? Why else do you think everyone in the family got sick day before yesterday? You didn't. I don't drink milk. And the barn's being ransacked. There's someone who wants to do us harm. <laughs> Make your fancy, stepdaughter. Someone who hates my father. <laughs> your father said a man at the bank had cursed him. <laughs> father said he'd seen the man loitering about. Oh, now we've come to it, haven't we? What? Now we've brought the conversation around. What? Your father. Tell you something. He doesn't care for you. <laughs> he doesn't care for you at all. He loves me. Not at all. <sighs> What's the matter? Blood. All over my hands. Blood. Ooh. Chicken blood. It'll wash off. That's the trouble with you, Lizzie. You shudder your way through... <sighs> what did you do that for? What did you s smear that blood on my face for? To see how you look, Mrs. Borden. This is not exactly a healthy relationship between two grown people. But, let's face it, the possibility of a lady's liking another lady in the Borden household was pretty remote. First of all, after the widowed Mr. Borden married Abby, he told his two daughters to do everything Abby told them. And often, Abby would order Lizzie to do things right in the middle of plucking a pear from the backyard tree. And Lizzie dearly loved the pears from the backyard tree. Also, it was a constant source of wild hilarity for Abby that Neither of her stepdaughters had been taken as bride. She'd gotten married, but Lizzie never did. Nor Lizzie's sister, Emma. And sometimes Lizzie would go to her father's room and she'd ask him this. How can you stand her? She takes care of my needs. She cherishes me. She's a hulk. When seen through the eyes of affection... Oh, father! It's much too late to ask you to love her, Lizzie. But I insist that this kind of conversation concerning my wife... Shall be the last. Whatever you say, Father. Now it's very hot. I think I lie down. I'll take off your shoes. Never mind. I want to. Very well. Father. Yes. Tell me about my mother, my real mother. Oh, Lizzie. Please. It's been Please. so long. I've forgotten. You have not. Yes. Yes, I have. No. She was very lovely. 
She had brown hair. She had brown eyes, and she was slender. You used to tell me... Father. What? Why did you let her die? She had a sickness for you which... You let the... her die. You could have saved her and you let her die. Lizzie! And you married that Hulk. I forbid you... Father, Father, listen to I me. I forbid you to speak of my wife in such a manner. Let's go away from here, Father. Away? Yes, you and I. Give that woman this house and we'll go away. Father... You'll go away, not me. What? You speak often of quitting this house. I'm going to live with a friend. Do it. You can't mean that. Do it. Good night. Father. Father. I want you to know I always love you. No matter what you say to me. I know. And I'm sorry for you. Good night, Lizzie. It was the night of August 3rd in the year 1892, a stifling night, humid, sleepless, and filled with drone. A million small sounds, continuous and insistent, made up of insects and dry grass and moist night clothes against moist bedding. And in the middle room of the second floor of number 92 Second Street, Lizzie Borden walked. And walked and grew warmer and walked. And Lizzie Borden wept. Her face pressed to the earth, she wept. And in a little while, for some reason or another, she got up and walked over to the pear tree and plucked a pear and ate it and smacked her lips, sweet with juice, at the moon. Lizzie Borden. listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. This Saturday night, CBS Radio's Gangbusters presents the story of the Soda Fountain Pigeon. Also Saturday nights on most of these same stations, don't miss the exciting adventures of United States Marshal Matt Dillon on Gunsmoke. Gangbusters and Gunsmoke, Saturday nights at the Star's Address, hear both for twice the excitement. Now, once again, Thomas Hyland in the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the bloody, bloody banks of Fall River. I'd like to give you a brief rundown on the Borden family. Let's pick the last day all of them were alive, August 4th, 1892. Let's say about seven o'clock in the morning. Andrew Jackson Borden yawning. A.J. Borden is the head of the house and worth over a quarter of a million dollars. He's getting up now and getting ready to go to the bank so he can be near some of it. Lace me up, Andrew. Abby Durfee Borden, just before lacing up. Abby is 64 years of age and hadn't gone downstairs without a corset since the age of 15. Lizzie Borden, still asleep. Night clothes on the chair where she left them last night. And dreamless. Woman in bed. There are two other people I must mention. There's Bridget Sullivan, the maid, who is making the mutton soup for breakfast. 
And Emma Borden, sister to Lizzie, who's off on a trip to Fairhaven in behalf of the Fruit and Flower Mission. We know that the Bordens, all of them, had their breakfast. We know that Mr. Borden left the house at 9 o'clock for the bank. And we know that Bridget washed the windows in the attic. And we know that, as Bridget sat on the windowsill, washing in such a way that a good part of her was hanging over 2nd Street, Lizzie Borden was inside, holding her feet so Bridget wouldn't fall. And we know, too, that there was conversation. I don't feel so good. Why? What's the matter? My stomach still hurts when I press it. It's from the other day. When the milk was poisoned? No, I don't think it was the milk. It was the bananas. I think Mrs. Borden fried them too long. And I always say that bananas fried too long in mutton soup don't go well together. Oh, help me inside, Lizzie. Here. Press me. Here. Oh! You see? Well, then you should lie down, Bridget, and sleep. Oh, if I could, I would. But I got these windows to do. You just lie down here in your room and sleep. Oh, but... Oh, you do what I tell you. If you mean it, there's nothing I'd like better. I mean it. I'd better inform Mrs. Borden where I'll be no. in case... No. I'd better? No. Mrs. Borden is going out soon. Going out? Oh, she did now a n- napping. I really do. Here. I'll turn down your bedclothes. In. In with you. Now you just go to sleep. Saying that to Bridget. You go right to sleep. Saying a thing like that was like putting chloroform under Bridget's nose. She was a snoozer, that one. When she worked, she worked, but get her on a feather bed, good night all, off she went. Lizzie tucked her in and watched over her for a few minutes, and then Lizzie went downstairs and into the guest room. Hello, Mrs. Borden. What do you want, Lizzie? I thought you'd gone out. What made you think that? I just thought so. And now what do you want? What are you doing in this room, Mrs. Borden? And why shouldn't I be here? Bridget could make up the guest room. You don't have to... You know very well Bridget is not allowed to clean any of the rooms on the second floor. Oh, yes, I... Her father's coming home. That's strange. The side door's locked. He can't get in. It's never locked this time of day. Hurry! Just a minute! Haven't you got a key? Why is the side door locked? I don't know. Haven't you got a key? No. Come down and open the door. But try the front one. All right. Wait a minute. It's locked. I'll send Lizzie down. Go down and open the door for your fa... A Vacuum in Time Here is where truth ends and knowledge. On August the 4th, 1892, at number 92 Second Street in the town of Fall River, Massachusetts, the time between 10 and 11.15 a.m. is lost. Lost, that's the only word for it. Wrenched somehow out of the rest of time and lost. And started again when that happened. when that was spoken. Did you call me, Miss Lizzie? Come downstairs, quickly! Someone came into the house and murdered Father! What? What did you say? Someone has murdered Father! Murdered him? With an axe. No, no, don't go in there. Go across the street and get Dr. Brown. Quickly. Mrs. Churchill! Mrs. Churchill! Please, come over. Someone has hit Father with an axe and killed him. Come in through the front door. It's open. Where is your 
father? In the sitting room, on the sofa. Come. You see? Oh, you'd better call for Mr. Harrington to the police. Yes? Who's that? It's me. It's Bridget. Dr. Bowen will be over. May I say something? Of course. Mr. Harrington of the police should know about this. Uh, perhaps Mrs. Borton should know of this first. She's not here. She's out on a sick call. Where is everybody? Oh, in here, Dr. Bowen, the sitting room. Your father is quite dead, my dear. Yes. I suggest you so inform the police. Inform Mr. Harrington. I'll, I'll see to it. You're very kind. This next will be pretty hard to take, but you just have to believe it. I've got the records right here to prove it. Not only was Mr. Harrington not to be found, but there was hardly any cop at all in Fall River. At this very moment, most of them were taking part in the annual excursion of the Fall River Police Association at a shore resort at Rocky Point, which is near Providence, Rhode Island. So, even as Mrs. Churchill was yelling her lungs out for a policeman, they were running sack races, splitting up into quartets for singing purposes, and the more athletic were getting their mustaches wet in the Atlantic Ocean. However, a Marshal Hilliard, who had gotten up too late to meet the trolley, which met the excursion train, was sulking around town, and he's the one Mrs. Churchill spotted. She brought him back to number 92 Second Street. Here, the marshal viewed the body, gave condolences to Lizzie, and set about looking for clues. During his search, Mrs. Churchill made a remarkable discovery. Lizzie? Yes, Mrs. Churchill? I've just been up on the second floor. Yes. Your mother's up there. She's not my mother. She's my stepmother. She's dead. She's my stepmother. It looks like somebody took an axe and... Well, she's dead. It was quite a troop who went upstairs to look in on Mrs. Abby Borden. There was Lizzie and Bridget and Marshall Hilliard... Then there was Mrs. Russell and Mrs. Bowen and several other ladies who happened in off the street. Then there was Dr. Bowen, and in a little while, the Reverend Mr. Jubb happened in. The latter was the kindest of all to Lizzie. Finally, toward dusk, Mr. Harrington did appear, sun-tanned and sandy and with both his striped bathing suits folded neatly in a strong brown paper. He took charge, and he asked Lizzie where her sister was. In Fairhaven. Doing work for the Fruit and Flower Mission. Had her sister been there at the time her mother was murdered? She's not my mother. She's my stepmother. Very well, but where were you, Lizzie Borden? In the barn, getting a piece of iron. For what? Sinkers for my fishing. The whole morning? And in the garden. How did you happen to find your father dead? I was bringing him a pair. And the doctor? I would say your father was killed an hour and a half after your mother. What about that, Lizzie Borden? She's not my mother. She's my stepmother. Who do you think killed them, then? The same man who poisoned the milk. The same man who broke into the barn. The same man who my father saw loitering. Don't you think it's strange that Bridget was asleep and your sister out of town and you out in the garden, all of you out of the way for one hour and a half while your parents are murdered? Mrs. Borden cannot rightly be called a parent of mine. And these were the questions asked, and these the answers. Harrington asked them, the coroner asked them, the prosecuting attorney asked them. Yes, indeed, Lizzie was tried for murder, so there was a prosecuting attorney, and he asked them. These questions and a lot more. The trial lasted 13 days, and Lizzie Borden was adjudged not guilty. So, if Lizzie Borden was declared not guilty, we must assume this is the way our unknown murderer operated. Hot day on a busy street in Fall River. Murderer walking down it, carrying axe.
Mrs. Borden disposed of. Wait one hour and a half. Then... Mr. Borden. Then... And there he goes. Murderer, covered with blood, carrying a bloody axe. And no one noticed him. Or they'd go yelling for Mr. Harrington. No one did. So the murderer was never found. And Lizzie? She never married. She embraced other things. Till death thy endless mercy seal. and make the sacrifice complete. Amen. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. Hello. Who is... Oh. How is my favorite shipboard acquaintance this evening? Oh, Simon, you, you startled me. I could hardly see you through the fog here on deck. Oh, yes, it is getting thicker, isn't it? <laughs> but I suppose it's to be expected. Last night, nature went on a binge of moonshine, and this is her foggy morning after. Oh. <laughs> Only it's evening. How can you tell through the fog? <laughs> so you know you have a very pretty laugh, Barbara. I'll listen for it in all of your pictures from now on. Thank you, Simon. But I'm... I'm not going to make any more pictures. I'm retiring. Retiring? At the peak of your career? I'm just tired of pictures, that's all. Barbara, you'll never be able to run away from it. What do you mean? I'm referring to whatever it is that frightens you. Why don't you tell me about it, Barbara? Uh, there's, there's nothing to tell. I'm I'm tired. I, I need a rest. Please, Simon, don't make me talk about it. There's some things that... Simon, is that someone standing there? No. No, I don't see anyone. Oh, you are nervous. Oh, Simon, if only I could confide in someone, if I could tell you what I... Perhaps I already know more than you think I do. You're cold. Yes, Where's your wrap? Over there someplace on one of those decks. <laughs> I'll find it. I don't see it here, Barbara. Are you sure you... Barbara! Behind you! Look out! Barbara! Barbara! Man overboard! Man overboard! Maybe you'd like a swim too, Saint. What? Oh! <laughs> Evidently, I wasn't hit quite that hard. 
I even remember who you are, Dr. Norman. It, it is Dr. Norman, the celebrated psychiatrist, isn't it? Yeah, that is very good, Templer, but I'm afraid I must still confine you here to the ship's infirmary for a while. Huh? A possible concussion. See, tell me, what makes a famous neurologist like you pose as a mere ship's doctor? Oh, I'm really not posing. Uh, Partridge, the ship's physician, is ill. Oh. I was within earshot when I heard the familiar call. Is there a doctor in the house? And uh, uh, No, Simon, don't try to get up. I have a flask here. A drink will make you happy. Oh, not right now, thank you. I recall I have some unfinished business to attend to. Barbara? Yes. Was she? They couldn't find her in the fog. She's oh, gone. Poor Barbara. Yes, it was a horrible accident. Horrible, yes. Accident, no. You mean to say she didn't fall overboard? She was murdered. Murdered? But who? I think I know. Ooh. In my head, it feels like the Aberdeen Proving Ground. I will mix you a sedative. You know, you're not looking very well. I always look like this when I'm angry. There's only one cure. Yes, I know. The lady with the scales known as Madame Justice. You know, Templer, I've been curious about uh, what makes a man like you think. Uh, well, I'll tell you. Every eight days or so, someone winds me up. Right now, I'm wound up tight. Tight with fury. Well, if it's a psychiatrist, I would advise you to unwind me. Ah, here we are. Now drink this. It will put you to sleep after a while. Thank you. You say you think you know who killed Barbara, sir? I was wrong. I do know. But I think you ought to talk to me. Unwind yourself. You think I need psychiatry, Doctor? Well, I think you're too taut at the moment. That plus your concussion it might be dangerous. Very well, Doctor. I'll unwind. I'll tell you the entire story. If you don't mind, Simon, here, this will help the rhythm. Huh? Say, metronome. Psychiatrists often use it. But, uh, Barbara... No, no, I don't mind. I'd never met Barbara Brooks. Although I doubt if there's a human being alive who hasn't heard of her or seen her in the movies. I first saw her the day we boarded ship. There was something in her expression, in the way she walked and talked and smiled, that immediately told me here was someone I should know. Her entire demeanor was an attitude of invitation. A romance. Fear, Doctor. She was a frightened lady. She wanted someone near her. I walked over to her there on deck and immediately made myself useful. Her steward evidently had become busy elsewhere, so I tipped my hat and said somewhat idiotically, um, Get your program here, lady. You can't tell the staterooms without the numbers. I beg your pardon. Your steward seems to have deserted you. Oh. I've sailed this scow before, so if it's the direction to your stateroom you're looking well, for... Well, I would like to go. Hmm, I would, too. Uh, number, please. A36, main deck. Thank you very, very much. It's this way. My, uh, my name's Templer. Simon, for short. And, of course, you're Barbara Brooks. You know, uh, we passed the bar en route to A36, main deck. Does an old-fashioned with a new acquaintance sound inviting? It will, a little later after... It's here on the ship. Who? There's several... I... Oh, that's You've gone now, Tim, Yeah, I think I saw the man you meant. A certain off-center gentleman named Raider. Rader, I, I don't know that name. No, surely you've heard of Phil Rader. He's just as big a star in his line of work as you are in yours. What, what is his line of work? Well, he's, uh, he's an exterminator of human beings. Mr. Timber, I'm afraid. That was obvious from the moment I first saw you. Why don't you tell me about it? No, I can't. No, I, I'd be killed. As good a reason as any for not telling me, but I must warn you I have a peculiar talent for finding things out for myself. Oh, no, you mustn't do anything. Please, please. <laughs> Hello, Raider. Well, the same. Mm-hmm. World's getting smaller. Yes. Yes, but I understand you're doing your share to see that it doesn't get overcrowded. Uh, traveling for your health again, or just traveling? Just traveling. Raider, why does the mere glimpse of you rounding a corner start a lady's teeth to chattering? Lady? I don't know any ladies. Obviously. Maybe she thought I was someone else. Maybe. If you're of a mind to annoy her, you'll wish you were. Look, Saint. Just soak up sunshine on this cruise. Don't go poking in any dark place. Might be bad for you. Oh, what sort of bad, Raider? Look, big shot, just so there's no misunderstanding. You butt in where you ain't welcome on this cruise and... Yes? And I'll kill you. How 
wish your head, sir. It feels as if a regimental trap game was going on inside of it with jet-propelled dice. You haven't drunk your sedative yet. Here. Oh, thank you. Uh, shall I go on taking the load off of my concussion? Yes, by all means. I think I was present at the next equation. Yes, sir. Doctor, you were. It was the night of that ridiculous costume ball ship captains are so fond of arranging. Yes. I remember. We were at the bar together. You were a pirate, I recall. Yes, and you were a clown. The ball was loaded with clowns, some of them not even aware of their clownishness. But it was gay and sprightly, and the music was good. I remember our conversation, Doctor. You suddenly appeared at my elbow and said in the most shivery, sinister manner... You know, Templar, I have a confession to make to you. Well, I'm always interested in confessions, Doctor. I've had a schoolboy crush on the beautiful Barbara ever since I saw her in pictures first. <laughs> uh, tell me, what does one do about it? Well, I know exactly what I would do if I were you, Doctor. Yes. I'd consult the nearest psychiatrist. <laughs> At the prices we charge? No, thanks. <laughs> I was hoping you'd cut a fellow in on your acquaintanceship, Templar. But uh, if you won't introduce me... Uh, won't you at least show me which mask she's hiding under? I think I might be able to make my own introduction. Oh, very well, Doctor. Look for a sylph-like figure in a blue and yellow harlequin costume. Ah, uh, thank you, Templar, thank you. And if you should ever need a good psychiatrist... At the prices you charge? <laughs> I will be seeing. <laughs> Don't turn around, Mr. Huh? Templar. I have a pistol in the small of your back. Well, now, really, is that any way to enjoy a war? Listen, Saint... I listen hard. Oh, I'm all ears, except for the small of my back, which feels abnormally large at the moment. Certain arrangements have been made, Saint. It means a big head of lettuce if they go through. So? All the signs say keep out. See that you do. Now, don't turn around. Huh? This costume's so pretty, I'd hate to have to put a hole through my pocket. Well, it's probably just a coincidence, but I've acquired the same regard for the small of my back. Keep regarding it that way, Saint. Don't let your nose wander where it doesn't belong. And you might begin by forgetting you saw certain people aboard this boat. See, uh, just tell me how you're going to swing it, Mrs. Miller. Well, don't be surprised. I'd recognize the notorious Lil Miller's voice on a party line. How are you going to take him, Lil? A palm date or, or perhaps a marked deck? This rod has a hair trigger, Saint. Just a touch and you're... <laughs> Lil, Lil, what's the matter? That girl there, the one in the hall. Lil, Lil. You're... Lil. You're lucky, Saint. I... I'd have shot... Give her air. Give her air. Don't crowd. Crowd her all you want to. She won't mind now. Is she? Yes. A stiletto in the back leaves very little doubt. She's dead. You know, Simon, I would never have paid the late Mrs. Miller for a professional card shop. She was anything but the type. Professional card shops are always anything but the type, Doctor. Yeah. And to think I actually played bridge with her myself, with a crook and a hot-headed one at that. Well, as my old grandmother used to say, Doctor, beware of lady thieves with red hair. <laughs> I guess the lady's red hair accounted for the lack of insulation in her temperament. Oh, how does your head feel, son? Better, Doctor. Much better. You still haven't touched your sedative, you know. Oh, haven't I? Uh, I think you'll find that it helps, Simon. Here. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, shortly after the murder of Mrs. Miller, Doctor, I called on her bereaved husband and uh, partner in crime. A very interesting visit it was, too. You have the knack for making all of your visits interesting, Simon. Tell me about it. Well, I found Miller in the bar, quenching his sorrow with the merry waters of the River of Forgetfulness. Fifty grand in the palm of our hands and beep. No more Lil. No more Lil, no more sucker. No more sucker, beep. No more 50 grand. Oh, I see you valued your wife highly. Uh, who, who was the sucker, Miller? Ha <laughs> ha. You're funny. Uh, tell me, what's Phil Raider cruising for, Miller? And uh, don't tell me it's a coincidence he's on board the same ship. You get funnier and funnier. Why is Barbara Brooks so afraid of Raider? You ain't even warm, Saint. You're a mile wide of the target. Uh, well, I'd better use a different kind of ammunition then, Miller. Yeah? Like what? Like a little murder performed on an unwilling sucker in Reno. Huh? What do you know about that? You won't like going back to Reno, Miller. It gets hot in the summertime, especially in the penitentiary. Uh, Raider was with Lil and me on this deal. All He's right, a... Miller. Put the zipper on. Uh, Raider. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything. Phil, honest, I was just... Skip it, Miller. 
I always knew someday you'd show canary yellow. I thought you and I had a little understanding, Saint. Uh, you've got a reputation for wrong thoughts, Radar. Yeah, but right or wrong, I back my ideas up to the hilt, Saint. Keep that frog sticker undercover, Raider, or I might take it away from you. And the Dutch courage that rides with it, too. I'll keep it hidden for now. You just be careful of the places where the lights don't shine, Saint. Come on, Miller, I want to talk with you. Well, I'll be out in a little while, Phil. I, I want a drink. You're I'll... drunk enough, Canary. Come on. You'd better go, Miller. And if you can't talk your way out of it, my regards to the fishes. And I recall it was shortly after Mr. Raider passed on his second warning that you and I met for the first time professionally. Yes, Doctor, the very next night. <laughs> well, I am very surprised at you. He'd warned you to stay away from Doc Plater. <laughs> yes, Doctor, so he had. But I'm perverse by nature, and I like to poke around. I was strolling around the deck with Barbara, getting moonburned and trying desperately to get some more information. So wonderful having you near, Simon. I, I feel safe. Safe? I refuse to accept the compliment, particularly on a moonlit night at sea. I'm referring to danger, Simon, not romance. They're often the very same thing. I'd like to join the team, Barbara. Why don't you confide in me? Because if I did, we'd both be dead by morning. I must go now. Good night, Simon. Good night. Don't turn around, Templer. I've got a... I know. A gun pointed at the small of my back. That's it. Now keep away from Barbara Brooks. Am I clear? Clear enough. Anything else? Yeah. Just so it sinks in, Saint. Take this along to remember me by... Once again, you enter the picture, Dr. Norman. You found me there, lying on the deck, basking in moonlight. And blood. Uh, go on, Simon. Tell me the rest of it. Well, after your neat job of vulcanizing me, thus saving me a trip to the ship's doctor and innumerable words of explanation, I hit upon a strategy, and my next visit found me calling in the lion's den. <laughs> I tell you, you're being made a patsy, Raider. You're on the verge of being demoted back to second-class hoodlum. I can take care of myself. Well, I admit a minor sandbagging committed in your good name doesn't amount to much, Raider. But what if the same someone likes your name and decides to use it in uh, other ways? What do you mean? I mean murder. You're a lead pipe cinch to pay for one of your own someday, Raider. But meanwhile... How would you feel getting hung for somebody else's shenanigans? I'd be annoyed. You sure would. Look, I'm not rigged up with no murder saint. Lil meant 50 grand to us alive. That's what we figured the sucker was good for. Uh -huh. That's a good enough reason for wanting Lil among the present instead of the late raider. Uh, tell me, what was the angle? Blackmail? Nah, nah, nothing so crude, saint. I sponsor the party, spot him, finger him, and oil him, and the millers squeeze him through a deck of cards. Huh? The guy's a sucker for good-looking dames and card games, that's all. That sounds very uncomplicated, easy picking. The guy ain't had the coin long enough to be smart about it. Who's the guy? Eh, he makes water heaters. Oh, the fat man with the diamonds from Passage. Yeah, that's the sucker. <laughs> I should have tumbled. Looks like you did. I thought you were out for a bust-up. 50 G's a lot of money, Saint. I figured if I could scare you, it'd be insurance. How about, uh, Barbara Brooks? Ah, deal me out. I'm not in on whatever the caper is there. She saw you the day we sailed, and she got scared. Well, maybe it's because I ain't exactly pretty. Yeah. But if you really want to know something, Saint, I'll tell you. I was propositioned on a stunt against that dame a few weeks before we sailed. I turned it down. A big dough, too. A murder deal? Yeah, a big dough to bump her off. Not for me, though. Nah, she's too prominent. Too much heat on those jobs. Who made the offer, Raider? He wasn't exactly interested in leaving his calling card, Saint. Just a John Smith, as far as I'm concerned. But he had a description, didn't he? Everybody has a description. Well, sure, sure. He was a medium-sized guy with... Hey, the lights. Who turned them off? Get Just... down! Ah! Raider! Raider! Ah! Raider, are you... A brown... Brown tie. Blue shirt. Brown tie. Blue shirt. Brown tie. Blue shirt. <clears throat> Not a very harmonious color scheme, is it? He... Raider. Yeah. Thank you, Raider. At least your last earthly utterance was in the direction of good. Thank you. Brown Ty 
that blue shirt. What did he mean, Simon? Well, it means that either the man for whom I search isn't a very fastidious dresser, Doctor, or else... Or else? Or else he's colorblind. Blue and brown just aren't worn together. Well, no, Uh, I'll take that drink now, Doctor. Oh, and the sedative I mixed for you. Your concussion. Later, Doctor, later. Uh, Very well. I can see that you're going to be a very difficult patient. I hope you don't mind drinking out of another medicine glass, huh? No, right now I prefer it. Say when? A little more, Doctor. That's fine. Has such a beautiful color, hasn't it, Doctor? Yeah, hasn't it, though? Aren't you going to drink it, Simon? In a moment, Doctor, when I finish my story. Oh, yes, of course, this story. Uh, Barbara's murder was next. Yes, huh? Barbara was next. But immediately before our last meeting on deck in the fog, Doctor, I found out what she was afraid of. You did? But how? It was easy. The steward had some keys. I had some money. The steward has enough now for that chicken ranch he's always dreamed of. You broke into Barbara's state's room. <laughs> yes. Well, what did you find, Simon? Oh, Largely perfume stockings and some letters, Doctor. Peculiar letters. Huh? Fan me? Yes. Yes, and all from the same fan. A fan she was once engaged to marry, Doctor. A fan who loved her very much and hated her in equal proportion. Who was so torn between love and hate, he had to kill her. Ah, it's schizophrenic. You should know. What do you mean? Well, you know the classifications. You're the doctor. Oh. <laughs> Drink your sedative, Simon. A colorblind schizophrenic. I don't believe I've ever met one before, Dr. Norman. So colorblind, he mistook the green and orange harlequin costume worn by Lil Miller for the blue and yellow one worn by Barbara. That is very interesting, Simon. Poor Lil. If she'd come to the ball as anything but a harlequin, she'd have lived to take in $50,000. Your sedative, Simon. You know, you were wrong about Lil's hair, Doctor. It wasn't red. It was brown. <laughs> you said it was red. I wanted to see if you'd agree. Uh, your sedative. Yes, of course. Hand it to me, would you, Doctor? There alongside the drink. Yeah. No. No, don't try to tell them apart by their aromas, Doctor. It's obvious that they're different colors. Or can't you tell? You'll find it, Saint. I'd like very much for you to drink it. My doctor, what a pretty purple gun you're wearing. Or is it pink? Drink up, Tipler. You hardly feel it. It's just a dash of prussic acid. Uh, Dr. Norman, when you give a sedative, you go overboard. Drink it, Tipler. Well, you're the doctor. A toast to you, Dr. Norman. To your green shirt, blue tie, and gray handkerchief. None of which match. Here's how... It was a question of your eyes or my stomach, Doctor. In my eyes, I'm blind. You'll get over it, Doctor, which is more than can be said of me if one of those wild shots of yours should hit me. I know I shouldn't practice medicine without a license, Doctor, any more than you should. But um, here's a sedative from me to you. <sighs> Pleasant nightmare, Doctor Norman. have been listening to another adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, in a prejudice-filled America, no one would be secure in his job, his business, his church, or his home. Yet racial and religious antagonisms are exploited daily by quacks and adventurers whose followers make up the irresponsible lunatic fringe of American life refuse to listen to or spread rumors against any race or religion, help to stamp out prejudice in our country. Let's judge our neighbors by the character of their lives alone and not on the basis of their religion or origin. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at the same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. Tonight, 
of the Saint was written by Michael Cramoy. Our cast included Betty Lou Gerson, Jean Bates, Frank Gerstel, Bill Conrad, and Barney Phillips. The music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Thomas A. McAvity. Vincent Price is soon to be seen in Harry M. Popkins' production of Champagne for Caesar, co-starring Ronald Coleman. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Merrill Rudd. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Hello, Ethelbert. What are you reading? Hiya, Casey. I'm just brushing up on the baseball scores. Is that so? I didn't know you were a baseball fan. Oh, sure. I follow the Dodgers every year. Hmm. Who's your favorite team, Casey? Well, I usually root for the Yankees. Uh, how about you, Tony? Who, me? Why, naturally, I root for Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, The Laughing Killer. <laughs> Midnight, and the Blue Note Cafe is doing its usual brisk midnight business. From the service end of the bar, a waiter beckons to Ethelbert, the head bartender. What do you want, Walter? Uh, the guy at that table by the wall wants another drink, Ethelbert. How about it? He's licked to the eyes. Hmm. You better collect his bill and ease him into a cab. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Huh? His face is familiar. You know who he is, Walter? No. He's a new one to me. Uh, I can't place him, but he's a clean-cut-looking guy. Yeah. See, he gets a right cab, Walter, with a driver you know, huh? Okay. If I can get him out and into a cab. Hi, Ethelbert. Well, Casey. Hello. Evening, Miss Williams. You Hi. two just put the paper to bed? Yeah. Nothing to do now but go home and get some shut eye. Oh, and how I'll go for that. Oh, I'm tired. You and me both, Annie. Uh, Ethelbert, give me a pack of cigarettes, will you? Same old brand? Sure, same old brand. What do you think? Here. Huh. Pick up what you need. Why well, you got a bullet mixed up with that silver? A bullet? Uh, oh. Oh, Captain Logan gave that to Casey today. Yeah. This 32 caliber shell was in an automatic that killed a guy last month, pal. Casey helped Logan get the killer, so that cartridge is to remember him by. A little slug just like that bumps someone off, huh? A 32 is big enough when it gets inside you. Oh, don't go into details. I can imagine. I don't want to go home. I look. I want another drink. Please, mister. Oh, no, I, I don't want to go One home. of your customers isn't listening to reason, Ethelbert. Uh, uh, Ethelbert, hey. Hmm? Isn't that drunk Artie Maddox? Artie Maddox? Yeah. Sure, I knew I'd seen him before. When did he get out of the big house, Casey? Last month on parole. I meant to look him up, but I haven't had time. You mean that nice-looking man is an ex-convict? Yeah, and he was sent up for murder, Miss Williams. Well, not quite. That was manslaughter. A lot of doubt that he was guilty even of that, too. Mm, that's so. What? His case was hot news before you come to this town, Miss Williams. Artie Maddox was an orchestra leader. Well, he had one of the best and... sweet bands in the country, Annie. Before he met some dame who calls herself Gypsy Hibbert. Gypsy Hibbert? Oh, the, uh, the big uh, blues singer. That's right. Yeah, you can shorten the gypsy part of her name to plain Jip. That'd describe her better, too. What happened? Well, she was singing in a roadhouse, and Artie heard her. He hired her and 
gave her a feature spot with his band. Then he went nuts about her and wanted to marry her. But she just kind of strung him along in order to meet more important guys. One of which was Phil Blaney. At that time, Annie, five years ago, Blaney was the big shot in the gambling racket here. You mean he had the spot that Lou Carboni has now? Uh Uh-huh. Carboni then was merely Blaney's first assistant. Well, Blaney went for the gypsy gal in a big way. One night, the cops got a phone call from Gypsy who said there'd been an accident in her apartment. When they got there, they found Blaney with a bullet in his head and Artie Maddox was in the apartment. He said Blaney had pulled a gun on him, that there'd been a struggle. The gun went off in Blaney's direction. Of course, Gypsy told the same story. A lot of folks, including the cops, were more than half convinced that it was she who'd really shot Blaney in cold blood. And that Artie Maddox told the story he did to protect her. Yeah. But she came out of the mess undamaged and poor Artie went to jail. And he hadn't been in the big house six months when Gypsy Hibbard married Lou Carboni, who'd fallen hair to Blaney's racket. Nice girl. Yeah. So nice that even a rat like Carboni couldn't stand for her long. They separated a little while afterwards. And Gypsy got a divorce and heavy alimony. Well, Artie Maddox is out on parole now. That's all. I don't want to go home. Except that he won't stay out if the parole board hears he's getting plastered. If those waiters are going to get him out of here, it looks as though they'll have to carry him out. Hey, maybe I could straighten him oh, out. Oh, now, Casey, don't start one of your Boy Scout acts. Huh? Walter will put him in a cab, Casey. Well, yeah, what happens after he's put out of the cab? I'm going over Wait there. Alone, I don't want to go home. I now, stay. look here, mister. Uh, I... I'll take care of him, Walter. What? You know this guy, Casey? Sure. Remember me, Artie? Uh, sure. You're a cop, ain't you? No. I'm no cop. But you know, it wouldn't be good if a cop saw you right now. A guy on parole is supposed to behave himself. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just celebrating something. Something awful funny that's happened. (laughs) You never guess the funny thing that's happened. Suppose I run you home, huh? You tell me about it on the way. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell anybody. But you... (laughs) You can read about it in the papers tomorrow. Okay, but let me take you home anyway. Now you can read it in the papers. Hey, say, you work on a paper. I remember you now. You're Casey. That's right. Uh, Casey, good old Casey. I'll buy you a drink. Uh, No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. We'll have one later. We'll have one later. You got a bottle at home, Artie? Uh, Sure, I got a bottle at home. Well, that's fine. Suppose you take me there and we'll have a talk about old times, huh? I'd, I'd like to talk tonight. I'd like to talk. Where are you living? Her Buckingham Apartments. It's uh, 6th Street, number 614. 614. 614. All yeah. right, that's fine. Well, let's go then. Yeah. Come on. You're not just trying to get me out of here. Of course not. Come on, pal. Come on. Okay. <laughs> you know, the funniest thing happened tonight, Casey. The funniest thing. <laughs> Here's where he lives, Annie. Hmm? If I can only get him into his apartment. What'd he do? Give you the number before he passed? Yeah, 2B, second floor. All right, here goes. Hey, you're not going to carry him. It's the only way he can be moved. But this is a walk-up place, Casey. The the stairs. Oh, poor guy isn't heavy. Open the door for me, will you, Annie? Oh, all right, sure. Mm. I'd better come along and help you with the apartment door, too. Yeah, if you don't mind, honey. Gee, an awful cheap-looking place. Well, guys don't usually come out of prison heavy with dough. Well, I wonder who's... What's he living on? Dixie Trumbull, the songwriter, was always Artie's closest pal. <sighs> Imagine Dixie's putting him up for... He hasn't been on the chips lately either. There, here we are. Here's 2B. Uh, yeah. You have to go through his pockets and find the key. Yeah, yeah. I'll prop him up right uh, here. Eddie. Funniest thing happened, didn't I? Why are you snapping out of it, Casey? Uh, funniest thing. Uh-oh. Passed out again. Yeah. I wonder where he carries his yeah. key. Uh, Annie. Hmm? Look at this. <gasps> Automatic pistol. This was in his pocket. This chump's just out of jail on parole. He's toting a cat. Uh-oh. This doesn't look good, Casey. Looks lousy. <laughs> hey, Annie. Yeah? This gun was fired not long ago. Fire? Yeah, smell it. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Let's look at the clip. Yeah. One cartridge missing. What do you think? Your guess is as good as mine. Funniest thing happened tonight. 
Let me see. There, I found his key. Here, Annie, unlock the door, will you? Yeah, okay. I'm going to snap this guy out of his daze and ask him a few questions. All right, switch on the lights. Oh, yeah. Uh, here we are. How are you going to make him talk? Yeah, there, now. You find some coffee in that kitchenette, will you, Annie, while I hold this guy up? Yeah. Make a pot of triple strength while you're doing it. I'll be ducking this guy in a cold bath. Okay. All right, now, Artie. You come into this bathroom. <clears throat> Get those clothes off, you. Uh, funny thing happened tonight. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it won't seem so funny after you hit this cold water. <laughs> Oh, look at Artie. There you are. Come on, Casey. Don't push my head under. Can you breathe? All right, Artie. Okay, okay. I think you're on the sober side now. Come on, get out of the tub, put on your clothes. Come out. Yeah. Lady's making you some hot coffee. A lady? Yeah, a friend of mine. Oh. I'll leave you alone now. I don't be long. Because I want to have considerable talk with you. Talk? What about? Stay to your help. Get dressed and hurry. Is he okay, Casey? He knows what's going on around him now, anyway. Did he tell you anything? I haven't mentioned the gun. Let's have another look at that thing. Yeah. Foreign make. 29.5 caliber. It's got a pearl grip on it. It looks like a woman's gun. Yeah. Say, it's funny. Phil Blaney was killed with a fancy little gat like this. You mean the man Maddox went to jail for killing? Yes. The bullet they took out of his head was a 29.5. I remember because it's an unusual caliber for pistol ammunition. Oh. You see, in this country, we standardize pretty much on 22s, 25s, and 32s, like the cartridge Logan handed me today, 38s and 45s. Yeah, you, Casey. What? Someone's trying the outside door. Yeah. Who's there? Open up. We're police. Police? Open up, Maddox, or we'll blast our way in. Hey, that's Sergeant Flanagan's voice. It's the last warning, Maddox. Hold Open everything, up. Flanagan, and I'll let you in. Casey, what are you doing here? Mind if I ask you the same question? We've come to arrest Maddox for murder, that's all. Murder? Who? Gypsy Hibbert. Gypsy Hibbert? Yeah. She was killed about two hours ago in her apartment. Now then, where's Maddox? Why do you think Maddox had anything to do with it? He was seen leaving the building she lives in. She was shot with the same kind of gap that killed Blaney five years ago. A 29-5 automatic. Hey, Casey, Let me do that... the talking, Annie. The only talk I want to hear right now is the answer to where's Maddox? He's here, Flanagan. Where? In the bathroom. There. Uh-huh. All right, bring him out, Sam. I'll cover you with my gun. Right, sorry. Hey, Casey, he killed that woman with a gun. Maybe not, Ann. Maybe not. Don't mention that gun. In the bathroom, Sarge. He's gone. What? Hey, that open window. He must have swung under the fire escape and got away. Casey, you're to blame for him getting away. I am. You stalled me here while he was going out that window. I wasn't stalling you. Well, we'll see what Captain Logan thinks about it. You know, you've got me in a jam, pal. Well, I'll make Logan see you weren't to blame. Where is he? At the late Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, trying to find out just what happened there. Well, let's go. I want to find out what happened at the late Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, too. <laughs> Mother's Day has become a fine American tradition, and many Americans make it a point to show their appreciation of mother's role as homemaker by sending her bright flowers and also practical gifts, useful items to lessen her work and increase her enjoyment. And that's why a complete set of Fire King oven glass is so appropriate. As an experienced homemaker, she'll tell you how much better food tastes when baked in Fire King oven glass, and how tempting is the appetizing clean look as the piping hot food is brought to the table. And as for cutting down her housework, well, Fire King Oven Glass cuts dishwashing time by a full two-thirds, for you bake, serve, and reheat food in the same casserole or baking dish. Fire King Oven Glass has a beautiful pale blue color which adds charm to any table. Every piece is guaranteed for two years against oven breakage. Now you'll find complete sets at your favorite chain, variety, hardware, or department store. The ideal gift for Mother's Day or any day. Fire King Oven Glass is a product of Anchor Hocking. The most famous name 
in Glass. That's why we were in Artie Maddox's apartment, Logan. That's all we know about him. Uh, when you undressed him before you stuck him in a cold tub, Casey, he didn't run across a gun in his clothes. I, I wasn't looking for a gun. Casey. Now, suppose you give Ann and me the lowdown on this shooting, pal. Well, a guy called up headquarters. Uh, wouldn't give his name, but he told us to pick up Lou Carboni and ask him why he'd just killed his ex-wife. Ask Lou Carboni why he'd killed Gypsy Hibbert? Yeah. So two of my men went to Carboni's home. They found him playing poker with three guys who said he hadn't left the house all evening. Hmm. At the same time he was being checked, I came here to Gypsy Hibbard's apartment, got the super to let me in, and found her lying on the living room floor with a twenty-nine-five slug in her head. And somebody told you they'd seen Artie Maddox leaving the building. Yeah, the superintendent. And checking the time he saw Maddox leave with the medical examiner's finding, the woman must have been shot just a few minutes before. Have you any idea who made that call to headquarters, Captain? Oh, I think Maddox made it. He killed Gypsy Hibbert because she married another guy, Lou Carboni, after Maddox took the rap for her in that Blaney shooting. Maddox hated Carboni, too, for getting the gal he wanted, so he tries to frame Carboni for the murder he's just committed himself. You know, Carboni wasn't on good terms with his ex-wife. He wasn't seen near this building tonight. Maddox was. A real murderer would take good care not to be oh, seen. Yeah? yeah. Sergeant Flanagan, Captain. Now, come in, Sergeant. Carboni wants to know if he can go now, sir. Carboni's here? Yeah, yeah, I was questioning him in the kitchen before you arrived. I'll talk to him, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, Captain wants you, Mr. Carboni. Captain, it's so late. I uh, wonder... Carboni, you can go home now, but don't leave there without letting me know where I can reach you. Very well. Hello, Carboni. Oh. Hello, Casey. <laughs> Sergeant Flanagan tells me... You helped the murderer of my ex-wife make his escape tonight. I don't believe Flanagan told you that. That I didn't, Casey. All uh -huh, I said was... No. He... Don't take me seriously. I was only kidding. Doesn't seem like a good time for kidding. You're in a spot, Carboni. What do you mean by that? Can't you figure it? Why, you... Never mind. Go on home, Carboni. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Perhaps you'd better tell Casey about my alibi, Captain. He has told me. It's a very good one. Good night. Oh. Well, Andy and I will be running along too, Logan. It's our bad luck this case had to break too late for a morning paper. <laughs> that is tough, isn't it? And I expect to have Art Maddox under arrest long before your next edition, so the afternoon sheets will get first crack at that news too. Where do you expect to find Maddox? Well, there's a general alarm out. We'll pick him up. Say... You used to know him pretty well. Maybe you have an idea where he'd hide out. I didn't even know where he lived until after I ran into him at the Blue Note tonight. Come on, Annie. Hey, Casey. Let's go, kid. Good night, Logan. All right. Hey, Casey, you, you suppressed evidence. And you didn't tell Logan about that gun you found. You were swell, kid. You didn't tell him either. Here's the outside door. But we've got to tell him. Otherwise, we're accessories We won't to... bother with the elevator, Annie. Let's walk down. We're not leaving until you give that gun to Logan. Well, yes, we are. Come on. No. Give him the gun later. After I have a talk with Maddox. Talk with... You know where he'd find it? I think so. Which makes another little item I've suppressed. Why? Well, let's call it a hunch, Annie. I have a feeling that if the cops find Artie before I do, if they have that gun that seems to clinch his guilt, he hasn't got a chance. And he didn't shoot Gypsy Hibbert any more than he killed Phil Blaney. You think Carboni did it? All I'm thinking of now is locating Maddox. Well, where are you going to look for him? Well, he needs a friend tonight, a dependable friend. His closest pal is that songwriter, Dixie Trumbull. All right, we're heading for Dixie's place. <laughs> Set eyes on Artie for two, three days, Casey. On the level, he ain't here. Oh, listen, Dixie. Miss Williams and I want to help the guy. He needs help. Don't give me a wrong steer. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. And I got no idea where Artie is. It's okay, Dixie. Hello, Artie. Why, you said not to let anyone know you were here. Casey's my friend. Yes. This should convince you of that, fellow. Oh, the gun. I figured you'd found it on me. And Casey didn't tell the police about it. Well... Take the shells out of it. Put it here on this table. 
until you tell me what to do with it. What does the gat mean, Artie, and what's the stuff about cops? I haven't told you, Dixie, because the less you know, the less trouble you'll have. I'll go out and take a walk for half an hour. Please, Dixie. Okay, pal. Guess you've got a good reason for asking. I have. That's all I need to know. See you later. I can't have him mixed up in this case. He's too grand a guy. This apartment of his was the only place I knew of to go after I ducked out that bathroom window. I spent five years in prison. I can't go back there. When I heard the cops say he was looking for me. I lost my head. What were you doing at Gypsy Hibbers tonight? You don't think I killed her? I'd have given the cops that gun if I had. And told them to look for you here. Come on, let's have the lowdown. Okay. You know, I was crazy about Gypsy before. Yes, yes, I know. Before, yeah. Well, after I came out of jail, she wouldn't see me or even talk to me over the phone. Last night, I made up my mind I'd see her. I had to. Then... <laughs> it was funny. It's the funny part we want to hear about. Well, I, I, I sneaked up to her apartment. A guy in stairs showed me how to pick locks, and I, I sat in the dark waiting for her to come home. Finally, the outside door was opened with a key. It was Lou Carboni. Carboni? Yes, he sat down in the next room and waited in the dark. Then the door opened again. It was Gypsy this time. <laughs> he told her why he'd come to kill her. Then I watched him do it. You watched Why did him... Carboni kill her? It was funny, Casey. It was, it was so funny I couldn't raise a hand to stop him. Come on, hold on to yourself, buddy. What did he say well, to her? She had been blackmailing him, you know, threatening to tell the cops it was really Carboni who killed Blaney. Carboni killed Blaney? And I had, I had taken the rap because Gypsy told, told me she had killed Blaney. She was protecting Carboni then at my expense. Then she married Carboni and they got to hate each other. And tonight... He killed her while I was there to, to watch. <laughs> it wasn't a funny case. It wasn't, it wasn't funny. <laughs> Come on, Artie, cut it out. What happened after Carboni shot her? Come on, Artie, pull out of it. Pull out of it. He, he, he wiped his fingerprints off the gun. He put it in her hand to look as though she'd committed suicide. But he didn't know I was watching. Then he let himself out the back way. I realize now it was a crazy thing to do, but I, I picked up the gun... I put it in my pocket. I thought he'd spoil his suicide setup. Then I got out of the place. I phoned the cops to pick him up. Artie, no jury's going to believe the story you just told us. I know that. But Carboni's not going to be free and alive while I pay for another murder he's committed. What do you mean? I got another gun before I came to Dixie's. You see? I'm going to kill Lou Carboni. Artie! Give me that gun. Keep back, Casey. I'm going to kill Carboni today before the cops can find me. Don't be a fool. You've just said no jury will believe my story. Give me that gun. Keep back. You... You won't shoot me. Not to kill you. But I'll let you have it. He will shoot, Casey. Look out. Okay, Annie. Now, you two get into this clothes closet. I'm sorry, but this is the way it's got to be. It's a foolish way, Artie. It's the only way. <coughs> no! Let me go! Don't get me! Give me back a gun. Not a chance. I never figured you for a killer, Artie. You're not going to louse me up by shooting Carboni or anybody else. Thanks, Casey. Hey. Drop the gun you just took from him, Casey. <sighs> Drop it. Carboni. Yes, there's nothing else I can do, Carboni. Thanks. Now all of you move back against that wall. You see, Maddox? Like Casey, I figured you'd hide out with Dixie Trumbull. Why did you come here? That gun I planted beside my late wife's body wasn't found there. And I leave nothing to chance. When your bodies are found, Casey, it'll be thought that Maddox killed you and this lady before committing suicide. Mm, same old gag, the gun to be found in Artie's hand. Same as you met that one on the table to be found in Gypsy's. It's always a good gag before a jury. And I'll use the gun on that table, the one that killed my former wife. Then there'll be no doubt that you did all the shooting, Maddox. Are you... You keep quiet, Artie. He'd better. <laughs> Sweet little gun, this 29.5 automatic. <laughs> Always like these imported gaps. Well, you take the first slug from it, Casey. But what's wrong? That 29.5 isn't loaded, Carboni. The shells are in my pocket. Give them to me. You can't hold your other gun and load the automatic, too. 
You can load it. With its barrel pointed at Miss Williams. If you make a single phony move. All right. I know when I'm licked. Take the gun. Put a shell in its chamber first. Okay. Now load the clip. This suits you. Hold the gun by the barrel and slide the clip in. Now what? Put the gun on the table. Don't get your finger near the trigger. There. <laughs> nice little guns. Those 29 vibes. Get ready to take it, Casey. Okay. I got you and the lady into this, Casey. You'll get the second slug, Maddox. Then Miss Williams. Now, uh, Casey. So long. <laughs> With that shell, Carboni, so long to you. Did the gun blow up? Yes, it exploded right in his face. Right in his face. Wasn't it funny? Huh. Wasn't it funny? <laughs> We'll join the crowd at the Blue Note in just a moment. Last week, we told you about a sensational announcement from Anchor Hawking, which was to be made on the air tonight. However, we're obliged to postpone this exciting announcement until next Thursday, so be sure to tune in Crime Photographer one week from tonight. Now, meanwhile, surveys show that a vast majority of women prefer to buy foods packed in crystal clear glass. They give dozens of different reasons but practically all say they prefer glass because it lets them see exactly what they buy before they buy it. Of the hundreds of young mothers questioned about baby food containers, eight out of nine say they not only prefer, but insist on prepared baby foods packed in glass. And their most important reasons are that glass is cleaner and more sanitary and that leftovers can be resealed and safely stored in the original container. Now, you too can enjoy these advantages in buying foods. Simply demand foods packed in glass in anchor glass containers sealed by tamper-proof anchor vacuum caps. Both products of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. explanation, of course, is very simple, Ethelbert. You see, I, I forced the 32 caliber cartridge Logan gave me yesterday into the chamber of that 29 5 caliber automatic. And it wouldn't pass through a barrel that was too small by two and a half hundredths of an inch. You remember, uh, remember, Ethelbert, that inventor's machine gun that blew up because the shells were too large? Yeah. yeah. The explosion didn't kill Carboni, huh? No. He'll live to go to the chair. And as for Artie Maddox, well, the criminal record he never deserved is being wiped off the books. So he'll just live again. Funny, wasn't it? Yeah. Funny. Very funny. Crime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Of 
an afternoon in springtime, Broadway stands on a street corner, sips its seltzer, and takes note of its blessings. Baseball scores to discuss, rides getting painted at Coney, and a new taste thrill known as tangerine juice can be found at most hot dog stands for a dime. And across the street, ushers in faded tight pants and gold braid turning green drag air conditioning banners across theater lobbies. Springtime activity. Open your collar to it. Hold out your hand to it. Slip April some skin to touch. And at police headquarters, the trailing edge of afternoon gleamed warmly, making from windowsill to floor the slant of dust motes and creating the wish that the clock hands would move more swiftly so that quitting time would happen instead of the intrusion. Danny? Yeah? Oh, uh, please come in. Take that chair there, Miss Fuller. Thank you. This gentleman is Lieutenant Clover. Danny, Miss Myra Fuller. Fuller? How do you do? Uh, you want to tell him, Miss Fuller? All right. Well... Go ahead. I told you all right, didn't I? I told you I'd tell him. Sorry. I was going to be married next week. I don't know now. Well, what's this guy? Take it easy. Why don't you show him the picture? You said you wanted to tell him, didn't you, Miss Fuller? Why don't you show him the picture? Okay, okay. Take a look, Danny. Hmm. So? Guy she was going to marry, or is, I don't know. Name's Ernie Lane. Here's the stuff on him. Wanted for murder. Yeah, suspected of having killed his wife, June 1950. I can read, Dennison. Miss Fuller... Listen, I didn't know what... Just take the time and tell me about it. You want me to help you? Go ahead. Well, about an hour ago, Miss Fuller walked into headquarters and she was steered to me because of the nature of her request. I see. Miss Fuller said she was going to get married. And she didn't know a whole lot about the guy, his background and all. And uh, before she did, she wanted to make sure the uh, fellow didn't have a jail record or anything. Right so far, Miss Fuller? Well, she told me the man's name, Ernest Lane. I went down to records. And, and you found out he was wanted for murder. What's the matter with you? Huh? Of course. What do you think? What do you think I'm here for? Yes. Yes, now I discover Ernie's wanted for murder. Where is he? Yeah, it starts now, Danny. I tried it, too. Miss Fuller? I heard you. Give me time. Give me some time to think. Sure. Cigarette? No. All right. And I don't want a shot of booze from the bottom desk drawer. What is it with men, anyhow? Listen, I, I, I've got a decision to make here, and I'll make it. I don't want a crutch. I don't want... Take your time. I inform Miss Fuller of the fact that shielding a felon makes her party... I'm too. sure Miss Fuller knows that. Which means if I don't tell you where Ernie is, you'll throw me in jail. Miss Fuller... Yes, what do you want? How long have you known Mr. Lane? Three, four months... About that long. Hadn't you asked him anything about where he came from, his background? Of course. Well. When I tried to ask him that, he'd shut my mouth for me. What are you going to do about all this? A man you love has plans to marry, and you suddenly find out he's wanted for the murder of another woman. You said the thing, all right. A man I love. Look. Uh huh. I really love him, Mr. Clover. You can't ask me to tell you where Ernie is. Not now. Not right now. You're wrong, Miss Fuller. That's just what the lieutenant is asking you. If Ernie's guilty, the state will kill him. Possibly. And I love him. I will have killed him. I'm leaving, Mr. Clover. You can stop me if you want, but then I'll think of something. Deny all this, something. Goodbye, Miss Fuller. Follow her, Dennison. Gentle nightfall of April, glow of spring darkness, and through its crests and deeps and shallows, the passage of a woman, and set adrift in her wake the official shadow to blend with darkness to later report the itinerary of night, and at police headquarters the waiting, place of muted corridors, place of murmurings and ringings of a city's violence. Wait. An office wall burst flash play of reflected lights and the phone the report from detective dennison myra fuller had walked uptown from headquarters had stopped in a side street bar bought a drink talked to no one but the bartender a man a drunk had approached her touched her shoulder but miss fuller had shrugged him off left her drink unfinished paid left the bar walked uptown again to a bench in the park at the public library sat for a while alone then across town bus to Lexington, 
and walked downtown to 39th Street into an apartment house, third floor front, lights on for a while, then off. And for 20 minutes, Miss Fuller stared out of her window. So far, no one else in or out. Dennison will make a bed for the night against a doorway across the street. We'll phone again if anything breaks. Bid Dennison good night. And to sleep then on the cot in the squad room. Room also of reflected light, reflected sleep. In the morning, relieved Dennison, be offered the spot he's made soft in brownstone. And in a half hour, Myra Fuller out of the doorway across the street, the drugstore for breakfast, a magazine rack for newspaper, armful of magazines, and into street, an aimless, drifting walk through the morning riot. The season's mannequins to observe in shop windows, display of remnants in storefront to be touched, scattered, flung from her, and back to third floor apartment. And Miss Fuller at window, to riffle armful of magazines, stare. At noon, be relieved by Detective Mugovan. And later, the report from him. Myra Fuller had gone out in the late afternoon, had stopped in a delicatessen, had bought beer and a sandwich, had walked her street for a while, caught a Twilight movie, had gone back to her room. No contacts with anyone. No leaving of the neighborhood boundary. And the night report from Dennison, not different from the night before. In the morning, third day, take it up again. Stake out again, and this time Myra Fuller boards the crosstown bus, gets off of 42nd Street, moves swiftly at a subway entrance downstairs, and follow her at a discreet distance. And suddenly she turns, points finger at you. That man on the stairs, he's following me. Stop him! Somebody stop him! Hey, Mister! Stop him! He's crazy! Stop him! Get your hands off me! Don't try any more, Buster! I'll sweat you. Me and these other decent citizens, make a circle, citizens. Let go of me! I'm the police. That's right, Buster. You're a lot of things. You're a molester of that pretty lady. And you're police. And you're sick. And us citizens will see to it. Here, my badge. See? I ain't up on police badges. Any citizen here know a police badge when he sees one? You? Show it to the citizen, Buster. Uh, Well, uh, yes, but I think... The McCoy, huh? The true thing, huh? Thanks, citizen. Oh, 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 that's all right. Thanks. Sorry, officer. I guess I made a boo Any of you see where that woman went, the woman who screamed? I did. She made that train just pulled out, officer, which you didn't. Boo-boo. <laughs> it's a day for it, huh, officer? Danny? What do you want now, Gino? I bring you a container of coffee, a chopped liver sandwich on date, and nut bread. For this, you're going to bite my head off? Oh, I'm sorry, Gino. Mayhap you would prefer untoasted rye. If you so desire, Danny, I could run out and exchange the slabs of date and nut bread. No, never mind, Gino. The sandwich is all right the way it is, and thanks. Use your mouth for eating, not for thanking. Here, pate. It's good. A joy to watch you eat, Danny. Is anything new on Myra Fuller? From the time you lost her day before yesterday through the heh, cooperation of our alert citizenry, nothing. She is still in her room on Lexington where her comings and goings are even now being observed by detectives Mugovan, Dennison, et al. So we... She must have made contact with Ernie Lane that day. So I presume she made contact with a fiancé who was a killer of his former wife and you missed it. So what's to suffer from? Gino. What's to kill yourself when that midnight she came home to roost has been there ever since? And one day, as I am standing here, the impulse will seize her to make contact again with her killer intended, and you will be there to the telephone, Danny. Thanks. Danny Clover speaking. Dennison, Danny. About Myra Fuller. What about her? Half hour ago, she left her apartment, complete with hat, veil, gloves, summer fur, and streamlined traveling bag. She held a cab. You're trying to tell me you lost her? <laughs> the way I hear it, it's happened. But not this time. This time, a fellow of the police didn't lose her. I've got her staked out. Where, Dennison? Brownstone, West 29th. 1347 West. Now, I'll wait for you outside, Danny. I'll be the fellow without egg on my face. <laughs> First floor rear, Danny, is where the guy opened the door to her. They had a long, hello kiss before he let her in. That's how I wasn't noticed. Very shrewd, Dennison. 
I figured you'd think that. Unsolved murder, a couple of years old, and by alertness, dictatorness, sheer grit, a chap on the force. Just knock on the door, huh, Dennison? Anything you say. Coy types, huh, Danny? Try again. Open up, police! Open up! No, Ernie! No! Get back, Dennison! He shot through the door. Not so coy, huh? You all right? Yeah, watch me. <laughs> okay, Dennison. <laughs> Thing killers forget. Don't stand too close to a door. Are you happy now? Are you satisfied now? You did it, didn't you? Now take it easy. Miss you Polk. did it. You made me give him to you. So he could be like that. Like you wanted. So Ernie could be dead, 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 dead. <laughs> Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Tomorrow night, CBS Radio's Hall of Fame Playhouse pays tribute to its host narrator, Lionel Barrymore, celebrating his 60th year in the drama field and his 75th birthday. Don't miss the special Hall of Fame Playhouse tomorrow night. And on the same evening, on most of these same stations, don't miss Claire Trevor on Theater of Stars. Miss Trevor, an Academy Award winner, appears in Taos Incident, a suspenseful story that begins with an innocent truck ride and culminates in a killing. The April sigh swirls upward over Broadway, drifts, races, sensitive to currents and eddies of night light, and composed of diverse things, springtime anguish of a muted trumpet, whisperings against closed doors, the fleet smile, shopped for, bargain, paid for by the light of the happy April girl of the spectacular. The great sigh mushroom scatters on high winds, then falls, prowls the corners of city, finally touches you, wherever you are, it touches you. In setting for April violence, facade of brownstone against side street, and a room in it where a man was dead of police bullets, where a woman swayed, wept, moved from wall to wall. <laughs> Not like that. You didn't have to kill him like that. <laughs> Cliche, Miss Fuller. It was him or us. Let's all break down and cry for a dead murderer. Let everybody do that. Huh? I wish he'd killed you. With all my heart, I wish he'd killed you. Miss Fuller. Don't touch me. Ernie! Ernie. Ernie. Ernie, I love you. You through, Miss Fuller? What? I asked a question. I asked if you were through, and if you were, I was going to ask you to tell us about how much you loved Ernie Lane. Get out of here. Leave me alone with it. Leave me alone. You know how you must feel, Miss Fuller, but some things aren't clear What's to not clear? He's dead. You killed him. Me with him. How clear can it get? You came to headquarters to find because out Because about... I loved him, because I was hungry to know everything about him. So you found out Ernie had murdered his wife a couple of years ago. That's nothing, huh? <laughs> nothing for a lady in love to worry about her fella, huh? Nothing, nothing, nothing. I was going to run away with him anywhere in the world he wanted. Anywhere he could love me. That other time a few days ago when you screamed, got away from me in the subway. This is where you were going, huh, to Ernie? To plead with him. To reason with him. Maybe it was better if he gave himself up. Danny, he just held me. Very close. Very, very close. And whispered to me, how could it be better than now? And he was right. Nothing in my life was ever like Ernie. Nothing. 
Nothing. Nothing. Nothing. Miss Fuller. Nothing. Don't. Please don't. Instant then of desolation. Small space of time when suddenly everybody remembers together. Death is here in this room, close, lying on this floor with eyes not yet shut. Suddenly everybody remembers, and for a second stands still. Then looks around for something that is alive. Movement now, relief. Take Myra Fuller to emergency hospital. Turn her over to Dr. Fensky. Leave her. Night Street is road home. Home is rented bed plus rented niceties, clean sheets and electric sockets, maid service, and keep the radio turned down after 10 o'clock. Place where the world can't touch you. Magazine, an easy chair that fits well. Place of sleep. Sleep and be done with it. There's a new day, which means something or other, mostly that you must get out of bed and give the world a reason for your existence. Go to work, look businesslike. Do the things you've been trained to do. Make your mark, be efficient. Wish you were back in bed. Danny? Yeah? A gentleman to see you by name of Mr. Wayne. Mr. Wayne, who... The chap who owns the apartment building where what happened last night happened. Oh, well, show him in, Gino. This way to see Danny Clover. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. That'll be all. Why don't you sit down, Mr. Wayne? Ah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> there, who's going to pay for the damage? Oh, I see. That's what you came here. I've got an itemized list here. That door that was wrecked with bullets. It'll be taken care of. And what about Mr. Clark, stuff? Mr. Clark? Mr. Clark. The gent was using my place for a hideout. <laughs> the gent you gentlemen shot. What about his stuff? Clark? His name was... Oh, yes, sir. I, of course I know. Ernie Lane, the papers said. But to me, for the last couple of years, his name was Ernie Clark. He came to me, Ernie Clark. He signed his checks, Ernie Clark. To me, he's an Ernie Clark. Not an Ernie Lane. I see. So what should I do with those? It'll be stuff? taken care of. <clears throat> oh, my, it's a shame, huh? It always is. Oh, the girl's broken up. I guess so. She's going to marry him. And finding out she loves a killer. Yeah. Well, uh... I looked in on her this morning. What? I looked in on her this morning. I told her just like this. I said, well, oh, he was no good tell me. Forget him. Oh, surely it hurts now, but there are plenty of tomorrows for a nice girl like you. Who did you tell us to? Thelma. You know. Well, sure. Where is this? Uh... Oh, Thelma? Well, she's got apartment 3C. That's my apartment house that I own. You live there too, Mr. Wayne? Oh, yes, surely. Yeah. Oh, yes, I do. Come on, I'll drive you home. <laughs> Thelma... Miss Reed. Miss Thelma Reed. What do you want? Police, Miss Reed. I want to talk to you about Ernie... Mr. Clark? You people shot him dead today. That makes you want to talk to someone about it? Yes. Let's go inside, huh, Miss Reed? All right. Let's go inside. Well? You've heard? You've read the papers? You mean how once Ernie killed a woman, his wife? It doesn't interest me. And what you did to him doesn't interest me either. Earlier, this morning. Now, no. Not anymore. Some things we need to know, Miss Reed. This morning I cried. You loved him? Miss Reed. There's something I'll have to show you, I suppose. Here. Marriage license. For Mr. Ernest Clark, for Miss Selma Reed. You want it? Have it. There was something else in the papers about the woman who led us to him. Uh -huh. She was in love with Ernie, too. She told us she was going to marry him. <laughs> you knew about her, about Myra Fuller? Sure. But I knew Ernie. Then you didn't... Mind? Mind about Ernie and all the living dolls, as he called them? Told me about it. The puppet dolls that came running when my Ernie pulled a string. Why should I mind? 
other women, like Myra Fuller and you... I think the feeling I finally chose was pride. Uh Uh-huh. It made me proud how Ernie was. Because he was going to marry you? Because he was going to marry me. To which I obtained proof positive. What you now hold in your hand. Which you can frame if you want. This license is dated a month ago. Ernie said wait. I didn't mind waiting. Because... Go on. Because finally I knew Ernie would marry me. No one else. Me. Because I'm what I am. Plain, ordinary, the type that makes a good wife, builds a nice home and keeps it going in the face of no matter what. Ernie needed someone ordinary to come home to. Someone who didn't make problems. That's me. I don't make problems. And Ernie loved me for it. And now... Now what? Now I just have to find someone else who'll love me for what I am. Like Ernie did. Danny? Got something, Danny. Yeah? What? Made a couple stops for odds and ends. Get off it, will you, Dennison? Technical says no prints on Ernie's gun. Cute? Mind if I go on? Dr. Sinsky released Miss Fuller, didn't he? Yep. Doctor say anything? Mm, Try to give her a few pills or whatever to quiet her down when you brought her in last night. Only Miss Fuller got real quiet after you left without any medication. She rested for a while, got up, and waved goodbye. What else? Autopsy report on Ernie from Dr. Sinsky. Here. Bruise on Oxip... Oxip... You read it. I mean skull, Dennis. Yeah, I know that too, Lieutenant. I'm just asking you to help me pronounce a word, Lieutenant. I'll help you in the squad car. Let's go. Three days I case it. Finally, I get into this joint. Proves all you have to do is wait long enough. That's what it does, huh? You hate climbing steps, too, don't you? Dennison? Yeah? Never mind. Ring the bell. Oh. Oh. What do you want now? We want to talk to you. You haven't done enough, have you? No. I'm supposed to ask you in, am I not? Well? Thanks. How do you feel, Miss Fuller? Tomorrow I'll start to feel better. You made up your mind about that, huh? That's right. Which way are you heading? South. Nearly finished your packing, haven't you? You walked in on the best part you want to watch. All that stuff for your uh, trousseau? Look, what do you want... Sorry, I didn't want to bring up old memories. Let me ask you something. Sure. How does it feel to kill a man? I don't like it. Well, you killed a man. Yes, he did. A man you wanted to marry. Bingo. And now he's dead. Now you're going to take a little trip. Starting tomorrow, you'll feel better. End of packing, boys. The show's over. I'll drop your card from Mobile. You got friends there, Myra? I will have. Make friends easy, don't you? You were me, wouldn't you? Two years ago, Ernie killed his wife. Why? Because you made friends with him? I wouldn't know. Think about it for a second. Men are mad, impetuous folk. Did you know that? You told us you knew him for three months. You knew Ernie a lot longer than that, didn't you? You think Ernie killed his wife on account of me? Well, I guess he did. Say, yeah. it would be just like Ernie to do that. You don't know the things that took hold of his mind. Once he brought home a paper mustache and a big black hat. <laughs> well, you wouldn't believe it. The little things that made you love him. Yes. Made you want to marry him. Yes. Because he asked you. On his knees, shyly. It was a picture the way he looked up at me and asked me, Myra, will you be my wife? I patted him on the head, meaning yes. Isn't that touching, Danny? Very. Except about Thelma Reed, the girl he really asked to marry him. Yeah, this louses up the whole act, doesn't it, Myra? What are you talking about? Look, honey. You trying to convince yourself you didn't kill Ernie, mister? No, I shot him. I killed him. When he was propped up against the door, out, unconscious. What? He was slugged before he died, Myra. You set him up against that door, waiting for the police to shoot through it. Is this what you want to believe so you and your friend can sleep night? The only way it figures, Myra. No fingerprints on his gun. So who shot at us through the door? You, Myra. No prints. Done up the way you are, real pretty. Hat, 
fur and gloves. Gloves. No print. Listen. So we knocked on the door, you screamed, you shot the gun, and we did what we did. I did. You sure did. Oh, I wouldn't feel guilty. That's your line of work. Now we come to the reason. Reason, Ernie was going to get married again, but not to you. Must have touched you real deep, Meyer. A man kills for you. Two years later, still hasn't married you. Then meets kind of a plain woman like Thelma Reed. That's for Ernie. But you? Well? You're the woman who he ducked his wife to meet. Nothing more, Myra. How does that make you feel, honey? He's dead, isn't he? First you came to us. Set it all up. You knew we'd follow you. You ducked the lieutenant and gave Ernie one more chance. Ernie balked. So you let us to him. You slugged him and propped him up there behind that door. And I shot him. So what does that make me? Right now? Just under arrest. They'll have the rule for you, Myra. Killer. Danny, mm-hmm. what do you do with a woman like this? What do you... <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> kill her. <laughs> kill her, kill her, kill her, kill her. It's the hurry-up time on Broadway now, the place that's strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley. And they're heaped there, the bright-eyed kids, the voice whispering from the doorway, the stalker, the stroller. It's crowd and it's laughter, and a Nickelodeon where you get pie tossed in your face. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Charlotte Lawrence was heard as Myra, and James McCallion as Dennison. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Howard McNair, and Clayton Post. Bill Anders speaking. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Take a letter, Miss Jordan. To Box 13, care of the Star Times. I, uh, I'll need your help. I dare not go to the police for reasons I'll explain when you see me. Please come to my office in the city. in the security building signed Douglas McIntosh. Not much of a letter, but then, as the proverb says, great oaks from little acorns grow. And before this was over, the acorn grew into a large, large oak. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Three to Die. Douglas McIntosh. That's a Scotch name, isn't it? Ah, you can smell the heather, Susie. Wonder what he wants. Well, if this man is the same McIntosh I looked up, he's building that new tunnel under the river. Oh, gee, maybe he wants you to be a hedgehog. <laughs> no, Susie, they're called sandhog. Oh, what will they think of next? Well, I think I'll see what Mr. McIntosh has on his mind. I'll be at the security building, Susie. <laughs> Security building. Huh. It was the only security I was to know until the whole thing was over. Anyway, I went to McIntosh's office. I was shown right into an oversized man who looked as big as the Washington Monument in Tweeds. He didn't waste much time. So you're the man, eh? Yes, I'm the man. All right. You call me Mac. What's your name? Holiday. Dan Holiday. All right. Now, Dan, I'm in trouble. Uh-huh. Trouble gets around. Fast. But look here, and I'll tell you quick. 
I'm a contractor. I bid on this new tunnel. Got the bid and posted my bond to finish the tunnel on time. So far, everything's clear. What now? Then, I'm not going to finish in time. Well, why not? Now we get to the point. In a sharp point. You say you're running into trouble? Hey, Sabotage. Well, why don't you call the police? They can't, man. It'd be publicity. Unfavorable. I, they can't risk it. Oh, then what's my problem? Find out who's doing this to me. You suspect someone of doing it? Now, look, man. Accidents like we've been having don't just happen. They're made. Broken air hoses, emery in the compressors, hundreds of delays, little things that add up to hours. Oh, I see. Another thing. So far, the men working for me think these things are accidents. But the moment they suspect somebody's doing the dirty work in that tunnel, they'd walk out. Sandhagen's dangerous enough itself. In short, somebody's trying to ruin you. Exactly. It would ruin me. The contract would go to someone else. They'd not get another contract for years. Well, what can I do? I'm not a detective. You see, I... I beg your pardon, Mr. McIntosh, but... Uh, can't you see I'm busy? What do you want? Telegram. I thought you ought to see it right away. Uh, all right, read it. Well, uh... Oh, it's... It's all right. You can talk in front of him. Dan, this is Fred Harris, construction engineer. Harris, Dan Holliday. I need to know you. Now, what about that wire? Uh, the last shipment of concrete we ordered was derailed about 200 miles from here. What? Well, don't just stand there and get every truck out on the road. Get that concrete here. You ought to have enough sense to think of that without coming to me first. Go ahead, get it down. Yes, sir. You see what I mean, Dan? Another delay. Who's this Harris? He thinks he's going to be my son-in-law. Also, he thinks an engineering degree makes him a great man. That it takes the place of 15 years of experience. That's an argument I'd rather watch from the sideline. Well, go on with your story. Well, we have to finish in three weeks or I'll forfeit my contract. McIntosh told me everything he knew. It wasn't much. Only that whoever was doing the dirty work causing accidents, delays, had to be working in the tunnel. So we went to the tunnel. But first, before I was taken down into the workings, I was given khaki coveralls and a fiber helmet. And a little metal tag to hang around my neck. Mac explained the tag. Every sandhog gets one of those. It's got his own number on it. Well, what's it for? Ever hear of case on disease? Oh, the Benz? Yeah, yeah. Well, on one side of the tag, it explains the man is a case on worker working under pressure. Oh, so if the disease hits him on the surface, he can be given proper treatment. Well, that's it. There are six places in the city where that can be treated. The man is put into a chamber, pressure increased. Then gradually decreased. Mm, like a diver. If he comes up too fast, the nitrogen in his blood is forced into his tissues. Causes pain. And sometimes worse. You seem to know a lot about it, Dan. <laughs> I'm a writer. A writer has to know a little about everything. <laughs> then I hope you'll be able to tell me more about what's going on down there. All right. Ready? Mm-hmm. I'm ready. Yeah, let's go. Together, Mac and I rode one of the hoists down into the workings. My ears began to pop from the pressure, and I swallowed hard to keep them open. Then we came to the bottom of the shaft, about 150 feet below the surface of the ground. Mac looked around for a minute, and then... Angus! Angus! Here! Come here! A short, powerfully built man walked over to us. He was grinning as he said to Mac... Ah! What brings the boss into the tunnel? Angus, meet a friend of mine, Dan Holliday. Dan Angus Campbell, my foreman. Best man in the world in his life. <laughs> Aye, the best beside yourself. Who do you do, Dan? How are you, Angus? First rate. Except we had another little rumpus today, Mac. Uh, what? Another break in the air hose at the shield. The hose whipped around. Anybody hurt? Aye, Phil Evans. Hose got him right in the middle. He's done for this job. Won't work for a month. Broken ribs. Uh, another one. Aye. You visiting us here, Dan? Well, you might call it that. Dan's a writer. Doing a story on sand hogging. Wants atmosphere. Uh, uh, you'll get it here. You want to see the works? Uh, show them around, Angus. And be careful of them. Don't you worry, Mac. Good. I'll go back to the office now. Come back there when you finish, Dan. Oh, sure. Oh, uh, it's got him worried, Dan. And little wonder. Every penny he stands to lose. Every penny. That bad, huh? Worse. And if I ever catch the one that's doing it, I'll whip him around with me bare hands. Mm. You and Max seem to be good friends, huh? I started together 30 years ago in Scotland. Uh huh. Well, time's fleeting. Want to show me around? Sure. Let's get going. 
I followed Angus into a big airlock. It was a reinforced concrete compartment with double steel doors. As one door closed behind us, the pressure was built up to equal that in the tunnel. It built gradually. But I knew what would happen if it went down fast. Caisson disease. A terrible, racking pain. Brother, I had a lot of respect for the men who worked down there day after day, taking risks, big chances every time they descended into the workers. Then he opened another steel door, and Angus and I were in the tunnel itself. As soon as my ears became used to the noise, Angus guided me to a small flat car. We got on and rolled down narrow gauge tracks to the center of the tunnel. If you can hear me, this car runs down by gravity. But the handbrake on it to slow it or stop. There's a motor for running back up. Saves time on a job like this. How long is this tunnel? This side's about a half mile long now. This side? Aye. It started on the other bank of the river the same time we did. Oh. Did you have any trouble over there? No. Only on this side. But we're keeping up with them. I'll keep driving till this thing's finished. Accidents or no accidents. How much time have you got? Three weeks. Think you'll make it? We've got to. Our max stands to lose every neck. Look. There's the end of the track. I looked ahead. A tremendous scaffold rose into the air. Men covered it like ants. Working with pneumatic drills, shovels, wheelbarrows. Dump trucks ran back and forth, filled with the mud and shale dug out of the wall of earth that lay ahead. I looked up and I felt a little funny when I realized that right over my head was the river. And lots of clean, fresh air. While down here was nothing but the deafening noise of the hammers. And the thought that death worked right next to every one of these men. Angus noticed me gazing up at the scaffold. First time you ever saw anything like this, eh? Yes, yes. What holds all that mud back? That shield and compressed air. Air? Just air holding back the river? <laughs> Aye. You see, compressed air here in the tunnel is built up to a pressure equal to the pressure that's shoving down from a boat. Oh, in other words, if the pressure outside this tunnel is, well, 45 pounds per square inch, that's the pressure in here. Right. This may not be a good question, but uh, what happens if the pressure in here gets less? We'd be crushed to jelly. Uh, nice thought. That's no all. There's always the danger of a blowout. What's that? Sometimes we hit a weak spot in the riverbed. The bed won't take all the pressure we've got in here. And you get a blowout, like a tire blowing out. Aye. The men, machinery, equipment all blown to the surface of the river and into the air. Did that ever happen? Aye. And once, only once, mind you, a man lived to tell about it. Angus, I take off my hat to you boys down here. A million people drive through tunnels every day. Yet maybe not one in a hundred stops to think how the tunnel was built. And what it cost. Not only in money, but in injury. In death. Yeah, when a man takes to sand organ, he takes to the danger too, won't they? Only what? We've only got a half crew working today. Oh? Why? Two men have been killed. Nobody wants to be the third. Superstition? Maybe. But lots of the men are staying home until the third. Well, uh, what I said. Angus showed me the whole thing. Oh, there were a million ways in which someone could sabotage the works. Break an air hose, tamper with the compressed air gauges, lots of ways. Then later, Angus took me to a complicated affair. It was like an elevator cage. In fact, it was an elevator, as Angus explained. This is the latest thing. Combination elevator and decompression chamber. Hop in, we'll go back up. We go up slow, Dan. As we go up, the pressure in here is decreased until it's equal to that of the surface. Oh, then there's no danger of caisson disease. Not if we go up slow enough. And the pressure's reduced. I set the gauges to do it for us. Oh, I see. Well, did you see enough to write your story? No. No, I don't think I have. Not yet. <laughs> So you, you didn't see anything then? Of course not, Mac. How could I? I was hoping you might get an idea. Yeah, but I didn't. Uh, you going back again? What could I find? Try, try it, man. Oh, but I don't think I could find anything. Hey, you advertised for adventure. You, you couldn't get it in a better place. Yes, yes, I know. But how could I explain myself down there? Hey, you're a writer. Use your imagination, man. Mm -hmm. Well, suppose... 
Suppose I went back there as a worker. As a sand dog, you mean? Mm-hmm, that's it. But you don't know anything about it. I can handle a hammer, a shovel, a... Uh... <laughs> You'd get dirty and tired. Every muscle in your body would holler out loud at you. <laughs> well, I can always say I'm doing it for my art. Be a sand hog, see how it feels, then write about it. By Harry, man, you've got it. All right, then. Starting tomorrow, you're a sand hog. Oh, that was the way to do it. But when I got home that evening, I thought about it. That huge scaffold... Men scrambling over it, the pressure within the tunnel holding back the tons and tons of mud and silt ready to come in and crush everyone. What, uh, what if that pressure failed? What if they hit a weak spot in the riverbed and there was a blowout? And the more I thought about it, the more inclined I was to... Yes? Telegram. Oh. Shove it under the door, will you? Right. Oh, ho. And what a telegram. It read, Save for the fact that I don't want more bloodshed, you'd have gotten yours today. Stay away from the tunnel, or you'll be the third to die. And now back to Three to Die, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. showed Mac the telegram the next day, and what he said filled the air with dark blue color for ten minutes. Then... We can check to see who sent this. No dice, Mac, I did. And? It was sent from a pay phone booth. I guess you'll be changing your mind about the job now, eh? What makes you say that? Well, he's after you, whoever it is. Yes, I know. Uh, You can back out if you want to. And what would you think if I did? Does that make a difference? No, but there are a lot of men in that tunnel who stand to lose their lives. Mac, you've got to get the police. I can't, man, I can't. The publicity would ruin me. All right. Fix it up for me to work down there, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so I became a sand hog. For three days, I used muscles that thought they'd gone on a permanent vacation. Well, I woke them up. And they woke me up in the middle of the night, aching. Then one day in the tunnel, I was talking with one of the sand hogs. You know, Dan, you've done pretty well, considering you're new at this. Oh, I ache, Joe. I ache all over. <laughs> You'll get used to it. I don't think so. <laughs> but, Joe, tell me something. Sure, what? What about these accidents down here? Oh, Dan. What about them? Well, maybe they're just part of the job. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think? Well, some of them weren't just like accidents, that's all. I mean, well... Like a hose break. Two guys been killed. And what? Look out! Hey, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You? I had to show you, Dan. That car would have clipped you in half. Yeah. Look. Look into the decompression chamber. Huh? Well, uh, Harris? Yeah, Harris. Oh. See what I mean? That car didn't look like no accident. Thanks, Joe. And this is one time I can honestly say I was, I was glad I was shoved. That's okay. You know something? You were almost as safe to die. Before leaving the tunnel, I ran down to the spot where that car hit the stop bumper at the end of the track. It was wrecked. But in the wreckage, I found something. One of the tags, like the one I had. This one had the number 57 on it. I slipped it in my pocket. Maybe one of the sand dogs had dropped it. Then, just as I was about to step into the decompression chamber, Angus Campbell came up to me and... Your ship's going off, Don? Yeah, I'm finished for the day. Almost in more ways than one. Huh? What do you mean? Come on, let's get in. I want to get back up. All right. Tired? Uh, I'm worried. I can guess why. Huh? Look, I know you're no right in a story on sand hogging. I know why you're down here. Oh, you do? Aye. Max desperate. I want him to call the police, but he won't. How did you find out about me? You've been nosing around, Dan. Hmm. That obvious, huh? Aye, but be careful, lad. Be careful. Yeah, I will be. Joe told me about the car that almost got you. Somebody sent it down the tracks. Aye. Angus. Aye. You've been with Mac a long time. Thirty years. Thirty years. Good ones, bad ones. And yet you stay with the job. 
I could have a top job on the surface. I see. Angus, got any idea who's doing all this? No. Harris? Huh? Why him? Mac doesn't like him. Ah, don't sense that. What point in Harris's ruin is his own father-in-law? Father-in-law to be, Angus. Still no point? Then how about the protection insurance to cover the completion bond? Eh? Huh? You mean Mac might be doing this himself to get the insurance? Yeah, this could be. No, no, lad. The insurance wouldn't half cover the loss. No, there's, that, that's no it. And why? Uh, I wish I knew. Competitors, do you think? Who are they? Brill and company. But no, they wouldn't. They'd be too easy to find out. Men got a habit to talk it. And talk gets around. No, damn, that's no them. And then who and why? And why did someone try to kill me today? You got the answers to those things, Dan, and you'll have the whole thing. Well, we're up at the top. I walked to the shack with you. you no, know, I'm going back down. But I thought you were through for the day. I've still got lots to do. See you tomorrow. What Angus said made sense. Couldn't be Mac's competitors, because I checked. They'd been in business a long time, had plenty of money behind them. They'd gotten a bid for another job upstate. And Harris? Eh, it didn't make sense either. If he was going to be Mac's son-in-law, it just didn't wash that he'd be sabotaging Mac. So I changed clothes, thought a lot, and then went home. Went out to get some dinner when... when it hit me. First a twinge... Sudden cramps that made me bend over as if someone had folded me inward with a baseball bat. The building started to spin, twist, then it got all nice and dark. There you are. You're all right now. I. I know this isn't very original, but. Where am I? Take a deep breath. That's it. Feel better? <sighs> Lots. What happened? Couldn't have been anything I ate, I... <laughs> you had the bends. The bends? Mm-hmm. The tag around your neck tipped us off you were suffering from caisson disease. So we put you in the chamber. Come on, get up. We may need this chamber for someone else any minute. You make it sound as bad as the housing situation. Yes, it is, but you're all right now. Next time, don't come up so fast. But I... I didn't come up fast. Uh, yes? Nothing. Nothing at all. Thanks a million, Doctor. Well, it had me. Good. I knew I came up slowly. Angus had been with me. He... He... Oh, but that couldn't be. Not Angus. The next day, I went back to the job. I had just put on my coveralls when... When an idea hit me, I searched in my pocket. Lose something, Dan? Huh? Oh, no, Joe, I, uh... It's easy to drop something out of these coveralls. What's the number of your tag, Joe? Tag? Oh, the one we all wear in case we get the bends on top? Yeah. 502. Why? Got it on? Sure. Always wear it. Here it is. Uh-huh. Why? What are you getting at? I... I don't know. Listen... I'm going back for something I forgot. I'll be a little late on the job. Tell the section boss for me, will you? <laughs> sure. Where are you going? You're all hepped up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I am, Joe. I'll be back. I went to see Mac. Told him he'd have to go into the tunnel that day and supervise operations. He thought I was crazy. Me? What for? To force your opponents into the open where we can get a shot at them for a change. I don't get this. Look, they're going after you, but by accidents. Things like that. So? But if you're in the workings, they might be tempted to wreck the entire tunnel with one stroke. You mean by going after me? That's it. You want me to lead with my chin like that? I'll call the whole thing off first. Lose the contracts. Money isn't everything. Exactly. You're right. But men have been killed down there. You've got to think of their lives, too. I do. Then get down with me. End this once and for all. Force them into the open. Uh, you're going, too? Yeah, because I've got an idea but I can't prove a thing until we see the last play. I was leading with Mac's chin, and I knew it. But mine was plenty sore, too, and that made me feel a bit better about it. 
Mac knew he had no choice, and so he decided to go with me into the tunnel. I went to my job, and it was a ticklish feeling knowing that any minute something might happen. Something that would make Joe, Mac, Angus, any one of us the third to die. Or worse. Then... Hey, Dan. Tell us something funny. Funny what? I could have sworn the mud down here wasn't this deep before. What do you mean, Joe? Look. Stand still. Look around. The mud's coming up. It's getting high. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Joe. The pressure in here must be going down. Yeah. Dan, if it gets too low, that wall will come in on us. The whole river will be in our laps. Come on, let's get to the gauges. Dan! Dan, what's the matter? Pressure's going down in here. Come on. There's nothing wrong with the gauges. They read the right pressure. But they can't. The mud's getting higher. Look. Look, the men are coming in. They've seen the mud coming up. With these gauges. Hey, there ain't no air being pumped in. The gauges are stuck. Jam. Somebody jam them so anybody reads them will think the pressure was okay. Get to the emergency compressors. Pressure's dropping fast. Get to the compressors. Get them on. I got them. Watch the gauges. We're getting pressure now. Angus, somebody jammed the pressure gauges to make it look like we had enough in the old town. Well, save for those emergency compressors, we'd have been done for. What did you say, Angus? I said the emergency compressors. You said save for the emergency. Save for. Funny way of putting it, Angus. Either in words or on a telegram. What's the matter with you? Where's your tag? Huh? Well, right here. Yes, with a new chain. So is your tag I picked up in that cart yesterday. The cart that almost killed me. You're crazy. And you, you weren't anywhere around a minute ago. I was coming in here. Then what are you trying to see? There's your saboteur. Man, you're crazy. Stop raving crazy. Yeah? And you went back down yesterday to decompress yourself after I left the chamber. You didn't turn on a decompression valve for me on the way up. You're, you're crazy, man. Not crazy, Angus, because you were the only one who could have played that trick on me. Get me out of the way by failing to turn on a decompression valve. You and I were the only ones in that chamber. Hey, he's running back to the shield. Get him. Get him before he gets the compressors. He'll wreck him. Cut him down. Good. Dan, I never can thank you enough. But to think that after 30 years, Angus would never do a thing like this. Mac, don't waste time even thinking about it. Let's go finish this tunnel instead. <laughs> What's the matter with him, Mr. Holliday? Jealousy, Susie? You see, he'd worked with Mac as a foreman. Then he saw Mac rise from a foreman to the owner of a big company. For 30 years, every day he'd go into the tunnels just, just an employee. While Mac stayed on top. The big boss. And it kind of made him, well, jealous, huh? To put it mildly, yes. Golly. Well, that makes up my mind for me, Mr. Holliday. Mm, congratulations, Susie. Huh? But what do you mean? I quit. Huh? In about 29 years. Oh. (laughs) Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville. Three to Die is an original story by Mr. Sandville, adapted for radio by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. After all, if a girl wears a dazzling necklace worth a fortune, should it make a man want to kiss her or kill her? The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as Pat and Gene Abbott, those popular characters of detective fiction created by Francis Crane. NBC invites you to join Pat and Gene each week at this time for an exciting adventure in romance and crime. In our story tonight will be Miss Sherry Britton making her dramatic debut in radio. Now here is Claudia Morgan as Gene Abbott to set the stage for tonight's puzzle in murder. 
a story entitled The Fabulous Emerald Necklace. The necklace was a breathtaking collection of precious stones. It belonged to Mrs. Dexter Blake, a curious young woman without any social background who'd somehow managed to marry the heir to the Blake fortune. Late one night, she and her husband had left the Stardust Club and were strolling to their Park Avenue townhouse, which was just around the corner from the club. Really, Kathy, I don't think you behave very well at the club. Oh, will you stop picking on me, Dexter? Don't be so prissy. You've been doing it all evening. I just had a little fun at the club. After all, how square can you get? Really, sometimes I... Now, look, I, I've had more than enough trouble because of you. The snobbery deal again? Now, it, it isn't snobbery, Kathy. It's just that I do have a rather well-known family. We're sensitive to publicity. The columnists were very cruel when you married me, and every time you misbehave publicly, you're just proving their point. You believe their point, too, don't you? I mean that there's something very wrong about your having married a divorcee. Especially one whose family wasn't descended from the original settlers. Pilgrims or whatever it was. Oh, let's drop it. It's come up too often. Now, let's settle it. You'd like to get out of our marriage, wouldn't you? Well, I... No, darling, I, I've never said that, never thought but it. Don't try thinking of it, Dexter. You'd never make it. If you don't like bad publicity, just imagine what I'd do if you ever threatened to get rid of me. I'd give Shut those... Up, Mrs. Blake, come back into that doorway. What? Uh, who are you? What's the idea? Get away from her. I said for you two to get off the street and enter that doorway. I've what? got a thirty-eight here and I'll empty it into both of you. Why, of all that... Go on. Into the doorway. That's it. Oh, I'll take that necklace of yours, Mrs. Blake. Cheap hoodlum. You think you can get away with this just because you're waving that gun? Why, I... That's it, Mrs. Blake. I'll take the necklace. Thank you. You give me that necklace? Take your hands off me. The police! Police! I told you not to do that. I told you. Oh, oh he... Come back here, you. Oh, Dexter. Dexter, he's dead. He's dead. Ah! <laughs> The jewel thief disappeared into the night, leaving Mrs. Dexter Blake hysterical beside the dead body of her husband. Pat and I had been home that night. All we knew about Kathy Blake was what we'd read in the gossip column. But the next morning, Pat had been invited to the Sterling Insurance Company. He was in the office of a company executive, Frank Tracy. I uh, sent for you, Mr. Abbott, because this case calls for a man of your caliber. We'd be glad to pay any reasonable fee, of course. Is this a reasonable case, Mr. Tracy? Well, frankly, it's rather difficult. That's why I'd rather you handle this case than any one of our routine investigators. Uh, our company uh, insured Mrs. Blake's necklace, uh, Mr. Abbott. Mm -hmm. For how much? $200,000. Can Mrs. Blake describe the man who attacked him? Well, she's uh, quite vague about it, but... Uh, Something very fascinating came to me in the mail this morning. Oh, what is it? A note from the killer. May I see it? Mm -hmm. You'll uh, notice, of course, that it's been written very much like a ransom note in a kidnapping. No use of pens, pencils, or typewriter. The letters uh, look as though they've been cut out of uh, newspapers and pasted together. Yes, they do. He uh, makes what he believes is a business offer. As you see, he wants $50,000. For that sum, he'll leave the necklace where our company can find it. We return it to Mrs. Blake and uh, save $150,000. Yes, very wise, too. The thief knows he'd have a difficult time disposing of the pieces through a fence. It's identified too easily. Exactly. I see he doesn't mention how he proposes to have you give him the cash. I suppose he'd get in touch with you later. Exactly. Now, couldn't we trap him by promising to pay off at a certain place and uh, at a certain time? I doubt it. Nobody would try a swindle like this without planning it very carefully. Well, then what do we do? I'd like to talk to the dead man's wife. All right. I'll arrange for you to meet uh, Mrs. Blake. Oh, uh, and you'd better have your guard up. 
She's very beautiful. And very clever. I think of her as a kind of uh, Lucrezia Borgia. Oh, really? Yes, especially for one reason. And what's that? Lucrezia murdered her husband. I was gallivanting around San Francisco buying play suits for the summer. A very innocent cherub indeed. And that husband of mine was closeted in a private office with Mrs. Dexter Blake. Mrs. Blake, you say you hardly saw this man who shot your husband? Well, it was very dark, Mr. Abbott. He pushed us away from the lamppost into the doorway. I could just see his shadow. How tall was the shadow? Mm, average height. It's, well, it's very difficult for me to be accurate. I was terribly excited. I didn't notice details. Well, if you couldn't see very well, you could uh, hear. How about his voice? Mm, rather odd, come to think of it. He didn't sound like the usual gangsters. Seemed rather cultured. Mm -hmm. That all the information you can give me? Mm, I'm afraid so. Sorry I'm not being very helpful. Well, unfortunately, Mrs. Blake, these cases often lead to our having to ask embarrassing questions, probing into the darker corners of people's lives. Go right ahead. Are you getting along well with your husband? Oh, I suppose so. How well do people get along after they've been married quite a while? I'm not a philosopher, Mrs. Blake, just a detective. Did you have reason to believe your husband was, uh, well, mixed up in any activity he'd rather you didn't know about? Is that your diplomatic way of saying, was there another woman? I don't think so. I don't follow you, Mr. Abbott. I wear a necklace, a very expensive one. Some thief holds us up, becomes excited, shoots my husband. And you're making a whole French novel out of it. Yes, because Mrs. Blake, very often what looks like a simple hold-up or assault or what have you, is actually more complicated than it appears. It's often a cover-up for something more deeply motivated. I am not a woman of very deep motivations. My interests and desires are normal and obvious. As for my late husband... Yes? Dexter was not a man of many dimensions either. Just folks, huh? With a few million dollars. You're a detective, Mr. Abbott. Not a humorist. Who collects on your husband's life insurance? I do. All of it? All of it. How much is that? Oh, about half a million. Do you also inherit all his property? Mm-hmm. It's worth another million and a half. Mm -hmm. Well, we were speaking of motives a while ago. You'll need an awfully good attorney to get you out of this. Why? I'm perfectly innocent. Well, I have an intuitive feeling about you, Mrs. Blake. Nothing too definite to support it. I think you didn't care very much for Dexter, but you uh, had quite a passion for his checkbook. What of it? Well, for instance, you find yourself a mug. You make a deal with him. He holds you up, gets your $200,000 necklace as payment, and takes a pot shot at Dexter. You're the helpless wife. Dexter's a very dead pigeon. You come into Dexter's money, the mug disappears with his two hundred grand. Very nice. I could have had anything I wanted from Dexter. Do you think I'd trade in a comfortable spot like that for the electric chair? Maybe. Lots of people try it. You're wasting your time, Mr. Abbott. Oh, really? Oh, not that I mind. Being questioned by a very handsome detective is so pleasant. You've changed the subject. Certainly. You're much more interesting. Married, Mr. Abbott? Mm-hmm. Oh, good. That makes it more fun. Well, haven't you had enough entertainment these past few days? Mm, not of the right kind. You wrote my phone number in your notebook. Will you call me? What for? Why, you amaze me, Mr. Abbott. Some men have to be told everything. That night at home, Pat told me about the case. Only because he had to, as I found out soon enough. How dare you know my policy about keeping you out of my cases. Yes, teacher. Now, for once in your life, you're going to come in very handy. Oh, well, now you're getting sensible. You have such a brilliant wife, I never could see why you didn't use her talent. Yes, well, look, brilliant wife. 
There's a way to get at this guy who likes emeralds and target practice with millionaires. Well, how do you do it? With a decoy duck. <laughs> that me? Mm-hmm. Well, what do I do? We buy you a necklace. Oh, this gets better all the time. We buy you a cheap necklace. Are you and Jack Benny, huh? We get our friend Nick Scudder to put a line in this column about the gal who's always at the Stardust Club wearing a sensational necklace. That ought to start our boyfriend, who likes sparklers, chasing around after you. Now, he'd try to pick you up at the club. But I'm hard to get, huh? No, easy, very easy. Uh, this wouldn't be typecasting, would it? <laughs> now, to get the jewels you'll be wearing, he'll have to get you alone. So he'll probably ask you to his place. You'll both go outside and get a cab. Pat Abbott, do you mean to say you're actually suggesting that I go to a nightclub, make a pitch at a killer, and then take a taxi ride alone with him? Well, it'll be a special kind of cab. What's special about it? I'll be driving it. Hmm, sounds like quite a Halloween party. Well, it might not turn out to be so jolly, dear. That's what I don't like about my little scheme. You see, somebody in this deal might, uh... Might, uh, what? Might decide that your throat is a good place to put old razor blades... We bought a flashy-looking necklace. Nick Scudder plugged away in his column about, quote, the mysterious gal seen every night at the Stardust Club with a rock-studded horse collar that could pay the national debt, unquote. Outside the club a few nights later, Pat was at the wheel of a taxi. I was inside the club, sitting alone at the bar. A very oily-looking Joe came over to me, smiled, and, well, I knew this was our man. I fluttered my eyelids in the best Hollywood manner, and we were off to the races. Don't tell me you're one of those awful people who like to drink alone. No, no, no. I'm just new in town, and I haven't made friends yet. Well, you've made one now. My name's Al. Al Francis. Well, mine's Jean. Why do I join you for a drink? Not at all. Do you always play the big bad wolf with all the red riding hoods who come here? Just the beautiful ones. Uh -huh. They fascinate me for more reasons than one. Oh, what do you mean? I'm, uh, psychic about them. I'll take you, for instance. I'll make a guess. I'd say you were married to a very wealthy man. Much older than you are. You're sick of him. You're bored. You've come here for some excitement. Uh, go on. That much was a guess. Now I'll tell you something I'm very sure of. You're looking for excitement, lovely. You're shopping at the right counter. I wasn't quite sure if Al Francis was just being amorous or if he suspected I was a plant and might suddenly give me the same treatment he'd given Dexter Blake. We stayed at the Stardust Club for about an hour. Francis hardly even eyed my necklace. He became more romantic and suggested we go to his apartment. We stepped outside to hail a cab. A cab I knew would be driven by Pat. Hey, taxi. Oh, here comes one, Al. Oh, great. Go ahead, Jean. Step in. Where to, Doc? 1785, Bayside. Right. Nice to be alone for a while, huh, Gene? Just the two of us? Mm-hmm. Gene, every minute I was in the club, I... I wanted to kiss him. Oh, Al, the driver can see it. How does he care? Come here. Oh, Gene. Did I... you say 1785, Bayside? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. Look at those stars up there, Gene. See? Through the window. We mustn't let them go to waste. Just one kiss. Come close to me. Closer. Oh. Hey, Jim. Doc! I don't think there is any 1785 Bayside. I have reason to think there is, driver. You see, I've been living there for nine years. Oh, okay. Gene, honey, I never thought I'd be lucky enough to meet anyone like you. I always used to say to myself... Deep in my heart. Al, I said... Hey, you think the Yankees got a chance this year? Look, friend. Just drive the car. Okay, Doc. When you walked into the Stardust Club, Gene, 
I thought for a while that someone might be with you. Then I realized you were alone. It took a lot of courage to go over to you. I don't know what I'd done if you turned me down. We're together now. Have me 45 cents. Thanks. Come on, Jean. Well, I... I, I've sort of a headache. I've got just a thing for it. Come on. No, really, I, I think I'd, I'd better keep the cab and go home. I'm so tired. You'll feel better when we get upstairs. I have some turkey on ice and a bottle of rice. Yes, but thanks. Ah, no, don't I... disappoint me. Just for a few minutes, we can... Come on, bud. You heard the lady. She wants to go home. Who asked you to get into this? I invited myself. You know, I met some fresh cab drivers in my day, but you... Look, the you... lady has a headache. But she's going home now. Oh, you're going to get real cute about this, aren't you? Night, pal. I'd love to knock your teeth down your oh, throat. Oh, Al, don't start a fight with him, please. Well, come on, bud. Let's play rough. I don't like your face. I think I could fix it up a little. Well, Al, please. Cut... No one must know you and I are... All right, Gene. All right. I'll call you tomorrow. What's your number? Uh, just meet me at the club. Same time as tonight. Fine. Bye, Gene. Bye. <laughs> You're the most wonderful cab driver I've ever had, Pat. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Where to now? Just drive along the bay. But we don't live out this way. Yes, I know. But didn't you hear what the man said? We mustn't let those stars go to waste. Well, the fellow I borrowed the cab from is waiting. It's all right. Cab drivers understand things like that. Morning. Pat was just leaving his office. He was on his way to see Frank Tracy. Come in. Good morning, Mr. Abbott. Well, Mrs. Blake. Do you have a moment? I certainly. I've been wondering about what sort of progress you've been making. Have you found any clues to the identity of the man who killed my husband? Oh, I don't talk about my cases until they're cleared up. Oh, I think I have a right to know what you're doing. After all, I was married to Dexter. Frightened, Mrs. Blake? Why should I be? Afraid that what comes out in the wash won't be very pretty? Not in the least. I went to the trouble of looking into the details of your background, Mrs. Blake. I wouldn't exactly call it nice reading for the kiddies. Three husbands... One of them had to go to Mexico for his health when the Justice Department cracked down on the chemical monopoly. Another husband of yours has been barred from every racetrack in the country. Then there was that party in Hollywood where you ducked a marijuana charge that might have been five years in the clink. How did you get out of that one? I off the judge. Where'd you get all that information? I called up the answer man. Very funny. Shall I tell you why you really came here, Mrs. Blake? I want to know who killed my husband. You came here because the life insurance company is ready to ante up with a small fortune now. You're his beneficiary. You're afraid I could prevent that by coming up with evidence that you might have done the killing yourself. You want to make sure I'll stay out of the picture. You are going to stay out of the picture, Mr. Abbott. Well, I'll tell you the next step, too. Now comes the pearl-handled revolver in the pocketbook. When you get shot with one of those, you're just as dead as with the other kind. So help me if you stop from if you stop me from collecting Dexter's life insurance. That's I... a dime a dozen to me, Mrs. Blake. They're part of my business. I collect them, like other people collect butterflies. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blake. Look, you two-bit key old peeper. If you and your junior G-man badge stand between me and a couple of million bucks, it wouldn't mean a thing to me to kill you. I've done a little investigating myself. Details about your background. You're mixed up in half a dozen cases where one of the suspects might knock you off at any time. And if you're ever found dead, my friend, it'd take the police forever to figure who did it. They'd get into a jigsaw puzzle that'd have them flipping. And I don't mind telling you about it this way either, because I also found out your office isn't tapped. That's very thoughtful of you. I think of everything. Like, for instance, down at the piers, there are men who would be only too glad to take care of you for me. I can buy your death, Pat Abbott. A man no one ever heard of, no connection with you, bumps you off. Disappears on a boat to heaven only knows where. I wonder if you're so upset with me because I might cost you the two million bucks or because I froze up when you made a play for me. Oh, it's the two million. And as for you, personally, I... I said good afternoon, Mrs. Blake, a long time ago. 
You're underestimating me, Mr. Abbott. And you may not live to regret it. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blake. That little interruption over, Pat went on to the insurance company's office to see Frank Tracy. Now, Mr. Tracy, I think I've got your man. Really? Mm -hmm. Who is he? He lives at 1785 Bayside. Smooth-looking chap, tall, thin, dresses very well. Oh. How did you do it? Uh, did you see the necklace? How can you be sure? I arranged a trap for him. Got him to go after a necklace my wife purposely wore to the Stardust Club. I see. Well, uh, what are we waiting for? Why don't no, we... No, 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 no. If we sail in and grab him now, we won't have much evidence to hold him on. We've got to give him more rope. He's seeing my wife again tonight. Is he, uh, connected with Kathy Blake, as I suspected? Well, that's hard to tell. But give me another 24 hours. I think we'll strike oil. You mean we can arrest him within 24 hours? Probably. Excellent, Mr. Abbott, excellent. Now, uh, do be careful. Francis is liable to be very slippery. Oh, uh, how about Mrs. Blake? Do we just let her wander around? Yeah. Remember the nursery rhyme about the lost sheep? Leave them alone, and they'll come home. That night, I put on a very slinky evening gown. I was getting ready for another session at the club. But Pat stopped me. Ah, uh, you're not going to the club, Jean. Oh, Pat Abbott, just because you're going to close in on Francis, you're getting the willies. You're afraid I'll be hurt. No, that's not the reason. Well, then what is it? Francis won't be at the club to see you. He's going to be late. Very late. I couldn't follow Pat's reasoning at the moment. But, as I learned later, Francis was at home just then, having a visitor. One second. Sorry to keep you waiting. I... What are you doing here? Why the... Why the gun? I... I didn't make any mistakes. Put down the gun. Put down the gun. You did make a mistake, Al. No, Tracy, no. I I did everything you said. But I told you not to kill anyone, Al. Blake tried to stop me. He started screaming for the police. Then you should have beat it. Well, you told me... Where I... is the necklace? It's in the dresser drawer. Here, I... I'll get it for you. Here. Here's the necklace. Thank you, Al. Lovely, isn't it? I didn't mean to kill Blake. I just wanted to shut him up. I just meant to hit him in the leg. You were very careless. They're not too close to me, are they? Now, take your hide. Where is he? Who is he? Abbott. He's very close, Al. Too close for comfort. Well, well what do we do? Oh, well, the answer is simple. Well, can you get me out of here? Or get me out of the country, maybe? Till things cool off? No, Al. Well, then, give me my cut on the necklace. I know some people. They'll help. With 25 grand, I can travel fast. You're not getting any money. Well, then what... It's terribly dangerous for me to have you alive, Al. You get rattled too easily. You might say something that would be very embarrassing. Oh, now, me. wait, wait, Tracy. Uh, listen, uh, listen to me. I don't want to cut. I I wouldn't sing to Abbott. I'll go away. That's all I want. I, I, want, I want to get away. You, you've got to let me. Uh... Sorry, Al. It would be stupid of me to let you go. Wherever you are, you're a potential threat to me. Now, we're wasting time. Oh, don't shoot, so... Tracy. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Drop the gun, Tracy. What? Abbott. Ow. Oh, oh, my hand. Keep away from that window, Al. Oh. I've got more bullets than I like playing rough, remember? You're the, the cab driver. That's right. I overheard your conversation, Tracy. Al wasn't half as careless as you were. Look, maybe we we can make a deal, Abbott. What do you say, uh... How about a deal? Your company had a very high recovery rate on jewelry, Tracy. And you insisted on not working with the police. That seemed kind of strange. But you clinched it yourself the last time we talked. When I told you I'd found our man, you said Francis is liable to be very slippery. I'd never mentioned his name, Tracy. Look, I... I I've got plenty of money, Abbott. Uh, make it worth your while to forget this. 
I purposely told you I wasn't closing in on Al for 24 hours. I knew you'd come in here to see him. Now, get up, Tracy. How's 10,000 cash right now? Stand up. 15,000? I said stand up. You too, Al. I've got the same taxi waiting, Francis. The one we were in before. But this time, we'll all have a nice, quiet, smooth ride. This time, we'll have a police escort. A few hours later, Pat had disposed of his two friends and had come home to his ever-loving wife. Well, darling, I suppose you're full of questions, as usual. As usual. Tracy had a very cushy spot figured out for himself, didn't he, Pat? He sure did. The lug steals the jewelry. Tracy gets his company to shell out, uh, oh, say, $50,000 to get it back. And Tracy quietly splits it with his pal. The company saves a fortune. Gal gets her necklace. Everything is moonlight and roses. <laughs> 